Curran is an expert when it comes to data visualizations. This is an edited collection of live streams where Curran teaches data visualization using D3. So, hi everyone. I'm Curran. Welcome to this stream. Get it right in black and white. I am super, super excited about this. This new series, which I'm calling Get It Right in Black and White, is going to be a long-running live stream series and course on data visualization with SVG and D3 and uh, maybe other technologies we will weave in in time. But uh, that's the theme. A little bit about what this course is. I'm very excited to begin again from the beginning. I have learned a lot from teaching this course in 2018 and 2020. This is the 2018 version of the course, which was quite popular, and it's visualization with D3. This is the 2020 version of the course uh, called DataViz 2020. It was recently published by Free Code Camp as a giant compilation. But having taught this entire course twice now, actually three times, the first time it wasn't public, I've learned quite a lot. And one of the th main pieces of feedback that I've got from DataViz 2020 is that, you know, that's cool and all, but how can I do all that stuff without React? So one of the key differences from the last year's version of this is that it's going to be oriented around pure D3, meaning figuring out all these visualization problems purely with D3, but coding it in such a way that if you wanted to, you could integrate with different frameworks. Another key difference is that this is going to be live. It's going to be like a TV show about data visualization. So you can tune in live to the event. I'm going to have, you know, YouTube chat open and I'll be responsive to that during the event. And I'm also inviting a small group of friends and special guests to participate um, with me live on the stream with their audio. So we can have direct discussions during this event. Um, the reason why I'm doing this is because in previous courses, I was sitting there all alone making these videos. And if I forgot to say something or cover something, it would come up only, you know, a week later. That's why I want to have this live element to it. This is a great opportunity to explain everything step by step. So I'm, there's lots of time here. I think this series, my intention at the moment is to have this series go for about a year. So this will be a recurring event every single Saturday for a year at this time. I mean, I might change the time, but uh, there's lots of time. So there's no need to rush through anything. There's no need to skip anything. So I want to build up um, the viewer's understanding step by step, every step of the way. So that's the overall summary of uh, this course. So introductions. There are a couple here, a, a couple folks here present in audio only via Google Meet. Um, this is my sort of little, uh, you know, community of collaborators slash learners. Um, you know, the idea is that these folks can step in, we can have discussions on the fly. Um, I can be interrupted and be asked questions to go into more detail about whatever thing is happening. So why don't you all just introduce yourselves? I think I'll, I'll call on you one by one. Um, ideally, you want to go first? Uh, sure, thank you, Karun. Um, hello, everyone. I am Adil, and I'm very glad to be here. I'm based in the UK, and I uh, work in the informatics department of a, a hospital. And uh, my work is a bit SQL heavy, but uh, I became enamored with D3 a while back, and I'm really excited to be learning it uh, deeply. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here. Nice. Welcome, Adil. Um, Sri Ram Sharma is also here. You want to go, Sri Ram? Sure. Hi. Um, 
my name is uh, shriram um, i used to be a journalist uh, uh, now i'm learning to become a front end web developer uh, i have uh, been following uh, d3 through current tutorials and uh, been a big fan of his uh, database 2020 uh, database uh, 2020 and even the 2018 uh, series so i'm i'm really looking forward to this uh, series as well and just kind of uh, learning more from uh, current on d3 as much as possible nice yeah welcome shiram and also nita is here you want to go hello everyone my name is nita uh, i am also uh, very much interested into data visualization and i see this uh, live stream as an opportunity to learn directly from karan and his time is really valuable but uh, he managed to do this streaming so i'm planning on getting benefited from it as much as i can and i hope uh, you also you all also get benefited from it it's a really good series he's doing all right welcome nita all right here we go this is episode 1 of get it right in black and white svg fundamentals what we'll cover today is what is HTML, CSS, and SVG? Adding an SVG element to an HTML page, creating circles, rectangles, and lines, adding text in SVG, and customizing the font with CSS. All right, so HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. This is the standard that defines the language of web pages that you see on the web. Every single web page is an HTML page. There's some source code that somebody wrote or that gets generated on the fly that has markup with those brackets and everything and your browser loads that in and it parses that HTML page and then displays it in your browser. So when you go to a URL in your browser that makes an HTTP request to some server. HTTP means Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That's the, you know, the protocol, the networking protocol that web browsers use. So the browser makes an HTTP request to some server. That server comes back with an HTTP response that has a bunch of text, which is HTML source code. And then when that source code gets loaded into your browser, uh, your browser parses it, meaning in, it interprets it, and then it does a whole bunch of stuff to make the web page appear. Within the HTML standard, there are um, APIs, application programming interfaces, that are sort of uh, partitioned off. One of them is SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. Another is CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. And another is JavaScript, which is often abbreviated JS. I'll go into detail on each of these a little bit. These Wikipedia pages are great. I would recommend to read them if these are new concepts for you. HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, um, it was invented in 1993, 28 years ago. That's very old. Uh, by Tim Berners-Lee. And it, it went through many, many revisions. And each revision introduced a lot of new features. Right now we're at HTML5. And um, this standard is maintained by this group called W3C, World Wide Web Consortium. So it's an open standard, and all these various browsers implement it. And this is what a, a very basic HTML page looks like. And I'll, I'll go into more detail later on the specifics. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. It is a style sheet language. So it's, it, it is its own different language that gets embedded within HTML. And... Um, it looks, um, see if I can find an example. It looks something like this, 
where inside of a style tag, these things are called tags, by the way, there's an opening tag and a closing tag, you can select elements on the page, like an H1 element, which is a heading 1 element, and you can set a bunch of properties on it, like the color, and there's many, many, many properties that you can use. This is very useful for styling things on the page. And when I say styling, I mean changing the color, the font, the size, um, all sorts of different presentation kind of uh, attributes. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. So Scalable Vector Graphics, it's a way of representing computer graphics that is based on the geometries and the shapes. So for example, if you have the letter S and you zoom it in with SVG, uh, because it's vector graphics, you don't lose any crispness because the graphics are defined in terms of the geometries themselves. Points and, you know, lines that connect the points as opposed to raster images like uh, PNGs, bitmaps, JPEGs. These are images defined in terms of pixels. And a pixel is one of these little squares on your screen. Um, so if you zoom it, the pixels will get uh, blown up or blurry. Um, often when you scale a raster, it ends up getting blurry uh, because the rendering engine tries to compensate. Um, so, so that's what happens with raster images when you scale them. They get pixelated or blurry. That's because they're defined in terms of pixels, not the geometries. And this is um, one of the many reasons why SVG is really good for data visualization, because if you define a visualization with SVG shapes, um, you can, for example, output that to a PDF and print it out, and it's very crisp when you print it. Um, in a web browser, you can use the browser zoom and scale it, and it doesn't lose any clarity. And that's one huge advantage of SVG. And also, it's generally easy to work with programmatically, because it's got this um, DOM structure, which I'll get into. But you can, you can define um, tags, essentially, in HTML for these different SVG shapes. So that's what HTML is, in a nutshell. Um, any questions so far? Sure. I was um, wondering, um, SVG um, elements, are they designed to um, create things that HTML can't do normally? Is that why SVG exists? So the question is, um, can, H, can SVG elements do things that you can't do in HTML without SVG? Yes. That's right. Yes, that's right. Um, I believe in the early days of HTML, SVG was not a part of HTML. And you were limited to uh, things like divs to make shapes. And that was it's very limiting to just use divs and CSS to make graphics on the screen. So there are many, many, many things that you can do in SVG that you can't do in HTML without SVG. Uh, there's a, it, it's, it's a massive library, essentially, of graphics capabilities. Um, paths, lines, areas, different ways of blending the colors together, uh, all sorts of text utilities, um, yeah, a great many things. And, and, and it's, SVG has a, a history as an image format as well. So um, tools like Adobe Illustrator can be used to create SVG image files, which if you open up an SVG image file, you see the text, it looks a lot like HTML. It's actually um, I guess a subset of XML. 
So yeah, it, it does introduce a lot of capabilities to HTML that, that HTML does not have without SVG. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And and we'll get into those those specifics and see what they are. So in Wikipedia it says SVG is an extensible markup language. Yeah. So I'm confused. Is it's a language itself or it's just a tag in HTML? Uh, well, actually, if you read this text carefully, it says scalable vector graphics is an XML based vector image format. So it's confusing how Wikipedia does this, but the way to parse it, it says it's, it's extensible markup language based, meaning it's based on XML. And XML is, is a good thing to know about for context because it, it defines the structure of SVG and HTML. In a sense, HTML, it used to be at least a strict subset of XML. I think now there's some more language features of HTML than XML. But XML, I think, came first. So the comments that you see in HTML are derived or inherited from XML. Um, the notion of tags with openings and closing is from a XML. And so what it says in the Wikipedia article is that SVG is based on XML. So you don't have any good example documents there, but just the fact that um, SVG is defined in terms of tags that can be nested, that's, that's all that it means, that it's based on XML. HTML is derived from XML. Yes, correct. But yeah, great question. Great question. I think I'll move on. I think Shriram has a question. Oh, did you, Shriram? Which chat? No, I just had an observation. Uh, one was that like, fonts which we use typically on the browser, uh, they are vector-based. Um, that was kind of like a thing I realized because you can scale up the fonts without losing any quality. So that's like a realization that that's a vector-based format, whatever type we import into our files uh, when creating an HTML file. Um, another observation was that uh, you know document formats that use the XML for syntax. This includes like RSS, Atom, yes, Soap. So uh, people might have used maybe RSS feed readers most likely. Soap protocols is used more by developers. I think were making uh, web uh, API, things like that. So that's unlikely, but essentially it's just following that same format. Even HTML is, I think, similar to the XML format in a sense. Yes. Yep, it's very, yeah, and, very similar. And another thing was that XML was considered to be the way that uh, everything was supposed to be written but then json came in and json has become now the de facto way for applications to talk to each other that's so right what has happened is there's been a reversal of fortune because xml is actually too verbose and there's a lot of craft um, in an xml document which is kind of removed in something like uh, json json is more readable which is why it's become more popular is what i've heard yeah, that's true. Yeah, there, and I'll get into this when we start getting into like fetching data, but there is a, a long history to to the idea of um, fetching data. It used to be that the only like the only way to fetch data into the browser was to use XML files, and so that XML text would contain data. And nowadays, people have migrated to use JSON instead, JavaScript object notation. But yeah, long story short, nowadays people use JSON, and XML is sort of a thing in the of the past. Uh, except for those you know legacy systems that still use it, like SOAP 
is using XML, I bet there's still a ton of software that, that uses XML as data interchange. But for new projects, yeah, the, the preference is to use JSON. All right, awesome. Thanks for the questions, everyone. Now, let's actually use these things to create some basic shapes with SVG. Now I'd like to get into the segment on creating stuff by writing code. And to do this, I'm going to use VizHub, which is this thing that I built over the past couple years, uh, essentially to help me teach my courses. Uh, and I'm trying to evolve it into a business. And there, it's quite an active community. There's you know 5,000 or so um, unique users over the course of its history, and there's a ton of content in here, and people are using it every day. So this is what I'm going to use for this entire series. And you too can use VizHub. So if you're following along um, with the live stream or watching this as a video, I encourage you to follow the steps that I'm about to do. So in VizHub, um, to start really using it, you have to sign in via GitHub. So I'm going to sign into GitHub. So now I'm signed in and I can see my profile or create viz. So if you click on create viz, there are a lot of these templates here. The most popular template is just a starter HTML page which is where we're going to start from today. So what I'm going to do next is fork this, meaning to make a copy of it that I can modify. And you can do the same once you're logged in. If you click on this little fork icon, you get this little uh, pop-up that says, you know, choose a name for this viz. And I'm going to say SVG uh, fundamentals as my name. So now I've got a copy of this and I can click open editor right here to see this um, little browser based IDE essentially. Um, IDE by the way stands for integrated development environment. Um, it's not an advanced IDE here by any stretch but it lets you edit code right here in the browser. So if you click a file, it pops open and you can see some details. I'm going to just remove stuff that we don't need um, because I really want to sort of start from the beginning here. And VizHub has all these options to, you know, reclaim screen real estate. A lot of this stuff I built specifically for teaching. So, here we have a very, very bare bones HTML page. Now I'm going to get into the details of what is a bare bones HTML page. First of all, we've got the doc type. This is a thing that tells the browser, okay, this document uses HTML version 5. And, uh, yeah, it's not strictly required. Like, I think it would work without it, but it's good practice, from what I hear, to include it. So once you've told the browser that we're using HTML5, then you can open up into this block of HTML. And so I just want to point out that the structure of HTML is, in general, you've got an opening tag and a closing tag. And a tag is defined by these um, greater than, less than things here. And a closing tag has this slash after the uh, this less than symbol right here. And once you've got this opening and closing tag pair, you can put a bunch of stuff inside it, essentially developing a tree data structure. And that's what XML is. It's really a tree data structure, meaning there's nodes and, and, and each node has children. So 
when you define a, a pair of opening and closing tags, that's a that's defining um, a node, a DOM node. DOM means D-O-M, uh, Document Object Model. So when this HTML page gets loaded and parsed and it, r it runs in the browser, the browser, in parsing this and running it, creates this thing called the DOM, the Document Object Model. And so this is the document, the source code, and the Document Object Model is this data structure that gets created from this stuff. And so this is the root node of the DOM, which is a tree data structure. And then this root node has two children, the head and the body. So you can see it very clearly here. There's the head and the body. The head of an HTML page, it defines stuff that sort of uh, is not directly visible on the page, but may have some side effects. Uh, for example, the title tag is a tag that goes into the head and it's, um, I believe it's actually required to, to have a valid HTML document. Um, so if you were to have a text file on your machine called index.html and double click it and open it in the browser, um, the, the tab would say X SVG fundamentals. And um, to that point, I want to stress the fact that you can do all this stuff without using VizHub. So let me just um, show you what I mean. I won't spend too much time on this, but I want to stress that this is all using standard technologies, and there's nothing really VizHub specific about any of this. So if I make a new directory called test, I'm using Linux here, and I create a file called index.html, and I save this file, and then I open up this folder, you can see, okay, there is a file called index.html, and if I double click that, it opens in the browser, and check it out. It says SVG fundamentals in the tab. So that's the role of the title tag. See all these different pages, they have different text in the tab. All of those are derived from the title tag inside of those HTML pages. And then, if you right click in the browser, you can say view page source. You can do this on any web page. And it shows you the source code of that page, which was just loaded in from this text file on my machine. So this little diversion is just to say that you don't have to use VizHub per se. Uh, this is one of the complaints that I've gotten in my previous courses. Like, he doesn't tell us how to not use VizHub. Um, VizHub is a tool that makes it easier to get started writing code right away without having to set up a local development environment. But for this SVG stuff, you don't need any development environment. You can just double click the file uh, and it should all work. In VizHub, the title tag, it feeds into the title of the viz, which you see here on the page. Also in VizHub, there's a file called readme.md. And um, I'm just going to delete all that stuff. It, this is just where you can add the description of this page. I'll type something here like a demonstration of SVG shapes. So the idea is you can use this readme.md to add a text description to your viz. And then um, you can close out the editor and then share a link. Like, this is just how VizHub works. You can share links to these things with other people, and then this page will load up without the editor open. All right. So now that we've got this basic page here, how do we create SVG shapes? Well, um, it turns out you can put SVG elements into the body. The body 
is the part of the HTML document that contains things that end up visible on the actual page. So just to give uh, a little preview, if we say hello world right here, then hello world pops up in really tiny text on the running page. And for this sort of thing, I like to use the mini mode of VizHub, which will show the running page right there. And I can edit the text over here. So to create something with SVG, we can create an SVG element right here in the body. So we can have an opening SVG tag and then a closing SVG tag. And this opens up a world of possibilities uh, because within this pair of opening and closing SVG tags, we can put tags that are not valid outside of SVG. For example, circle. We can put a circle right here. And again, it's all tags, so you have to have opening and closing. So we've got circle, um, not circle. I like to phrase, a lot of people phrase the closing tag as not. So you could say body, not body, SVG, not SVG, circle, and then not circle. But the circle doesn't actually show because there's no, um, there's no attributes of it defined. And in HTML, attributes are specified like this. CX equals um, 50. Um, CX is the attribute that defines the center X coordinate of the circle in pixels. So if we set CX to be 50 and CY to be 50, we still don't have anything showing up because there's no radius defined. The radius of the circle you can define with R. So if I say R is 50, now we get a circle. Current. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, just to recap, the an element, whether it's a HTML element or a SVG element, that is a group of tags. Is that is that right? It's, it is the the difference between element and a tag. Is it is that quite um, important to know? Yeah, that's actually a really great point. It's it's real. Oh, thank you so much. This is what this is so good. The distinction between element and tag is is very confusing. Um, I feel like a lot of people, even folks who have that have been doing this stuff for a long time, don't really grok what the difference is. So my understanding of what the difference is between an element and a tag is that a tag strictly refers to the text in the source code of the HTML. So this, you know, when I select this text on my screen, that's an SVG tag, and that's a closing SVG tag. And then when the page runs in the browser, that tag, which is part of the source code, it's part of the text of the source code, um, all of these tags get parsed by the browser into this tree data structure called the document object model. And then in that document object model, the instantiation of that object is called the element. So this set of tags in the source code, when parsed, leads to the creation of an SVG element and a circle element inside of that SVG element. And you can see these elements using the Chrome dev tools, which is a really essential thing. Uh, so if I right click here on that circle in Chrome and click on inspect, it opens up what's called the Chrome dev tools. And you can arrange these however you like. I prefer them at the bottom. Um, I'll make it bigger with control plus. So you can see here that this is the SVG element that's actually instantiated on the page. 
and see when you hover over the SVG element, that little box appears. And that box, by the way, is the default dimensions of SVG when you don't specify width and height. Um, you'll also notice that that box is not flush with the edge of, of the page. So all of these things we will be addressing. But yeah, to your point, the element is what's instantiated in the browser after the page runs. The tag is just the text in the source code. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. So, so tags are used to describe what gets created at runtime. Exactly. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Yep. Um, and and by the way, I want to highlight that these Chrome Dev Tools are are so amazing because you can actually edit the DOM. So if I change CX to say a hundred in the Chrome Dev Tools, the circle moved over. And if I change the radius to five hundred, here it, it gets bigger. It well, it fills the entire space of the <laughs> SVG because SVG, this SVG element has the default width and height, so we can set the width to be um, 960 and the height to be 500. These are the default dimensions inherited from blocks.org, uh, which VizHub also uses. So what we're doing here is, um, I would call it manual DOM manipulation. So manually manipulating the document object model using the Chrome DevTools. And uh, when you hear the term DOM manipulation, that's usually when a JavaScript program reaches into the DOM and changes it around at runtime. And that's what D3 does. That's what React does. That's what Vue does, Svelte, all these things. Uh, jQuery, <laughs> the original, uh, they all do DOM manipulation. And so that's another key distinguishing factor between tags and elements. I mean, a tag is just, it's static. It just gets loaded once from the source code, but an element, the instantiation of the tag is dynamic, meaning it can change at runtime. So it's, I'm changing it manually by, you know, changing this text in the Chrome DevTools, but you can also make these same kind of dynamic changes using JavaScript. And we'll do that in uh, future episodes. But now, if, I, if this program reruns again, if I trigger a rerun by editing it, all of those changes are lost. So um, at this point, I noticed some folks uh, poking their head into this file. Uh, I saw Anita and Sriram in there in terms of their presence cursors. And um, I want to take this opportunity to open up this viz to be edited in real time by you all. So I'm going to go to the collaborators and add both of you. And I'll add ideal too, just in case. So this is a feature of VizHub where you can give people permission to edit the document in real time. And I see some edits are already being made. Um, whoever's editing, you want to describe what's going on? Yeah, I'm editing it. It's just so much fun. Right? <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is amazing. So, okay, a copy of the circle was made. And the fill was set to be red. This is perfect. Fill is an attribute of SVG elements that defines the color of the inside of the shape. And notice that the formatting is a little different. Um, there's single quotes in use here, uh, and there's spaces around the equal sign. Uh, but I've used single uh, double quotes. Um, I just want to say it, it doesn't really matter in terms of how the program runs. But uh, stylistically, you can uh, unify 
all of this stuff with a utility called Prettier. Prettier is an, an amazing uh, utility that automatically formats code, and it's built into VizHub. Oh, I see you just use Prettier. Nice. If you click this little colorful P, it auto formats the code in VizHub to be consistently formatted. Wow, this is really cool. Really cool. So CX is 150 on the red circle, meaning it's moved over to the right. Um, I, I want to clarify that, that the coordinate space of SVG, it has um, the origin in the upper left. So the upper left is actually the coordinate 0, 0. And then as X increases, the shape moves over, uh, where's my screen? The shape moves to the right. And as Y increases, the shape moves down. And the Y direction is inverted relative to what you see in like math textbooks with graphs and stuff. Um, or in data visualizations, <laughs> Y typically goes up. So that's that's going to be, a, it's a source of confusion. Um, oftentimes when developing visualizations, Y is flipped. So just to be aware, that's the coordinate space of SVG. So I see some edits are being made where there's a rectangle at X equals 400, but that's not going to show up because the SVG currently still has its default width and height. So I'm going to just change that by saying width is um, 960 and height is 500. Now the SVG should uh, fill up the page, and it does. Um, this is quite the little party going on here. We've got a green circle, we've got a red circle, we got a rectangle. This is great. So let me just use prettier on this so we can see clearly this rectangle. Rectangles are another, you know, fundamental SVG shape. Uh, it's You can create a rectangle with the rect element. X and Y are the coordinates of the upper left corner of that rectangle. Uh, rectangles can have width and height. Uh, these are all in pixels. Uh, and yeah, fill set to none means that the shape is transparent, that there's no fill inside of it. And stroke, stroke is an attribute of SVG elements um, that you could apply. You can apply to circles, rectangles, uh, a lot of different shapes, and that's the outline. And so stroke equals blue means that this thing here has a, a blue outline now. And stroke width is what you can use to control the thickness of that outline. So if I set the stroke width to be like 20, we can see that that rectangle is actually the outer rectangle. And, and check that out. That outer rectangle is actually above the circles. That's another thing about SVG is that um, in, in SVG, you can't control the Z index by setting the Z index CSS property, which you can with other HTML elements. The Z index means which, which thing comes on top of which other things. The Z ordering uh, is purely dependent on the ordering of the stuff in the document itself. So that's why this rectangle is on top of those circles. But check this out. If I move the black circle to be, to be after that rectangle, see how it appears on top now? So that's why, um, that's what I mean when I say the Z ordering is determined by the ordering in the SVG document. And that becomes super, super important uh, when you're in the weeds of making a visualization. It's like a fundamental thing that you really need to understand. So how about this? Let's collectively um, clean this up a little bit. Um, these rectangles. Let's have like one rectangle, one circle. 
or no, we the, it's multiple circles are it's nice in a way. Um, I also wanted to introduce the SVG element of a line. So you can have a line element, begin line, end line, and that line has x1. So if I put x1 at 0, y1 at 0, x2 at maybe 100, and y2 at 100 should create a line. Um, it does not, and I believe that's because we have not set the stroke on the line. I think lines might be invisible in, until you set a stroke on them. There we go. Now you can see that little line. Um, Karen, I, yeah. I noticed something earlier uh, when the height of the SVG was, uh, I think, maybe halfway down, and the nice big yellow rectangle was only only half of it was showing. And I was wondering whether that meant you could create uh, shapes and elements outside of that, uh, out of outside of the width and height. Uh, does that mean uh, when one set of width and a height on the SVG element in the SVG, SVG tag, sorry, that only shows a partial view of what's what's being created or is it like a sort of a window, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's correct. See, if we, if we were to change the width, for example, to be 400 or let's say 500, it clips everything that falls outside of that. So if you inspect the, the SVG element, you can see that it's bounded at this square, which is 500 and 500. The outer SVG element clips the things that are inside of it, um, because the, the browser gives the SVG only the screen real estate of its width and height. And the things inside of it may well be outside of those that width and height. I mean, if we set x to 600, that rectangle is going to be totally off to the side and it's going to get clipped out and you won't be able to see it. So, yeah, I mean, you can you can totally put stuff in an SVG that's outside the bounds of the width and height and you just won't be able to see it. Yeah, and and there's a a similar construct called an SVG clip path that I think we'll get into a, a lot later on. But that with an SVG clip path, you can you can use these shapes to clip other shapes inside of it. Like say, if you had a texture, you could clip the texture by a circle, things like that. I'll get into all that quite a bit later on. Oh, I see. There's a path. Who made that path? I think it was Sri Ram. Do you want to talk about that? Sorry, Kurt. Um, I was just actually playing around with uh, an SVG that I downloaded from Icon Monster. Nice. And, uh, so I thought I'll just try and paste some elements out of it to see what exactly it's doing. Uh, yeah, Very so cool. It's, like it's actually an element from um, this thing that just creates an X button, um, like a menu X button. Nice. So. Like we have these burger icons, right? Like which are pretty much now the idiom for menu. Yep. Uh, so so I was just going through that. It was an SVG. And did it work? Did it show up there? Yeah, actually it did. I saw a small like line uh, cutting across the black circle. So that line, I believe, was the one that I had added. See, if I set the stroke width on that line, you can see it uh, should get bigger there. I don't know if that path is visible. So let me let me do this. I'll inspect the element. And the path, somehow the path is not showing up there in the SVG. Is it valid? Oh, it's got a self-closing tag. I, I don't believe that's, uh, that's not valid. Um, HTML. It, it may be valid JSX, 
but in HTML yeah. you have you have to explicitly close the the tag like this, not path. Now it should show up. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Like, doesn't have closing tag. There it is. Yeah, yeah. You, in 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 straight HTML, a closing tag is strictly required, except for certain elements, like maybe an image element, IMG. I don't know, but uh, but yeah, there's that path. It is there. It's a nice little rounded, uh, a rounded line there. Is there um is there a difference between line and path, or, or is is one based on the other? Um, because that that um, I suppose one could use either either thing to create a straight line like like the line shown in path. Yes, there there's a huge difference. Line is just is just a straight line from point A to point B, point A being um, x one y1 point b being x2 y2 but path is a much much more generic thing that you can use to construct all sorts of shapes really um, it's got this domain specific language as part of it so let me let me edit this path because this string this string looks very cryptic and uh, when you when you have icons and, and stuff that are defined in SVG, you do have these cryptic strings that you can copy paste over. But these cryptic strings actually use a language. They use their own language. So I'm going to actually edit this particular string. I'm going to make um, some edits right in here to clarify how this little domain specific language works. Let me preserve that one just so we have it as a reference. I'll make a new I'll make a new path. So D equals this domain specific string that's specifically for SVG paths. M is the move to command. So M, if we want to move to um, let's say 400, 400 move to the x coordinate 400 and the y coordinate 400 it's like that and then there's another command that you can issue which is the l command which is line to and and this is how it works like this is one command in this little domain specific language it means move to this these coordinates it's like putting a pen down it's like move your pen to this place and then l means line to means draw a line from that place to the other place. So if I, if I say L uh, 500 comma 500, it should draw a little line. And I believe I have to say, I need to, I need to specify a stroke. So I'll, this, I'll say the stroke is black. And see there, there it is. There's that little line there, which is, which is our path. And you may be thinking, well, that's the kind of stuff you can do with an SVG line. But check this out. Um, you, can, you can add another line to command attached to that one. So let's say if we go L500, um, 600, what does that do? Oh, it's actually off the screen. Let me just bring everything down. So move to 200, 200, line to... 300, 300, and then another line to, let's say, 300, 400. Um, you can see that it has created this filled-in shape there. And it's filled in because fill is automatically set to black. So if I say fill equals none, Now it's just this uh, this path here, and and let me in increase the stroke width too, so you can see it. So here's an example of a path that's actually comprised of two line segments. This is the first line segment, and this is the second line segment. And so this one here uh, is actually that path element, and the path element is what is used 
to construct line charts, for example, that are data driven. Instead of having a bunch of separate lines that are separate elements, you can just have one path element that is comprised of many lines. And same thing for area charts. If you just use the fill, it becomes this filled in area. So you can use um, you can use paths for areas and area charts. Paths are also also used for um, geometries in maps, like you know the shape of uh, a country or what have you. So I think that's all I really want to cover today. But I feel like that's a lot. Oh, and by the way, this is how you can make comments in HTML. Begin it with this uh, exclamation mark and two dashes, and then end it with two dashes and a and a um, a less than a greater than symbol or less than symbol. Yeah, th those are HTML comments. So I see there's some activity in the YouTube chat. Let me address those. There's a question, can you make layers, like circle on top of another circle? I see when I was talking, someone made that edit. And in fact, yes, you can see that there's there's the circle below and the circle above. And yeah, the layering is just purely based on the ordering of the document. So if I were to take this smaller circle and put it before uh, then it would be essentially invisible because it's actually behind the red circle, which we can see if we if we move it around a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that's how you would create layers, is by just making sure one comes after the other in the document, and the one on top is smaller, so you can see that what's behind it. Yeah, great question. Adil, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I was just, just curious uh, about the path elements, uh, specifically the D attributes. And yeah. um, I was just, uh, is there a difference between uh, the letters, if they're uppercase or lowercase? And um, uh, is, is that is that something that um, you, you, you've had to do before? To Because uh, I'm not sure exactly what the difference is. Um, and uh, it would be, it'd be uh, I was just wondering if you Sure. Yeah, um, let's find out. If I make it a lowercase m, it seems to still work. And a lowercase l, oh, uh, looks like that did something different, actually. So um, it appears it is case sensitive. Uh, to learn more about this, I, I would suggest the MDN article about SVG paths because it's an entire language. It says the D attribute is a value of string. It is animatable, yes. Um, and somewhere in here, yeah, here it is. These are all the path commands. So there are a ton of these path commands. Uh, but more often than not, you don't need to construct these commands yourself because there's some utility that generates it. Often you encounter these like uh, if you want to put icons into your SVG, you can you can copy paste these paths from an icon SVG file. Um, with data visualization, there's a package called D3 Shape that we'll use later that actually generates these strings for you. So usually, you can treat this D attribute as a black box that you don't really need to know about. Like, you don't really need to understand it. Um, but I wanted to go into a little detail now because it's good to just know um, the structure of it. Um, and I see in this example there are spaces. Like, I think it could have spaces in it, and it would be fine. Yeah, it works just the same. And I feel like I've seen space delimited coordinates. Yeah, that works too. You don't even need the commas. So there, there is some flexibility there in terms of the structure, but it looks like it is case sensitive, maybe uppercase L and lowercase L. Um, honestly, I don't know. They might be different commands or something. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it yeah, says, 
absolute versus relative coordinates. Um, it could be. Uh, just, yeah, in the note just below your, where you're highlighting. Ah, yes. Ah, oh, look at that. Uppercase is absolute and lowercase is relative based on the differences. Oh, that's quite interesting. So let's let me just see if I uh, really understand that. In our path, we've got a move to command, and let's let's see this second line to command. It uses the absolute coordinates 300, 400. But in if we were to rephrase that in terms of relative coordinates with the lowercase l, the change in x would be zero, and the change in y would be 100, and we get the same result. Yes. That's what it is. Nice. Nice. I'm actually learning that just now. <laughs> so thanks for that. Oh, there's a question in the YouTube channel. Uh, did you say there was a get it right in black and white channel in the U in the D3 Slack? Yeah, you know, um, I was going back and forth mentally about how I wanted to deal with the... Um, asynchronous communication for this and what I've decided is um, for now at least I want to try to use the VizHub forum for these um, communications not the D3 Slack uh, mainly because the D3 Slack is very um, transient um, but if you feel strongly let me know. I mean, I, I, I may end up creating a D3 Slack channel for, for this series. I'm not sure. But I used I used Slack in the past for, for the DataViz 2020 series, and there was so much really great activity in the D3 Slack that is currently gone forever, lost to the sands of time, uh, because Slack doesn't preserve its history with the D3 Slack, which is on the free plan of Slack. So that's why... Um, I want to use this VizHub forum thing instead. So, um, in the YouTube stream, there's a link to the blog post about it. And in the blog post, there's a link to the forum index. And the forum index looks like this. Uh, this is a page that I plan to maintain that will have an index of all the resources for all of the episodes. And right now there's just episode one, which doesn't really have anything in here yet. But this is what I want to leave you with. As we close out today, I want to leave you all who are watching with an exercise. Uh, this is another differentiator between this series and last series. Um, I want to give exercises at the end of each and every episode um, so that you all can engage with this stuff and try your hand at it and share your work and hopefully we'll build up a community of people who are following this series uh, and participating and so here's what I want you to do make something creative with basic SVG shapes and do that by uh, you know fork, fork uh, the hello HTML example or you can fork the example that we made today. And I'm just going to remove collaborators right now so we can like freeze it the way that it is uh, as a record of today. And so you can fork this viz to do your um, exercise. And by the way, in this VizHub forum software, which is an instance of discourse, what you can do is uh, put a VizHub link on its own line, and it will unfurl to include a thumbnail. So when you share your work, that's what you can do. Let me just sign in so I can edit. Uh, so you can fork this example. And what I'm going to do is drop that VizHub link and on its own line. And you see what happens here. Um, it unfurls. So yeah, that's what I'll leave you with today. Uh, if you followed along, enjoyed this, please go ahead. 
uh, fork this thing, modify it, and share your work here. Um, and feel free to ask questions also in this in this forum thread. Um, I'm hoping that this forum works out well as a platform for discussions and stuff. Um, if there if it doesn't, I might introduce a Slack channel. Um, or a Slack channel might be good to have anyway. I'm not sure. We'll see. Uh, stay tuned for that. So welcome, everyone, to episode two of Get It Right in Black and White. Um, I'm just so pumped to do this. So we've got Adil here. We've got Nita here. Some others may join. But uh, in the meantime, we can start. Episode two is going to be about pseudo visualizations. What that means is we're going to use basic SVG shapes to approximate visualizations. And this will make sure that, you know, we really grok the fundamental shapes that go into making visualizations. What we'll cover today, and this is aspirational, I may not get to all of these, but I am going to review the exercise submissions from last week. Uh, we got some really good ones. Removing the default margins and scroll bars that appear on an HTML page. I would like to revisit the topic of tags versus elements because there was some confusion around that. And then we'll go ahead and develop a pseudo scatter plot, a pseudo bar chart, a pseudo line chart, and a pseudo area chart. And I would like to discuss SVG interoperability with Figma and other tools. Um, and if we get to it, we'll add SVG text and customize the font. Before we get into all of that, I just want to um, reflect on what we've gotten into so far. It's been HTML, which is comprised of SVG, CSS, and JavaScript. And we have delved into SVG a little bit more. So within that SVG concept, we're looking at circles, lines, and paths. And I think I'll be evolving this diagram as we go to add in all the various concepts that we learn about. Let's review the submissions from last week. The exercise was make something creative with basic SVG shapes. And this is what happens. Um, Here's one submission. I'll click through it and see what it is. This is just gorgeous. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful stuff. You know, it's very artistic. And this is what got me thinking of, of highlighting some of the um, integrations with design tools. And I want to point out, if you put the link on its own line, it will unfurl like this. You get a little preview in here. So here's another submission, uh, the vision. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. And it's all just SVG right there in the page. Oh, here Nita did one with um, transitions. Actually, now that I'm here, um, Nita, would you mind just describing um, the transitions that are happening here? Should I talk about it? Yeah, yeah. Can you just talk about it for a few minutes? Okay. And I'll highlight the, the code as you as you talk about it. Okay, so we made a basic uh, rectangle using SVG. So rectangle is graphics here. And the properties of these rectangles are width, height, fill, X and Y position. And we can change all of that using CSS language, which is here on the top, style and in the style. So using the rect, I'm accessing this rect element index which you directly. And what is what is our aim is to do the transition on it when I'm hovering on a triangle. So what I want to change the feel of it, feel and stroke width. So when I hover on it, The transition is happening at 3000 millisecond, means three seconds. Yeah. And 
then in the beginning, the fill of the rectangle is red and stroke is black. And on hover, rect and hover, it's changing the fill to green and stroke width to 100 pixels. For so the first one, it just uh, it uh, shows the CSS properties for rectangle and the next rect semicolon hover is another state on the first state. So it changes and that's where the transition comes. Transition is actually between two states. First is when the field is red and the second state is when field is the green for rectangle. And that's where transition property comes. And we can define that using CSS language. Nice. Thank you. That's awesome. Oh, thank you so much for for describing that. That's that's really great to see. Thank you. So yeah, just to recap a little bit, um, I think this is the first time we're actually using CSS. So when you when you introduce these style tags, it opens up into a block of CSS, and then these are the CSS selectors. So this selects the body element, this selects all rectangles, and this one, colon hover, it says, okay, apply these styles when the thing is hovered over. And so that is cool by itself. And then, you know, when you add this transition, you know, this is one way to, to animate things with SVG and CSS. So yeah, great one by Nita. This one, is really incredible. I was just blown away by this. I mean, look at this. This is just so beautiful. So beautiful. And I want to highlight that when this submission originally came in, it looked like this. And I immediately noticed that there's the default margin that appears with HTML. See on the upper left corner, there's a default margin of some, I don't know, some amount of pixels. And then there are scroll bars here. And so these are both undesirable things. And so um, in the forum, I just said, oh, add this CSS. And I want to just discuss this CSS a little bit because it's very useful for pretty much anything that you do where there's a full screen SVG. This CSS applies to the body element that has a default margin in HTML. And so to get rid of that default margin, we can set the margin CSS property to zero. That will get rid of the margin. But then there do appear these scroll bars, which are kind of a bummer, and I don't really understand why they appear. But anyway, to get rid of those scroll bars, you can add overflow hidden to the body as well. And this gives you a really nice blank canvas where the SVG does fill up the screen. All right, really good stuff. Yeah, here's here's my comment. You know, that's how you can remove the scroll bars. A couple more. Here's one with some circles. It almost looks like a record. Very cool. Um, oh, yeah, and you can set the height of things in VizHub. So I noticed with this one, it's actually larger than the page. There's this scroll bar. So you could get rid of the scroll bar. Or another thing that you could do is change the height. There's an option here to set the height. I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware of this. So yeah, you can use that to change the aspect ratio of the Viz. And this one also blew my mind. <laughs> Look at that. Took my avatar with GIMP and, uh, you know, exported the paths to SVG. Pretty wild. And this one also uses the hover CSS selector. So when you hover, it changes the transform which is a CSS property that you can use to um, to scale and rotate and translate things. 
And so I thought this was very nice work. Very nice work. Here's a flag of Seychelles. Very beautiful. This one uses the polygon construct within HTML. It also uses an H1 element, which is this text here. H1 in HTML means heading one, so the text is kind of big and bold. And here's what seems work. Very nice. Kind of like abstract art. And you can see that it's a bunch of path elements where the only difference is where it moves to initially. And since these are lowercase commands, these are relative, so all you need to do is change that one thing and it moves the whole thing down. And check this out, there's a class on the path element. And a class can be selected uh, with CSS, uh, meaning you can use CSS to select all elements that have a specific class using the dot prefix on the CSS selector. So this one here, this little block of CSS, selects this inner path, this one here, and sets the fill to black just on that one. Whereas on all the other ones, the fill is none. So that's a nice, you know, first sighting of CSS classes. Can I ask a question there? Yeah. So, uh, what is the difference between ID and class? Ooh, ID and class. Yeah. Just could be a basic question. Let me just uh, fork this so I can modify it and show you to give a sense. So, the question is about um, ID versus class. Class is something that many things can have. So, there could be many classes that have the same... Uh, sorry. There could be many path elements that have the same class, in which case this selector would apply to all of them. There's also a construct called ID, and if you use ID, see how now it's broken, it didn't, uh, it didn't select. If you use ID, then the prefix on the CSS selector is a hash symbol. So now that should work. Oops, I, I misspelled ID as I am. So ID is inner path, and it works. The main difference between ID and class is that the intention behind ID is that there's only one thing that has a given ID. That's why it's called the ID. It means the identifier for that one particular thing. So ID is for just one element meaning no two elements should have the same ID, ideally. But class is, is, it defines a class of elements, meaning a grouping of multiple elements. So there could be many elements that share the same class. So that's the main difference between ID and class. So going through the um, submissions and questions here, Nita asked a question about SVG. It says SVG is an XML based markup language for describing two dimensional vector graphics. As such, it is text based and so on. And so the question is Is SVG a graphics language similar to HTML and XML? Yes. Yes, it is. SVG, in fact, stands on its own as an image format. And so, in a sense, it's not strictly within HTML. Um, SVG exists as a standard for defining images outside of XML, uh, outside of HTML, but it is based on XML. So XML is the language used uh, with the tags and everything. That's the language used inside of SVG images. So I hope that, I hope that answers the question. Is that clear enough? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Nice. Yeah. And is everything inside SVG tags text data? Um, well, 
this comes to the point of the distinction between the document and the DOM. This came up last time too. I think it was ideal that asked what is the difference between a tag and an element and I gave an answer that I don't think was 100% accurate uh, and Nita did some researching and reading about this um, and I wanted to just clarify this point that in a document meaning in the text that defines an HTML document, the source code, you know, in the .html file. There are elements there in the sense that the syntax in there defines the element. And that element in the document is comprised of the start tag, the ending tag, and everything in between. Tags, on the other hand, are constructs that only exist in the document. The tags for an, like every element in its definition in the in the document has two tags, an opening tag and a closing tag. And those tags are purely syntax for defining uh, the elements. But when the document gets loaded and parsed into the browser, it becomes the DOM, the document object model. And in the DOM, it's a tree data structure where there are elements. Um, so, if you if you Google HTML elements and read about it, people discuss it in um, in different ways, and they use the same term element to define things that are in the source code, meaning you know the start tag, the end tag, all the attributes, and everything in between. That's often referred to as an element when you're discussing the source code, the document. But there is a distinction between an element in the source code and an element in the living, breathing DOM. And so the living, breathing DOM is a dynamic thing where the elements can change over time. But the element in the document is a one-time thing, like it's, it's fixed when you load the page. So I just wanted to discuss about this a little bit. Um, I hope it clears up any confusion around this. Any, any remaining questions about this? Uh, will we be talking about DOM in the future because we did not talk about it yet? Oh yeah, I mean we'll be using the DOM quite a bit, quite a bit, and I think we did talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so if you look at anything in VizHub, um, I just want to clarify this with some some grounding. Um, here's the begin tag. Here's the end tag, and taken together, it defines the element in the source code. Uh, similarly, here's this SVG. All this stuff that I've selected defines this SVG element, and there are elements nested within this. But this is the source code, you know, this is the document. But when it runs in the browser, you can right click it and say inspect, and that gives you this. Chrome DevTools, which is a is a window into the DOM, not the document, not the source code. And so um, in this sense, we have touched the DOM by using the Chrome DevTools. And like I said last time, uh, you can manipulate these things, these attributes in here, and it will update. And see, look at that. It actually... It, it actually transitions. So if I set the width to be 400, it transitions because there's a CSS transition applied to it. But what I'm doing here is manipulating the DOM by using the Chrome DevTools. And in the future, we're going to use JavaScript to manipulate the DOM. Yeah, but we're not quite there yet. So going through the submissions, I want to uh, highlight this one by Ideal. This is so good. Yeah, check this out. It's this really beautiful animation with the sun setting and the colors changing. So this is just gorgeous, gorgeous work. And um, Ideal is live with us now. And I was hoping we could um, 
dive into this a little bit because there are a couple of new constructs used in here like gradients and animate tags. Um, so Adil, um, would you like to sort of narrate what's going on here and also describe how you, know, how you came to create this? Sure. Uh, this was uh, a really fun exercise. Um, uh, it, I thought uh, of the, uh, yeah, there was a, the idea of the sun rising and setting and uh, automatically um, thinking, well, I think how would that affect the surroundings as well? So we have a, um, um, to begin with, I created the sky element as a rectangle. Um, and uh, gave it a fill, um, and uh, which would be determined by the something called yeah the sky gradient, um, and uh, so this is a linear gradient um, that sits in a special tag called defs, um, where it gets. Uh, defined and um, um, sorry this was a radial gradient not a not a linear one and uh, the uh, it takes an ID so we can refer to the definition and it's uh, there is also it takes a, a CX and CY property which is uh, familiar I think when when we use the circle tag and what the, these do is uh, similarly they define the um, the circle for that gradient um, and that the perimeter of that circle um, can be uh, have a gradient um, or a color attached to it um, and uh, so yeah this was this was really uh, this was the first time I'd really come across the uh, animate and gradient uh, APIs of SVG. Um, so I just so... want to make sure I understand, and just to explain everything, uh, if you change CX to zero, see how the, the gradient is sort of emanating from this side, and 50% puts it in the middle, and likewise with CY, if you put it to zero, it's emanating from the top very very nice and I you know I didn't actually know that um, percentages are the unit here that so I'm, I'm learning things as we go so yeah I just wanted to tweak those um, but yeah continue please yes the uh, yeah it, it takes uh, percentage units uh, which was uh, interesting and uh, I may be wrong but I wonder whether it uh, it uh, it just corresponds to the position across the screen in terms of how far, in terms of as, as a percentage, it goes across the screen. Um, uh, so I think this would be 50%, 50% for each of CX and CY would be right in the middle of the screen um, of the SVG. Yep. And um, there is a, uh, it takes a radius, um, uh, which also, I I think uh, tries to yeah uh, describe the again in a, in a percentage, um, uh, but also tries to uh, describe the width um, of the uh, overall um, where the position of the perimeter would end up. And uh, so that was this was quite new, um, and um, uh, so I think yeah in so I think we. After experimenting just like that uh, with the various numbers, uh, I settled on 75, um, and then, uh, but yeah, I was experimenting exactly in that way just to get an idea of what what that radius really meant. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a inside of that radial gradient. There are a there is a stop tag, um, a, a couple of stop tags. Um, one that uh, has an uh, each of the these have have an offset property of z um, and one is zero and the other is a hundred and um, 
I think this really describes the offset property, describes where that gradient stop is mm. located. And um, so I think for a radial gradient, um, it will be the distance from the center to the uh, edges of the circle. Um, so um, yes, ex again, I was experimenting exactly like that just to see uh, what the how the numbers would translate into into different uh, um, uh, yeah colors across the screen. Nice. Um, so that was uh, yeah just um, and then there was uh, a little uh, yeah so there was a radial gradient used for the sky backdrop and then two linear gradients used for the two landscapes in the foreground. And um, uh, actually, before we go on, what is this Q? Is this what makes it curvy? Uh, yes. So I think uh, this is a cubic curve. If if uh, I, I looked up the MDN documentation um, from uh, uh, last week, and I think this is um, a it might be sorry, not cubic, but quadratic. Hmm. Um, some uh, quadratic Bezier curve. Um, so um, that will allow, uh, so from the current position, which is defined by um, the first two, sorry, the, last, the, the second two, which is um, um, the, okay, see if I just get this right. So it takes a current position, hmm. uh, which is uh, defined by what comes after M, uh, where we, as you described last week, that's where when we s put the ink to paper or yes. we put the pen to paper, and then the what comes after Q are four numbers. The first two of those numbers are control points, and the second two are where you would uh, where the final point ends up. Hmm. Um, so that's. 960 is right on the other end of the screen and um, yeah again experimenting this is this is how I uh, became a little bit more comfortable uh, with understanding what it does and the two um, the control points uh, straight after Q I think these help this uh, help um, these are points located somewhere which help describe the um, the curve uh, right. and the way that it gets pulled towards those control points. Um, yeah, again, lot, lots of experimentation was involved just to just to see how um, this this could this could work. Um, uh, Very nice. Uh, yeah, but it was it was fun. Um, yeah, similarly, um, we had. Uh, yeah, th th that, that was, yeah, again, very Yeah, I think that and, about sums it up. There's linear gradients that use a similar format to the radial gradient and stops mm -hmm. within those. And I'm curious about this animate tag. How did you figure this out? Yeah, so this was, uh, so the problem I was trying to solve here was how could we animate the gradients, so to speak? How could, as as the sun is rising and setting how can the colors change um so um in this case uh this is the um this this particular uh landscape in i think in the foreground this would go from um alice blue to steel blue back to alice blue um and it would do it across a number of seconds um and uh so yeah uh the animate tag was very interesting. Uh, you can try and describe uh, by using something called the attribute name, uh, which is uh, the hmm. stop color. Uh, you can change the values of the stop color from Alice Blue to Steel Blue and Alice Blue. Um, so that's a list of values that you would like it to go through. Nice. Um, Again, Beautiful. so much experimentation. <laughs> yes, really to help uh, understand what was really uh, uh, what was going on. This is really great, Adil. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you. You know, this might be a good um, 
transition with the discussion on control points to using um, Figma. Figma is this really amazing design tool that I've actually been learning myself for the first time uh, recently and I've used it to create all of the various uh, you know pieces of graphics for this series so far. Uh, you may be interested to know that the mask that is applied to my video is actually drawn <laughs> driven by this graphic right here so that's being masked onto my video and that's actually how it's working um, but anyway Figma and a lot of different design tools like Figma including Sketch or Adobe XD or uh, even like straight vector graphics tools like Adobe Illustrator or Inkscape which is open source or GIMP I believe GIMP has limited SVG capabilities but it it lets you design SVG graphics and there's this whole interface around it and because the idea of control points came up I want to just create a little sample to illustrate control points. So I've got this sort of template here. I'm going to delete this stuff. And there's this thing called the pen tool. And you can use it to define SVG paths. And so there's a path I can set the stroke and interactively control all this stuff. So instead of having to tweak it little by little in, S in uh, the HTML, you could use a tool like this to very rapidly iterate on stuff like this. And because the control point concept is so abstract, I wanted to illustrate it in a concrete way. And I believe if you drag in here, you can define a control point. And so this dragging defines the control points along this uh, Bezier curve. I think it's a Bezier curve. I may be mistaken. But that that is the effect of the control points. So if I grab that and change it around, see that is that right there is the control point. It sort of pulls the line in a certain direction. Yeah, so that's the essence of control points. One thing I wanted to do today was pseudo visualizations. And what I mean by that is approximating visualizations. And I, I want to take a moment to just discuss that sketching and doing mockups in a design tool are actually very important pieces of data visualization work. I mean, uh, when I get involved in a client project, for example, we have a meeting, and then the first thing I do, you know, if they send me the data, I'm lucky. Uh, if they don't, I have to imagine the data. Uh, but often, based on a discussion, I, I often sketch out something. And this is a popular technique from uh, Nadi Bramer and Shirley Wu. They, they have data sketches, that whole thing, highly recommend it. Uh, but to give a sense, you know, what I do is sketch on a, on a notebook. So I've got all these ideas that I've sketched out. Uh, this is for like what I wanted to talk about today and the next episode. And so sketching is the first step and then once you have a sketch that you like, and sketches by the way, you can communicate sketches to clients. It's a very effective tool because then they realize that it's sketchy, it's not final in any way. But then once you get a sketch you like, the next step often is to mock it up in a design tool. Um, I mean, sometimes you do go straight to implementing with D3 or whatever, but mocking up something in a design tool is a big part of the process. And I think it would be good for us to do now to cement our understanding of the basic SVG shapes that go into visualizations. So here I am in uh, Figma which is the tool that I've come to really like for this sort of stuff. And I think uh, 
you know, you can sign up for a free Figma account and use it for free. I think they charge you when you want to add real-time collaborators. So I'm going to start by making uh, what they call a frame in Figma. This is going to be the sort of container for our SVG. And I'm going to set the width to be 960 and the height to be 500 because that's what the default width and height are in VizHub and in blocks.org. And let's start by creating a pseudo bar chart. Um, P-S-E-U-D-O. Pseudo something means a fake version of the thing. Uh, if anybody hasn't heard of that term, pseudo. So, um, yeah, I wanted to make a pseudo uh, scatter plot, a pseudo bar chart, a pseudo line chart. So why don't we start with the pseudo scatter plot? A scatter plot visualization is comprised of circles. And so if you drop in a circle there, I can set the fill here to be black because we're going to get it right in black and white. And then I'm just going to make a bunch of copies of that circle and position them around uh, the screen, like this. So this is a pseudo scatter plot, really. Um, so I'll just you know spread them out a little more, make it sort of aesthetically pleasing. And uh, at this point, I want to highlight the interoperability of SVG uh, between tools like this and HTML. So in Figma, you can select this frame and click on Export, and then select SVG from this drop-down menu here, and then say Export, like that. And then you get a .svg file that you can open up in Chrome, and then... Uh, you can say view page source and here you have the SVG text which you can then copy into VizHub. So here I've got the SVG fundamentals from last week. I'm going to fork this and call it pseudo scatterplot. So I'll clear out the the readme. I'll actually say an approximation of a scatter plot. And then in index.html, I'm going to get rid of that SVG that we had before and paste that text in there and use prettier to auto format that. And there we go. We've got a pseudo scatter plot. Um, Cohen? Yeah. Does the XMLNS uh, attribute is that important? Um, uh, is that necessary? That's a great question. Um, I believe it might be necessary for .svg files, as in image files that are outside of HTML. Inside of HTML, you really don't need it. It'll work without it, and it gives you actually a lot of stuff that you don't need. Um, you'll see this a lot with programmatically generated SVG. There's a bunch of stuff that's not really necessary. So we could clean up this SVG, like the view box um, is something that you can use to control the relationship between um, the actual pixels and like the, the pixels that you use, the coordinate space that you use to define the shapes. Um, it helps with controlling the aspect ratio. There's some tricks you can do with the view box, but I'm gonna delete it because it's not strictly required. And also fill of none on the SVG, that's not required either. Um, and also fill equals black. I'm going to use vim mode here to delete all of these at once. You don't need the fill equals black because the fill is black by default on all SVG shapes. And this one is suffering from the default margins and the scroll bars issue. So I'm going to just add that style back in to remove the 
margin, I'm going to select the body element and say margin is zero. See that moved it up just a little bit. And then overflow is hidden. Okay, that looks decent. So there we go. A pseudo scatter plot. Uh, let's do also a pseudo bar chart. I'm going to go back to Figma here. I'm going to make a copy of this frame. I'll delete everything in it by selecting it, hitting delete. We can create rectangles. Can you give me access to the file? Oh, sure. Yeah, Figma has real-time collaborations, so I can add you. Can edit. It's an invite. You should be able to see it now. Right, so making this pseudo bar chart, we can just change the fill of this rectangle to be black. And then I will copy this rectangle, move it over, and make it a little smaller. And then do the same thing again. And Figma has this really nice thing where it will sort of snap to um, proportions that make sense. So like the spacing is now the same, 39 pixels between all of these. And I think I'll make one more. Make it a little smaller. And then I could select all of these and then drag them in. Uh, yeah, Figma has these really cool features where you can uh, move things around all at once like this. See, this, this here is a bar chart with with no padding. It's the term is padding between the bars. And when you move them to be spaced out like this, that's introducing some padding between the bars. But anyway, now we have our pseudo bar chart. I'm going to export this as SVG. Open it up. View the source. And I'm just going to copy the inside of the SVG because we already have an SVG sort of container in VizHub. Then I'll go back to VizHub here and I'll fork this and I'll call it pseudo bar chart. And I'll change the description to say an approximation of a bar chart. And then in the source, I'm going to just delete the stuff in the SVG and paste whatever came out of Figma. And there we have it. There we have a pseudo bar chart. And again, there's some unnecessary stuff. Um, there's a white background rectangle that we don't need because the background is already white. We don't need to fill all of these with black because black is the default fill. And if I run prettier again, it, it nicely formats itself. So there we have a pseudo bar chart, the essence of a bar chart right here. And I want to point out one thing here, um, because this point trips up people later on when you end up uh, coding with D3. You might think that you can just change the height of the bars and it'll lay out like this. But that's actually not the case. Look at the Y coordinates. I mean, if the Y coordinate is the same and we just vary the height, you end up with this inverted bar chart. And this is because in SVG, the coordinate space of the Y, uh, the Y coordinate, it goes from top to bottom, meaning a Y of zero is at the top, which is again, a, a confusing point. And so what you have to do you do have to change the height of the bars, but you also need to change the Y coordinates of the bars to be uh, the Y coordinate of the bottom minus the change in height relative to the biggest bar. And so we'll express all that in code 
later, but I just want to sort of foreshadow that element, you know, that aspect of bar charts. So let's let's do some more. Um, a bar chart can also go the other way, meaning instead of being the bars going uh, from left to right and vertical like this, you could have a bar like this and then have several bars that are you know going down the page like this this format often makes more sense mainly because you can position labels to the left of it and the text of the labels is not uh, is not sideways and that's a great lead into text. We can say like, okay, this is this is bar A, and I can change the size of it. Yeah, so there's like bar A, and this would be like bar B, and these would be replaced with you know actual labels in real data viz, but these are pseudo visualizations, so it's just A B C D for now. And the font here I've selected as uh, ShareTech. This is sort of the, the font that I'll be using throughout the series. In Figma, you can quickly preview different fonts. And I think most of these are available with Google Fonts. But anyway, ShareTech is what it'll be. And then I'll just, uh, you know, adjust this to be pleasing to the eye. And let's export this one as well. Export frame 8. I'll, ins I'll view the source. Copy this stuff. Um, oh, that's, that's odd. The path has ended up as uh, text. Uh, rather, the text has ended up as paths. I guess that makes sense uh, so that you can preserve the font. But this is a great opportunity, actually, to to introduce fonts in code. So what I'll do is I'll fork this one, pseudo horizontal bar chart, and then I'll paste that SVG right in here. And it worked. There it is. But um, if you want to programmatically set the text, it'll have to be a little different from this. I mean, if you wanted to change what the text says, you would have to like regenerate this path, which is it's not something you want to get into doing. So instead, what we can do is define the text as text elements. On the SVG. So I'm going to delete all those paths that gets rid of those letters. And then we can add a text element. So begin text, end text, and this is going to say A. And I want to put it right next to this particular rectangle, so I'm going to inspect it to see what the X and Y coordinates are. So x is 122, and, and with text elements, you can have x and y. So I'll say x is 122, just as a starting point, and y equals 27. And we can't quite see it. Um, what if I say x is 100? Not seeing it. Do you have a question? X could be a little less. I think then we can see it. There it is. So it is there. It's there. It's just not getting shown. Maybe I need to say explicitly fill is black. There it is. So we've got a little A. Okay, we've got a little A here. 
Now we want to make it so that it's aligned to this bar and it is big and it has a specific font. To do that, um, well to do a couple of those things, we can use CSS. So we've got this style tag here. We can say select all text elements within the SVG and say font size is I don't know, 36 pixels. You just have to sort of tweak it. 150. Okay, maybe 120. Or actually, what was it in Figma? I'm going to use the same thing. 72. Okay, now what we want to do is. Um, center it. So to do that I can just tweak the X and the Y. So let's say X is uh, 90 or 70 and Y should be a little bigger maybe uh, 40, about 80. Getting there. 90 100. That looks about right. And to move it over to the left, I'll make it uh, maybe x is 60. How about 50? There we go. That's approximately the right place. And now I want to introduce the font. The font. And so Google Fonts is the way to go when you want to add custom fonts nowadays. Um, there's a long history of fonts on the web, but, you know, this day and age, I would recommend Google Fonts. Uh, you are dependent on the Google servers, but I believe all of these fonts are openly licensed. So if you wanted to migrate away from Google Fonts, you could, but you would have to host these font files yourself, which is sort of a pain. Uh, but to use any of these fonts now, you can just use Google Fonts, and I'll show you how to do that. So I want to use this font called ShareTech. So you could download it. Um, and then to use it, we can click on Select This Style. And it gives you this little snippet of CSS that you can just copy. So it says here, Use on the Web. Just copy this CSS. Or no, this is HTML, rather that includes a link. So in VizHub I can just paste that right there. Oh, there's some problem. Hmm. Uh, looks like I've got a syntax error somewhere. Does it require a closing tag for the link proper, uh, for the link tag? You know, I think link is one of those things that does not actually require a closing tag. And see, if I get rid of it, the syntax error is still there. Unexpected character in line 55. Oh, I didn't... <laughs> see, there it is. I didn't add this little character to close out the text. Silly me. Okay, now we're unblocked and I can paste that stuff up here. And uh, yeah, the, the link tag is one of those special tags that does not require a closing tag. And I think image is also one of these. So this is a slightly different syntax. This is called a self-closing tag, where it's, it gets closed with the, um, the slash right before this character here. But anyway, now that we've got those, uh, these link tags actually pull in the fonts. And then we can set the font family like this by copying this little snippet. So all the text gets this share tech font family. And boom, there we have it. All right, so we've got a pseudo bar chart here. Um, we can fill in these labels just by 
copying this text. I'll make a couple copies of that and move them. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Is, is the CSS accessing the DOM or just the document? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Is the CSS accessing the DOM? Well, it's it's like um, the browser is this engine. You could think of it as an engine that takes all of these things as input and works with everything. And so, so yeah, it's a great question. Does CSS manipulate the DOM? Not really. It's almost like a layer on top of the DOM. Um, but it depends on the DOM for sure. Um, so it's not, it's not like, it's not strictly modifying the DOM. It's like the DOM is there as one thing, and then the CSS is sort of a layer on top of it that describes to the browser how to present that DOM. And so the dependencies are like the CSS depends on the structure of the DOM to function, but the DOM does not depend on the CSS. So it's, it's really a layer on top of the DOM. So once the DOM is there, the browser says, OK, I've got this DOM. I have to present it. Um, how do I present it? Oh, I have to check all the CSS that's there to just see if there's any properties that apply to these elements before I display them on the screen. And so the browser engine internally says, OK, here I've got this text element. I want to, I want to display it. What do I do? Which font do I use? Hmm, let me go and consult the CSS. Uh, is there any CSS selector that matches this? If so, does it have a font family associated with it? Oh, here it is. Yes, it does. Therefore, you know, I need to use that font family to present that, that DOM element. So that's generally how it works. Like, that's generally the relationship between CSS and the DOM. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it is always CSS which makes the final decision, or it is it a DOM? Like if we have fill color in DOM, if same fill in the style for same element, then which one will work first? Which one is dominant? Oh, which one is dominant? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's a really good, and this this trips people up sometimes. So let me uh, give a little demonstration. So I'll say the class here for this rectangle is first bar. And I'll, let me set the fill to be red in the in the HTML. And then in the CSS, we can select that by saying first bar gets a fill of green. And look at that. The CSS actually takes precedence. The CSS overrides what's there in the DOM in terms of uh, the fill. So this is one of those tricky rules. And uh, you know, sometimes I have run into this particular problem. Um, when you're coding with D3 and everything, and you use some code that sets the fill of a particular element to be some color, and it's not working. You know, I've often sat there tearing my hair out, being like, what the, what is even happening? It's a Twilight Zone moment. Um, and so the first thing to do, if your, if your uh, fill or any of these attributes in the DOM, if they're not working, check if there's any CSS that might be overriding it. Um, see, no matter what we set here, if we set this to blue, it's not going to work because there's CSS that is conflicting. And the CSS actually takes priority, which is counterintuitive. I mean, I thought I thought it would make more sense that the attribute in the DOM would take precedence because it's more localized, but it turns out it's not the case. So yeah, for this first bar, we can set the fill to be, let's say, white, and the stroke 
to be black and the stroke width to be like 20 pixels. Goes to show you that, yeah, CSS overrides what's in the DOM. Um, Karen, I have uh, a question um, relating to this about um, the fill attribute. Is that um, because we are applying it to an SVG element, uh, it works, but uh, I don't know if I've seen a fill uh, attribute would, would that apply to HTML as well? Because I, I think I've seen other things like background color or color, or, uh, but I don't think I've come across a color um, a fill attribute for. Yeah, that's a great question. I believe it is localized only to SVG. It only makes sense to use it with respect to SVG elements. Um, and and to to clarify this. Like, if I were to have this question, I, this is where I would go, the MDN documentation page for fill. And I think there's this notion of a presentation attribute. And, and that's what um, the presentation attribute is in, in the uh, DOM if you set the fill attribute on an element. And I recall somewhere in here, uh, there was a list of things that could be used as attributes and also as CSS properties, because there are a couple of these. Um, but I don't know offhand what they are. But definitely fill and definitely stroke and stroke width. But yeah, to answer your question, fill is only applicable to SVG elements. It's not, it doesn't make sense outside of SVG, but there are a lot of properties that do apply outside of SVG, uh, like transform, I think is, so, is very generic. It applies to all HTML elements, not just SVG elements. But yeah, fill and stroke, they could be used as attributes, or they could be used as CSS properties. And if they are used as CSS properties, then they dominate the value uh, from the attribute. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Thank you. Awesome. So before we close out today, I do want to also just do one last pseudo visualization, which is a pseudo line chart. Um, oh, wait, I've already done that. <laughs> Look at that. So this is a pseudo line chart right here. It's pretty much an SVG path. Um, and on this point, um, there are aspects of SVG paths that become important, like the line join. You could have different values for line join to make it either jagged, cut off like this, or rounded. And then there's also the cap. The cap can be set to round, for example, to make the, the caps round. So as a last pseudo visualization, I'll just make this bigger, export this as SVG, view the page source, copy that into VizHub. This is going to be a pseudo line chart. And then I'll paste that here. Yeah, so that completes our series on pseudo visualizations. Yeah, I was looking at the YouTube chat. Uh, the only thing I see is from Wasim. Isn't the logic with SVG filled different from regular HTML in which inline styling dominates over the style tag? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if... I mean... We've just looked at how it is with SVG. With SVG, whatever's in the CSS dominates. But with other types of tags, um, like straight HTML, I'm actually not sure 
how it is. Um, I can do a little experimentation. Yeah, let's find out. So here's this thing that Nita made that is sort of an exploration of basic HTML elements. There's the h1 element that ends up as this text. There's the p element, which is a paragraph. Uh, h2, which is this smaller text here. And I'm going to fork this and call it investigation of CSS precedence. And in here, oh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, there's some missing um, tags, which is another point we should discuss. But to answer the immediate question, I'm going to introduce a style tag. And I'm going to say um, H for H1 elements, let's make them red. Oh, fill. Uh, sorry, uh, not fill, but rather color. Color is the generic HTML uh, CSS property. Okay, so now that's red. Um, how would we make that red otherwise? I don't... I'm sort of grasping at straws here. You have to do... Uh, can I tell you? Yeah, tell me. You write style as a property in H1 equals to... And everything else goes in the quotes. Yeah. Right, yeah. This is called inline styles, which you can do with SVG too, by the way. Um, yeah, I believe in straight HTML like this, the color is not something... It's not, it, There is no attribute for color. And so you would do inline styles like this. And so in this case, um, yeah, I see in the YouTube chat, Milo is saying, yeah, both things are style instructions. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it, it is CSS. So, so this is called inline CSS. And the inline CSS does take precedence over the other CSS, the sort of external non-inline CSS. See, if I get rid of that, it becomes uh, green. But if we put the inline style there, it does take precedence over the other style. And I believe it might be the same with SVG. Let me just uh, double check that. So we've got this pseudo horizontal bar chart. And instead of saying fill equals blue, if we say style equals fill is blue, does that take precedence? It does. It does. Look at that. OK, cool. So we have learned a couple things. Um, inline styles like this, inline CSS, always takes precedence over CSS defined uh, elsewhere. However, with the attributes, if I say fill equals blue, the CSS takes priority over the attributes. So that's how, that's how it all works with the priorities here. That is so deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is so great. I, I love this question format because um, we can stop and really investigate and get to the bottom of things uh, that people watching are wondering. So, yeah, this is so, uh, so good. Before we go, I want to leave you all with this exercise. In the forum entry for episode two, here's the exercise. Recreate a pseudo visualization from one of these visualization taxonomies. And so I invite you to go through, I invite you to go through these links under data visualization taxonomies and 
look through all of these and then pick one to reproduce as a pseudo visualization. There's the visual vocabulary, uh, deviation, correlation. See, there's already sort of pseudo visualizations in here. These are great taxonomies of visualization types that you can use as a reference uh, to know how to encode you know, certain types of data. And we'll get into all of the logic behind this later on. But for now, you can just see, you know, there are a bunch of pseudo visualizations here in these various taxonomies. So what I want you to do is look through these, uh, pick one, and reproduce it with SVG in VizHub. You could modify the HTML directly or use um, some design tool like Figma or others. And here's another one. Really amazing work. Uh, these are really fascinating uh, taxonomies of visualizations. Uh, from data to viz, another one. Uh, sort of a decision tree based on what sort of variables you use, which chart types to pick. So yeah, go through these links and recreate a pseudo visualization from there and post your VizHub link in this thread. All right, really looking forward to see what you come up with. And thanks for tuning in. I'll uh, see you again next week. Take care. Bye. Welcome everyone to episode three of Get It Right in Black and White. Um, I've been really looking forward to this one because it's where we're going to dive into DOM manipulation with JavaScript. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about this time. Sol Lewitt reproductions in vanilla JavaScript. And this, this thing right here on the screen is a Sol Lewitt piece. What we'll cover today, first I would like to review um, the exercise submissions from last week. Got some really good ones. And then I'll talk about Sol Lewitt, this artist who's done a lot of really amazing uh, pieces that we can reproduce with JavaScript and SVG. Then I'll talk about JavaScript basics, like JavaScript language features. And then I'll talk about the DOM API. Uh, so we're not going to use any libraries, no D3. It's just going to be vanilla JavaScript, DOM manipulation. And to implement some of these Sol Lewitt pieces, we're going to need to use SVG masks uh, and perhaps SVG clip path. All right, so let's, ex let's uh, review these exercises. So here's the forum post from last week's assignment, which was recreate a pseudo visualization from a visualization taxonomy. I'm just going to step through these, um, these works. Here's one from Nita, a pseudo Venn diagram. Very nice. Um, oh, Nita's here. Do you want to talk about this at all? Yeah, I can talk about it. Um, I made this one using Figma, just basic three circles. And from the link that Karan shared last time, basic Venn diagram, it was it took like not that long to make it and just exported it using SVG. So each shape here is SVG. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Here's a pseudo Gantt chart from uh, Philippe Mayel. Uh, forgive me if I'm not saying that correctly. But this is very nice. Very beautiful. I mean, this is getting into some serious uh, data viz type stuff with the numbers and the labels and the grid and there's a dashed line. Uh, this is fairly impressive. You know, this is amazing. And, and um, to be able to implement this later with D3 would be a great uh, direction for a project. Wasim made a pseudo slope graph. Very nice. 
very nice. I appreciate the styling with the font and everything. It's very much in the theme of Get It Right in Black and White. And this is one of those visualization types that we can definitely implement in the future with real data with D3. Andre made a pseudo spider chart. This is pretty neat. Also sometimes called a radar chart where, yeah, it could visualize different dimensions of the data along this circular grid shape here. Very nice. And here's a pseudo icon array. This is pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool indeed. You know, and I love the the creative font and, and the trees here. They're sort of filled in at different levels. Very nice work by Senna. And Adil, check out this one by Adil. Oh my gosh. This one, when I saw it, I, I was so happy. This is just so gorgeous. So gorgeous. Um, Adil, you want to talk about this one a little bit? Uh, yeah, this was um, a really nice uh, exercise. Um, it's um, circle packing is um, plays on the tree structure, and each circle represents uh, a level and also a branch. So, in the case of uh, subcircles, will also represent uh, subbranches, and um, um, and it just I think it it brings out the the hierarchy uh, at different levels of the tree quite nicely. And I think maybe one improvement I could have maybe do in the future is to probably uh, apply different shadings to the different levels mm. uh, circles just to bring that maybe uh, bring that emphasis of the uh, hierarchy out a little bit more um, but yeah this was um, a really nice uh, fun exercise um, and built in uh, the shapes were built in figma and uh, the text was added later inside this oh very nice that's a great approach and i have to say i love how um, the consecutive levels are inverted. That's a really nice touch. Really nice. And I, I love how it's just totally black and white. Uh, but yes, if you were to add color, you could do a lot of different things with this type of viz. And this is another one that we will definitely implement later with D3 based on data. So I love where, where this is going. Uh, there was some discussion about how is this animation done? It was using 3JS which is this really crazy uh, three-dimensional library that we might touch later on. But, um, yeah, the point here is that if you inspect the DOM, you can uh, do some sleuthing and figure out how these various things that you find on the web were done. Alenka did this really nice uh, pseudo-joy plot. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, here's, here's another one from uh, Kirsten this faux data viz it's it's a approximation of a stream graph very nice very nice indeed yeah this is another one that we can implement in the future with real data so great work from everyone on these all right now i'd like to talk about sol lewitt uh, the whole context for this is that um I went to this exhibition of Sol LeWitt art years and years ago, and I was very inspired by the, the art. And, and years later, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is perfect stuff to recreate with code, because it highlights some of the, uh, the sort of foundational things that you can do with code. This is Sol LeWitt. He was an, an American artist, and he's done all sorts of interesting... Um, art pieces. He had a very sort of storied career in art. And he does these large-scale um, exhibitions in, in large spaces. Here's a piece by Sol LeWitt where it's this giant set of shapes installed on a wall. And uh, as you can see, it's like bands of black and white, vertical and horizontal, with different masking patterns applied. 
So this is one of the pieces um, that I think is really nice, and this is the one that I would like to try to reproduce today by writing code. Um, and I, I really look forward to it. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. It may be too ambitious to have the multiple shapes done today, but I was thinking just the first one, the leftmost one here with the circle masking pattern, I think that's what we can target for today. Um, before we dive in, though, I would just like to take a look at a couple of other solo wit pieces. Here's another variation on that theme of different textures going in different directions. Here's another variation of the same theme with sort of larger scale textures and adding color to some of them. Here's another piece that explores mm, colors with patterns. Um, I don't know how to describe it really, but some of the same themes are present in this one. Here's another piece by Sol LeWitt where it's interconnected lines between randomly placed points. And by the way, the, the general theme with Sol LeWitt is he would not do the art himself, I don't believe. Um, or this probably changed in different places in his career, but the main thing with Sol LeWitt is he would give instructions, almost like algorithmic instructions, to a crew of people that would implement his artwork based on those instructions. So it's very algorithmic to begin with, and it's, it's ripe for implementing with computer code. Here's another Sol LeWitt piece that is just a grid uh, that's expanding. Very fundamental. I love it. Let's dive in to trying to reproduce this, <laughs> this solo wit piece with code. I'm going to start by uh, creating a viz. I'm going to fork from this SVG fundamentals viz that we did uh, earlier. I'll fork this and, and call it Sol LeWitt Reproduction. All right, we've got this sort of blank canvas here. Um, I'm going to just adjust the README and say a reproduction of a Sol LeWitt art piece. And I would like to link into it. Um, and this is a good opportunity, actually, to talk about how to make links in Markdown. Um, a very small um, sidetrack thing here. This is how you make links in Markdown. It's very useful, so whenever you add a description to things in your vizs, it's always a good idea to link to whatever resources you're drawing from. And the way to do that is with square brackets for the text. See, that becomes a link there. And then in parentheses, you put the URL where the link is going to go. And here is the actual article that I got that image from. So I'm going to paste that URL right there. That's how you can add links in Markdown. And then in index.html, I'm going to clear out all of this stuff in the SVG. OK, from here, what I would like to do is start using JavaScript. And the way that we can start using JavaScript is by introducing a script tag inside the HTML page. So script, not script, like that. And what this does here is it opens up a whole world of JavaScript. You can put stuff in the script tag that is, you know, statements in the JavaScript language. And so the most basic JavaScript program uh, is called hello world and it looks like this console.log hello world in quotes and then if you open up the chrome dev tools by clicking on this little icon here and then going into more tools developer tools uh, by the way this is this is like something that you have to use pretty much all the time when you're developing JavaScript. So I would recommend learning this keyboard shortcut, Control-Shift-I. So inside the developer tools, 
we've got different tabs. We've seen the Elements tab when we inspect Elements, but then there's the Console, meaning the JavaScript console. Um, and by the way, with Chrome DevTools, you can use this little uh, widget here to move the DevTools around. I believe by default they may be on the right, so, um, but I personally prefer to put them on the bottom. And within here you can change the font size with uh, Control plus and Control minus. But anyway, when this program runs, it outputs Hello World right here. There are uh, a bunch of things going on here. Console is a variable that's just uh, there in the browser. And when you say console.log, you're accessing a property in that object called log. And it happens to be a function. And that function gets invoked with these uh, parentheses. And then the argument that is passed into that function is this string. It's called a string when you put something in quotes. Uh, that is hello world. At this point, I want to just stop and take a brief tour of the JavaScript language. It's not going to be in depth, but it's just um, for for folks who've never seen JavaScript before. Um, and I, this course is for such people. You don't have to know JavaScript already, and I want to introduce everything that you need along the way. So that's why I'm going to just touch upon some JavaScript basics. So inside of console.log, um, you could put any JavaScript expression. For example, numbers. If I hit console.log5, it prints out 5. And in JavaScript, you can comment things out with uh, two, two slashes in the beginning of the line. I'm going to comment out everything that we cover so that this thing is here as a, as a record of what we've done. Console.log5 works. It just outputs a number. Um, this highlights that you can pass different types of things into console.log. It accepts strings. It accepts numbers. With numbers in JavaScript, you can use arithmetic, like 5 plus 5 is 10. That works. And there are you know, various operators. 5 times 5 works as well. That gives us 25. Parentheses work the way that you would expect them to. Um, with math. So if it's like 2 plus 3 times 5, that's one thing, but then if you put parentheses around a group, uh, that's another thing. So these are basic uh, arithmetic operations in JavaScript. There's also a fundamental concept of a variable in JavaScript. And for that, um, in modern times at least, we use let or const. So I'm going to say const num equals 5. Uh, that, that creates a variable that's called number, and it sets the value of that variable to 5. And then we can say console.log num, and that references that variable, and it outputs 5 here. The thing with const, though, is that you, you're not allowed to reassign to it. So if I say num equals 10 like this, it says, ooh, that's not allowed. Um, and that's why it's called const, because it's a constant. It's not allowed to change over time. This breaks. In order for that not to break, we can use let. If we say let num equals 5, we console.log num, we get 5. But then we can say num equals. This is called reassignment of a, of a variable. It's changing the value that it has over time. So if we say num equals 10, it changes the value of num, and that works because we're using let, not const, and we get num. And in some older code that you may see, you might see var. And var works just the same as let for the most part, but there's some differences about um, scoping, which we can maybe get into at another time. Uh, it's not really so critical. Older format behaves like let. And what else? In JavaScript we have objects. Objects are critical. So if we want to create an example object we could say const obj 
or I would, I'll call it object. And the way that you create an object is with a pair of curly braces. And then objects can have properties inside of them, uh, like num, for example. And then the way you set the value of properties is with a colon, um, like this. And now we can say console.log object dot num. The dot is how you access properties within objects. So it prints out five, and that works. And uh, while we're here, I want to show you a, a thing that is a little um, conceptually tricky to grok. And that is um, you can assign properties of objects even if the object itself is stored in a const. For example, object.num, we can assign that to a new value and it works. See, it, it says 10 here when we access it. And that's because we are mutating the object. We're not reassigning the variable object that's called object here. We are just um, changing its value, its internals. This is called mutating something. So that's the essence of, of objects. Another piece that we'll need is um, iterating over loops. Uh, because when we do this texture thing, we're going to have to make uh, a shape many, many times. And to do that, we can use what's called a for loop. And I'm going to type this up in a comment uh, so that it doesn't break. Because if you run a for loop uh, before you stop typing it, sometimes it gets into this infinite loop situation. And so this looks like this. For, we put some stuff in parentheses, and then we put some stuff in curly braces. In the parentheses, we can set a variable, uh, let's say i, to 0 initially, and then say as long as i is less than some number, like 5, we increment i, i++. plus um, plus. By the way, um, let me just introduce the plus plus operator on its own. So if we say let num is 5, console.log num, we get 5. We can say num plus plus. That increments the number by 1. So now we get 6. It's the same as num equals num plus 1. And so now it's, it's incremented twice, so now it gets 7. So that's the plus plus operator, increment operator. Um, and also, there's another construct, this less than. Um, there are comparators. Uh, so if we say like f 4 is less than 5, that outputs true. And true and false, that's another primitive type. Um, you can say true console.log false. These are booleans. So if you say console.log 4 is less than 5, that says true. Yes, it is. But then if you console.log 4 is um, greater than 5, that output's false. So those are these uh, comparisons between numbers that you can do in JavaScript. And these are, uh, to be clear, these are expressions in the JavaScript language that return a value that is a Boolean. Uh, and these can be nested with you know parentheses and whatnot. That's the beauty of programming languages. But anyway, oh, now that we've got this for loop here, I'm going to uncomment it, and then inside of these curly braces, I can say console.log i, and it outputs these numbers. One, two, three, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. See, it starts at 0. And that's the usefulness of a for loop. Um, you can have one line that just does one thing, but the for loop says, OK, do that one thing you know, x number of times, and, and it gets repeated. I'm seeing there's a question in the YouTube chat. Can you assign without const? For example, just stating object.num equals 10 without first assigning the property with const. I can maybe clarify that. So it's about this example here. 
maybe the question is, can you just say object.num equals 10 without defining object first? No, you can't. You have to have object. It has to be something. It has to exist first. However, um, it does not need to have the property inside of it. So I'm going to comment that out, make another copy. It does not need to have num defined first. So it could just be an empty object. And then you can you can um, create a property on that object that didn't exist before, just like this, and it works. Yes. So I, I hope that answers your question. I hope that answers your question. You don't need to have the property declared like when you create this object. It can be added after the fact. But the object itself needs to exist. Um, if the object doesn't exist, you get this what's called a reference error. It says like object is not defined because it's not. There's nothing called object. So there you have it. Uh, as we talked about objects, can we talk about other basics of JavaScript like functions? Yes. While we're here, let's do it. I want to cover each and every um, fundamental concept, not in a deep level, but I do want to cover it. So let's say we want to add two numbers, 5 and 5. We can introduce a function to add two numbers. I think this is a good first example of a function. Uh, so I could say const add equals a function that returns a value, and this is ES6, um, ES6 syntax for defining functions. It can take as input two numbers, I'll call them a and b, and it can return a plus b. So now we can say console.log add 5 and 5, and it, it says 10. And so if we say add 5 and 10, we also we get 15. Now, this is how you would do it with ES6 JavaScript syntax. I want to talk about the different um, variants that you might see of this. So this is one way of defining add. Another way of defining add, you could say function add, and then put the parentheses right here and then open it up into curly braces and then say return a pl This is the sort of old school way of defining functions. It's valid JavaScript still today, but uh, as you can see this arrow syntax is much more concise. Another way of defining add is like this you could say const add equals a function that takes as input a and b and then open up into curly braces. See, when you open up into curly braces, you can put uh, many, many different lines of code in there and those lines of code will run when that function gets invoked. However, you need to explicitly return the thing like this, return a plus b. See, now it says 15. And that's uh, a little confusing thing about this syntax up here is that it uses what's called an implicit return. It implicitly adds this return statement if you don't open up the function body with curly braces. Current? Yeah. I was just curious, um, what if we happen to be returning an object? Um, oh, that works, yeah. Uh, the curly braces, if we had multiple statements and then on the last line we are returning an object, would that be um, Oh, I see. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the curly braces for the first function would be just, just be uh, the function body and returning an object would um, still be okay yeah that's fine i think I, I yeah think I, I, I get i i understand what you're getting at and i i yeah. would like to walk through that so let's say for example um i'll start with the old school syntax let's say we have a function that's going to return a person object with a first name and last name um, if we were to construct that object let's say i'll call it person example this is going to be like the output that we would like first name is uh jane Last name is Doe. It's a generic name. 
this is the kind of object that we would want to create from a function. And so then we could say person example dot first name and it'll output Jane and then console.log person example dot last name it should output Jane and Doe. And by the way, you can console.log an object, which we do often, and, and then you get this little inspector for that object in the DevTools, which is super duper nice. Okay, this is setting the stage for, for writing a function that generates such objects. So I'll, I'll call it uh, create person, and it can take as input first name and last name. Or for the sake of um, brevity, I'll just call it person, first and last. And what we can do in here is say return an object, and that object can have first, first being the property of the object. We can assign the property of the object called first to the value of the variable th that's inside this function body called first. Um, this is called a closure, by the way. Um, the arguments become visible, just like variables, inside of this closure that's demarcated by curly braces. So we can return an object where first is first, last is last, and now we can say console.log person, and then we can pass in Jane and Doe. And then we should get this object back. This is first Jane, last Doe. So to get at your question, how does it play out with the um, the ES6 arrow syntax? It is a sort of tricky business. And let me show you what that looks like. We can refactor or re rearrange this code to use ES6 arrow functions. Um, so const person equals a function that takes as input first and last arrow to curly braces. And then the inside of it can remain just the same like it was. This is one valid way to do it. And yeah, no issues, no confusion here. The place where it gets confusing is when you start to leverage the implicit return on those uh, that arrow function syntax. So the way that looks is if you want to return an object, you can't just do it like this, as in first name, last name, like this, because uh, it gets sort of confused about, um, you know, is this an object or is this a opening up of a function body? So if you if you put a, a begin curly brace directly after the arrow, it's always interpreted as, okay, we're opening up the function body now. Uh, so this this is not valid code. It says unexpected token. What you can do though, is use parentheses, to say, okay, I am going to return the thing that is inside these parentheses. So this version of the code works. And I think this is uh, what you were getting at. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, it was the uh, um, thinking about how ES6 syntax would uh, accommodate returning an object. Yeah. Yep. Nice. And, and this, is, this is it. This is how it works. As the last thing in this um, segment with this function, I want to highlight that in ES6, uh, the most recent version of JavaScript, there is a, a simplification that you can do in the case that the property name matches the variable name. And that is, you can just get rid of this stuff here. And it automatically assigns um, the value of the property called first to the variable that's in scope here called first. So it's a shorthand for defining object properties where the property name happens to match the variable name. So this is sort of the most concise way of implementing this person function. And maybe it could all fit on one line. Yeah, it can all fit on one line. And that's like a very concise way of doing it. All right, that concludes our um, 
foray into JavaScript. I did not touch arrays yet. Um, I think I'll do that later once we start using them. But this is a first um, first pass at some stuff in JavaScript. Okay, since that's what this really is, I'm going to rename this to be JavaScript Basics. And then I'll fork this one into Solowit Reproduction. Okay, now we can start having some fun. I'm going to delete all this stuff. I would like to build up the DOM for this textured background that we see in the Solowit piece. Within this piece, I'm going to first target the background of uh, one of these squares. So it's going to be the background of the leftmost square where we're just going to have vertical lines going across the screen. That's the first target. Now, to do that, I think it makes a lot of sense to use JavaScript so that we can automate the creation of those rectangles. Otherwise, we would be, you know, creating a hundred rectangles by hand, which is just not uh, practical. But to get there, we need to build up this SVG using JavaScript. As a first thing, I would like to create this particular SVG element using JavaScript. Now, how do we do that? Um, well, it turns out there's this thing called document. If we say console.log document, we can see what this is. It says document. It turns out it is the HTML document. It's, it's a DOM node that you can um, unpack. See, it has the head, it has the body. All of this stuff is available to you in JavaScript. So what we can do is say um, document.body. That actually gives us the body element. And on the body element is where we can append things using JavaScript. So as a first goal of something to create using JavaScript, let's create this SVG element itself. The way we can create a DOM element, a DOM node, part of the document object model, um, I'm going to make a variable. I'll call it SVG. And we can use document dot create element and we can give it SVG which is the um, tag name for this element and now if we say console.log SVG we see that it is in fact uh, an empty node uh, that is SVG right now though this DOM node is sort of hanging in space it's not it's not actually attached to the DOM. It's just uh, in memory, in a variable. To put it on the page, we can use, on the body, we can use a method called append child SVG. That will append this DOM node to the body. And if we inspect the elements on our page here, now we should be able to see that in fact there are two SVG elements now. See, there's the one that we created in our HTML syntax, and there's the new one that we created with JavaScript. My aim is to replace this first one with the second one so that we can add more stuff into it. It's going to need to have uh, width and height. So how do you do that? Um, well, we can call svg.set attribute and the first argument is the name of the attribute namely width and I'll set that to 960 um, and from the JavaScript perspective uh, you can pass in numbers and it will be coerced to a string um, so that's what I'll do because it's conceptually a number and then svg.set attribute um, width, sorry, height, svg.set attribute height to be 
500. Now, if we inspect the DOM, we can see that there are two identical SVGs. Look at that. So now I can delete this one that's defined in HTML and just have the one that's defined in um, JavaScript. There it is. So this is our starting point for uh, JavaScript-driven SVG without any libraries, without using D3. Um, D3, when we do start using it, is going to do all this stuff. It's D3 uses all of these APIs internally. It just gives a nice way of interacting with these APIs. All right, now that we've got this SVG element, let's create a rectangle that goes inside this SVG element. I'm going to do that by copying this block because it's structurally very similar to what we want to do. We want to create a new element, let's say a rectangle. We can say document.createElementRect to create a rectangle. Rectangles also have width and height, so I'll just set it to 100 and 100 just so we can see something. And then, instead of appending a child to the body, we can append it to the SVG. This is how you can programmatically build up a, a tree data structure, uh, which the DOM is. It's a tree data structure. So svg.appendChildRect should add that rectangle to our SVG. And I noticed I'm just, I have inconsistent formatting. I'm going to use Prettier to just make everything consistent. Uh, we should be seeing a rectangle, but we're not. Let's see, let's see if the DOM is correct. Oh, it's not. <laughs> There's, the width and height is 100 on the SVG somehow. You have to change attribute. Yeah, I just forgot to update it here. So rect.setAttribute should be the one. Okay, now if we inspect it, we can see that it is there. All right, it is there. SVG has width and height. The rect is there, but it's not showing up. The reason why it's not showing up is because we're using create element. Create element does not work with SVG. You need to use create element NS. So here's why. SVG and HTML is a fantastic addition to the web platform, but since SVG is an XML-based language, see it comes back to that concept of it is based on XML, there is some nuance in how it can be used. When parsing HTML, meaning if we write SVG and those attributes in HTML, SVG elements are automatically created correctly so long as they're inside an SVG block. But SVG elements cannot be dynamically created with create element in the same way as HTML elements. It's um, in order to dynamically create SVG elements, you must explicitly tell the browser that you want to use the SVG namespace. So this is something that's particular uh, with XML. I must admit I don't fully understand it, uh, but what I do understand is this is how you need to do it in order for it to work. So let's try this in our code. I'm just going to paste that block here for reference. It's dot create element ns passing this namespace string that def I think what it's doing is saying, okay, this is an XML document that uses the SVG namespace, meaning it's an SVG XML document. So instead of uh, document dot create element, we can say document dot create element ns. Pass that thing and say, okay, this is an SVG container element. And similarly with uh, the rectangle, we can use the same thing. Okay, now it shows up. All right, so this is how we can create SVG elements that work using the DOM API. Now, let's get into um, creating a bunch of rectangles to approximate that sole Lewitt piece. This rectangle is 100 by 100, but 
what we're going to do is we're going to create a bunch of vertical lines with rectangles. So the, the width of them could be small, let's say 10, just 10 pixels. But the height of them should be the same as the height of the whole thing, uh, meaning 500. See, now, now it's going to go all the way down the screen. And we can move this rectangle around by setting uh, x. If I set x here to be 10, see it moves over a little bit. If I set x to be 100, it moves over 100 pixels. Now at this point, uh, I see some duplication, duplicated logic in the code. Um, it's a very uh, simple form of duplicated logic, but instinctually, I think to myself, oh, there should not be duplication like that. And that is the 500 and 500. Now that we're out of HTML and in JavaScript, we can start using variables uh, and later functions to eliminate duplicated logic, to me meaning uh, if you have to define something multiple times in different places, it's preferable to just define it in one place so that you can, you know, if you need to change it, you could just change it in one place. So to do that, I'm going to say const width equals 960 and height is 500. And then wherever there's 960 in use, I'm going to use width. And wherever there's 500 in use, I'm going to use height. So setting the, the height of the SVG and the height of the, all of these rectangles. So that's just a simple uh, refactoring. And at this juncture, I want to point out that uh, instead of hard coding these, we can actually read them from the parent page, which I always love to do because then when somebody loads the page uh, and it's resized differently, it'll use whatever width and height the page actually is at the time. And the way to do that is, I believe, um, window dot inner width and window dot inner height. Yeah. So window is another thing, kind of like document, that's available in the browser that you can call upon. And using inner width and inner height gets you the, the actual uh, dimensions of the page when it's loaded. OK, this feels right to me. There's no numbers that are hard-coded. I find this uh, beautiful. Uh, oh, except for 110. But I feel like maybe those are fine for now. All right, now that we've got one rectangle, let's make many rectangles. And uh, conceptually, what we want to do is, you know, have this code run, but just change X every time. Uh, but rather than copy paste it a bunch of times, I'm going to put it inside of a for loop. For, and I'm going to type this in comments so that we don't run into an infinite loop situation. For let i equals 0, i is less than n. I like to use n so that we can change it later if we want to. Um, initially, I'll just I'll set it to 100. Let's make 100 of these. i++. Plus plus. And, and by the way, in VizHub, if you ever do run into an infinite loop, you can just type hash recover at the end of the URL. And um, this is how you enter recovery mode. In recovery mode, you can edit the code, and it's not going to automatically run. And then when you're done uh, fixing the code that created the infinite loop, you can just hit exit recovery mode. But anyway, hopefully that'll never happen. So now, inside of this for loop, this is where I'm going to move this code. I'm going to cut this code with control X and then paste it into this block with control V and then use prettier to update the formatting so that it's all indented properly. And now we can use I to, to move things around. See, I starts at zero and then uh, the second time around, i is 1. 
and then the next time around i is 2 and so on and so on until it gets to be 99 in which case um, oh, this still runs for the 99th time, but when i gets to be 100, this check fails because 100 is not less than 100, and then the for loop exits. So our values of i are going to be from 0 to 99. So the thing that we want to vary is x. If we just set x to be i, it's going to go across the screen, but it's only going to move one pixel at a time. Right, so if we want it to move, uh, let's say, 20 pixels at a time, I can multiply i times 20, and we get it. There it is. There it is. I see there's a question in the YouTube chat. Um, for properties on the window object, you actually don't have to write window.innerwidth. Just inner width should be enough for the browser to get it. Yes. Yes, that's true. That is true. Window is uh, an alias for the global object. So you can actually say inner height and inner width just like that. And it works just the same. It's true. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that. However, if you use a bundler or a build tool, uh, something like that, uh, it will complain and say inner width is not defined. Um, so that's why I just sort of... Uh, by default, I do like to explicitly say window because those tools, um, well, we're not using them now, so it doesn't matter. But if you are using a tool that sort of checks, or ESLint, for example, that checks the validity of the code, it often would complain that, okay, these variables are not defined anywhere, so that's an error. But it, those tools do understand that document and window are... Um, things that are provided by the browser and are expected to be in the global namespace. So, um, yeah, that's why you may need to use window. And I see there's another comment. You do need window prefix for ESM. ESM. Mm, oh, modules. ECMAScript modules. So, I don't know. I'll just... Um, I think I'll keep it here for now, but I'll just add a little comment that says... Windows optional sometimes. But yeah, it's a great little uh, side discussion. Thanks for that. Any other questions in the meantime? Yes, I think uh, I have one question. Um, I'm curious about the const inside of the loop. Um, it looks like it's being reassigned, but it's it's not. Um, and I'm, I'm curious as to um, how that works. Yeah, that is a great, great question. It looks as though const is reassigned here, but in in fact it's not. That's because const and let are block scoped, not closure scoped the way that var is. So what that means is the block that gets opened up with these curly braces and this for loop defines the scope of that rect variable. Uh, let me give a concrete example here. If I say console.log rect out here, it says reference error. Rect is not defined. And that's because we use const and it's block scoped. That means that that variable does not exist outside of that for loop. And so essentially every time that for loop runs with an, another version of i, that const is recreated in a brand new block scope. And so that's what makes it so that const, like this rect, it's never actually reassigned. The whole variable is recreated again and again each time the for loop runs through one of its loops. However, if we were to use var here, check this out, then this console.log rect actually succeeds. It actually prints out this DOM element here. Why is that? Well, it's because when you use var, it's actually scoped relative to the closure that you're in. So right now we're in the global uh, closure because we're not inside of any function 
definition, but if we were inside of a function definition, the curly braces of that function would define the closure, meaning the scope of that variable. And this is actually the core difference between var and the new constructs of let and const. Let is also block scoped. Um, so this is actually the, the, the difference, the fundamental difference between var and let. Var is closure scoped, but let, see if I use let here, it's block scoped, meaning it's scoped within the for loop. That's why we get this reference error when we try to access it here. So yeah, that's, that's a rundown of scoping with var versus let and const. I'll switch it back to const because um, it's, it's generally, I, I think, um, and this is a personal preference thing, it's generally good practice to use const, to default to using const un until you have the need to reassign it, and, and then you can use let. It just makes it easier to read the code later on for your future self or for anybody else reading the code. Someone says um, let would still be nicer there, but I respectfully disagree. I mean, you could use let. I see actually a lot of developers use let by default, but um, I would argue strongly that it's best practice to use const because when the reader of the code in the future sees that, it's, it's clear, okay, this is not going to be reassigned. It makes it easier to reason about the code. When I see let, when I read somebody else's code, I immediately look for where it's going to be reassigned. I'm like, oh, that's like something confusing. I have to think about it, it could be reassigned to value. Where is that reassignment? And that's where I immediately would go. So that's why I would strongly argue that um, just use const by default. And if it turns out that you need to reassign it, then yeah, change it to let. Change it to let, but only if you need it. That's just my, my personal take on all this. All right, so I would like to actually reproduce that solowit piece. We've got this as one of the directions of the solowit piece. Now I would like to change it around so that the texture goes the other way. That way we have our two ingredients that we will eventually put together with this clipping path thing. To do that, I'm going to fork this viz, and I'm going to call it solowit reproduction uh, vertical. It's just going to be a vertical variant. And how do we make it a vertical variant? Um, it's just changing around this stuff here, this logic here. Instead of x varying with i, we can vary um, y with i. So y now can be i times 20. And instead of width being 10, height can be 10. And width can be the value of the width variable. OK, that's it. Now we've got our vertical and our horizontal. And now what we can do is we can use an SVG mask. The idea with an SVG mask is it defines an alpha mask for compositing things. So what we can do is say mask, give it an ID, and this mask is going to be the circle in the sole wit piece. See how this circle in the middle masks uh, the textures? That's exactly what we're going to do here. So we're going to have a black background and a white circle for one of the textures, and then a white background and a black circle for the other of the textures to invert the mask. And this is how we can implement this piece. So it looks generally something like this. We create an, a mask element inside the SVG and give it an ID. Let's do that. And since we're in this world of uh, JavaScript generated stuff, we need to uh, use this API, which gets cumbersome pretty fast. So what I'm going to do is copy that block of the rect, and I'm going to change this to mask. Document.createElementNS mask. I'm going to set the ID attribute to something arbitrary. I'll just call it uh, my, or I'll call it um, circle mask, circle dash mask. We don't need anything else. And then we say svg.appendChild 
uh, mask. And that has to set the attribute on the mask, and we append the mask as a child. Okay, now that we've got that mask, we can, s we can create a circle within that mask. So I'm going to copy this block again, and I'm going to say uh, circle is document.createElementNS circle. And then on that circle, we can set the attribute of CX and CY to be the middle. So CX would be width divided by 2 to put it in the middle. CY would be similarly height divided by 2. And then we want to append the circle to the mask. It has to be a child of the mask. Now that we have this, we can set the mask of these rectangles to be that circle mask. And let me just consult the documentation again. So on any shape, you can say mask equals URL parentheses hash, the ID of the mask. And it's kind of a quirky way of doing it, but you know, that's just what it takes to make it work. So I'm going to copy, I'm going to paste that reference, and then on these rectangles, we can implement that by saying rect.set attribute mask, and the value of that attribute is going to be URL hash, and then the ID of our mask, which is circle dash mask. And I think that should work. It did not work, oh, because we need to set the fill of the circle, I believe. So let's set the fill attribute of the circle to be white. I think this is how these masks work. No? Uh, black? We don't have vertical rectangles at all. Yeah, I know, we're not seeing them, because I'm, I'm setting the mask if I remove the mask, then we do see them. Question is, why is the mask not working? Oh, oh, I believe I didn't set the radius of the circle. Ha! <laughs> Silly me. So R of the circle can be, um, let's say, 200. And we may need that fill after all. Okay, so we need CX, CY, and R. I'll just try a value of 200 for R. And let me try setting the fill to be white. Ah, there it is. There it is. Woohoo, got there. So now the next challenge uh, would be to invert this mask for the other texture. The way that we can invert the mask is by setting the fill of the circle to be black and then we put a white background rectangle within the same mask because the way the masks work is black becomes you can't see it and white becomes you can see it so I'll follow the same pattern as we have for the circle but with the rect I'll call it uh, mask rect so that it doesn't conflict with the other rect. Not maybe it wouldn't anyway. Uh, but anyway, I'll call it mask rect, and the tag name will be rect. And on the mask rect, we can set um, width and height, just to be width and height, because I want it to fill up the background. That's the point of this: is to just fill up the background, and then mask dot pen child mask rect. And I would have thought that would work. Um, oh, I have to set the fill to be white. Boom. All right, see that? We've got the inverse. And now that we have all of the pieces, let's put them together to create our uh, Solowit reproduction. What we need to do is have the rectangles that go in both directions present at the same time. 
right? And so I can use um, VizHub to look back at what I've just created. So we've got these horizontal lines. Oh, and let me consult the direction. So the background should be vertical and the foreground should be horizontal. So um, in this one, we have the vertical lines. We, we should really invert this mask because, yeah, the foreground should be the vertical ones according to the actual piece. And then let's bring back the um, let's bring back these lines that go in this direction. I'm just going to copy this block from here into here as another for loop that runs. Um, N should be really only defined once. And uh, check that out. That's kind of a cool uh, <laughs> intermediate state by itself. I think I'll fork from that. And at this point, what we need to do is create another mask that is the inverse of the mask that we already have. So I'm going to just take all this stuff that defines the mask and I'm going to paste it and rename this to be mask2. And I'll call it circle mask2. Not very creative. Um, I'll just put 2 at the end of all these variables. All right, so now we, we have that mask 2 with the rect and the circle. Uh, we can invert these colors of the mask. So I'll change black to white, change white to black. And for these um, vertical rectangles, we can use the mask of the circle mask 2. So instead of circle mask, it should be circle mask dash 2. And boom, we have done it. There we have our Soul the Wit reproduction. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, this is so satisfying. I'd like to leave you all with an exercise to do between uh, now and next week. Reproduce any Soul the Wit piece, ideally using the JavaScript DOM manipulation that we've done today. Uh, and these are actually three different options for an exercise. Uh, I want it to be open-ended. Uh, so instead of reproducing a particular solo wit piece, you can create art. You know, just create generative algorithmic art in the spirit of solo wit. Very open-ended. You know, you can be very creative, creative or add animation to what we created today. Like I was thinking maybe the textures could be rotating or or the circle could change size, uh, or something like that. So these are your three options in terms of the exercise for this week. I have updated the forum index to create uh, to have an episode three link. So when you uh, submit your piece, please just submit it as a response to this thread, and I'll go over it. Uh, I'll I'll review it next next time. All right, questions, anyone? I have a question. Sure. Sure. What is functional programming and objective programming? Functional programming versus um, perhaps what you're thinking of is object oriented programming? Yeah. yeah. That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's very like abstract and philosophical in a sense. Um, but I'll give you a brief take, you know, my brief take on that. Functional programming generally uh, makes heavy use of functions, and in particular passing functions to other functions. Uh, JavaScript is actually a functional language. It's been called Lisp in C's clothing, and I love that. I think that was, who said that? I don't remember his name. But yeah, JavaScript is Lisp. 
a famous functional language in C's clothing. And C is a procedural language, uh, and C++ and Java are object-oriented languages, meaning the central construct in those languages is um, a class, and then you can have instances of the class that are called objects. Um, and so in, in the language Java, for example, an object is an instance of a class. It's fundamentally different than in JavaScript, an object in JavaScript is, is um, a set of key value pairs. That's often called a, you know, a hash table in other languages. Um, and then there's another language called Haskell on the extreme side of functional programming. In Haskell, there is no mutation. There is no such thing as let, and there's no such thing as reassigning a value to an object. So you have to create new objects all the time in Haskell. It's what's called a pure functional language. So if you want to learn, really, really learn about functional programming, I would suggest to learn about Haskell. It's fantastic. Um, but yeah, practically speaking, we are in the world of um, functional programming with JavaScript. Although it is a mix, I mean, in ES6 there is there is a class construct, and you can do fun uh, object-oriented programming in JavaScript. I personally have sort of moved away from that. I don't use classes very much. I just use you know objects that have key-value pairs that are expected to be a certain thing. Um, and then there's the idea of TypeScript and type safety, which you don't have in vanilla JavaScript. But TypeScript is great if you want to be sure that there's no um, bugs uh, regarding, you know, objects not having the things you expect them to. So that's my brief take on functional versus object-oriented programming. I see there I are some... Yeah, go ahead. What we see here in this one exercise we did just now is functional programming, mostly, right? I mean, is it functional programming? Is it object-oriented programming? It's um, it's almost like at a at at too high of a level of genericness to even say to even make a call. I mean, the DOM API is object-oriented, in a sense that you know you're 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 invoking these functions to create objects that are instances of a class, namely the class called DOM node. I believe it, it is, uh, yeah, so in this API that we're using, it's an interface, it's an abstract base class, and all of this terminology reeks of object-oriented programming. It's like, yeah, this is definitely object-oriented programming. They're having a base class, and in object-oriented programming, you have classes that inherit from other classes, uh, and you have this whole hierarchy of stuff. Uh, so we are using an object-oriented API to the DOM. So in that sense, it is very much object-oriented. However, we're not, you know, we didn't create any classes of our own. So in that sense, it's not object-oriented. Um, and we're also not using any functions except for the methods on these instances of the classes. Uh, so when you when a function is positioned as a property of an object, it's often called a method. So these are methods on these objects, which is also from the object-oriented realm. You know, instances of classes have methods. That's just how object-oriented programming works. So if you were to, you know, broadly say, is this code that we wrote today object-oriented or functional? It's more object-oriented, honestly. We're not using any functions really. Um, and even this, this way of doing iteration is very procedural. If we wanted to do it in, 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 a, in a functional programming kind of a way, we would use some other constructs. And we'll do that later, by the way. I'm thinking next week we, we refactor this whole thing to use D3 and functional programming and abstract away duplicated logic with functions um, just to see how things get really um, tight and concise when you do really embrace functional programming. And thanks, somebody in the YouTube chat said, um, 
lisp in c's clothing is from douglas crockford yeah 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 douglas crockford he's he's got some really good stuff um really good really good written pieces about javascript um oh someone asked could i do this using visual studio code yes yes of course i mean it's just a text file here so in vizhub by the way you can export the thing and you get a zip file you can extract this somewhere and then just open up index.html in visual studio code and you know everything will just work the same way that it's working here except that you'll have to open up the file in a browser and every time you make a change you're gonna have to save the file and then go and refresh the browser unless you get deeper into the tooling of having something that automatically refreshes like a webpack development environment yeah all this stuff I'm I'm doing here is just purely uh, HTML standard standard HTML and JavaScript and SVG and it's it's not in any way dependent on the fact that I'm in VizHub. VizHub is I'm just using it as a, as a teaching tool so that I can give you references to these code files. Uh, but yeah, you could totally do all this with uh, Visual Studio Code. And as we get deeper into JavaScript, I think I'll get deeper into um, showing how to work outside of VizHub um, using different build tools. Yeah, great question. Oh, yeah, there's a discussion in the YouTube chat about um, classes in JavaScript is actually syntactic sugar for appending stuff to the prototype. It's very true. It's very true. But that's like, that's a whole other rabbit hole. There's like, uh, uh, the <laughs> when you create objects in JavaScript, you can actually create them to inherit from a prototype which is, it's just a whole can of worms that I just r would rather not get into because we're not going to need those constructs. Uh, another comment in the chat is you could have wrapped all this stuff in view.js. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, this is a very crude way of doing DOM manipulation, but I wanted to explicitly use the DOM APIs just so you see what it is in its bare form. You could wrap all this stuff in D3, do it in React, do it in Angular, do it in Vue, anything but the the resulting dom is going to be the same and that's really what matters in terms of what you get uh, what you see on the screen all right i think i'll wrap for today this has been a really good session and um, yeah i'm really super excited to see what you all come up with um, feel free to fork this or start from scratch um, you know be creative add gradients or whatever add animations and uh, all right, we're really looking forward to next week. Thanks, everyone, for joining. See you in a week. Bye. All right, welcome to episode four of Get It Right in Black and White. Today, what we're going to do is use D3 to reproduce this solo wit piece in its fullness um, with different shapes. What we'll cover includes uh, a review of the exercise submissions from last week. And then we're going to start using D3 selections and data joins. We're going to take what we did last week and refactor it, you know, move the code around, change it uh, so that it does the same thing but uses D3. And then we'll look at D3 symbols. D3 actually provides these nice shapes that we can use. Uh, and Along the way to reproducing that solo wit piece, we're going to talk about SVG group elements, translating group elements, meaning moving them around, and we'll touch upon D3 point scales and potentially band scales, depending on how far we get. All right, so this is the solo wit piece that we're aiming to reproduce. And today, what I'm hoping to do is get to the point where we have multiple different shapes in this mask. And if we get to that point and still have time, I want to tackle the problem of the background being different for each of these. 
Um, I think the first pass would be, you know, the background is all uh, vertical lines and the, sh the filled in shapes are all horizontal lines. That would be the first phase that we're going to shoot for. So phase two um, would be to make it so that each square here has has the um, the horizontal lines in the background and the vertical lines in the foreground, alternating with the vertical lines in the background and the horizontal lines in the foreground. So, I don't know. I hope it's not too ambitious. Um, let's give it a shot. All right, here's the forum post from last week. Let's see what we've got. Um, Philippe Mayon, uh, he's been following, and, and I'm very impressed by this work. Um, this is actually a game. Check this out. Uh, he <laughs> It's my face with, uh, you know, this Sol LeWitt-esque kind of a thing going on. Pretty wild. And it changes over time. Uh, I'm just blown away by this. Very nice, very nice work. Yeah, and I think he actually made this into a full-blown game. Uh, although I can't find it right now. And look, he made this one earlier. Oh, this is so good. Look at that. Incredible. Really incredible. So here's another one from uh, W. Gloss. This is pretty neat. There's some randomness here. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Vanilla, JavaScript, and DOM API. Here's one from Nita. Check this out. Whoa, what? <laughs> That's crazy. Oh my gosh. Nita, you want to talk about this a little bit? Yes, uh, I can. Um, can I see the code? If I write it in the So I added animations on the Y position of the rectangle, each rectangle. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. Dot animate, fast. Dot animate is a function that is used. Wow, I've never, never even seen, seen this seen method. method. That's very cool. Yeah, I just researched that a little bit on this one. Wow, wow. Amazing. amazing. Very nice. Very, very nice. Thank you. But how is how are they all going at? Uh, could you mute? Could you mute yourself? My audio is bleeding. Now, how how is it that each of these are are not going all at the same time? It seems like it's the duration of this animate is is a random number. That's really cool. Really cool. So that's how that effect happens. Very nice. And, um, whoa, look at this one. Very nice. It almost looks like three dimensional uh, balls or something. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Let's see. Oh, here it is. He posted again. This is the game version. So I was I was quite impressed by this. Check this out. You have to you have to you have <laughs> This is so funny. You have to click when it's black and white. So that's I just got one point. And if you click when it's not black and white. Okay, I clicked on a uh, black and white again. But if you click when it's color you lose a life. <laughs> See that? One less little icon there. Um, 
So this is just through the roof. Really great job. Um, really creative. Very nice work. Here's another one from Nita. A bunch of circles. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful grid of circles. Very nice. Do you want to talk about this one at all? Yeah, I would like to talk about it. So what I did here, uh, we are actually uh, positioning each circle in X and Y direction. So we are using I and J twice. So we can get the kind of matrix values in the matrix I and J for each cell there. Something like that. You can say it is going in the X direction and Y direction at the same time. And Beautiful. You are getting the whole grid gets filled up depending on how many numbers the circle we are using. And you can add animation and other things on top of it. And I did it in other example. I kept forking it again and again. It was just so fun. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. So it's a nested for loop where I goes from zero to count, J goes from zero to count. And for each combination of I and J, the circle is positioned. Very nice, very nice. And it's pretty close to this other Solowit piece. So that could be the next phase, perhaps. All right, that's it. That's all the work. Very cool. All right, here we go. Here's our piece that we made last time. I'm going to start by forking this, and I'll call it Solowit Reproduction with D3. All right. Open the editor. The first order of business that I want to do here is include D3 into our app here. One way to do that would be to add a script tag to the head and put the source equal to something, uh, usually from a CDN like Unpackage. A CDN is a content distribution network that essentially hosts files on the web that you can pull in. However, in modern um, web development, usually you use a, a Node.js based build system, uh, like using Webpack or Rollup or using some starter app uh, system framework thing. And there's a relatively new feature of VizHub that lets you approximate package.json which I'm very excited to start using. So let's let's do that. I'm going to make a new file called package.json. Uh, package.json by the way, it's like a it's a standard in a way. npm and the node uh, NPM stands for Node Package Manager. It's a whole ecosystem of uh, JavaScript libraries. And so NPM expects this thing called package.json. And you can put a bunch of stuff in here, like set the license and, uh, you know, add dependencies. Dependencies is what matters for us. So it's you specify this object that has dependencies and then the library name and the version we can use this to pull in D3 to our program. In package.json, I'm going to make it an object in, in JSON format, JavaScript object notation format, JSON. And the key will be 
Oh, there's some something um, strange happening. All right, so we can type dependencies as the key, and the object can contain D3 at some specific version. And um, let me check which version D3 is at. The way I like to check that is to go to unpackage.com, which is a CDN that hosts script files, and just type D3 and it will automatically fill in the latest version. So we're at version 6.6.1. So in here, D3 version will be 6.6.1. All right, that's like a bare minimum package.json. And then what we can do is introduce a, a script file where our JavaScript can go. And just by convention, I'm going to call it index.js. And what we can do is take all of this JavaScript that was in this script tag directly on the page and move it over to index.js. And everything still runs. Now I can delete that script tag over here, and we have this sort of new setup in which we can import from D3. So here we go. Let's pull in uh, something from D3. I'm going to say import selection from D3. This is ES6 uh, module syntax to import from packages. And this syntax you can use, again, with all the modern uh, templates and whatnot. And so let's see if this worked. Console.log selection. I just want to see, did it get defined as anything? In the dev tools, we can see that indeed, it's a function. Hooray! It's a function from D3. It's got these weird uh, characters because it comes from a minified uh, file, the, the D3 build. But anyway, this means that now we can start using D3. So let me talk about selection. If you Google D3 selection and click the first result, It's the documentation page for this package called D3-selection. And D3, by the way, is structured as a collection of many smaller packages that are all composed into this one monolithic library called D3. And so if you see in, in uh, D3 itself, it just Im it exports things from all of these uh, D3 packages, which you could use on their own, but for convenience sake, I'm just going to pull in the whole D3 build, which contains all of this stuff. But anyway, D3 selection is one of these things, and I'm going to pull in uh, from there. And feel free to stop me at any time with questions, by the way. Yeah, I haven't really introduced um, D3 itself. Let me stop and do that. Since this is the first time that we're pulling in D3, uh, I thought I would take a moment to discuss D3 and why we'd want to use it. Uh, overall, just some broad context for this. D3 stands for data-driven documents. It refers to documents as in 
the, doc, the HTML document object model. D3 has utilities for DOM manipulation, which we did last time with the vanilla um, JavaScript API for DOM manipulation, which was quite verbose. A lot of that stuff can be changed such that it uses D3 for DOM manipulation, and the code will shrink down. It'll be a lot simpler to read and use. In addition to DOM manipulation, D3 has all sorts of utilities for building data visualizations. Uh, so that's why it has become sort of the de facto standard for building visualizations on the web today. The whole rest of this series is going to be diving into using D3 to make all these different types of visualizations, but as a starting point, um, I wanted to introduce D3 in a way that's disconnected from data and all the complexities that comes along with data uh, in this Solowit exercise here. D3 selection is the package within the set of D3 packages that does DOM manipulation. Here are some examples of how to use it. Um, and and I'll, I'll go, you know, we'll craft these ourselves. But for reference, this page is the canonical documentation for D3 selections. All right, now that we've imported selection from D3, we can start to use it to replace this code that we had from last time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to comment out everything and then re-implement it with D3 one block at a time. The first block to consider is the one that sets up the SVG element. I'm going to comment this out as well and replace it with some D3-based stuff. Select body is what we need to do to get um, a D3 selection of the body element. And now that I think of it, um, we really need to import select from D3, not selection. So we've got select from D3, we select the body, um, and a D3 selection instance is this sort of complicated thing that we'll be learning more about. But it has this, this pattern of using it called method chaining, where once you invoke something and you get a D3 selection back, that thing that gets returned by this function has a bunch of methods on it, one of which is append. And you can pass into append the tag name, like SVG. And that returns the selection of the SVG element that was appended to the body. So this, this one line here does the exact same thing as this line and this line. It creates a new SVG element and appends it to the body. To set these attributes on this well, first of all, let me save this as a variable. I'll call it SVG. Once we've got that, we can say SVG.attr, which is short for attribute. Uh, internally, this actually invokes set attribute. And the signature is compatible with the vanilla uh, DOM API method set attribute. So I could just paste this stuff here. We set the attribute of width to be the value of the variable width. And same thing for height. The height attribute gets the value of the height variable. Now we can inspect the DOM to see if it worked. And sure enough, there it is. There's an SVG element with width 960 and height 500. Any questions at this point?
All right, so this is one way to set up the SVG element. Um, due to this method chaining thing, you can actually combine these together into one big statement. So instead of having multiple different statements, it could be one giant statement where we chain these things together. So we append this, the SVG, and then on the selection of the SVG, we set the width and height. All right, so we've got our SVG set up. The thing that I wanted to do next was add the, the, the rectangles that are in the background. That would be a good next thing to add. Yeah, this block here, where it's a for loop that adds a bunch of rectangles, let's do this with D3. So I'll bring that up here. The way we would do this in D3 is uh, we need to have an array to work with. And then once we have an array, we can use uh, the D3 data join concept. So here's what we can do. I'm going to use this code as a template to build up an array of objects where each object represents the attributes of a single rectangle. So I'll paste that, uncomment it, and then I can initialize an array. I'll call it marks because it represents the visual marks that are going to appear on the page. I'll initialize it like this to an empty array. And then in the body of this for loop, instead of creating DOM elements, I'm just going to push objects onto this array, meaning, you know, append them to the array, add new entries to this list of things by using the push method. So we can say marks.push and pass in an object literal. And on this object literal, I can build up all the things that it needs to know uh, to render a rectangle. So y, for example, could be set to i times 20. Width could be set to width. Height could be set to 10. I'm just copying from what's there. And the mask can be set to this string here. That's how we can build up an array of objects that describe the rectangles. This is not using D3 at all. This is just pure JavaScript. And just to see that it worked, let me console.log marks. Sure enough, we get this array. And we can see it's got a bunch of objects where the only thing that really varies is y. All right, so far so good. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, so we are doing this because D3 requires an array as a data, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um. You know your audio is really bad. I, I don't know what it is, but maybe grab a camera or something. The reason why we're setting up this array is because D3 expects an array to work with, to use this data join feature of D3, which we're going to use right now. I'm going to refer to this SVG selection from earlier to add rectangles inside of it. And to use this pattern of D3 data joins, we can take a D3 selection and say, you know, that selection dot select all uh, rect 
This makes a selection of all rectangles that are on the page already. And at the point that where this code runs, there are none. But the fact that there are none is useful information to D3 because it knows that, okay, the set of DOM elements on the page, it doesn't contain what it needs to, therefore I have to add it. So once we've said select all, we can say dot data marks. This produces a D3 uh, data join that has a bunch of methods on it. Um, one method, which was added fairly recently uh, in D3, is dot join. It's a simplified API to um, the other stuff that was in use before, like uh, en dot enter, uh, dot merge, sort of stuff. And we'll, you know, we'll get deeper, deeper into this, but this is the simplified API that we can use for our case. So what it's going to do here is create one rectangle for each of these marks. And then on this uh, selection that contains all these newly minted rectangles, we can set some attributes. We can set the attribute of... Uh, I'm looking at this object here. We want to set all four of these attributes. We can set the Y attribute to be... Well, what we want to set it to is the Y value from the corresponding object that was constructed over here. To do that, we can accept a function as input to the second argument to .attr. And that function can take as input d, which is the datum. Uh, it's just a convention to use d to represent the datum, like one row of the data, or you know one entry in the data array. And that can return d.y, because we've set it up here. So when we access d.y, it's going to access the y value that we set up over there. And we can do a similar thing for all the other attributes that we need. Width, we can set it to d.width. Height, we can set it to d.height. And mask, we can set to d.mask. And that, that's not doing anything now because I commented out the actual masks. And as you can see, it worked. We've got our rectangles back. This is how you can use D3 to create a bunch of rectangles on the screen. Now, this duplication between here and here um, is not ideal, but I kind of like this way of doing things, in a sense, because it decouples the computation of the marks from the rendering of the marks. This here, it just creates an array of objects that we can directly pass in to all this D3 logic over here. Um, and I like this setup because if in the future you ever wanted to change what you were using for doing the DOM manipulation, you could. And this part wouldn't have to change at all. The only thing that would have to change is this, like if you wanted to render it using uh, React or Vue. For example, these other DOM manipulation frameworks. But this is not often what you see. So often what you see is it's all combined into one big block. And in a sense, that's more efficient because there's no need actually to create all these strings if they're all the same and then refer to it here. You know, we could just pass in uh, the value right here. So what I'll do, I just wanted to show you how that looks. So I'm going to comment out this, so it's there as a reference in the future, and then refactor this to use the more common pattern that you find with D3, which is 
to um, to compute all the values in these accessor functions. So instead of doing all this stuff here, um, I'll do it down here. And if we're doing it like that, we don't actually need all this logic to build up the array. We can use a utility from D3 called range, which creates an array. Range of, say, 5, it creates an array that has 5 integers in it that start at 0. And to use this, we need to import range from D3 along with select. Now that we've done console.log range of 5, you can see that it did output here that array that just contains some numbers. So this is the data array that I'm going to use now as the input. Instead of saying dot data marks, I'm going to say dot data range of 5. But we did have this variable called n, which is the number of rectangles, so I'm going to use that instead. Now, in here, instead of accessing the properties that were on those objects, we can compute those values on the fly. Um, D is the number in this case, so I'm just going to say D times 20. It can take the place of I. And for these other ones, I'm just going to return width and uh, 10 for height and then this string of the circle mask right here. And since these are returning the same values for each rectangle, these don't actually need to be functions. We could just pass in the value directly like this. This highlights an important aspect of this .attr method, that it accepts either constant values like this, or functions. And when it, when it accepts a function, it passes in the object from the array into that function, and then whatever that function returns, it's going to use as the value for that attribute. All right, so we've got this far. Let's keep going in our refactoring of this code here. What does this block do? It creates a mask, and it sets the ID to be circle mask, and it appends it to the SVG. We can do the same with D3 by saying svg.append mask. And we want to set the ID attribute to be circle mask. All right, that should do the same thing as this block of code over here. I don't know why it's not showing up our rectangles, though. Oh, oh yes, because now that mask exists, but it doesn't contain anything yet. It doesn't contain those uh, the circle or anything. So that's our next step. The next block of code adds that background rectangle of the mask. Well, let's do that now with D3. That would look like uh, mask.append, although we don't have mask yet. Um, I'll just define that here to be that D3 selection of that mask element. So now we could say mask.append rect. This one statement does the same thing as this statement here, which creates the rect element, 
and also appends it to the mask parent. Now we can set the attributes width height and fill and if I change this to white it should show up all of our rectangles and it does okay but black means hide the rectangles this next block does the same thing but for a circle so I'm going to copy that logic for the rectangle and change it to be for a circle instead where we set the CY attribute we set the CX attribute and we set the radius attribute and finally we set the fill attribute of that circle all right and the mask is working again fantastic now let's do the same for mask 2 now remember mask 2 was all the same stuff as mask 1 except just the colors were inverted so we can copy uh, this whole block of stuff mask 2 is a new mask that has the ID circle mask dash two. And then we append a rectangle to mask two. And instead of it being black, it should be white. And then we append the circle to mask two down here. And the fill of that should be black instead of white. Okay. That seems to be working. Although I forgot to change it to mask2. So I'll change that now. Mask2.append, mask2.append. All right, and lastly we have our rectangles which I'll bring up to the top near the other rectangles just so all the rectangle stuff is in one spot so I'll paste that here and it's almost exactly the same as this block of code that we did for the first set of rectangles the only difference is that X gets set to I times 20 so I'll just change this Y here to X width gets 10 height gets the value of the height variable and the mask is circle mask dash 2 okay um, see this breakage this is not what we expect see that so does anyone have um, any idea what's going on here see what appears to be happening here is that this first chunk of code that made these rectangles it set up all of these rectangles uh, properly but this line this uh, next block of code that deals with rectangles 
it actually selected all of the rectangles that were there from the first block of code. And then it set um, the x value of that, and it set the height value. Um, so it's just sort of a mess where our two different blocks of code are you know, impacting the same set of rectangles, which we don't want. So how can we how can we make it so that these two different blocks um, act on different rectangles? Well, there's a couple of approaches. Um, one approach is we could use classes to differentiate them, and another approach is we could use group elements to contain them. Uh, let me show you how both of those would play out. If we want to use classes we can set the class attribute to be something like um, maybe horizontal. And then when we say select all, we can say rect.horizontal to only pick up on those horizontal ones. And it's still broken because we haven't done the same treatment for the other set. But we could say class is vertical over here, and then we select on the vertical rectangles only. This is one way of doing it. I'm going to fork at this point just to have a reference of that state of things. Okay, so this is one way of doing it, using classes. Another way, I'm just going to put it back to the way it was. Another way of solving this problem is to use group elements, where you could say svg.append g first. And that way, it would only be working within this newly appended group element. Uh, and an svg group element is it's a very um, useful element. It, it just groups its children together in the DOM tree. And uh, let me do the same for the other set. OK, now you can see it's, it's not broken anymore. And if we inspect the DOM, we can see that there's one group element that contains the set of rectangles going from top to bottom. And then there's an entirely other group element that contains the rectangles going from left to right. Yeah, and the reason why this works is because the selection for the rectangles only acts within each of these different group elements. So that's another way to, to solve that breakage. Okay, very good. Uh, this feels like a milestone. From here, I'm going to fork this and try to uh, reproduce that um, the full the full set with the different shapes. Any questions at this point? Yeah, just a couple. Uh, um, the attributes, uh, the ATTR. Um, just so to get it straight in my head, those the second arguments to the ATTR methods, those effectively take match a data point 
in the um, your array and put it on the screen basically that they 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 attach some kind of pixel point to that data point is is that the right way of thinking about these um these these arguments that are passed to ATTR yes yes that's correct that's exactly right so whatever we pass into dot data should be an array and the dot ATTR applies to all of the DOM elements in that selection and so after we call dot join um, the first time this runs I mean it's not running multiple times but when it runs it's going to create a bunch of rectangles and then for each element of that array it's going to pass that element as the argument to this function that we've passed in and so the responsibility of this function is to map that entry in that array, whatever it may be, whatever shape it may be, onto whatever is expected for the x coordinate in this case, or in general the you know the attribute value of the DOM element. And so yeah, it's a mapping function that essentially transforms the thing from data space, whatever that may be into, well, I like to th think of it as screen space. In this case, the x-coordinate, so literal position on the screen. Uh, but it could, could also be a color or, you know, width and height, like these cases here. But yes, yes, that's exactly what it's doing. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, the earlier chunk where um, it talks about, yeah, it append g um, and select all and data are these so just so I, my mental model is correct um, or as close to correct as possible it's recreate uh, it's creating a brand new selection um, at that early stage and what the ATTRs are doing are modifying that selection is is that is that the way to think about it Correct. Yeah, some of these lines create a new selection, and others of these lines modify an existing selection. There was, uh, in the past, I mean, it still is, there was a convention around indentation relating to this point. And that convention was any line that creates a new selection be indented one level, and then any line that modifies the exist the other you know modifies the selection that was defined on the line above uh, should be indented by two spaces. However, that's sort of fallen out of fashion because everybody's using prettier nowadays. But it's a nice touch, and just to to really make it clear, let me walk through each and every line of this. SVG dot append G creates a new group element, a DOM element. You know, internally, it invokes exactly this code of, um, you know, document.createElementNS with the SVG namespace. And it takes that, that DOM node that was constructed and associates it with this new newly minted D3 selection that didn't exist before. And it creates a brand new selection. So the return value from svg.append g is a selection that just contains that one group element. When you say dot select all rect, this creates yet another D3 selection that happens to be empty. Uh, it, it's it's an empty selection that would contain rect elements if there were rect elements there, but there's not. Um, this information, the, the fact that it's empty, is very useful to the internals of the dot data 
method, which associates an array to that selection. Um, and at a certain point, selections were made immutable, which is a really nice feature of selections. Selections are immutable. Um, so the dot data call creates a new selection where that empty selection of no rectangles is associated with this data. All right. And then when you say dot join rect, this is actually a short form of uh, another pattern, which I'm not sure I totally want to get into, but uh, essentially it's dot enter dot append rect. And so the enter selection handles the case where there's no DOM element on the page corresponding to a given data element. And so for each of those cases, it will append a new rectangle. So that's this, this dot join is a short form for that in this particular case. And then all of these lines that use dot ATTR, they, they don't actually mutate the, the, anything in JavaScript. Like the, so the D3 selection of these rectangles is immutable. However, what it does when this line runs, it goes through each and every DOM element and it mutates the DOM element. It sets the Y attribute to be the return value of, you know, whatever the value is returned from this function. And same thing with all these others. It goes through and updates the DOM elements based on the return values. So I hope that clarifies the the role of the different pieces. Uh, definitely. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I see there's some questions in the YouTube chat. Did join used to be enter rect? Well, no, it used to be dot enter dot append rect. And join, it actually does something with merge, but we, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, another question from the YouTube chat. Since mask height and width are the same, can you bind them to a parent G element? That's interesting. So the mask width and height are applied to the the rectangle within the mask, not the mask element itself. Therefore, um, no, I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can do that. Okay, here we go. Let's um, let's fork this one. And I'll call it uh, full solo wit reproduction with D3. The first thing I'm going to do here is just delete all this junk that is left over from earlier. Deleting all these blocks that are commented out. All right, now we're left with this program that is uh, what, 62 lines of code. What we can do next is change this mask 
to be a shape. And uh, D3 actually provides a set of symbols that we can use. There is a package called D3 shape. And in D3 shape, there is a section on symbols. These symbols here are provided uh, by D3. And the way this plays out is that um, you call some D3 functions, and it generates for you the string to use as the D attribute for a path. To create one of these symbols on the screen, we need to just make a path element and then set the D attribute to the, re the return value from some invocation. Let's see what that invocation would be. We have to call d3.symbol and pass in type and size. The type that we pass in should be one of these symbol types like d3.symbol circle, d3.symbol cross, d3.symbol diamond. Also, the set of symbols is exposed as d3.symbols. This is an array that contains all of these individual things. And so since our aim is to reproduce this piece, which has a bunch of different symbols going across, um, I'd say we can just use that array of all the symbols that are available and, you know, traverse it. Use that as our data. All right, so let's import symbols from D3 in our code. Import select range and symbols from D3. We also need to import symbol from D3. The way we use this is we call symbol passing in a type and a size, and that returns a symbol generator which we then need to invoke with some arguments, or no arguments, I guess, works. And that, there's, I'm just, there's just something complicated um, that you could do if you pass an argument, but you don't need to pass an argument. So once you invoke this function, it will return that, that string that we can use as the D attribute of a path. So let's give it a shot. On one of these masks, I'm going to replace this circle with a path. And instead of CX, CY, and R, we can set the D attribute to be symbol. And I'm going to pass in the symbol type, which I can just access, you know, symbols at index 0 the first entry of the symbols array. And the second argument here could be the size. Um, I don't really know what the range of size is. I'll try 300. And this invocation here returns a symbol generator, which we then need to invoke as a function. And once we do, it should return uh, some stuff. All right, I don't see anything. Maybe the size needs to be increased. There it is. I see something start to appear. Yeah. Okay, there it is. Um, the first symbol happens to be a circle. <laughs> but to see some other shape, we can access, uh, I don't know, the next symbol. Symbols at index 1, for example. Notice that the symbol is centered in the upper left. That's, I think, the first problem I would like to address here.
Um, yeah, and the way we need to do this is, uh, well, we want to move it around. Uh, my first goal here is to move it so that it's in the center. And to do that, I think the most straightforward way to, would be to use an SVG group element as the parent of this path and transform that group element, meaning move that group element around with everything in it. Let's try that. All right, so here we've got mask.append path. But instead, what if we did mask.append g dot append path. This works just the same as it did because it's just a grouping with no transform applied to it. To apply the transform to this group element to move this path around, we can say dot attr transform and the value will be translate of uh, let's just try some numbers, 400 comma 400. Yeah, that moved it. The way this works is um, it's a string, but it looks like a function invocation. It's, um, it's a domain-specific language for transforms. And wh what it looks like is the first argument to this uh, function-esque kind of a thing in a string is the x coordinate. So it's going to move it over to the right by 400 pixels. And the second argument here is the y coordinate. So it's going to move it down by 400 pixels. Ideally, uh, to put it in the center, we could say um, width divided by 2 and height divided by 2. But since this is a string, that's not going to work. Uh, we can take advantage of an ES6 language feature called string template literals. And the way we can use this is by using backticks. And then inside of this thing, we can bust out into JavaScript using this syntax here, a dollar symbol and then a pair of curly braces. So now whatever is inside this pair of curly braces will be evaluated as JavaScript and inserted into that location in the string. So now we can actually use width over 2 and height over 2. And now it's dead center. Look at that. I'll bring the size down a little so it fits on the screen. There we go. All right, so the problem now is that one of these masks uses this symbol, and the other mask still uses the circle. So, I mean, one thing we could do to address that is copy-paste all this code, which is what I'll do you know, for now, and change white to black. All right, now this sort of looks is starting to resemble that solo wit piece a little bit more. But I hate this um, duplicated logic between these two blocks, these two masks. I mean, there's a bunch of code that looks almost exactly the same. The only difference is one of these is filled with white and has an ID of circle mask, and the other is filled with black and has an ID of circle mask 2. And now that I think of it, these names are a little outdated because um, it's not circles anymore. Um, so I'm going to rename it to uh, mask 1 and mask 2. 
and I have to go and update the references as well. Okay, now what I would like to do before we go any further is refactor this so that there's no duplicated logic. The reason being once we start adding more shapes into here we're gonna have to copy paste larger and larger chunks and if we want to change it in one place we'd have to change it in two places it would be a total nightmare. And so this is a point at which refactoring makes a lot of sense. Refactoring is this notion of reorganizing code so that it's more maintainable uh, or you can do more things with it. Generally, it, refactoring is triggered when you see duplicated logic in your code. All right, so what I'm going to do here is define a function. And the idea is we can invoke this function and, and we can pass in only the things that vary between the two, namely the mask ID, which is different, and the fill, which is different. So let's try that. Const, um, what should I call it? Render mask equals a function. And I'm just going to take all this logic that appends the rectangle and the path and put it inside these curly braces and use prettier to automatically indent that. Now, the things that we want to accept here are the ID and the fill. Uh, oh, but first of all, we should actually invoke this function. Okay, now everything is in working order again. And we can take as, as one argument here the ID of the mask, and we can use it here when we're setting the ID. So I'll say render mask and pass in that string mask-1 here, which surfaces inside of this function as the local variable called ID, which is used here to set the attribute ID on the mask. Right, so we can actually now call render mask twice, passing in different IDs. And um, I'll just comment out this other block because um, it's going to be replaced by this function. All right, so the, the fill is the other thing that we, we need to have vary between these two function calls. So I think what I'll do is, uh, instead of white, this will be fill, which we can accept as the second argument. And so what we can do here is pass in white to the first one and black to the second one. Although this is not exactly right because we also need to deal with the, the background rectangle which needs to be inverted. Like if it's black, it needs to be white. So you know what? Instead of using fill, I'm going to accept an argument called inverted. And this, this will be a Boolean where if it's true, the colors should be inverted. If it's false, they shouldn't be. And so inverted for the first invocation should be false. And for the second invocation should be true. And then uh, we want the rect fill to be black if it's not inverted and white if it is. And uh, to do that, I see there's some YouTube chatter. Uh, let me finish this thought and I'll answer some questions there. To do that, uh, the tool that I would reach for is the ternary operator. So we can say inverted question mark. If it is inverted, this should be white. Otherwise, it should be black. 
since this is the first time I'm using this, um, I, I want to stop and show you what it would look like without this syntax. It would look kind of like this. Let rect fill equals black. And then we could say if inverted rect fill equals white. And then we would use rect fill down there. So what it's doing is if it's not inverted, this code will not run and rect fill will be black. But if inverted is true, rect fill will be white and this will be filled in with white. However, um, I think the cleaner syntax would be to use the ternary operator and say if it's inverted, it should be, see now I'm losing track, of, you know, which, what should it be? Uh, let's say black and white. Now we can apply the same logic to the fill of the path, but it should be inverted from the background. And so if it's inverted, now it should be white if it is and black if it isn't. Okay, there we go. Victory. Now we can get rid of this commented out stuff here. And now there's just one block of code that is responsible for rendering this mask. The first time we render it as mask one, which is not inverted, and the second time we render it as mask two, which is inverted. And at this juncture, I want to um, introduce the, the syntax of calling functions on D3 selections. What that looks like is it can take, uh, this is just a convention that I want to introduce now. It's a convention that's used when you start to use functions to abstract, uh, to build abstractions in this D3 world. So what it looks like is we pass the selection as the first argument, and inside of this function we refer to it generically as some selection, and we would pass it in as SVG here as the first argument. Now it works, everything works as expected. And the conventional way of doing these sorts of invocations with D3 would be to use selection.call. So we could say svg.call render mask and then pass in these second two arguments here like this. and we can invoke it again with these other arguments. These two are exactly equivalent in terms of what they do. I just wanted to introduce this uh, way of invoking functions on selections. It doesn't have any immediate benefit right now, um, but it, it, it can be a very nice, elegant way of doing it. Um, one of the things one of the reasons being that you can chain it like this. So this is also valid syntax. All right. So I'll fork from here just to capture the state of things. Now the task before us is to render multiple symbols in here instead of just one. So how can we do that? Well, we've got symbols at index one in use here. And what we essentially want to do is iterate through. So if I change it to be symbols at index two, the shape that you see is a different shape. And symbols at index four is a star for example. What we want to do is append multiple paths where each path has the, the this D attribute from a different symbol. 
So how can we do this? Instead of just appending a single path, we can use this data join pattern that we used earlier with our rectangles. What this looks like um, is, well, instead of doing it on the end of here, I'm going to assign a variable called g, just to sort of uh, separate these concerns here. So g is our parent. We can say g dot select all paths and initially it's going to be empty dot data and what should the data be here what I'm thinking is it can just be the same thing we did with the rectangles we can use the range utility to create an array that contains integers starting at zero and how many things should be in here? Well, it should be the same as the number of symbols that are available, which we can access from symbols.length. All arrays have this dot .length property, and it, it returns to you the number of elements that are on the array. All right, so we've got this array of integers going from 0 to uh, the number of symbols um, so now what we need to do is use this dot join method on paths now it's going to create a bunch of paths and on each path we want to set the D attribute to be something like this that we had earlier, but we want it to vary based on the symbols. And we also want the fill to be white or black. Since we are making multiple paths, we can use a function here to take as input d, one of these integers, and we can access symbols at index d to have it be different symbols. And what we get here is like this giant splotch where all the symbols are um, right on top of each other. So the task at hand here, now that we've got this far, is to split these apart in the x direction so that, you know, one symbol is on the left and one symbol is on the right. Since we have d as an integer, um, that starts at zero and goes upward, we could potentially uh, move each of these group elements uh, over if we had them, but we don't. We're just creating path elements and there's a containing parent group element. I think what we really want is to have it so that for each symbol there is a separate group element created and then within that group element there should be a path yeah to clarify what I'm what I'm saying if we inspect the Dom here we can see that within the mask there's a group element that has a transform and then within that group element there are a bunch of paths I think instead we want to invert this containment relationship where for each symbol there should be a parent group element that gets a different transform that gets translated differently in the x direction and then within each one of those group elements we can put the path yeah that's what I'm gonna go for and we could keep this parent 
element, but I don't think it's necessary because we could just set the transform on the inner elements. So I'm going to get rid of that for now. And instead of appending our paths to G, I'm going to append them to mask. Now it's working again, but it's it's in the upper left corner because um, you know they, they're at the origin now. The next step here is to use group elements instead of paths. So I'm going to say mask.select all G dot data dot join dot join G. However, this um, this convenience method is no longer enough for this case that we've got. Now we need to deal with this concept of the enter selection because what we want to do is tell D3 whenever you create a new group element you should also append a path element inside of it. Yeah and to do that we need to use the join method in a slightly different way. Um, what we've seen so far is the shorthand of join where it accepts a string being the tag name but the long form of dot join is where it accepts arguments for enter update and exit and I'll get more into this later but um, the simplest form of this is we pass a function to dot join and it's interpreted as uh, the enter selection um, Actually, more precisely, we need to pass a function that takes as input the enter selection. All right. Um, I realize it is a little confusing. And in here, we can say enter dot append g to create our parent group element. But on this, we can say dot append path. And then on these paths is where we can set the D attribute and the fill attribute. Okay, we're back in working order. Just to work through to walk through this one more time, we're passing a function to dot join. That function will be invoked with the enter selection of this data join. And because there are no group elements initially, the enter selection will um, will have this append method that will get triggered for each and every entry in the array. So we append a group element, and we append a path element to each of those group elements, and we set D and fill on each of those paths. So now if we inspect the DOM and look at it that way, we can see that there are indeed many group elements. It's just that what we need to do now is transform each of these group elements to translate them so that they're in the middle vertically, but they're spreading across the page horizontally. And I see in the YouTube chat, Vani says, use this code right here. Okay, I'm going to copy that code and see if it works. Thanks for that. I'm just pasting this from the YouTube chat. Oh, that's that's what I've got already. But yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, all right, what we want to do here is for these group elements, we want to set the attribute of transform to be uh, we can take this thing that we con had constructed earlier. Translate by width over 2, height over 2. Okay, now it's in the middle again. But we don't actually want to translate in the x direction by width over 2. We want to translate in the x direction by some function of d. And keep in mind d is an integer that goes between 1 and uh, however many symbols there are. Let's just say d times 200 
to like spread them out by 200. Oh, but this is not a function. It's just a string literal. So let me make it into a function that accepts D. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, it's starting to come together. That looks like pretty cool abstract art right there. Oh, Vani says it's not the same. It uses I. Let me see that. Let me take a look at that. Yeah, so this is the code that I wrote. This is the code from Vani in YouTube. It's, it is slightly different. It, it accepts I. Yeah, this when you pass a function, it does take um, a second argument, which is the index in the array. So this works as well, just the same. However, it just so happens that the array is integers that would be the same as I all the time. So that's why this this variant works. But anyway, um, we can just tweak these numbers to make it so that different shapes show up at this point. So they seem to be a little too large. What if I say, you know, the size is 50,000 and by the way, I think this size is like the number of filled filled in pixels. I don't know. It's it just they're high numbers, but uh, I don't know. This is just what what it takes. So I'll bring down the size until we can see multiple shapes. There we go, starting to starting to come together. And I'm just guessing here at the um, this constant that will split them apart. can make it even smaller. All right. This is almost there. Look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Any questions at this point? So the um, example of the join in this case, that was um, a case of appending um, elements to multiple elements, um, which was uh, different from before. Um, is that right? Correct. Yeah, it's it's a slightly different pattern. And it's using the the long form of dot join so that we can access the enter selection. Yeah, so it passes in the enter selection and the enter selection is populated with uh, the, the case where there is no corresponding group element for a given data element which is the case for all of them when this runs. That's why enter.append g will append a group element for each and every entry in our array here, for each and every symbol. And then after appending that group element and setting the transform, we append to that group element a path. And then .attrd um, this whole thing works because of some, uh, the way D3 is set up, it actually uses the, the data element that was bound to the parent. So that's why this works. The data element D, which is one of those integers, is associated with the group element. And then if you append to it, if it came from the enter selection, you can you can reference those those data elements from the child so that that's why this this uh, works but i realize it is a lot at once 
in, in for today. Um, but that's sort of the intention to just like show, you know, the scope of this D3 data join thing. Um, and I, it will hopefully become more clear over time. Uh, but does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, that's really clear. Thank you. Nice, nice. And by the way, this this dot join method is is new to me. I mean, I've I I learned really well the old syntax with the dot enter and the dot merge. Um, so for what it's worth, I really only learned this this pattern recently, and I'm still sort of get, you know trying to wrap my head around it. So yeah, feel free to interrupt me as I go and, and ask questions like this. Uh, this is great. This is great. Oh my gosh, oh look at it. What time is it? Hang on. Oh, look at the time. I'm over time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, well, we've got pretty far for today. Uh, I just want to wrap this up by tweaking these numbers a little bit so that there's some space along the side. See how this circle is right up against the edge there? Um, I can just add some constant to this, like 100. Yeah, that looks decent. And then I'll bring this number down so that there's some space on the right. Yeah, like 125 or so. And I'll bring the size down just a bit to make sure that uh, we can see all the shapes. And in VizHub, you can set the height. So I'm going to make it maybe 200 pixels so that it more closely resembles the original piece. OK, there we have it. There we have it. Uh, that's all we're going to do for today. I will leave it um, as an exercise. to make the back <laughs> sorry scratch that to make the background rectangles match the original solo wit piece so here's your exercise and this is this is um, kind of a challenging one see how in this original piece each subsequent square uh, reorients the lines however in our example what we've done is um, they're all the same. So that's one thing you could do as an exercise. Alternatively, um, I, I would encourage you to use D3 to try to reproduce any other soloit piece. Because now that we have this, uh, this new tool in our toolbox of the D3 data join, uh, it'll become a lot easier to reproduce these solo wit pieces. Um, or create art, just generative art in the spirit of solo wit. And just as a reminder, here's some other solo wit pieces um, that you could do with the tools that we have now, the SVG mask and the paths. Um, this one, for example, could be done with nested for loops and math.random to pr produce the points. So yeah, that's all for today. Um, thanks everyone for joining, and I'll see you next week. Here's what I'm hoping to cover today. JavaScript arrays. Writing the dot range function of D3 using vanilla JavaScript. I think this is a good example to cement uh, understanding of arrays and functions. And then we're going to look at the ins and outs of D3 selections. That's what this diagram is over here. We'll get really deep into that. And then the D3 data join concepts and various ways of implementing them with the D3 APIs. All right, so from here, I'm going to dive into VizHub.
and I'll create something new. Just to, uh, to get some variety in how we include D3, I'm going to start with this Hello D3 version 6 D3 starter. I'm going to fork this and call it... Um, oh, actually, apologies. We're just going to do vanilla JavaScript first for arrays. I think I'll start with this HTML starter. Just totally vanilla HTML here. And I'll call it JavaScript Arrays. All right, I'll open the editor, clear out the readme, and then we've got this index.html to work inside. And again, I'll open up the developer tools so we have this console to work with. And it says here, hello JavaScript from this console.log hello JavaScript. All right, so we won't really need any HTML output, so I'm just going to sort of clobber all this stuff so we can focus on just the JavaScript and even I'll hide the output just so we have our code and the output in the console here. All right, JavaScript arrays. JavaScript arrays are like arrays in many languages. It's a list of things, essentially. And the syntax for JavaScript arrays is something like this, square brackets. Square brackets right here, it just defines an empty array. And you see here, it inherits from the prototype of array, which is a built-in data type in JavaScript. And if we want to put things in this array, we could say like one, for example. Now it's an array that contains one, um, or zero comma one. Now it's an array that contains two things, zero and one. And in the developer tools, if you click this little arrow, it tells you, all right, at index zero, the, the entry in the array is zero. And at index one, the entry in the, the array is one. And we could put other types of things in here, like A and B, for example. This really demonstrates the index concept. So the index of the array always starts at zero, and you can sort of use that to look up things at different uh, indices, different places, um, different numbers in the list. So let's assign this to a variable. Then we can do more things with it. Const array equals this, and then we can say console.log array. Same thing happens. Now, um, we can access things in this array by using the square bracket notation right after the array, and we have to pass it the index, like index 0, for example. So array at index 0 gives us A, and array at index 1 gives us B. Now, arrays have a bunch of methods on them, one of which is push. So we can say array.push C, for example, and now the array has A, B, and C on it. And I want to point out that um, unlike other languages where arrays need to all contain uh, the same type of thing, JavaScript is a little more flexible, so you could have a mix of types like A, B, 1, and C, or A, B, and an object, and C. Uh, it doesn't really matter. So it's just a list of things that could be any type. And at this point, I believe we have everything we need to write the range function of D3.
Um, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, there was an interesting, um, an interesting property called length. Um, uh, Indeed. Does, yeah, does that mean uh, an array is an object? Ooh, is an array an object? Well, it's a array is one of those types that is built into JavaScript. Um, is it an object? I guess it really depends on what you mean. What you can do is say type of array and it will actually tell you object and while we're here I think this is the first time we're seeing type of so I can just explain a little bit about type of um, it's useful to figure out what type of thing uh, something is in JavaScript so if you say type of zero it says number if you say type of the string a it says string if you say type of an empty object it says object and somewhat surprisingly, if you say type of array, it's, it also says object. So in the JavaScript language, it is actually an object, but it's a special kind of object that's an array. Yeah, there are, there are some mysteries there, to be sure, but uh, that's, that's my understanding of it. And yeah, because it is an object, it can have various properties and methods. See, if we just say console.log array and we expand it in the DevTools here, we say we see that the prototype, this underscore underscore proto, is actually array. And on that array prototype, it, it's essentially a class, you know, from the world of object-oriented programming. So what we've got is this instance of this array class. So it's, it is an object, but it inherits from this prototype, which is this built-in array um, class or interface. I don't know really what the correct term is, but this is where all of these methods are defined. So you've got array.concat, every filter, find, um, for each, join, map, push, reduce. I'm just calling out the ones that I actually use on a regular basis. Sort, um, slice. These are all extremely useful things. And hey, if we're talking about arrays, why not dig into some of these? But uh, yeah, does that answer your question, Adil? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's a lot more clearer. Nice. Thank you. Whoa. All right. So at this point, let's dig into building that um, range function from D3. So the idea with the range function is that if you give it a number, say 3, that's what the length of the array should be, and this function should return an array that has integers uh, 0, 1, and 2. So to simulate what it would be, we can enter 0, 1, and 2, and now we get out this array with 0, 1, and 2. So we can combine all the knowledge from the, the basics that we covered before with for loops and everything to define this function range we can say const range is a function that takes as input, I'm going to call it n, the number of things. And then in this function body, we can just define an empty array. And then at the end of this function, we can return this array. And in the middle, we're going to want to push some stuff onto this array, starting with zero. And then to sort of test this out, I'm going to say console.log range of, let's say five. Okay, this is functioning so far, but it's not actually giving us an array with five things. What we want to do 
is push, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, like this. This is the correct result, but then if we change the number, it's no longer going to be the correct result, because we're not even using n inside the function. What we can do now is use the for loop construct that we looked at earlier. We can say for uh, let i equals 0, i is less than n i plus plus. So just to remind you the structure here, this thing runs once, it defines this variable called i. This thing runs every time you go through the loop to check if it should proceed or not. And so as long as i is less than n, uh, we proceed, it executes the code in this body. And then this thing executes at the end of whatever's in the body of this for loop, and this increments i. It's equivalent to saying i equals i plus 1, or i plus equals 1. These are all the same thing as i plus plus. And I typed it in a comment just to avoid an infinite loop uh, if it were to run while I was typing it. So now that we've got this in place, we can say array.push inside of that loop. And now, see, we get an array with four zeros. And now if we just, if we want the correct values, all we need to do is pass in i to this array.push. And now we've got the correct implementation for range. So if we were to pass in 10, it would give us this array with, with 10 integers in it. This is what d3.range does internally. So yeah, I'm happy to get to this point. This is, I think, a good example to cement our understanding of arrays, for loops, and functions. Any questions about this so far? All right, and I'll, I'll just give a brief tour of a couple other frequently used array functions. I'm going to extract this return value to a variable, and then we can say my range dot, uh, well, we could say a lot of things. There's a lot of methods, but, you know, I'll just talk about the methods that I use most frequently. For each is a super nice one. It allows you to pass a function that takes as input something. I'll call it d, just by convention. This is a convention from the d3 community to refer to each element in an array as d, stands for datum. And then we can say console.log d. So now it's console.logging each of these things here. And by the way, this is equivalent to writing a for loop and then accessing my range at index i, like this. It does the same thing. Oh, i, I is less than uh, my range dot length. This is what it's equivalent to. So yeah, dot for each, it's like a functional shorthand for writing this uh, verbose for loop. And then we've got some other things like uh, filter, super useful. Filter takes as input a function that takes as input one of the elements of the array. And we could just say, is, is it equal to 3? And it will just pass 3. Or we could say, like, is it is it even? And we can check if it's even by saying d uh, percent 2 equals 0. So this will give us all the even numbers. This, by the way, is the modulo operator. It's like, uh, it's the remainder. Like, if you were to divide it by the number, it gives you the remainder. Sometimes useful.
let's just see what are what what are the other methods I think I might stop here for now but if there's anything that I'm a, I'm a big fan of sort yeah yeah sort sort is huge because then you can because then it, it comes back when you're doing Dom stuff because the order of things in SVG is really important for its rendering so I, I use sort a lot to sort of get around that for sure so let me here I'm going to add you as a collaborator and in fact let me add everybody here as a collaborator because I want this to be a live Sweet. sort of jam session kind of a thing we've got a deal here and we've got Sriram so I'm going to add all of you and oh let me drop this link to you I'll share it in the slack I suppose and the meet why not So yeah, feel free to jump into this as I'm going here. But yeah, sort. Sort is hugely useful. Let me give some examples of sort. I guess it's hard because your your data is already sort of pre-sorted. You, you yeah. made it in an order, so. It's already sorted, so we can build up an array that's not sorted, like four three five you know just sort of random numbers here and if we console.log that that's what we get but then if we just say dot sort on that it's sorted all of a sudden so a couple subtle things um, sort actually mutates the array and it also returns the array so that's why it works here it returns the sorted array so let me just demonstrate the fact that it mutates the array. So I'll call it sortable. <laughs> sortable is this thing. And if we say console.log sortable.sort, it does sort. But check this out. If we just say console.log sortable, it's unsorted. And if we say sortable.sort as an expression in between, it's sorted in the output. That means that it actually changes around the stuff in the array. It mutates the array. So it's not, it's not one of these immutable uh, things. It does not create a new array. It just sorts the things that are there. And um, I'm not sure how deep we want to get into it, but sort accepts a comparator function. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, how do you, what if I want to sort it in the other direction? Right. Well, well, if you want to do that, then the easiest thing would be to do reverse oh, on the sort. Fancy, fancy. So now it's sorted in the other way. I'm curious, what would happen if we add a new number like 20? Well, let's find out. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. Thank you. This is amazing. So I think what's happening here is if you just call dot sort, maybe it treats everything as a string. Is that right? Yeah. See? What is it? What is it? What is the default sort sort on? I guess is the real question. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Let's see. MDN JavaScript array sort. The MDN docs are always the best. Array.prototype.sort. It sorts things in place. The default sort order is ascending built upon, here it is, built upon converting the elements into strings and then comparing the sequences of UTF-16 code units values. Cool, makes sense, totally. <laughs> right? Very logical. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should actually dive into the comparator idea. Um, should be done here, compare function. That's what they call it here. Compare function. It specifies a function that defines the sort order. So we can use this if we wanted to sort it by the actual numbers 
or if we had an array of objects and we wanted to sort by a specific field of those objects, we could use this as well. So here's what it does. It accepts two things, the first element and the second element, and it returns mm, I'm surprised that it doesn't specify here specifically what this function should return. But I believe it should return negative 1, 0, or 1. Yeah, it's weird that it doesn't say. This has always been a fuzzy area. If, like, it's always been sort of like an incantation. But the yeah. what you just said of like, it's like if if your first element is less than your second element, return negative one or zero, depending on how you want it to sort. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So here it is. If you scroll down a little, it says, if A and B are two elements being compared, then compare function should return less than zero oh it says it says if compare function returns less than zero then it leaves a and b unchanged in the order if compare function so that's, that's our negative one yeah <laughs> what a weird way to say it but that, that's that the could negative be, one that could be negative one yeah yeah so if we return <laughs> negative one it leaves them unchanged, meaning A is less than B, I'm pretty sure. Got it. But yeah, if, I think you're right about that. If it returns 0, also leave A and B unchanged, uh, with respect to each other, but sorted with respect to all different elements. I don't know. This is kind of confusing. Yeah, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so, But if it returns greater than 0, also known as one. <laughs> yeah, also known as one or any other number greater than zero. But yeah, one is is the most common. Uh, then it then it sorts. Yeah, that's how I've I've always seen it. B before A. So let's give it a shot. That was really confusing, right? So I'll just leave a record of this, and I'll say it outputs this. Is the, is the documentation assuming that the elements are numbers, the, what's being compared? Um, well, we can do. I think we can do whatever we want in it and return a number. It is expecting us to return a number, but we could have like a random number generator doing negative one through one, and it would randomly sort. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah, A and B are the elements in, in the array, and they could be anything. What matters is that this compare function returns a number, and um, it's up to the implementer of the compare function how you derive that number. So let's try this again. Let's say sortable.sort, .sort, and then console.log sortable. I'll get rid of this reverse. And we pass in a comparator function that takes as input A and B, two things. And because these are numbers, I believe we could implement this pretty simply as like A minus B. And now they're sorted. Very good, because you're just telling it to not treat it as strings, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and this little expression follows all of those rules for sorting, meaning um, if B is greater than A, a negative number is returned, but if A is greater than B, then a, a positive number is returned. So if you did B minus A, it would reverse it? I believe so. Let's give it a shot. Yeah. Cool. That's right. And another way to phrase this would be um, like, is B less than A? If so, return 
minus one, otherwise return one. That works, but I think if there- Oh yeah, that makes a ton of sense. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, this works. Um, and this is often what you see of like, if, if these are data elements um, and you want to compare a field, you could say like b dot some field a dot some field. But I mean, it doesn't make sense now because we don't actually have that scenario. But later we will, I guarantee it. Yeah, I'm sorry for sending you down this sort rabbit hole you were about to move on. No, no, it's good. It's good. This is why I love these interruptions because because like I want to empty my head of the stuff that people are uh, uncertain about and, and want to know about. I just don't know what people need to hear at the moment, you know, when I'm going through this stuff. And so, totally. yeah, that, that's but why I, I, I don't I, think. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. I don't think I've ever read the docs for sort. Like I've just like seen like this pattern and then sort of like hacked it to, cause it is mildly intuitive a little bit, but yeah. it's cool to sort of actually see it laid out in detail the way that you have. For sure. For sure. Oh, thanks. And you know, I think um, if we really want to be like pedantic, pedantically correct about it, if if two numbers are the same, this function should return zero, I think, ideally. And so to do that, we can say, okay, is b less than a? Return negative one. Otherwise, is b greater than a? Return one. But otherwise, they're equal and return zero. So I think this is like the ultimately correct way, but it's like, who wants to come across this and, you know. Yeah, you're a madman. What is this? Yeah, what is this? <laughs> it's like some insane person like scribbling on a wall. <laughs> <laughs> so D3 to the rescue um, turns out there is a D3 utility to help you through this stuff. A and B, we can re return ascending of A and B. And ascending, we can import from D3. Um, and this is actually the same as just passing ascending into sort. And D3 also provides a thing called descending. So this is what you would typically use in practice. And these a ascending and descending things from D3 automatically, like, I think they implement this logic internally, but they hide it from you. They just make it, you know, very intuitive, easy to use. And that's the same as like, like you were about to go talk about D3 range, right? Like that's, these are all sort of very simple wrappers, so you don't have to get into this level. I've been spoiled, right? I only ever use the D3 wrappers. I never really write any of this stuff. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And some of the you know philosophy of this course, the way I'm progressing through things is to like to show uh, like how it's made, like how the sausage is made, sort of thing. You know, like this is how D3 works inside. It's not like so crazy mysterious. But it's a pain if you wanted to implement it yourself all the time. All right, I think um, I think that's it for arrays. Let me see. Um, we covered filter for each push. Oh, map! I gotta talk about map. Oh, oh yeah. Gosh, map is map is huge. Map is like the most, you know, one of the most useful things that I find myself using all the time, all the time. All right, we've got console.log sortable and we get this stuff. Um Oh, actually Let me let me use the other um, arrays just so all these sections are like decoupled. 
Okay, we've got my range here. Console.log my range gives us these numbers from 0 to 9. Check it out, we can use dot map. Map expects a function. It's a lot like for each. It goes through each of the elements of the array. And if we just write a function that returns each element, uh, it doesn't do anything. It essentially passes things through this function. Uh, it generates a new array with all the return values. So if we say like d times 2, for example, now we get all of the original, the original numbers but multiplied by 2. So this is this is super useful. I mean, you could you could do all sorts of things in here like return an object that says number is d. And then Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Yeah. Right? And then even like double is d times 2. So you can construct objects in this way using dot map. So yeah, dot map is it's just super useful, you know, especially when you have data loaded in from like a CSV file or something, you can uh, parse dates, for example, uh, clean up the number of fields that you have all using dot map. Well, for me, a lot of my work is finding an example of a visualization that's pretty close to what I want. And then I have a data set that's slightly different from that. So most of the way of like bridging that gap is just a dot map where I make my data look like the data that the example works on. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. And dot map can be the bridge from here to there. For sure. For sure. Let's see, what else? Reduce. Reduce, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Now, reduce, that's one of those ones that is like kind of tricky to wrap your head around, and you can get through life without using reduce ever. However, I find that one of the most useful things with reduce is to build up an object where the keys are derived from some array. So let me just uh, just try reduce. Console.log my range dot reduce. Reduce accepts two arguments. The first is a function that takes as input two things, and I can never remember the order. Let me just consult the documentation. Reduce looks something like this. You define what's called a reducer. It takes as input the accumulator and the current value. And here's one that just adds them together. You could use this, for example, to sum all the numbers in the array. Current value here is one of the elements from the array. Accumulator is the returned value from this function. as it goes through, um, but the first time this, this is invoked, accumulator gets the value that you pass in as the second argument to reduce. So let's put this into practice. We can say dot reduce accumulator. I do like that term. And I can use D, you know, why not? So if we say accumulator plus D, we get 45, which is the sum of all those numbers. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure what it, what it uses as the first value, because I didn't pass anything. But if you pass in 0 as the second argument to reduce, that's what accumulator gets for the first entry, right? Uh, this is this may be kind of confusing, so let me just um, open it up into a function, 
and say console.log accumulator just to see what this is. Um, looks like I have a syntax error. Actually, I didn't. Huh. So what this is doing here is it's logging the value of accumulator as, the, as it progresses through the array. So here's what it's doing. It's adding 0, which we passed in as the second argument to reduce. And it's also adding 0, the first element of, of the array. So the first time through, this returns 0 plus 0, which is 0. That's why it's outputting 0 twice. And then it's then it's returning 0 plus 1, 1 coming from the first element of the array. And then the next time around, accumulator is 3, because it added 1 plus 2, 2 being the next element of the array. So to be even more clear here, we can say adding accumulator uh, plus D. So now we can see that it's adding 0 plus 0, 0 plus 1, 1 plus 2. So 1 plus 2 is 3, and then so the output of adding 1 plus 2 is the new, the next version of the accumulator. Then it adds 3 plus 3, which is 6, and then it adds 4 to that which is 10, and then it adds 5, and so on until it gets to 45. So that's reduce in a nutshell. And while we're here, I do want to show the most common use case that I encounter for reduce. Uh, oh, but first of all, are there any questions yet here about reduce? Yes, if, if uh, you remove the second argument, which is 0, does the f does it default to something? Um, am I, could it just default to the first value of the element in this case? Th that exactly appears like what it is doing. Yes. Yep, yeah, it appears to be adding 0 plus 1 in the first time around. And it must be getting that from the array. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. And we can we can be totally sure, but just by saying like, you know, two and three. It it does see, yeah, the first time around, it takes the first two elements of the array, and adds those together. Meaning it it takes the first element of the array, the the, the thing at index zero, treats that as accumulator, and then takes the thing at index one, treats that as d. So that that is what happens if you leave out the second argument. And actually, I wasn't sure of that until I just did this just now. So I'm learning too. All right, I think the last thing we're going to do here with arrays is construct an object from an array. And let me show you what I mean. Oops. I'm going to make a thing called entries. And in this thing, there will be objects. And the key will be something like, um, I don't know, just A. All right. And value will be um, foo. It's just random stuff that doesn't make any sense. And then we have another one where the key is B and the value is bar, um, just to show the mechanics of all this stuff. So now, let's say what we want is an object that actually has the key of A and the value of foo, like this. 
and then the key of B and the value of bar like this. This is our desired result. So the challenge is, how do you write code that gets from this to this? I encounter this all the time. Um, and here's how you can do it. You can do it with reduce. Entries dot reduce. And the trick is that you start with an empty object. So you pass in an empty object as the second argument to dot reduce. And then this reducer function takes as input the accumulator, and I'll call it D, just by convention. And in the body of this reducer, we ultimately want to return the accumulator. I mean, so here's the approach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a property to this object and then return the object. So we return accumulator, but before we do that, we can say accumulator at d dot key equals d dot value, and then we got that object that we were trying to get. And, and by the way, I'm not sure I've introduced this syntax yet, but if you have an object um, let's say you have an object, you can say object dot a equals foo like this, but the there's an equivalent syntax where you could say object at a like this using these square brackets and that's equivalent. So now object has a is foo like that. But anyway, yeah, this is this is how you can use reduce to accomplish that task. Oh, I see there's a question in the YouTube chat. Here, let me pull it over here so you can see it. Question. I deal with two-dimensional arrays a lot. Um, is there a way to sort by columns? Question, 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 question. <laughs> sure, let's do it. Why not? I mean, so we've got this entries array. Let's say we wanted to sort by the key. And let's say they're out of order to begin with. I think the question is asking, how would you sort by a certain field of these objects? So if you wanted to do that, you could say entries.sort and pass in a comparator uh, or a compare function rather, that takes as input A and B. These are objects. These are the objects in the array. And it can return, you know, if A dot key is less than B dot key, and, and this will be comparing strings. So it would be essentially A is less than B, which you can do in JavaScript. That works. It sorts by alphanumeric values. So you could say if a is less than if a dot key is less than b dot key, then return minus one. Otherwise, return one, and that works. It sorts by key now a b c. And if we're using D three, we can say entries dot sort. ascending a dot key and b dot key like this and that would do the same thing if we had d3 uh, at our disposal so thanks for that question
So I think what I'll do is actually pull in D3 so that we can use this, and it'll work. Um, and then I'll take a short break, like a 5-10 minute break, and then come back and do something uh, creative with D3 selections. Uh, but are there any other questions at this point? All right. So I'm going to go about uh, pulling in D3. In VizHub, um, the most straightforward way of doing this is to use the package.json feature, which is relatively new. Specify dependencies, uh, D3 at version something. Let's see what's the latest. Latest version of D3 is 6.6.2. So we use that. And now, um, Now we can put some JavaScript in index.js. So I'll move this into index.js. And now we can say import ascending. from D3. And now it should run. There we go. So now uh, this code actually ran. And this is how you would sort things by a value with D3. All right, I think we'll dive in to D3 selections. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to fork this viz and say, D3 selection exploration. Fork it. And I'll, I'll add you all as collaborators again. I want this to be kind of a jam session. All right, I'm going to delete everything here. And then we can import select from D3. The select function lets you um, create D3 selections uh, using what's called a selector string, where you can select elements that are on the page already. So for example, we can say select body, and that is a D3 selection that contains the body element. So here's what I, th I think I'm going to do. I'll create an SVG, append it to the body, give it a width and height, and then we can create some array, maybe using the range function from D3, and then make a bunch of circles based on that array, and maybe make the circles move around in different ways. Selections have a method called append. So we could say dot append SVG like this, and it creates a new selection and returns it, and that is the selection of that one SVG element. At this point, if we were to inspect the DOM, we can see that there is, in fact, an SVG element there in the DOM. And I'm noticing there's an extra script tag. Yeah, there's an empty script tag. We'll just get rid of that.
we can see that in fact there is an SVG element appended to the body right here. So uh, to work with SVG, we need to give this SVG element width and height. So we can say dot attr to set the attribute of that DOM element of width to be width, which is a variable that I'll create, and I'll derive that from the actual width of the browser. So we can say window.innerWidth, and we're also going to want height as window.innerHeight. So what's happening here is it's created a selection of that SVG element, and then when we call .attr, oh, hey, hey, Felipe has joined us. Hello. Hello. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm so glad you could make it this time alive. <laughs> you, I see you've yeah. always been watching. First time I was able to. Amazing. I was not able to do the exercise from the last class, but I was able to join, at least. Amazing, amazing. So look, I'm going to add you here as a collaborator, so if you want to jump in, you totally can. Okay, thank you. Oh, what's uh, your... I think it's, uh, yeah, it's misspelled. Oh, there yeah. it is. Yeah. There it is. Nice. Here you are. And I will drop you this link in the Hangout chat so you can see it. So yeah, everybody here, feel free to jump into this thing once we get rolling. All right, so we give this SVG height of height here. And we can assign this to a variable because we're going to want to add stuff into this SVG. So const SVG equals the stuff. So now when we inspect the DOM, we see that it has width of 960 and height of 500. I also noticed that it's slightly offset from the corner and there are scroll bars. This is a very common thing that we can address with a little bit of CSS. So in the head, I'm going to say style, not style. And add some CSS that says for the body, make the margin zero. That gets rid of the margin. But still, for some strange reason, there are scroll bars. We say overflow is hidden to get rid of those pesky scroll bars. Now we're good to go. All right, so here's where I want to have some fun. We can we can make a bunch of circles. And this is our first sort of foray into D3 data joins. Um, and it looks something like this, svg.select all circle. This selects, it makes D3 selection that contains all circles that exist within that SVG. And at this time, there are none. But that's an important piece of information for the internals of D3 because uh, once we say dot data and we pass in data, and I'll just define data to be range of, let's say, 15. We're going to make 15 circles and we can import range from D3, like this. Now that we have called dot data, we have created what's known as a D3 data join. And on this data join, there are three parts, enter, update, and exit. And I have a slide about this.
with a D3 data join, there is an array, and I'm calling that data here. And then there are DOM elements, uh, which I'm just putting DOM, call, calling DOM here on this diagram. For example, it's all of those circles that don't exist yet. In the case that there is a data element, you know, in that array that does not correspond to any existing DOM element, that's what's known as the enter selection. We can tap into the enter selection to append new circles for all of the data elements for which there are no circles yet. So let's do that. To tap into the enter selection, we can say dot enter like this. That gives us the enter selection. And then on there, we can say dot append circle. And what this whole expression does is it creates a data join it accesses the enter selection of that data join and then on there it appends a circle. So if we inspect the DOM now, we can see that inside of this SVG there are many circles, 15 to be precise. But they don't have any attributes. So let's let's work on setting setting up the circles so that we can see them. We can call .attr on this selection that contains these newly appended circles, and whatever we put in here will be applied to all of the circles. So we can say .attr r is where I'm going to start, specify the radius to be maybe 100, and now we get some circles to show up. But they're all on top of each other. They're all at the same place. So to spread them out in the x direction, I'm going to say dot attr cx, which is the center x of the circle. And I could say like, I don't know, 400. It puts them all in the middle, but they're still all overlapping. To make it so that they're not overlapping, we can pass a function here as the second argument. That function takes as input what I'm going to call d, one of the entries of this array. And if we just return D, we can see that they're slightly spread out because it's setting the pixel coordinate of the center of the circle to be those integers, but they're only varying by one pixel, so they're not that spread out. If we wanted to make them vary more, we could multiply them. Let's say multiply by 100. Now they spread out across the screen because for each of these numbers, uh, it's multiplying it by 100, and we're getting this x-coordinate that goes all the way across the screen. We're just going to tweak these variables here, or not variables, tweak these values so that we can see some of these circles better. And I kind of want to see where it ends. See, there we now we can see there are 15 circles here. And I don't really like how it, it's touching the corner, so I'm just going to add some number, like 20, or how about 50? Okay, now they're nicely spread out in the x direction. We can do something similar for the y direction, so cy, like this. So now it's diagonal. If we just return, let's say, uh, 250, that puts them right in the middle. And uh, here's where I want to do something fun. I'm going to use the sine function from math. So we say math.sin. This is a built-in function in the browser. It, it, it's the sine function from trigonometry. So if we say sine of d, uh, it sort of varies a tiny bit just because the output of sine varies from negative 1 to 1. If we want to see that variance, we have to multiply it. Uh, so if I multiply it by, say, 
200, we can see that now they're all spread out. Which is, you know, not ideal. It's, it's, it's sort of the sine wave is going too fast. And to slow it down, we can multiply d by some value like 0.5. And now we actually see that it is, in fact, a sine wave here. And I'll just tweak these to, uh, you know, make it a little bit more. Uh, if, if I want to to access the value of CX in the CY, how can I do it? Access the value of CX in CY. Well, the way that I would do that is extract this into a function. Um, it's usually not advisable to actually read the properties out of the DOM that were already set, but what you could do is recompute it. And so, um, I could do something like this, say const x equals this function, and then we can say uh, x of d to get that value. To com but it would be recomputing it, essentially. So yeah, I was gonna say I I I'm tempted to um, ask you to turn like when you make data, like I would do all of the cool stuff you're doing in a map or like making a new object and then just reference yeah. those values when I'm rendering it, right? Love it, love it. And this this is a great, great segue into the discussion about how do you decouple the logic. Oh yeah, I saw that someone in the YouTube chat was asking about like how to separate your, your concerns of like processing data versus visualizing it and all that. Yeah, exactly. Separate the concerns of data from charting. Yeah, another question here from Lilac Foonish. Can you please talk about organizing the project top down, how to create modules for reusable? Yeah, I'm going to get to all that later. But what we can talk about now is this separation of concern between uh, data manipulation and charting, uh, which is you know essentially rendering or DOM manipulation. Right now, right now, you're sort of you're manipulating it in as you visualize it. You're exactly. changing it and then rendering those values. Whereas you might want to like do a, a making a visualization data middle step that sort of takes your source data and makes it into a format that's ready for visualization. And then on the visualization side, you just grab exactly what you need. Exactly, exactly. Right now, it's tightly coupled. This rendering logic is essentially too smart. There's there's all this data processing logic embedded in here with the rendering code. And this is exactly the pattern that makes it really tough to port things from D3 to other frameworks like React or Vue or Angular. Well, and, and also to get the value of CX, right? So if it's calculated on the visualization right. side, your other visualization parts can't access that, right? Like exactly. they would have to recompute it. But if you do it in the, in the viz processing step, then at any step of the way, you can process all those cool values and work with them. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. You wouldn't have to recompute it. You could just compute it once and then access it. So let's do that. The way we would do that is to use dot map right here. And so that can take as input D and it can return an object. And on that object, we can define properties X and Y. I think this is how I would like to do it. And X, I can just move this logic over here and say X is this, and it's going to work because D is the same. And then I can take this logic here for Y and move it over here. And so now we're constructing the data elements that we can just directly visualize. No need to have any complicated logic down here with the D3 selections. We can just simply access d.x and d.y like this. Now, Felipe, to, uh, uh, to answer your question, we could just access it like this, d.x, in the, in the function that computes cy, if we wanted to. For example, if we just use it, it would be a diagonal. Yeah, I love. I don't want to get too distracted. You could do also cool stuff like you could get the extent of your CX and CY, 
like if you wanted to make a light to dark scale for how where they were in the sine wave you know what i mean right yeah for sure for sure we could do something like um uh, yeah so here's here's a place where i want to get to i want to i want to get this thing to move and then we open it up for all sorts of creative directions and so love it here's what i'm thinking we, we can use this construct called request animation frame um well <laughs> let me sort of ease into this we want to animate it and one construct that's available to us in javascript is set interval and set interval takes as input a function and an interval in milliseconds so if i say 1000 that's one second so every one second it would um, re recompute this stuff and i think what i'll do is i'll just move this entire logic into here and so now it's going to append these circles every time but I want to introduce the notion of time so let's say let t equals zero t is going to be our time and every time we go through this we can say t equals t plus let's say one and then in our sine wave uh, calculation, we can say plus t, like this. So now, every second, it should work, but it's not. I think, you, do you, don't you have to like call set interval again, or wrap it all in a function or something like that? Well, I, I think what's happening here is that the enter selection is only triggering on the first run. Uh. Back to our back to our diagram here. The enter selection, which we're using to set all these properties, only triggers in the case where there are no corresponding DOM elements for your data elements. But what's happening is that is happening the first time that that function runs but one second later when that function runs again actually what we need to work with is the update selection and that's the case where for each data element there already is a dom element and all we want to do is change it we don't need to end we don't need to append new ones again so let's try that let's work with update Okay, here's what we can do. We can say const circles equals, and we can define it to be this data join here. Right? So it will select all circle dot data data. This is the D3 data join. And then we can say circles dot enter dot append circle. And this is only going to happen the first time through, right? So all we want, all we really want to do is create the circles. Um, and I suppose we could set the radius here as well because it's not going to change over time. And then uh, circles actually contains that update part of the data join. So we could say circles.attrcx and cy like this. But notice what happens. It actually works. So now it's it's animating, which is cool, which is where I wanted to get to. Let me just tweak it so that it animates in a smoother way. So now it's like every tenth of a second. And we can say um, t equals t plus 0 0.1 to make it move more slowly. So now you can see really what it's what it's doing here however this is super fun right right but there's like now, now that you have this there's so many ways that you could just add cool stuff to it 
Exactly. Yeah, there is. It's it's going to be so so intense. Uh, but before we get into that, what I want to what I want to highlight is that check it out. When this runs, uh, let me set this delay to like f five seconds. Then we can see the first time it runs. Boom! See all those little circles there? They're in the corner. The circles are just in the corner on the first run. And then on the second run, they get positioned. That's because the first time through this whole thing, the update selection is empty. There's nothing there. There are no circles to update. Enter only triggers. So here, the, the challenge here is that what we want to do is we want to set all the coordinates of all the circles the first time on the enter selection and also on subsequent times using the update selection. And so how do we do that? Let's get back into the code. One option here is that we could duplicate this logic. Right, we could set the values for CX and CY on the enter selection. So it just appears immediately correctly. And then the next time around, it increments just a little bit. However, this is duplicated logic. I mean, we want to avoid duplicated logic at all costs. Because, I mean, if you wanted to change it one place, you'd have to change it someplace else. Um, so as a best practice, we should aim to avoid this sort of duplicated logic and this is where merge comes in. See ideally we could just have this logic once applied to something that that will be the enter selection the first time and it will be the update selection on subsequent times and here's how we get to that thing let me uh, assign enter to be a variable. So now we have the enter selection defined here as circles enter and we have the update selection defined as circles. So what we want to do is merge those two together. So we can say circles dot merge circles enter like this and it creates a brand new selection that merges those two together. It's, it's like both of them. Meaning the first time around that selection resolves to the enter selection with all the brand new circles. But on subsequent times it um, Oh, I'm, I'm just confused at what's happening. Sorry, I, ha I hacked. I was playing around with some SVG transitions. I wasn't sure if it would take effect right away. It did. It did. And I'm like, why are those circles moving a tiny little bit? <laughs> Sorry <laughs> like, about that. So I'll, I'll comment that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, but, you know, this is this is where I wanted to get to just to explain this this pattern with dot .merge, uh, which is one of the most confusing aspects of D3. So if we use circles dot .merge, circles enter, the first time around, it's going to be the enter selection with all the brand new circles and we're going to apply CX and CY to those and on the second and subsequent runs it's going to resolve to the circles from the update selection and in recent times I believe it was D3 version 6 uh, there's a new shorthand that you can use to do this exact same thing which is dot join so let me just, I'll keep this as it is, comment it out just for reference. And with the new API, you can say right here, dot join circle. And that actually gives you the merged enter and update selection. And on there is where we can set all of the attributes. So this is sort of a simpler way to do it. And it, it accomplishes the same thing. 
I mean, it would it would actually be equivalent to defining R on the merged enter and update selection. Um, so it's assigning R unnecessarily, but you know, maybe that's fine. All right. So now we can start really messing around with this, uh, making the animation go faster and faster. Um, ideally, it would be 16 milliseconds which is uh, at 60 frames a second. So like 1000 divided by 60 should give us animation at 60 frames a second. And then we can slow down this stuff. So yeah, I mean, we just, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, any questions or discussions at this point? Oh, I see. I see there's a question. Um, what is the difference between merge and join? What is the difference between merge and join? So merge is a method on a selection where you can pass in another selection and it will merge them together. It's essentially a set union. You can think of it as a set union. That's what merge does. And the most common use case is to merge together the enter and the update selection uh, for rendering a bunch of things. That's what merge does. Join, on the other hand, is sort of a magical shorthand for this entire pattern. So it actually does a bunch of stuff internally. What join does internally is it creates the enter selection using this tag. Um, so it's what it actually does is it's equivalent to this up here. We pass in the tag name to dot join and internally it says okay on this data join we will create the enter selection and we will append tags of this type. It does that internally. It has this exact logic internally and it also returns the merged enter and update selection. So what we get as a return value out of join is essentially the result from merge, which it uses internally to merge together the enter and update selections. And so then, once we have that, um, we can set all these attributes on it. And I believe join also removes elements that are in the exit selection. So it's a shorthand for the entire pattern, which is known as the general update pattern. Yeah, and actually, I would love to to demonstrate that. So I think I'll I think I'll go for that. Um, we're defining range of fifteen every time, but what if that number were different? So I'm trying to get get us to a case where where there are things exiting the scene, where at a certain point there are fewer data elements than DOM elements. So I'm going to go back to this the long form using dot merge and then I'll define this number as n like the number of circles so if I set it to say 14 it's fixed but what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna set it to a value that changes over time so I'll say 10 oops. I'll say 10 plus math dot sign of um, time times five. So now it should vary between five and 15. And notice the effect that it has on the animation. Over time, it is sort of disconnecting from those circles. 
but it's leaving those circles there on the page. This is where the exit selection comes into play. The exit selection is the case where there are DOM elements sort of hanging out in the DOM from some past events that no longer have any data elements associated to them. And the most common thing to do with the exit selection is just to remove those things. So let's try that. To access the exit selection from the data join, we can say circles.exit dot remove to remove all of those circles. So now you can see that the circles are added and then as that number gets decreased the circles are actually removed from the DOM. And this is also done sort of automatically for you when you use this dot join method. So as it decreases, boom, see those circles are removed. So that's what dot join is all about. So I think I'll fork this just to sort of save the state of everything. But then I'll go back to this one where folks have been added as collaborators. And we can sort of get a little creative here and uh, make something cool. But uh, yeah, what do you all think so far? I mean, I hope this is, hope this is a clear explanation of D3 data joins. Yes, it's... Um... So this, uh, it sounds like D3 is automatically matching every data point with every circle in this case. It's, it knows which data point belongs to which circle. That's right. Vice versa. Yep, that's right. Um, I believe internally D3 may actually store the data values on the DOM elements, which are also JavaScript objects, which you can do, which is kind of a um, a tricky thing if you get into doing it yourself. But yeah, I believe what D3 does is when it enters, I mean, when it appends new elements as part of the enter selection, I believe it actually associates the data values on those DOM nodes for future use. I may be wrong. You'd have to study the D3 uh, source code. But yes, essentially it does associate the data elements to the DOM elements. And so it knows once you create the data join, you select all the circles that are there on the page, you tell it what data you want to use, it computes that Venn diagram internally uh, by sort of inspecting those two things, comparing them somehow. That's how it works. Yeah, sounds, that's fantastic. Uh, Karan, what is this particular programming pattern called where you just join methods together like this? Oh, this is called method chain. chaining. Yeah, yeah method, method chaining. chaining. It's a very uh, jQuery like thing, right? Uh, was jQuery the first kind of language or is this just a common programming pattern? You may be right that jQuery was the first one. I haven't used jQuery in so many years. I don't even know. I don't even remember what it looks like to use it. But yeah, it does have perhaps this the same method chaining idea where you can say dot, dot something and then that returns the same thing that you invoked it on. And so you could chain more and more methods. This still uh, this still uh, separates the two concerns, one for data processing and then uh, one for displaying it. This program, yes, I would say it does, um, because 
we're just using vanilla JavaScript to produce this data. And then in the rendering logic, it is just accessing those properties. It's not computing anything from those properties. I mean, yeah. if we if we wanted to go all out, we could we could associate the radius to these values as well. And we could say, you know, access D dot R and we could compute that as well. And now that we've done this, we can, you know, vary vary the radius as well, which could be cool. To that question, is some part of me wants to go like because you basically have two functions here, right? You have your like make data and you have your viz data. You could easily just make the set interval call those two functions, right? Yes. Yeah, you totally could. You could you could abstract this into a function, and you could abstract this into a function. Yeah, that would make for really clean, readable code. We could do it, shall we? Yeah. Do you wanna? Do you wanna? I'll I'll do make data and you do viz data. Sounds good. Then you just need the number. It's like you just use n, I guess. I suppose t is what you would need. Or no, Viz, yeah, right? I like that. Oh. Yeah, n. Or n and t. T is is used inside of there. Yeah, so you would need it. Yeah, exactly. All right. that work? Did I break everything? Let's take a look. I need the return, probably, huh? Oh, yes. The return is critical. <laughs> That's it. Pretty important. Nice. It works. Fun. Sweet. Yeah. Now, now this is a nice, compact little thing that says we compute n. We call make data with n and t. Pass that into viz data. Yeah. And we could even conceivably make it even smaller. But I kind of like explicitly saying, all right, this is our data. We're going to pass it in. Yeah, totally, totally. This is a great way to decouple these two concerns. And these could even be refactored into modules. I mean, that's something that we could do as well. But I don't know if it's worth it. Actually, why not? I, I don't think we've discussed modules yet at all. Right? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that. That would be really cool. Yeah, let's do it. So I'm going to make a new file. EJ, you want to do it at the same time again? You want to do make data and I'll do viz data? <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. So I'll make a new file called vizdata.js. And then I'm just going to grab that stuff inside that function and paste it into that file. And in order to expose it to the outside world, we need to say export, like this. Now we get what's called a named export from this module. And then in index.js, we could say import viz data from dot slash viz data. That tells it to look for a file uh, locally. So this is ES6 modules. Super, super useful way to break down code into multiple files and scale a code base. Super, du super duper uh, useful. So while and you're, you're all set with make data, yeah. Yeah, while I'm here, I'll, I'll import that too. Make data from dot slash make data. And let's see, does it work? Oh, range is not defined in make data. Nice. So we just need to move that import over. I'll do it. We need to import range in that module. Got it. 
And then I don't believe we need range in index.js. SVG is not defined, it says. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is my bad. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't pass it into viz data. So viz data should take as input the selection, SVG, and the data. So the S, uh, SVG can be the first argument. And now it's working. All right. Excellent. So while we're here, uh, I just want to say, once you abstract things into a function like this, it's sort of a best practice to rename this to be like selection, or at least this is my personal preference. And I'm realizing we're not using the circles variable, so we can just get rid of it. And this still works as well. The idea is that if you wanted to, you know, call this on a group element, it would, and the variable name would still make sense. And last but not least, I do love to use selection.call when I can. So we can say svg.call data and data like this. This is the D3 invocation pattern on selections. Uh, it just takes whatever arguments you pass. and uh, you know passes them as arguments to this function. These two lines are equivalent. All right. So the, uh, the SVG object is the first argument being sent uh, to the first of the argument to call. Correct. I is that how it works? Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's how it works. Yeah. When, you, when, you, when you use selection.call, it takes as input the first argument, which is a function, and that function should expect the selection that it's called on as the as its first argument, and then whatever other arguments you pass get sort of uh, spread out as the arguments to that other function. Right. Yeah. I mean, in this in this case, it really doesn't matter which which way we we do it, but I just kind of like to use dot call when we can. Is is dot call a D three thing or oh, is yeah. it something that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's a specific method on D three selections only. It's for, it's a D three thing. Yep. It's useful for chaining because then you could call, you know, multiple things if you wanted to, but we don't have that scenario here. All right, I think I should wrap it up at this point. Um, Oh, where'd my slides go? Okay, I'd like to leave you all with uh, an exercise. All of you who are viewing, following along this, this whole series, fork and modify what we created today and just make something super duper cool. You know, change the sine wave and like maybe, maybe set the fill color based on sign of time or, or something like that. Um, and just see see what you can come up with. As an alternative exercise, uh, more specific and targeted, see if you can add lines between these circles. And to do that, you could use line elements, or, or you could use a path element, or you could use a polygon element, any of these things. And please, once you do this, submit it in the VizHub forum on this episode 5 topic here. Welcome, everyone, to episode six of Get It Right in Black and White, where we'll discuss JavaScript, modules, and build tools. I often get asked the question, how do you work outside VizHub? Every time I've taught this course, you know, people are happy generally using VizHub to learn how to code. Uh, it's great because you can start coding right away, but um, when folks start to export the stuff out of VizHub, they're confronted with this new universe of stuff like npm, package.json, rollup, uh, building a bundle.js, and then including it in the page, and then having to serve the files locally with an HTTP server, 
So all of this stuff is what I want to get into today. Today's episode is dedicated to answering this question thoroughly. What we'll cover today, I will start with reviewing last week's uh, exercise submissions, as usual. And then we'll get into this uh, content. Starting from scratch, really, how, you know, how to include JavaScript in HTML. Various ways to do this. Um, we'll talk about ES6 modules. We'll talk about rollup, how to use rollup, how to configure rollup. I think I'll use a, a rollup starter project. Webpack as well. And perhaps some other things around Webpack, like <coughs> Create React app. If you all could mute yourselves, it'd be great. Thanks. Webpack and things around Webpack. Um, and also using GitHub, because if you're not using VizHub, uh, you need to you know store the code somewhere, store the revisions. And so I think I'll walk through also using GitHub, creating a GitHub repository, putting the code into the GitHub repository, and maybe even hosting it with GitHub pages uh, if we have time. So that's what we'll cover today. That's the plan. Let me pull up next week's, uh, last week's exercises here. All right, here's last week's uh, forum post. Let's see what we've got. This is so cool, double harmonic. Look at this. It is a double pendulum inspired by Sisyphus table. Not sure what that is, but sounds cool. beautiful stuff, very mesmerizing, and it creates something most worthy of being printed out on a canvas or something. No, there is a latest version of it on the homepage of VZAP. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's cool. Oh, wow. He's got a lot of stuff going on here. Oh, my gosh. Look at this. Black and white version. Sweet. And yeah, it, it looks like spears in there. This one? Oh, look at that. That's pretty wild. Wow, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, W Gloss. Nice work, W Gloss. Um, let's see, what else have we got? Oh, there was a question, actually, like, oh, I just cannot get this running locally, <laughs> which is like, okay, yes, now it's time. I have to talk about how to do that. So we'll address all of this stuff today, for sure. Oh, some new stuff I haven't even seen yet. Look at this one from Nita. Whoa. Very cool. Some nice transitions. Very nice. You want to talk about this at all? Yeah, I will. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's using transitions. I just use uh, transitions to create the basic animation. The one you created uh, felt a little difficult. Um, Very nice. So yeah, if you if if you run this, it has a transition when you load it, and that's created by. So this the C X and C Y are initialized, I guess, at zero, which is inferred, and then you use transition and duration, and change C X and C Y. Very nice. Very nice. I think in a future episode, I'm going to get way deep into transitions. And here's one from Adil. Look at this. Oh, 
nice. You got the lines to work. Fantastic. Beautiful. Wow, very nice, very nice. Adil, um, would you mind like walking through how you did this here? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's yeah, so it's basically using, um, trying to make use of the path element to connect all the circles up. Very and, nice. Uh, and um, so that, yeah, D3 has this um, uh, a line generator, which will uh, convert all the data points into the string that gets passed to the D attribute, which is uh, which is part of the path element. Um, so uh, yeah, this was really just an experiment to see if I could get it to work nice. uh, with. Uh, and uh, so I, I would be very keen to find out whether there's a better way of doing this, but like, for, for example, combining uh, everything in one method chain. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my first pass was just to try and think about it separately and then uh, use the uh, the join method um, to uh, yep. handle yep. all the, uh, uh, yeah, syncing up all the DOM elements with all the data. Um, and uh, yeah, but that line generator is, is really awesome because it just generates that complicated D string right um you know what's happening here is it's creating a path for each and every element of the array and so for however many circles there are there are an equal number of paths that are all on top of each other ah uh, yes so if you inspect the dom you'll actually you'll actually see a many many paths and that's why the line appears somewhat uh, harsh, like thick. If the anti-aliasing around it is not quite right, that's because there's maybe t you know ten or five lines on top of each other. Let me just quickly fork this and and you know give you my take on on how to do this. So instead of using um, data here we can just use an element with a single sorry we can we can just use an array with a single element and see now that line is not so thick as it was uh -huh. because yes. now there's only one of them and it doesn't matter what this thing is you could have it be null or whatever because you know none of these functions access it because d is always a line generator of data it's not a it's not a function of the this element in this array so this is um actually something i was hoping to get to in the last episode which is namely the special case the special case of a single element and this is a perfect example of it you know where there's just a path you only want to have one of these path elements but it's driven by data that could have many elements but it's actually just one path um, if you wanted to ha do it a different way, where you had uh, maybe line elements, multiple line elements, then you would, you know, use an array as data with many elements. But since it's just one path, this this uh, approach works perfectly well. And I would say this is sort of, you know, the optimal way to do it, to use a path and have that path use these multiple lines. So... Yeah, great work, Adil. That's that's really really good to know. Yeah, I, that that's uh, that's uh, it makes a lot more sense now just to have the one element in the uh, being passed to the data method. That, that makes sense. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, that's it for the exercise submissions. All right, that's it for a review of last week's exercises. Let's get into ways to include JavaScript in HTML.
For this, I will start uh, in VizHub. I'll create a viz from the Hello HTML starter. I'll fork this one and call it JS in HTML. Okay, so this example, I'll just clear out the README. This example already has some JavaScript. And this is the most straightforward, you know, maybe simplest way to include JavaScript in an HTML page. You use a script tag, and then inside of that script tag, you can put arbitrary JavaScript. But as you see, when we write a lot of code, it ends up uh, getting very large, and there may be more stuff in index.html, and then pretty soon you're at like 100 lines, 200 lines, 500 lines. Um, in my various work, I've seen, I've seen you know, HTML files that are a thousand lines or two thousand lines of code, which is just um, it's unwieldy. So there becomes a need to split the files up. So here's one way to split the files up. You can take the JavaScript, create a new file. Let's I don't know. I'll call it uh, script. Js just as a a silly example name. And then we can remove the stuff in that script tag there. But notice that it's not running now. This script is not doing anything because it's not included into the HTML of the page. To include it, into the page, we can use the src attribute of the script tag. So we can say src equals script.js, and now it runs. It loads. And all this stuff works without any build tools. Um, the issue with this approach, uh, which, by the way, used to be the approach years ago, uh, in sort of the early years of JavaScript, for a very long time, the status quo was, you know, this is how you include a library on your page, and this is how you include your script files on the page. But what would happen is that over time, you would end up with many script files on the page, you know, script one, script two, like this, and then you would need to manually keep track of which script depends on which other script. So, you know, for example, if in script one, you want, you want to refer to a global variable introduced by script three, then you would need to rearrange these such that they're in the right order. So everything has its dependencies. And the algorithm to do such ordering is called topological sorting. Um, so I, I think in like Rails, Ruby on Rails, you can specify which script depends on which other script. And then there's some utility that calculates the correct ordering and automatically generates the script tags. But that all is sort of um, in the past. Because in modern times, there's this thing called ES6 modules. Anita says that's so deep. <laughs> yeah, feel free to speak with sound, it's fine. Yeah. This is, you know, how one option uh, of a way to work. But let me, sh let me show you how it looks with ES6 modules. In VizHub, you can use a special name called index 
Vizhub.js. This is a special name of a file that Vizhub specifically looks for. And so if you, if you define an index.js, see Vizhub automatically created this file that you, you're not allowed to edit called bundle.js. This is a bundle created by rollup internally within Vizhub. So inside of the Vizhub software, it actually loads in rollup, which is an amazing tool for, for generating uh, bundles. Um, and what a bundle is, is it's a, it's a file that combines many modules together. Here's what ES6 modules look like. You can say import something from, I'll say dot slash um, something dot yeah. js. And we can create this file called something.js. And in here, we can export something equals, I'll just define it as a string, a thing. So you can use export before the, the keyword const to export a named uh, well, it's it's called a named export. Whatever variable you have locally, you can export it with a name. And then if you have named exports, you can import them with this syntax. Let's use that by saying, instead of hello JavaScript, hello plus something. Whatever something is, it should appear. And now it says hello a thing. All right, so that's generally how you author ES6 modules. Let's take a look at bundle.js to see what it's done here. Rollup has actually combined index.js and something.js together into a single file. Here's the content of something, and here's the content of index.js. So bundle.js makes basically index.js with everything included? Bundle.js is automatically generated from index.js. Everything that index.js imports is included in bundle.js. And also, the things that are imported by the things that are imported by index.js are also included in bundle.js. So something.js could also, you know, import um, thing from dot slash thing dot js. Just making stuff up here. And then that, that could say a uh, plus thing. And then we can make another file thing.js equals uh, thing. Planet Earth. Sure. Planet Earth. So that allows us to author this module that defines this named export called thing, which we, we can import in something.js and use. And something.js in turn exports the named export called something, which is imported in index.js, which is used there. And then the cum cumulative output is hello, a uh, planet Earth. And if we look at bundle.js, all of those various modules are included inside of bundle.js. So bundle.js is totally separate file. It is, yes. Yep. And, and, and uh, yeah. And we, if we name, we have to name index.js as index.js. Exactly. Other name would work. Correct. 
Correct, because um, the VizHub rollup configuration that it uses internally looks for a file called index.js. Yeah. So what role do the Curdy braces play, the ones that wrap uh, something in this case? Oh, that's a great question. This is the distinction between named exports and default exports. With named exports, you could you could import multiple named exports from an ES6 module. Uh, and here's an example. I, I, uh, let me just see this through. We can use both of these. And then in something.js, we can say export const something else. Um, other. When you use this form of exporting, export const, um, you could also use export function. This is valid syntax. Um, you could also use let, export let, something. These are the various ways you can use named exports. And with named exports, the key thing is that you can export multiple things that have names. So now we can see that the output is hello, uh, planet Earth, other. That's named exports. If you don't use the curly braces like this, uh, right now we get an error that says default is not exported. If you don't use the curly braces, it uses what's called the default export. This is um, this is the case where you want a module to export only one thing. So if we modify some uh, this, if we modify something.js, we can use the default export like this, I believe, export default something. This will expose the variable in this file which is called something, as the default export. And by the way, you can have a default export as well as named exports. So let me just show you what that would look like. Like this. So if we don't export something, we export something else, and then we export default something check this out. In index.js, we can import something, which is the default export, and something else as a named export. And we can use that here, like this, and it still works. And uh, you'll often see this uh, with React, if you end up using React React, uppercase React, is the default export of React, but then there's a lot of named exports from React, like use effect, stuff like that. That's an example where you would see this sort of stuff in the wild. Does yes. E3 have something like that? What default models and. Sorry, what was that? D3, does D3 have? D3. Something? Well, I believe it does not. I believe it only uses named exports, which is a really good segue. Let's check it out. So in VizHub, you can include a script tag. So here's, here's, um, here's the D3 library hosted on unpackage, which is a content delivery network 
that hosts npm packages. All right, and npm is this uh, giant database of packages with all of their different versions. Um, it's a package manager for JavaScript, and it's sort of the de facto package manager. So all this is to say, let's let's load in D3 onto our page using unpackage by going to unpackage.com slash d3 and if we just go to unpackage.com slash d3 and hit enter it automatically resolves to the latest version of d3 which at the time happens to be 6.6.2 and this is the minified build of d3 which contains all of the different modules that are part of d3 so I'm going to copy this URL and then over in index.js, I'm going to insert a script tag. And set the source equal to that URL. And this is how CDNs, content delivery networks, or content distribution networks, um, are intended to be used. At this point, in our JavaScript, we can say console.log d3, and it should work. See? That script tag defines d3 as a global variable. This is called a browser global. And this is one way, it's like the, sort of the old school way of using libraries. Insert a script tag that pulls it from a CDN, or you could pull down D3 to your files and load it from your files, either way, and then access the global variable that it defines. This is one way of doing things. Uh, this is not using ESX modules at all. Not at all. This is this is an older way before there were ES6 modules. That's called browser globals. So you could say d3.select. That resolves to a function. D3. Dot, you know, scale linear. All this stuff. Uh, so um, a D3 is object, and each module is property. Correct. And yes. Values as functions. Yep. That's yeah. correct. That's correct. Yeah, using the D3 browser global, you could say that yes, D, when you include this script tag here that defines D3, that introduces a single global variable into the you know global namespace of JavaScript. That's called D3. So that's a variable called D3. And the value of that variable is an object. And on that object, you can see all the methods of D3 listed out here. And this is great because when this program runs, it just pulls in JavaScript from that CDN. And it doesn't cost us anything, meaning I don't have to host D3 inside of VizHub or anything like that. It's just when you load the page, it pulls that from that unpackaged server, which I have no control over. It's you know totally not my thing. Um, this is why this is sort of the preferred way of using libraries in VizHub in particular. And I want to say the VizHub rollup configuration has a mapping for D3 as a package. So that's what lets us do import select from D3, like this. And then we can say console.log D3. Whoops. There is no D3 dot anymore. It's just select because we've imported select, a named export, from D3. And it resolves to the right thing. 
this is slightly mysterious, right? It's There's a little bit of black magic going on here with the roll-up configuration. Roll-up has this, this feature where you can tell it to resolve package names to browser globals. So somewhere in the configuration, internally in VizHub that you don't see right now, there's a mapping that says, okay, if you try to import from D3 without the dot slash, so it's not looking for a local file, it's looking for a package called D3. If you do that, then look for the browser global called D3 and resolve all the named exports to properties on that browser global. This is a really nice configuration of rollup that allows us to use this really nice ES6 import syntax for packages and at the same time pull in the script tag from a CDN. Now let's take a look at bundle.js for this case. Oops. Bundle.js is wrapped up into this this one expression, right? So it doesn't create any global variables. It's very self-contained. It defines a function, and inside of that function is all of our code from all of our modules that we've authored. And that function is immediately invoked with D3, which is not defined anywhere in this file because there's an assumption that it will be defined as a browser global. And that's why all this works. Uh, let me show you um, actually <laughs> there's a little bit of magic as well where VizHub is injecting a script tag at the end of the body that includes bundle.js. Script src equals bundle.js and if we have it there then it is not automatically injected. So I want to I want to show you that if we include d3 after bundle.js it doesn't work. I wanted to do this to cement this idea that bundle.js when it runs it assumes that there's a browser global called d3 and inside of any html when you have a script tag that script tag is fully loaded, parsed, and executed before the next script tag in the list. So what's happening here is um, bundle.js is looking for D3. It's not there, and we get an error. But if we reorder this to include the the script before bundle.js, then it all works. So it is a uh, hierarchical. I mean, in a sense that bundle.js depends on D3. Yes, but the data structure is not actually a tree. It's not a hierarchy. It's actually a graph. It's actually a directed acyclic graph, if you want to get into the weeds. Yeah, but, so rollup knows which one comes first, right? Right. Yeah, internally, rollup, I mean, if you have this dependency graph of modules, rollup knows internally that the stuff in thing must come before the stuff in something, because something imports from thing, and also it knows that the stuff in something must come before the stuff in index.js inside bundle.js. So that's why it has done this correct ordering using the topological sort algorithm internally. Nice. So in virtual world also, the things are hierarchical. Uh, sure. I see there was a question here from Sriram. Is 
roll up comparable to npm or yarn what's the, what's the difference between a package manager and a module bundler yeah i mean they're at different levels of this hierarchy in a sense npm is it's a company actually that makes money and it's a, a bunch of servers that exist out there in some cloud somewhere that's what NP npm is and it's a set of scripts and tools that allow people to publish modules into npm and also to get modules out of npm and so what we're using here is npm as well as unpackage which is another another product in inside of the ecosystem of npm uh, to pull this script down and npm confusingly is also a command line tool where you can say npm install npm run npm this npm that uh, and there's an alternative command line tool to the npm command line tool that's called yarn and yarn is arguably more efficient faster better but it also pulls the packages out of the npm uh, package manager database system cloud thing so in a sense you know npm and yarn are not that different they're pretty much equivalent tools and rollup is a module bundler and rollup has peers in this ecosystem like webpack and parcel uh, snowpack recently uh, but rollup is pretty nice yeah so the difference between a package manager and a module bundler is a package manager is a repository of packages but a module bundler is just a tool it's actually a package within npm <laughs> rollup is also a package inside of npm um, and then when you run rollup on your stuff locally it pulls the packages that are that are installed locally using npm and generates a bundle so it's all kind of <laughs> kind of this big hairball <laughs> of stuff which is why it's confusing Uh, Shriram says NPM and Unpackage are sort of like CDNs for code. In a way, in a way, I mean, the CDN is is essentially a wrapper around NPM, this Unpackage CDN. And Unpackage itself is more akin to a a library, like a physical library where you go to get books like when you publish an npm package it's like you're putting a new book in the library and when you're pulling it out it's like you're 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 asking them to mail you a copy of the book <laughs> i don't know maybe it's not the right metaphor but yeah i hope that clarifies things uh current uh going back to the the default exports and the named exports yeah is there um uh are there are they used in different situations? Uh, is, is there a, 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 a general uh, advantage to using named exports over default and vice versa? It, um, is, is there something, is there some general guideline or, around that that uh, one could keep in mind? If you Google named exports versus default exports, there are a lot of people that have very strong opinions about this stuff and like here why i've stopped exporting defaults from my javascript and this is actually the philosophy that i adhere to um, there's a lot of issues with default exports um, often i've seen in the in the module that has a default export internal to that module that export is named something uh, or not not exactly <laughs> something but it's it has a particular name and then in the mo in the module that imports it it's imported with a different name which is super confusing 
that's the that's the one big drawback I see of of using default exports. They don't dictate what name you use. So you could actually say import uh, it, which is the default, and then we could use it like this, and it still works. So um, yeah, actually this cropped up in the VizHub code base where the names don't match. And then when you're navigating the code base, it makes it super confusing because you have to remember, okay, it's called this inside the module and it's called this outside the module. Um, and it's just it just makes things super confusing. So I personally tend to always only use named exports and imports in the code that I author. Uh, but there's pros and cons, for sure. I mean, React has chosen to use the default export of React, uh, which makes sense for that case, I think. Um, so there are cases where, you know, using a default export makes sense in a way. Uh, but yeah, that's my personal take on it. And so all, all the code that I author today in my, you know, f work with clients and everything, I strictly just use named exports. And that's it. No default exports. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. I think I'll, I'll follow that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I see there's a bunch of chatter in the YouTube chat. So let me get caught up on that. Metal guitar covers. Oh, I think I addressed this. Uh, is bundle.js used there in index.js? Yes. Um, it's there now because I added it. If it's not there, VizHub does some magic and it inserts that exact thing. So that's that's what's happening there. And then, yeah, you can give the default export of a module any name. When you're importing it, that's true. That's true. That's why it's confusing. How is index.js included since I don't see it in index.html? Oh, yeah, it's the confusing black magic part where VizHub injects. Uh, exactly this thing automatically if it's not there. You know, the intention is to make it easier to use, but it, it's sort of cryptic and strange um, if you don't know that's happening. Try out Vite sometime as a bundler. Yeah, Vite. I heard about this like last week for the first time. I feel like an old man. I can't keep up with this stuff. <laughs> So Vite is another one. Um, yeah, it looks cool. It looks cool. See, the thing with all of this stuff is the intention of Vite, uh, Webpack, Rollup, Snowpack, Parcel, the intention of all that stuff is to make it easy and straightforward to author your code so that you don't need to think about or deal with all the complexities of generating a bundle, including the bundle into your HTML, and all that stuff. We've discussed how to use stuff in VizHub and ES6 modules. Now, I want to talk about how to set a project up locally. So, let's start by exporting out of VizHub. There's this export feature. What it gives you is a zip file that has a bunch of files. So I'll open up a terminal. I'm on Linux here. I'll go to my my place uh, where I put code called repos, short for repositories. Uh, I'll just make a directory called example. which is empty. Um, and as you do this stuff, you, you know, your setup, your mileage may vary. I mean, I'm very comfortable with the command line and everything, but you may want to use GUI. You may be in Windows. You may be in Mac. So um, the place where we're going is fraught with peril because everybody has a different setup, a different system, different IDE text editor that you use. Um, VS Code is most popular, I think, nowadays, but I like to use Vim. Doesn't matter. 
once we have this zip file, we can hit Extract. And I'm going to extract it to repos example. I'll hit extract, show the files. In here we have index.html, index.js, bundle.js, which was generated by VizHub. We've got the readme markdown file, and these are all just uh, text files. We have something.js and thing.js and we have a few more things that are not visible at all in VizHub. We have a package.json and a rollup.config.js. Let's dig into these. I'm going to use Vim. You can use whatever IDE you prefer, like VS Code, uh, to look at the files. Package.json it's a file that defines your dependencies. And there, it's, a whole, it's a whole thing that has a lot of very well-defined aspects to it. The NPM documentation for package.json is the canonical documentation for everything that you can put in package.json. This whole concept of package.json has come out of NPM, essentially. It's a way for NPM to track dependencies. Um, and if you define a package that you want to publish to NPM, you need a package.json to specify the name, the version, uh, description, keywords, home page, all this stuff. But if, <clears throat> and the license you can specify in here, which open source license, all sorts of things. But if you're not publishing a package per se, the main thing that we use it for is for dependencies. It just maps package name to a version range. And this is using Semver, semantic versioning. And this is what you'd want to research if you get interested in, you know, how exactly these versions are specified, what the caret means, all this stuff. Here we have a very simple, small package.json that says, OK, we have dev dependencies, meaning they're not dependencies of this package if it were to be published, but it's dependencies that you need if you're running a development environment locally. So what this means is that if you run npm install, in this directory that has this particular package.json, it will use that package.json to figure out what it needs to install. And then after it installs that stuff, it appears in this directory called node underscore modules. Node underscore modules, let's see what it contains. It has all this stuff. These are our direct dependencies, including rollup, and another package called at rollup slash plugin dash buble. And we can see those here. It's got rollup and it has at rollup and I think the slash, uh, there's stuff inside of there that we're using. But what are all these other packages, right? These are the transitive dependencies of our dependencies. A transitive dependency is a, essentially a dependency of a dependency. If we look at rollup, for example, and we're still inside node modules, if we look at the package.json file of the rollup package, it contains a bunch of dependencies, dev dependencies in particular. So all this stuff is pulled in, and each of these dependencies has other dependencies. 
So all the dependencies of dependencies of dependencies of dependencies are pulled in. And what we end up in node modules with is this list of all the transitive dependencies. So this is how you set up a project locally. Essentially, you, you run npm install. That uses package.json to install these dependencies. Now, the dependency that we're really using is a rollup. And we're also using Buble to support JSX, um, which we don't actually need here. We don't actually need it here. But if we want to author React code with JSX, we would need Buble. So I'm actually just going to delete this. I'm going to start iterating this configuration locally, which I would well, I would suggest you do, um, because the VizHub export is just sort of a generic, simple export that makes it so you can generate bundle.js by yourself outside of VizHub. Here's bundle.js. What I'm going to do is delete this file. So if I use rm, there is no longer any file called bundle.js. And then, um, if we look again at package.json, it has a scripts field. And in that scripts field, there's a, a key called build. And the way that the scripts field works with package.json is that you can say npm run followed by the name of a script, in which, in this case, the name is called build. And there are sort of conventional names, like npm run build generates the bundle across all various um, tools. There's also npm run start, which is equivalent to npm start which is set up for a lot of, with a lot of these templates, but it's not set up here. There's no script here called start, because this is just a very minimal, simple configuration that's aimed toward the minimal possible thing that you need to generate bundle.js. If we run npm run build, it invokes rollup, because that's what the script is defined to do, rollup-c, and then it creates bundle.js from index.js. So this is how you can create bundle.js locally in your own machine outside of VizHub. The dash C of rollup means use the rollup configuration file found in rollup.config.js. Let's take a look at that. This is where that mapping exists between the external packages and all of this stuff is sort of pre-programmed into VizHub. We don't actually need any of it except uh, D3. So I'm going to delete all that junk we don't need. And here's the mapping from the browser globals to the package names. Or rather, <laughs> the other way around, from package name to browser global. Again, we just need D3 because that's the only one we're using. I mean, I would like to, imp there's a lot of things to improve with VizHub. Like, ideally, it shouldn't include any of the stuff that you don't need, but this is the state of things at the moment. It also uses this Buble plugin to transpile JSX, but we don't actually need that, so I'm going to delete that. And yeah, here's an interesting use of default exports. You could just say export default and boom, put a put an object literal right there. It doesn't even have a name. <laughs> so this is this is an ES6 module that defines the rollup config. So now if we if we run that build script again, it still works. It generates bundle.js. And there it is, bundle.js. How would you run this locally uh, if you wanted to actually develop? Well, you need to use an HTTP server to serve the file locally. Um, you could maybe get away with not doing that uh, by just double clicking on index.html. Yeah, in this case it works. But 
as soon as you introduce any code that uses XML HTTP request or fetch to fetch data, that fetching of data uses the HTTP protocol, so you need to be hosting it with a with an HTTP, HTTP server locally. Let me just quickly show you how I would do that. My go-to tool for that is um, HTTP-server, which is an npm package. So you can say npm install dash g to make it a global command that's available to you. HTTP dash server and then you can run HTTP dash server just like that as a command and boom it's created this server that's now running so you can go to this URL here and it's serving your page 127.0.0.1 this is a special IP address that is equivalent to local host localhost colon 8080 the 8080 is the port number that's a sort of conventional port number that's used um, that's how you can set up things locally and then once you start developing you get into this loop this development loop this cycle Check it out. Our code is running. Um, there's something about a fav icon file. Yeah, the browser, when it loads a page, it always looks for this thing called fav icon. Fav icon? I don't know how to pronounce it. But that's the little icon that appears in the tab. So that's what that error means. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not important. But that's what it means. If you wanted to customize the little icon that appears in the tab, you would have to introduce a fav icon file. But anyway, let's say we wanted to change some of this code. And oh, check it out. Here's the log from HTTP server. Every time we fetch the page, it, it outputs something to this log. Let's say we wanted to change this text from hello to greetings. If I change it, and then I save this file. Oh, oh, wait a minute, I'm editing bundle.js. That's a big no-no. We don't want to be editing bundle.js because it's an automatically generated file. So, um, here's what I typically do is npm run build that generates bundle.js. It's the same it was as it was before. It says hello because it was derived from index.js, which we should be authoring and changing. Let's say we wanted to change hello to greetings. If I save this file and then I refresh this page, it does not get our change because this page is using bundle.js, not index.js. In order to update bundle.js, we need to manually run this script called npm run build. Now, if we go and refresh the page, it says, hello, uh, planet Earth. Uh-oh, there's like something wrong here. This is called caching. If you hit shift and hit the refresh button, now it says greetings. Because it, when you hit shift refresh, it disables the cache, the browser cache. The browser cache is a thing that it uses an older version of a file that you that you got, and it's for you know efficiency on the internet. Uh, if you loaded an image yesterday, and then you go to the same page that uses that same image, and that image is on your machine in the cache, then the browser will use it and not fetch the image again. It's a, it's a way to conserve bandwidth. So this is another sort of thing that you would run into with local development is the cache. And in the network tab of the Chrome DevTools, you can click a little box that says disable cache, which is something I would recommend doing um, because then you won't have to use shift clicking the refresh button. It'll just never use the cache. 
All right, so this is how you can set up a local development environment, and it basically works. However, you don't get the automatic refresh stuff, which is which is nice to have. I mean, in in VizHub, if you make a change, it automatically generates bundle.js and reruns the program for you instantly. This setup here does not does not do that. If you want to do that, that's where you get into these project templates. And so Rollup Starter App would let you do that. Oh, but before I get into that, are there any questions so far? Guess not. Rollup Starter App is a more fully fledged uh, project template. If we take a look at the package.json here, it has more scripts besides build. It has start, which does the serving for you. The HTTP server stuff is built into this. It has build, which is our same thing we had, rollup-c. It also has watch. What watch will do is automatically rebuild your bundle every time the source changes, the source code changes. And then there's dev as a script, which is what we would want to use during development. We would say npm run dev. And what this does is it starts these two scripts in at, in parallel using this package called npm run all dash dash parallel so it runs start which serves the stuff on an http server and it also runs watch and i believe this package called serve which is a, a dev dependency here it i believe it does that automatic refresh but I don't know. Let's let's give it a try. Let's give it a spin. So how do we use this? What I want to do is I think clone this repository using git. I'll call it example rollup starter. And then I can run git clone. Whoops. I should just copy this here. It already has the git clone. Run this. This uses git to make a copy of all these files for me locally. It's inside a directory called rollup starter app, which I guess it's fine. So in here I could run npm install or just npm i which is shorthand for npm install. That will install the dependencies. And then we can run npm run dev. And it gives us this nice little output. Okay, it's running on localhost 5000. It's a rollup starter app. Excellent. And then the development workflow. Looks something like we don't open up these files. And this is these are the files from the starter app. It's like um, just their version of hello world we could put our code in here uh, that's probably that's the way to do it if if you want to like really start a new project based on something in vizhub probably the thing to do is just copy your files into one of these starter apps 
Um, notice how this rollup config is slightly different. It looks for src slash main.js as the entry point instead of index.js like ours does. Yeah, and it has a couple more plugins to resolve npm packages. And this is something I want to get into. All right. So I'm going to gut these files and put our own files in there. I'll remove this update.js and then main.js I will replace it with the code that we wrote earlier. So here's our index.js. I'm just going to copy that over to here. And then we need something.js. So I'll make a new file called something js and then I'll just copy this code into there and then we also need thing.js so I'll make a new file called src slash thing.js and then copy our code into there. Save all these files and let's see what happened. In our window where we're, ru we're running npm run dev, we have a couple warnings here. It says unresolved dependencies. Oh no! D3 is imported by src slash main.js and yeah, the bundle has not been updated. The problem here is that we don't have D3 as a dependency here. Now, here comes the main difference between what VizHub does and what people usually do in projects. Usually, instead of pulling in libraries from a CDN with a browser global, usually people add it as a dependency in their package.json. And then the bundle contains that entire library. Let's see how that plays out. What we want to do is add to this dependencies D3 at a specific version. Uh, but rather than hand edit this file, what we can do is run a command called npm install dash dash save. This will update bundle, uh, sorry, this will update package.json and it will add that new dependencies. The new this will update package.json and include whatever we type here as a new dependency at the latest version. So if I run npm install dash dash save d3 it will figure out the latest version and add it to our dependencies section and it will also install it in node underscore modules. Now if we look at package.json, it has D3 version 6.6.2. All right. Let me restart this. I don't know if it catches that, if I change it like that. Oh, there's some warning about circular dependencies with D3. Yeah, that's a long-standing issue, but it's just a warning. It's fine. It created a bundle.js. Let's take a look at bundle.js. I'm quite curious to see what it looks like now. It's in the public directory. Public, by the way, is a conventional directory name for the stuff that gets served over HTTP. That's where our index.js is, and that's where our bundle is. Now, inside of this version of bundle.js, um, I forgot how to turn on line numbers in Vim. One moment. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, in this version of bundle.js, let's see how big it is, how many lines. It's massive, it's huge. 
look, we're only, you know, 10% of the way to 300 lines. So what, 3,000 3, lines of code? This is because all of D3 is included now inside of our bundle.js. VizHub does not do this because it would be a huge waste of storage and compute time and everything. But as a standard practice nowadays, you know, if you have your own project, this is typically what folks do. You know, all the dependencies get included inside of bundle.js, which introduces the need for minification. Uh, minification is when this stuff is sort of compacted. The variable names are given nonsense names that are just one character or two. Um, and the idea with minification is to get the size of the bundle down. I'm just curious, what? how big is this bundle? If we take a look at these files, we can see that bundle.js here is 76 kilobytes. So that's, you know, that's what happens when your uh, dependencies get in there. And as you add more and more dependencies, this bundle gets to be, you know, 500 kilobytes, a megabyte, two megabytes. Um, so you got to be careful when you just, you know, add dependencies willy-nilly. But anyway, when we look at the web page now, uh, it says roll up starter app. I'm not sure why. Oh, perhaps because um, I did not in I didn't update index.html. Yeah, we're still using their version of this. And notice in the roll up starter app version of this, they also have script source equals bundle.js. It's sort of a standard convention. As the last step, I'm going to replace that with our version of index.html. Copy all this stuff that we had from earlier. Put it into index.html. However, we no longer need to pull in D3 from Unpackage because it's installed locally and it's included inside of bundle.js. So I'm going to delete that. Now if we look at this page, it says hello HTML and it has our greetings here. And it also resolves the D3 stuff to the correct thing. All right, this is how you can essentially bootstrap a local project for development. Yep. That's it. Any any questions? And does this uh, also refresh the page every time you make uh, a change? Oh, good question. Source code? Let's see. If I change index.html and save it, it does not. No, so we need to manually refresh. But I wonder, is it set up so that when we edit the code, it reruns? Let's just change something here other thing. No, it does not. It automatically generates the bundle, but it does not automatically refresh the page. Hmm. I don't think. Let me just try again. Make a change, save it. No. It automatically generates the bundle, but does not automatically refresh the page. OK, at this point, if you wanted to add that, we can start researching about that sort of thing. But it's a whole, it's a whole can of worms, really. There are other starters 
um, for example, the Webpack dev server. Um, I was hoping to go through this today, but we don't have time. We're at time here. Webpack is a great alternative to Rollup, and it has this thing called the the Webpack dev server, which does exactly this sort of re automatic refreshing of the page and automatic generating of the bundle. So I, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to go through the docs of Webpack. Uh, they seem to have a very nice getting started section. Where was that? It's in here somewhere. But yeah, it's, it's a similar kind of configuration to the rollup config, where there's an entry and then there's output. It's not exactly the same as rollup, but it's you know the same in spirit. Webpack, I think, is uh, perhaps more widely used than rollup for projects, for you know applications. However, rollup is very popular for libraries because it has this efficiency around uh, only including the code that you need, which is called tree shaking. But anyway. I would like to leave you all with an exercise for this week. Export something you made in VizHub. Put it in a GitHub repository. Um, unfortunately, I didn't cover that today. But, you know, try to figure it out. And then adopt a build tool. Roll up, maybe go through the same process I did. Or try Webpack. Or try a newer tool like Parcel or Snowpack. Or what was that other one that was suggested today? I don't even remember. <laughs> what was that one? Vite. Vite, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe try out Vite. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope this has clarified the question of how do I work outside of VizHub? All right. I think we'll we'll I think we're pretty much done. Any any uh, any last questions or discussion points? Uh, if I have to if I want to do the local development then should I start with roll up only? I would suggest it. That's actually my go-to tool. It seems to work extremely well. Uh, but maybe Webpack is for you. I mean, uh, totally up to you. And some of these new ones, like Snowpla Snowpack or Vite, you know, they claim to be even better than whatever else is there, Webpack and Rollup. So it's um, it's wide open territory. It's ever it's an ever changing landscape where things are coming and going. People, th things are hot. Things are things are cold. You know, so it's it's really a jungle out there. And uh, I've sort of reached the end of what I can recommend because honestly, I haven't really kept up with this whole space. So it's a, it's an you know trial and error, and um, just try a bunch of things and, and see what works. Yeah, I think I think what I'll do is extend this to next week. Uh, well, actually, I should tell you all, next week is canceled. The 17th is canceled. But I'll resume these streams on the 24th. 24th, I think that's a Saturday. And I think it's it would be worth going through setting up a GitHub repository and maybe walk, walking through using Webpack to bootstrap a project. And as always, I welcome any input or suggestions for things to talk about. But then, yeah, after this, we could get into more of the visual stuff, D3, making different visualizations and so on. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. I'll uh, 
See you on the 24th and beyond. Thank you, Cor. My pleasure. Very useful. Thank you. Testing. Testing. productizing a code base. This is part of Get It Right in Black and White, but it's a little different because it's just me working on the stuff. And uh, this is work I was going to do anyway, so why not put it in the series? This work is about exporting something that you built in VizHub out of VizHub, putting it into a GitHub repository, which is where people, you know, generally put code, and deploying it with GitHub pages. Also, this particular work happens to do some data processing in Node.js, so we'll touch upon that as well. This is the thing that I built. It's a stream graph of D3 activity for the past 10 years. I'm not going to talk at all about how this works, but you know, think of it as a black box code base that we're going to get out of VizHub and um, sort of productize, you know, make it a, a real open source product. I'll start by exporting these files. And we get this zip file that has a bunch of files in it. But where should we put this stuff? We should put it in a Git repository. Let's make one of those. In GitHub, I'm going to click on this little plus and create new repository. I'll call it something like uh, Git History Stream Graph. 
I'll make it public, add a readme, choose a license, I'll make it MIT. Create repository. All right, we've got this empty repository. I'm going to copy this text. so that in our terminal we can go to where the repositories are and use git clone and paste that URL to clone that down. Whoops, the directory already exists. Let me try that again. And now it's working. I'm in a Linux terminal, by the way. This is my typical working environment. Git is installed. You might have to stop and install Git on your machine. RM means remove. Uh, the dash F means force. And the dash R means recursive. And git clone is the command that you use to make a copy of all the stuff in the git repository on your machine. Now that that's there, we can cd into that directory. cd means change directory. And then ls, meaning list all the files there. And I like to use vim as my editor with nerd tree that lets you see all the files. So this, is, this license is a MIT template. And this readme is a blank readme. I think I'll start this work by just referencing all the input sources in the readme. This project aims to visualize Git history as stream graphs. It draws from the following previous work, namely and this is where I'll drop a link to this thing here, D3 Git History Stream Graph. And I'll make that a link in Markdown that goes to that URL this one here. I'll copy it and paste it right in there. And this one refers to this thing that's in GitHub Gist right now, which is a set of node scripts that are forked from original work by Ian Johnson. He actually figured out how to do this, how to get the data of commits out of a Git repository and into a CSV file. So I'll link to this one as well. Ian Johnson's set of scripts to pull the git history. And I'll make that a link to this URL right here. Okay, I'm going to write the file and quit vim. And now I'm going to make the first commit. git status s is how you see what the status is. Git diff is how you can tell what changed. 
git add makes sure that all the uh, changes you made are sort of staged to be added to a commit. And then git commit dash m add links to readme. And then finally git push. Git push will push up the changes that you made into the repository in GitHub. So back in GitHub, if we refresh the page, we should see this new stuff. The language of the readme file, by the way, is Markdown. It renders to HTML and looks like this. So you, now you see these are links, but in the original uh, text, you know, this, this big heading is just a, a hash and uh, you can make the bulleted list with these asterisks. All right, now that we've got this far, I'm going to start by pulling in those node scripts. And then after that's done, we'll pull in the, the front end code that makes the visualization. Here's my fork of Ian Johnson's gist, which has been modified to remove bulky commit message data and to also publish the combined file uh, to a gist. And by the way, that, that stream graph thing, it pulls the data from this gist. To add these files to the Git repository, I'm going to start by cloning this gist I'm going to clone it as a peer directory with git clone and then I'll paste that URL for the gist okay it's already there on my machine I'll just do a git pull to make sure I have the latest and I do Okay, so we have a bunch of files here. The main things I'm interested in are these JavaScript files. So I'm just gonna say, copy everything that ends with JS over to our git history stream graph directory. Then I'll go back to that directory, take a look. Okay, everything moved over. At this point, I know we're gonna have a bunch of files eventually, so I wanna start to organize them. These files are the data processing scripts, which will be, I think, in a different directory than like the front end code, so I'm going to make that directory now. I'm going to make a new directory called data processing scripts, and then I'll move over all those JavaScript files into that directory. Now our directory looks something like this, where we have 
a bunch of JavaScript files, and a README and a license at the top level. At this point, I'll make another commit. Oh, before that, I have to add all these files. And then I'll make a commit that says add data processing scripts. And then git push. At this point, the main focus is just to get all the code into the repository, so I'm not even going to run these scripts. Uh, I'm going to refactor and massage that stuff later, but for now, the goal is to get the viz running and publish it with GitHub Pages. To that end, I'm going to extract the stuff from our zip file, our vizhub export, into this directory by clicking on extract. Scratch that by clicking on extract. and navigating to that directory. And I think I'll make a new directory, actually. Let's scratch that. And I think I'll make a new directory called vizhub export, just to keep everything totally separate for now. I'll hit extract, show the files, and there they are. Okay, great, now we have our VizHub export. I'll make a commit. But first I have to write git add. Okay, I'll push this up. Okay, the main thing that's missing at this point is the data itself. The data is currently hosted in a gist, and the viz pulls it down from that gist. But as we're unifying things, we'd like to make the visualization code pull the data from this repository somewhere. scratch that whole segment. Now that everything is there, we should just be able to turn on GitHub Pages and get that whole hosting working. For that, I can go back to the repository 
which now contains vizhub export and inside there there's an index.html that should work if we just host it with github pages which we can enable in the settings of the repository we can just scroll down and find pages by default it's disabled but we can just turn it on and say all right host the main branch at the root and click save now it says your site is ready to be published at this URL here and now we just need to modify that path to go to slash vizhub export slash index.html I think if I just paste that in, it's going to work. Not quite yet. It says it's the site is currently being built. I guess it might take some time. Okay, I just refreshed, and boom, there it is. All right, that's how you can export something out of VizHub and put it into a GitHub repository and then enable hosting with GitHub Pages. From here on out, I'm just going to massage this code base to be coherent and clean. and also make it so that the viz pulls the data from the repository as it gets generated in, in this repository. The first thing I'm going to focus on is whipping these uh, node scripts into shape. Currently, they're kind of a mess. They create GitHub repository. They they create Git repositories as peers of the source files, which is not quite right. So if I open up the editor, go into data processing scripts. There's a bunch of different scripts that do different things. This one clones all the D3 repositories from dependencies. And then you run this knife SV thing that generates a bunch of files, JSON, which converts those files to JSON, and then combine, which combines all of those together into a single file.
ideally we would just have one script that we could run. So let me start there and see where it goes. I'll make a new file called index.js under data processing scripts. And this will be the main thing that runs. So first we clone the repositories. Convert to knife SV files. Convert to JSON files. and combine the output file. Since this is node, I'm just going to use uh, require rather than import. If we say require dot slash clone, that should pull in the stuff from this clone file over here. I'll call it clone when we import it. But the thing is, this is currently a script that runs. So instead of just running a script, I'm going to define a function called clone, which is a function that just goes through each of the dependencies and clones them. And then in Node, we can export it by saying module.exports equals clone. Now we can just prove that this is working by saying console.log clone. It should output a function. And then I'll make a new terminal window here. navigate to the data processing scripts directory and then run it node index.js okay it's looking for d3's package.json Yeah, those scripts assume that the D3 repository is, is cloned, but that's not really the case. So I'm just going to take this package.json and drop it into our repository. I'll call it D3 package.json. Create that file, paste the content, and then I believe it's this depends thing that is pulling in that file. Let's change this path to be d3 package.json and see if it works now. Okay, it worked. We got a function. Great. 
Now, this clone function itself just runs git clone. And so, um, you know, I'm not even sure where these would end up. Well, let's run it and find out. In index.js, we can actually run that function. So when I run this, it's doing a bunch of stuff. I'm going to stop it before it gets too far. And now, see, there are all these D3 repositories right here in the same directory as all the source files, which is kind of a mess. So I'm just going to delete all those, remove everything that starts with D3 dash, because I want to keep D3 package JSON. OK, now those are all gone. I think the best approach might be to have this clone script make like a, a directory. We can run exec outside of all that and have the command be make directory repositories and we could handle errors here but I don't think we really need to and then we would CD into repositories and then run git clone on all this stuff we'll see if that works I'll run node index again. And then again, I'll stop it with control C. Huh, it did not work. It did create the repositories directory, though. I guess the CD didn't work. Yeah, it looks like it doesn't work for CD. It looks like we can pass something into exec called CWD. Let's try that. So instead of CD repositories, we just pass an object with CWD. dot slash repositories would that work I'll get rid of those d3 things again and then see what's in repositories. Okay, it worked. Look at that. All the stuff has been cloned into repositories. Excellent.
Okay, at this point I'll make a commit. Oh, you've added another Git repository inside. Yeah, you know, I think we just want to totally ignore that directory, which we can do by editing dot git ignore. If I just put that in git ignore. Okay, it's still added then, but let me just remove that whole thing. Okay, now if I go and run that thing again, it's gonna clone all the repositories. Now when I do git add, it doesn't catch them. But I think they are still there. Yep. Okay, so git ignore is working. Now I'm going to make a commit that says start iterating data processing script. One thing I don't like about this is when you run it, it doesn't even tell you what it's doing or how far along it is. So I'm just going to add a little something that says console.log command, just so we know which command is running. Also, we may as well output the error, just so we know um, if anything happens. Or rather, um, if there's no error, error is null. So let's say if error, then console.log error. OK, now we get some, some stuff. Git clone fails when it already exists. OK, yeah, that makes sense. So let me remove that repositories directory and try again. OK, it's, it's running all this stuff. And it finished. Amazing. So if we run that again, it's going to give us all this, um, these errors. But I think I wanted to actually just not tell us if there's an error, because I could imagine, you know, running this this um, index again and again, and if it's already cloned, you know, it's already cloned. So now let's let's work on the knife aspect. We just copy that line. Change all clone to knife. And then we just run knife. But over in knife we need to again make an exported a function. So I'll make a function called knife. that runs this command.
and then add it to module.exports. Module.exports is knife. Now if we run this whole thing, Oh, it's trying to CD into the repositories, at the, but it's trying. It's looking at the wrong place. So instead of CD repo, it should be CD. Repositories slash repo. Let's try that. cannot create dot dot slash data slash d3. Okay, that makes sense because we don't have a data directory. Similar to clone, we might want to make a directory. Make directory data. So now let's try it. Okay, that did not work. I think we need to be going dot dot slash dot dot slash because here we go two levels down, not one. So let me try that dot dot slash dot dot slash. Okay, it's working. And we're getting all these nulls because it's doing a console.log error. I'm going to change it to only console.log the error if there is an error that's not null. Okay, now it runs fine. Now let's run the JSON conversion which we can get from that file. Replace knife with JSON. And in JSON, we can say const JSON equals a function that runs all this stuff. and then export that. Let's see if that works. It seems to have worked, but I don't really like, uh, we don't know what's what it's doing. So I'm gonna add a little bit of console.log Cloning dot dot dot. Knifing dot dot dot. Converting to JSON dot dot dot. That's a little more user friendly. I sort of know what's happening. And lastly, we need to combine the output file. Dot, dot, dot. So we can run combine. 
which we get from combine.js. And here again, we need to make this a function. that runs all this code here and then export it like that all right let's see if it works Okay, that looks good. We've got this new file, all D3 commits. Which looks something like that. And you know, I'm always a bit hesitant to add data to repositories because the files are usually pretty big. And in the case of this one, there is actually further aggregation that happens in the front end. It actually aggregates by week. Yeah, with some stuff from D3, UTC week. And then it applies some smoothing to that data. But, you know, the smoothing, I kind of want to keep that on the front end so that if we wanted to, we could vary how the smoothing is done. But I think it would be advantageous to do this data processing in the node script so that we don't have to fetch a 500 kilobyte file. We can fetch a much smaller file that just has the weekly aggregations. And then we wouldn't need to add this data file to the Git repository at all. In our data processing script, we can add another step aggregate by week. I'll call it aggregate. And we can get that from aggregate.js which is a totally new file which will have a function called aggregate and that will be exported.
This is where we get to do the fun exercise of porting browser-based code into Node. This code here expects data as the output from the previous script in this pipeline. Namely, this file here, all D3 commits. So let's load that file here. with fs.read file sync all d3 commits dot json and we can call that data string and then data would be json.parse data string and then let's console.log data just to see if it worked Oh, FS is not defined. Fair enough. I'll look at some of these other scripts. Um, it just requires FS, which is the built-in node file system module. And it looks like we might need a dot to string on the result from read file sync. But if we run it without that, it actually works just fine. So maybe we don't need that after all. Okay, we've loaded in this data. Now we can take the stuff out of VizHub that processes this data. I'm going to copy all this code up until the place where it computes layer data. And what we're calling layer data here, I think, will be the output. It's the aggregated data. So I'll paste all that stuff in here. This code imports a bunch of stuff from D3. But since we're in node, we can say const d3 equals require d3. And uh, for that to work, in our data processing scripts, we really probably should have a package.json to track our dependencies like D3. To create a package.json, I'm going to run npm init. 
and I'll just you know accept all the defaults and then we can run npm install dash s meaning update package.json d3 and if we take a look at package.json this is how it looks that's fine uh, main thing is it has the dependencies now that means that this line of code here will work oh we also need array blur no no we don't we don't that'll be done on the client side that's the smoothing we can reconcile this uh, ES6 import syntax with our ES5 you know node environment by saying const all this stuff equals d3 this is destructuring right here and I might as well move that up to where it's imported Okay, so let's organize this code here. We've got parse date and layer, which are statically defined. So I'll, I'll pull those out. Transform data equals data. Well, we don't need that because we're already inside of a function that has data there visible. All this stuff should run just fine. And then down here is where it sort of trails off. It's we gotta just wrap it up here. And we we have layer data. Which we some somehow need to get into a file. So let's see what layer data looks like here and see if the code runs to this point. So if I run index.js apparently layer data is a big array Probably the easiest thing to do would just be, you know, make a an object I'll call it aggregated data. And layer here is the name of a layer. So I'm just gonna say aggregated data at layer equals layer data now we have something that we can output to a JSON file let's see how did that other module do it there it is fs.write file sync
So I'll just drop that line and it calls json.stringify and I'll just pass in aggregated data to there. And the file name, I think I'll just call it aggregated data dot JSON. Now if I run everything we have a new file called aggregated data dot JSON. It contains a bunch of zeros, but I think that's okay. Each of these numbers corresponds to a week, but you wouldn't know that based on this data. In our code, the weeks are available here as all weeks. So let me just make that available here. In aggregated data as all weeks. And then we can nest the repository. data under, say, repositories. Now we can say aggregated data dot repositories add layer equals layer data. Let's try this. Okay, now we have all weeks. Um, the format is a little verbose. I kind of want to just clean that up. We already have this parser, so let's just add a formatter. Format date is time format. And we need to get that out of D3 as well.
now um, instead of all weeks I think I'll call it dates um, because you know we, we might want to use months or something in the future and then we can say all weeks dot map format date Now when we run this, oh, we get an error. I'll just backtrack. Okay, now it works. I don't know how I what I broke or how I broke it. Just introducing the formatter shouldn't do anything. But it does? What? That's odd. If I don't create the formatter. I don't know, Twilight Zone moment. Okay, let's try it again.
Okay, this is super weird. It says, you know, d.date is undefined if we do it like this. Uh, but if we do it like this, explicitly pass one thing into format date, then it works. Weird. Might be something about a second argument to format date or something. But anyway, now it's working just fine. Now if we take a look at the files, we can see that the aggregated data now is only 31 kilobytes instead of a whopping 426. We should just make sure that this data doesn't end up in the repository. So I'm going to delete this file. And I'm going to tweak this script to generate this inside of data, uh, inside of the data directory. Data slash all D3 commits. And then when we load that, we need to get it from this the same place, data slash all D3 commits. And then in our git ignore, we can also ignore the data directory so that everything in there does not end up inside the git repository. So I'll run all that stuff one last time. OK, it worked. If we do a git status, we see the stuff here. Generally looks good, but I see there are swap files being tracked. And also node modules is being tracked by git. We don't want that, so let's go back to our git ignore and say any swap file. This is just a temporary thing that Vim generates that we don't need in Git. Also, node modules. OK, great. There we have it. We have aggregated data.json visible, which is only 30 kilobytes. So I feel good about adding all this stuff. And then I'll make a commit. Add aggregated data. All right, now that we've scratched that, all right, hmm, scratch that. Now that we've got the data processing scripts sorted out, let's deal with the front end code. The front end code is currently in this vizhub export thing, which has 
sort of a sketchy dead simple package.json and rollup config. The first thing I want to do here is make sure that we have a proper setup. So I'm going to turn to rollup starter app. We can pull things in from here, and I like to do it one at a time. So here's package.json. Since the thrust of this project is the front end, I'm going to let the front end code live at the root of the repository. So I'll just drop that stuff into package.json. But instead of rollup starter app, we should call this git history stream graph. Like so. Everything else looks decent. I'm just not sure that it's at the latest version. Oh, and we don't need date functions. That's something that's used by, you know, the starter app. I'm just not sure all this stuff would be at the latest version. So I'm going to run ncu, which is, you can get it with node, sorry, npm install dash g npm check updates. This is a little utility that goes through your package.json and checks if all the versions are the latest. We can run it with ncu. And it turns out there's some version increments. And so I'm going to run ncu-u to actually modify package.json to use all the latest versions of things. And then I'll run npm install. While that runs, we can pull in some other stuff. From this starter app. Such as the rollup config. This is more of a production oriented configuration for rollup. So I'll make a new file called rollup.config.js and I will drop this content into there. Now let's look at our files and take what we need from the vizhub export. There are really only two main modules here, index.js and transform data. 
I'm inclined to make a new directory called src, the source directory, and put those files there. So I'll just move those into the source directory. And notice that the rollup config looks for src slash main.js. I'll just change that to index.js. And index.js imports a lot of stuff from D3. and also from D3 area label. Now this is a fork in the road where we could choose how we want to include our dependencies. We could either go the traditional route of pulling in the dependencies into our bundle having a huge bundle with all of the functions from D3 and these libraries that we're using. Or we could opt to pull our dependencies from a CDN like Unpackage and have our bundle only contain our code, not any other library code. That's what I'm inclined to do because we're publishing this with GitHub Pages. And to publish this stuff with GitHub Pages, we need to include the bundle in the Git repository. And if we include a bundle in the Git repository that contains like D3 and, and libraries, it's going to bloat the Git history. So that's why at this juncture, I'm going to opt toward using libraries that come from a CDM. To do that, we need to adopt some of the stuff that's going on in the vizhub config for rollup. Namely, marking things as external. I'm going to bring that line into our rollup config. It says, okay, D3 is external. Also, globals, we need that as well under output so that D3 can be resolved to the right thing at runtime. Since we're using D3 area label as well, this piece also needs to be pulled in from our rollup config. It just says anything that gets imported from the D3 area label package looks to the D3 global, and that just happens to be how that uh, library is set up. It adds more stuff to the D3 global. Okay, and finally we have index.html. Where should we put this? And this is a kind of ugly indentation wise. Let me just fix the formatting.
Okay, we're pulling in these three libraries from Unpackage, and then we're running our bundle.js. Uh, but is that where it ends up in our new rollup config? No, it, end up, it ends up in public slash bundle.js. Okay, good to know. That makes a lot of sense. The directory name public is typically where index.html lives, and also CSS, and maybe images uh, or data files, things that get loaded by the client. So I'll go ahead and make a new directory called public, and I'm going to move index.html into public. And you know, that's where the data should live as well. So I'm going to move aggregated data dot json into public there's also styles.css which can go in public as well okay now public has our data our html and our css Let's see if our rollup build works. See, our index.html expects a file called bundle.js. And our rollup config outputs a file called bundle.js in public. However, that's not there at the moment. To make that exist, we can look at our scripts in package.json. See, we have a build script, which will just run rollup to generate that bundle. To invoke that, we can say npm run build, like so. And it says unresolved dependencies and also missing global variable name. Okay, we just have to take some more stuff over from our other rollup config from VizHub, namely we need to add array blur and d3 area label. under the external configuration, like that. Also in globals, we need to define uh, which global array blur resolves to. It just so happens that that library is also set up to add stuff to the D3 global. So we can say array blur resolves to the D3 global. Let's try that again. Okay, no errors. And now bundle.js has been generated in the public directory.
and it looks something like this. It's pretty small. Um, this has been minified, by the way, because in the rollup config, Terser is used. Terser is a minifier. Okay, great. Now let's see if everything actually works. There is a script here called start, which just runs serve, which is another npm package, and it serves the public directory. Let's try that. npm start. Okay, we have a local HTTP server running on port 5000. And if I run this, boom, it works. Look at that. Amazing. So the work is done. The final step here is to, you know, commit whatever we've done and make it work with GitHub pages as well. Also, I'm remembering that I manually copied the data over into the public directory, but ideally our scripts would output there directly from the aggregate step. So instead of writing aggregated data.json, I'm going to change this to dot, uh, dot dot slash public slash aggregated data. This way, if we modify any of these scripts, we can just run it and then push to GitHub and it'll actually automatically deploy to GitHub pages with the fresh data. I'm just gonna run that processing script one last time to make sure that the last step works. I think it worked, but to be sure, I'm going to delete this file. Now it's gone. I'll run this again. And I'm getting an error now. Hmm. scratch that. Okay, that ran. And now in public, that file exists. Boom. All done. Get status to see what changed. Oh, a lot of stuff changed. I'll add everything to get this change set looks good. Make front end work is my commit message. Push that up.
Now in the GitHub Pages config, since we have a public directory now, we can actually change this configuration so that instead of serving the root at the root, it should serve slash public. Scratch that section. Okay, now we can go to this GitHub Pages site. Oh, now it shows the README. That's pretty cool. But we can go to slash public, and we should get the visualization, and we do. All right, sweet. Ideally, we would not need the slash public. But in the settings for GitHub pages, we can only select between two options, the root and slash docs. So the thing to do might be rename public to docs. That way we could, you know, just use the root of this URL and that would resolve to the working visualization. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll move public to be called docs. And then I'll search for all mention of public. Which gives us these um, three places that we need to change public to docs. And by the way, I'm using this AG function, which is a really nice thing called the Silver Searcher. It's like a command line search utility. Okay, so in rollup config, I'll change public to docs. Yeah, that's the one. Same thing in package.json. Public to docs. And lastly, in our aggregate script, public to docs. All right, there we go. I'll 
add that to git, make a commit. Migrate public to docs for GitHub pages. Push that up. Now I can change this setting to use slash docs. And now if I go to this URL, It'll take a minute to change, but if I refresh,
it should eventually show up. The last sort of loose end we need to wrap up here is the fact that our our client program is still pulling in data from GitHub Gist. See, so check it out under source index.js. We've got this data URL, which is still pulling from GitHub Gist. This one needs to change to pull it from dot slash aggregated data dot json and this is where you know we've moved a bunch of stuff from the front end to the back end or the pre-processing step so we're gonna have to modify this transform data function so that it does not do all the stuff that it did before. Rather, it's going to expect this new format for our aggregated data, which contains dates and what else? Repositories. So we can destructure those from data. And let's take a look at our aggregate step. It does a bunch of stuff in here. So we can delete that from the front end code. We don't need to do the grouping. We don't need to compute all this stuff. We do, however, want to apply the smoothing.
layers here represents the list of repositories. So we can derive that from repositories by saying object.keys repositories. And all weeks is actually dates. However, we do need to parse those strings into dates using parse date, which we have defined there. So how about this? Instead of doing this destructuring, we can say data.repositories, and we can also say dates equals data.dates.map a function that takes as input one date and re returns parse date of that date. Now dates should be defined correctly and we should be able to set everything up, you know, just let it run like it did before. However, there is this thing called data by layer. What is that? I think I clobbered its instantiation. We can use git diff to figure that out. Yeah, here it is. I deleted it by accident. It's just a new map. So we can bring that back, scratch that. So we can bring that back right here, data by layer, new map. And now let's see if it works. So npm start just serves everything. What we want to do now is actually regenerate the bundle. So let's try this dev script, npm run dev, that will run in parallel both the start script and the watch script. And the watch script is essentially the same as the build script, but it watches, meaning every time you change a file, it automatically regenerates bundle.js. So I'll shut down npm start and run uh, npm run dev. Oh, look at that. We have some warnings. That's really nice. Unused external imports. UTC week, UTC weeks, and group are imported but never used. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we can just get rid of those. We don't need UCT week, UCT weeks, or group. Great. See, I wrote that file and then it updated bundle immediately, automatically. Let's see if the front end works. I believe it was localhost 5000. It appears broken. It says grouped data is not defined. Okay, let's see what what is that? I think what used to be called grouped data is now called something else, uh, but no, that's actually not the case. What we have is layer data. Yeah, I remember. 
this stuff is actually in our data processing script in the aggregate step. Yeah, so what we're doing is we're saving layer data to the file. So we can just get layer data out of the file by saying data.repositories at layer, like that. Okay, let's see if that worked. All weeks is not defined. Yeah, I think we re we changed that to be called dates. T is not an iterable. Hmm. Okay, it says t is not an iterable, and if we follow the code, it's it's when it tries to compute extent of data. Apparently, data is not an iterable. So let's see, we just need to connect the dots. Data, I believe, was the original data. So we actually need to change the front end code. so that it doesn't need data at all. All it really needs that for is to compute the domain of the x scale, which is the extent of the dates. And we have those dates available. So we can just expose these dates instead of data. And then we can use that to compute the extent. It's just going to be the extent of the dates. And it sort of worked. Got something kind of funky going on. I don't know why the dates go back to 
it appears that we might have like an invalid date. Yeah, the dates are going back to like 1971. Why is that? Okay, well that's that's what's appearing in our aggregated data. So why is that? Looks like there's some bug in our um, data processing scripts. Oh, here it is. It's all weeks dot map. That should be Well, no, that looks fine. Format date of date. It should just format all the dates. Let's console.log all weeks at index 0 to see what is the first date here. It says 2013. That seems right. So what are, what's going wrong here? What if we pass that into format date? It says Okay, this is super weird. If I just bring back the code like this, it gets the correct date and the stream graph appears correctly. Okay, weird. But we seem to be missing a bunch of commits on D3.
Okay, the issue there was it was calling exec and this command was not finishing before the next step in the pipeline ran. That's why we were missing some commits. So I just changed it to be exec sync. So this command actually totally finishes before the next one runs. And that was the source of our strange errors. So now if we run this and we load the data into the viz, it is full and complete and has all our stuff in it. All right, that's how you can productize a code base. All right, welcome everyone to episode eight of Get It Right in Black and White. Today, the goal is to build a D3 scatter plot from scratch. So introductions for new folks, if any, I see, um, Oh, someone joined the call and left, but you're all welcome to join. Um, if any money, if anybody does join, I'll come back and uh, we can do introductions. I'd like to begin by reviewing some of the submissions from the last episode, which was two weeks ago now. But let's take a look at what folks did. That was the one on JavaScript modules and build tools. And um, here's a nice roll-up example by uh, floating per. Very nice, very nice. And here's another one that uses Vite. This looks kind of interesting. I've never used Vite, but it seems to uh, it seems to work. And here's another one that seems to be just the straight VizHub export, which works too. But yeah, I'm really glad to see folks are able to get their stuff out of VizHub into GitHub. Um, so that's that's one of the most commonly asked things, like how do you get out, get out of VizHub? So that's how, and uh, hopefully that's satisfactory. And by the way, I recorded um, episode seven by myself a couple days ago. I'm going to release it as a video soon because I was doing this work anyway of, of getting a, uh, you know, making uh, like an open source product out of something that's in VizHub and I just recorded it. So I'm going to post that eventually. It's not posted yet, but that's why we're in episode eight now, not episode seven. Metal Guitar Covers. Hello, everyone. Hey, feel free to join the uh, audio if you'd like. It'd be a lot of fun. Today, we'll build a scatter plot, And the goal here is to create a vanilla HTML implementation of a D3 scatter plot that uses modern D3 conventions and implements this pattern of decoupling rendering from data processing. The goal of that is to make it easier down the line to swap out the rendering logic if you want to with another framework or canvas or what have you. And I hope to get out of this a forkable template that can be sort of a go-to resource. Uh, if anybody asks, like, how do I make a scatter plot with D3? You could just send them a link to this template and like, boom, that's it. And it's like probably less than a hundred lines and it works and it's basic and it's vanilla. And I mean, truly vanilla. So we're not going to use ES6 modules even uh, because I want to show what that option looks like to not use ES6 modules. Okay. I'm going to start by creating a viz in VizHub from this vanilla HTML starter. I'm going to fork this and say D3 scatterplot. So 
so what have we got here anyway? It's a basic HTML template with some space for JavaScript. I'm just going to gut this. I'm going to delete everything. Um, but I'll keep the places to put things like the script and the style um, because I know we're going to need to use that stuff. Okay, step one, let's load in D3. And um, th there's a number of ways to do this, but since we're doing vanilla HTML, let's just load it in from a CDN. I'm going to use unpackage as a script tag. At the end of the head, I'm going to make a new script tag. Open script, close script, and the source will be D3 somehow. And the way that we get that is, I like to go to unpackage.com slash D3, and it resolves to this minified build of D3. So I'm going to paste that URL here. Now we have access to D3, which we can prove by saying console.log D3 and taking a look in the console and we get this object that has all of the D3 methods. All right, the next step is to load in some data. And since this is a, you know, going to be a template, I like to use the iris data set. If you just do a Google search for the iris data set, there's even a Wikipedia article about it that helps to give some context. It's also known as Fisher's iris data set. It's a multivariate data set from like 1936 um, about flowers, about iris flowers. These are the iris flowers and it's got like petal width, petal length, and they're just measurements in centimeters about these particular flowers. So it's a classic data set. I'm going to use it because we end up with nice scatter plots. But part of the goal of this is to develop something that's a template that you could easily swap out the data to be something else. So in a sense, it doesn't really matter what data we use to start. Anyway, if you scroll down in the search results, I've got this gist up in GitHub that contains the iris data set as a CSV file. Publishing data in GitHub gists like this is a pretty common practice uh, for visualizations that are hosted on the web and various platforms. Um, it's great because GitHub essentially hosts the stuff for free and lets you pull it down from any program. So if we click this raw link right here, we get to see the content of this file, which is a CSV, a CSV file. And CSV stands for comma separated value. This is the header row, and these are all the rows that contain uh, the data. So it's got sepal length, and the sepal length of the first flower is 5.1. It's got sepal width, and the sepal width of the first flower is 3.5 centimeters. It's got petal length, and the petal length of the first flower is 1.4, and it's got petal width, the petal width of the first flower is 1.2, and it's got species. And the species are iris setosa, iris versicolor, and virginica. These are different species of iris. So we can take this URL right here, copy it, and paste it into our program. I'd like to make a variable for this. So I'm going to call it CSV URL equals, and I'm just going to paste it 
right there. And at this juncture, you know, for me, I don't really like seeing these long lines that wrap around in sort of an unwieldy way. So here's a little trick that you can use to, um, to clean up the code around strings. I'm going to make it an array of strings so we can see the different components of this URL. Yeah, I'm just going to split it up here, close out the array, and then we can say dot join, which is a method on JavaScript arrays. And then we can use prettier to format that nicely. And now I feel this is a lot more readable. We know that it's coming from GitHub gist. This is the user name. This part of the URL is the ID of the gist. And this part is the commit. And then this part is the file name. So that's how you can split a long string into multiple lines in you know a somewhat elegant and readable way in JavaScript. And just to make sure we're getting the right thing still, we can console.log CSV URL. And we should see that URL. Yeah, there it is. And we could even click on that, and it resolves to the right thing. OK, now that we've got this CSV URL, we have to fetch this CSV file. To do that, we can use d3.csv. Now, at this juncture, we can make a decision. Do we want to have d3 dot all over the place in our code? Or do we want to extract the d3 stuff into local variables? The latter would be my preference, because that's how it ends up when you use imports, ES6 imports. So to make this vanilla JavaScript more closely resemble the code that you would write if you were to use ES6 imports, I'm going to make a decision to destructure all this stuff out of the D3 global, like this. We can say const CSV equals D3. And I'm going to do it at the top, because traditionally that's where the imports go. So what this is doing is, is exactly the same as this, const CSV equals D3 dot CSV. It's exactly the same thing, but it uses ES6 destructuring is a nice language feature. So now that we've got this, uh, this CSV thing, we can, we can use it. We can say CSV and pass in CSV URL. And what this does is it makes a network request using HTTP for that particular URL. And the CSV function returns a promise, uh, which is a construct in ES6 JavaScript to deal with asynchronous control flow. So when you run this code, it makes a request. And then that request takes some time to come back. And then after it comes back, the promise resolves. And that's when we want to get the data that comes back. To do that, we can say dot then dot then is a method on promises. And we could pass in a function that takes as input data. And then we could say console.log data to see if it worked. Indeed it did. See, we get this array of 150 elements that also has a property on it called columns. See, this is the result of d3.csv doing its thing internally. It actually loads the file and it also parses it. It goes through that big string of text and it, it splits it into rows and it constructs these objects, one object per row. So what we get here, it's an array of objects and each of these objects has a bunch of properties like sepal length, sepal width, 
However, these are strings. And ideally, these would be numbers. So the next step here is to parse these strings into numbers. d3.csv takes as input a second argument. I'm going to call it parse row. And this is a function that takes as input a single row. I'm going to call it d. And it returns some object that will replace that row. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to return d, but before doing that, I'm going to mutate d and say d.sepal width. Well, actually, let me just copy the set of columns out because I can't remember all of them. And we only want to do this for the things that are numbers. So species is not a number, so we don't need to parse the strings into numbers. And by the way, the reason why it's good practice to parse strings into numbers is because, you know, when you do math on strings, you don't always get the right result. Just as a brief detour, um, let me just show you if you add like 5 plus 5 as strings, you get 55. But if you add 5 plus 5 as numbers, you get 10. So how do we get from strings to numbers? We can use this operator called unary plus. If you put plus right before the string, it parses the string into a number. And so that's what we can do for, for all of these numeric fields here. I'm going to paste that here, and I'm going to use um, Vim macros, I think, to just uh, write this code quicker. So we can say d dot sepal length equals plus d dot sepal length. and then set up for the next one. And with these macros, I can automate that. And then I'll use prettier to format the code. And there we go. We've got numbers instead of strings. And let's just see if that worked. In the console, we can see, indeed, these are numbers now. We've got some questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, by the way, anyone can join the live audio. It'd be higher bandwidth. So CSV is converting the file to a JSON structure. Yeah, you could think of it like that. I mean, it's a it, it's converting it to a JavaScript object in memory, which is the same structure as a JSON file. But JSON is is a serialization of JavaScript objects. So it's not exactly JSON, but it's similar. It's it's yeah, it's an array of objects. That's true. Doesn't D3 add columns? Yep. Yep, totally does. Yeah, so D3 does all that magic internally where it adds this columns property. Yep. Okay, what's next here? Let's start using D3 to build up um, this graphic using SVG. So the first step of that is to create an SVG element on the page. We can do that um, right here, I suppose. const svg equals d3.select body dot append svg. This will append a new svg element to the body. However, since we don't want to see d3 dot sprinkled throughout our code, I'm going to also destructure select 
from D3 up there. And for SVGs to work, we need to give them a width. So I'm going to say dot ATTR width. And also we need to give them a height. So I'm going to give it width as the value of a, a local variable called width that I haven't created yet. And the same for height. Height gets height. And let's define width to be window dot inner width. This measures the size of the browser at the time where um, the program runs. I like doing it like this so it's generic and it's not a hard-coded number. Okay, let's see, did this work? We get these, uh, these undesirable scroll bars which we can address with some styling. In the CSS, we can say, okay, on the body element, set the margin to be zero. This is just a common trick that you sort of need to do all the time if you want to have full screen SVGs. Uh, and overflow is hidden. That will hide those pesky scroll bars. Okay, that looks better. All right, now that we've got this SVG, what do we want to put in here? Um, well, a scatter plot is made of circles, so let's just go at it that way. You know, let's add some circles to this SVG based on the data. The thing is, though, the data is only available inside of this callback here. And I don't know, this dot then, I don't really like it because because there is a, a more elegant construct called async and await. Um, my preference is to use that. And the way you can do this is introduce a function. I'm going to call it main. And this is going to be an async function. And what that means is we can say const data equals await CSV, all this stuff here. This um, strike, strikes me as a little bit more elegant. You know, I prefer to use it like this. Um, and then we have to invoke main, of course. And let's just see if it still works after this. Console.log data. Indeed, there it is. Okay, so that's how you can you can use async and await instead of the dot then syntax for promises, which is sort of a more modern approach. Now we can add circles to our SVG with the D3 um, general update pattern, SVG dot select all circle dot data data. dot join circle and now we can set our attributes on the circle attr cx is going to be now what is it going to be i mean this is where we need to do a lot of work actually to figure out what that x position should be and it brings up the point that um, I would like to have the concerns separated of the data processing and the rendering. And so I feel like we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. We're not quite ready for the rendering because we haven't done the data processing. And so by data processing, what I mean is figuring out which X and Y coordinate each circle needs to get based on the data and using this construct called scales, linear scales in particular. 
So let's do the data processing first and then circle back to this rendering logic. All right, I'm going to comment out this. And to figure out where x should go, we need to use a scale. And I'm going to just call it x. This is going to be the x scale, uh, because this is a convention that I've seen in recent times um, with D3 programs. This is going to be an instance of scale linear. And it would be d3 dot scale linear, but we're also going to destructure that up here out of d3 scale linear. But what does a scale linear, I mean, what is this? What is scale linear? Why do we need it? I've prepared a diagram to explain this. Scale linear has a domain and a range. The domain is typically the values that you see in the data. Uh, in our case, this would be like the, you know, the width of the sepal or whatever. And typically the domain goes from the minimum to the maximum value that we see in the data. So let's just say we have some data set where the minimum value that we want to use for, say, the x position is 0, and the maximum value is 10. And what the purpose is for scale linear in this case is to transform data space into pixel space. And the range of the scale is the pixel space. And in the case of the x coordinate, this is going to be, you know, the, the lowest and the highest x pixel coordinate that we want to see. Whoops. Hang on. So, when we have a data value and we want to project it onto the screen, we, we give this scale a value from the domain, and what the scale does is it gives us as output a value in the range. For example, if we were to have the number 5 in our data, we could say, okay, Mr. Scale Linear, my data value is 5. Where should that be on the screen? And then Scale Linear would say, oh, I know, that should be at 25. Because think about it. 5 is halfway between 0 and 10, and 25 is halfway between 0 and 50. So that's the purpose of scale linear. I see someone has joined. Hey, Felipe's here. Hello. Yeah, hello. Hey. So I'm late. It's really difficult to make, to make it. Oh, no worries. I'm happy you could join. Yeah, me too, me too. I'm, I'm also glad that I, I, can, I could join. Nice. Um, I can't remember if you introduced yourself last time you came on, but uh, maybe just give a, a brief intro to yourself here. Okay. Uh, I'm Felipe. Uh, I'm an engineer as a profession. Um, I don't code. I, I just love to code, but it's not my job. And... Uh, and then I'm I'm trying to learn as much as I can to to start coding and make things more more easily. Very nice. Uh, I really I really enjoy making making things. Awesome. Yeah, I've been very impressed with your work. You know, I'm I'm so happy Thank that you. you've been following the series and and doing the the exercises. You know, it's very 
it's very great to see and I'm so happy you could join me today. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share my screen in the Google Meet. Okay. So that um, you can follow along there and you can close the YouTube stream because there's a lag there. Um, but this is great because you can, we can have discussions in real time if you have okay. any questions. So feel free to interrupt me if anything's not clear. Okay. We can dive Perfect. deeper. But in the meantime, please mute yourself because there's a little bit of background noise. Oh my gosh, Adil is here too. Hey, hey, Adil, how are you? You're muted. Hello, everyone. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hello. So glad you could join today. Sorry about the the last minute arrival. I had some babysitting duties. Oh, no worries. No worries. <laughs> Oh, this is great. Two folks joined at once. And Felipe just joined. Felipe, have you met um, Adil? Uh, not, not personally, but uh, nice to meet you. Nice. Hi, Felipe. How are you? Hi. Great. Well, let me just um, give a quick recap because you're, you're all just joining. This is what we've got so far. It's not that much. It loads D3. It uh, fetches a CSV, parses the rows from a CSV, constructs an SVG element, and constructs a scale linear. And the goal here is to make a scatter plot. And I just went through this slide about linear scales. And the, the purpose of linear scales is to convert values from a domain to a range. Domain is like the input, the range is like the output. The domain is the data space, and the range is the screen space. So in our case, we, we want to position these circles in the scatter plot in the x direction. And what should that be, though? Uh, we have to pick one of these columns to use. And this is where I like to define uh, an accessor that I call, you know, I like to call it x value, y value, color value, size value, whatever. It's a naming convention that I like to use. And it's a function that takes as input one row, and it gives you back some value from the data that we should use. So here are our various options. Um, I don't think it really matters at this point which one, because I just want to get something to show up. So I'll pick petal length. This is going to be our x value. And the same for y. Let's try uh, simple length for y. So we're going to build a scatter plot where you know, petal length determines the x position of the circles, and sepal length determines the y position of the circles. Now that we have that in hand, we can define the domain of our x scale. And the way that you do this is, firstly, you construct an instance of scale linear by invoking d3.scalelinear as a function. This gives you back this object that has methods on it such as domain and domain can be used to set the domain and the domain remember is just two values a minimum and a maximum and so we can this is going to be like min and max min and max are actually functions from d3 so we could say d3.min give it the data and give it the x value accessor. And this will actually iterate through all of the different values and compute the minimum from there. And we can do the same for max, d3.max, data x value. And it will compute the maximum x value. Let's just inspect uh, what happened there. X value is the same of X, or uh, did I miss? X value is just okay, this okay, function. Okay. Yeah, it's just this function here that returns the petal length for each row. 
and we could tweak it here if we wanted to change which row to use. But yeah, that's all it is. It's just a function that returns the pedal length for each row. And so what, it, what we're doing here is we're passing in that function to d3.min, which expects a function that takes as input a single row, and we're also passing in the data. And when we run this d3.min call, it actually checks each and every value that gets returned from this function for each and every row and it keeps track of the minimum one that it saw and then it returns the the minimum of all the values and same thing for max but just for the maximum and we can check if this worked by saying x.domain and the thing about this um, scale.domain is if you pass it a value it acts as a setter meaning it sets the value of the domain. But if you don't pass it any value like this, it acts as a getter and it returns the, the value that you set previously. I just use prettier there to format. And so if we look at the result, we can see an array of two values and check it out. It goes between one and 6.9. So d3.min and d3.max are great and all, but there's actually a function that does both of them for you at the same time, which is called extent. So instead of this, we can use d3.extent. Oops. And d3.extent actually returns an array with two elements. So when this runs, we can see that it's actually the same, the same end result. And as a last piece of cleanup, instead of using d3 dot extent, I'm going to destructure extent from d3 up here. Okay. So now we've got the domain of our X scale figured out. It's the minimum and maximum value for that column in the data. Now we need to figure out what should be the range for our X scale. We can set the range in much the same way that we set the domain with a function called dot range. And by the way, note how it's calling dot range on the return value from dot domain. And the thing is uh, with this with the D3 API, it's using um, this technique called method chaining. And what this does is um, if you use, for example, domain as a setter like this, it returns the instance of the scale, which is the same thing as X. So we could potentially say, OK, X is a scale linear. And then x dot domain is this, x dot range is this other thing. And this all would work, but since it's developed uh, with this method chaining API, we can use this shorthand. And this works as well. So let's figure out what should the range be. Well, the range. It's going to be an array of two numbers. And I think to start, let's just make it go between zero and width to fill up the screen. And we can see what that is by saying x.range like this. And it's array of you know, zero to 960. That seems right. OK, that's our x scale. It's finished. Now let's do the same for y. I'm just going to copy all that, change x to y. And then we want the range to go from 0 to height. But not actually, because the y coordinate is flipped in SVG. So, so 0 is at the top, not the bottom. But we want the lowest data value to be at the bottom of the screen. So we actually need to flip this. 
the range will go from height to zero. Now we can do our data processing. I'm going to create this thing called marks and it's going to be data.map where we invoke a function for each and every row of our data set and we can return an object. And this object can have on it the properties of X and Y. So X will be X, meaning this X scale, of the value from the domain. And by the way, these linear scales are functions and you can pass in a value from the domain. And so the value from the domain will be, you know, d dot, um, what is it? Petal length. Whoops. However, um, since I don't want to hard code these values in here and we already have this accessor function, we can just say x value of d. That way it's nice and generic. And the same thing for y. Just replace x with y. And there we go. Now let's console.log marks to see what we ended up with. Oh, I've got two console.logs here, which is confusing. Let me get rid of the other one. I'll get rid of this console.log data. So now we're just going to see the marks. And we have objects that have x and y in pixel coordinates. All right, fantastic. This is great. Now we're ready to move on to the rendering step. And, and because we did the data processing separately, the rendering step is a very straightforward thing where you just map x and y from these objects directly onto cx and cy of the circles. Pixels, pixels for me, I have the, the impression that should be in integer uh, numbers, not floating numbers. Why is that? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Pixels being integers versus uh, floating point numbers with decimals. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, SVG, because it is scalable vector graphics, when you're looking at it on the screen, um, let's say you're looking at it on a high DPI display, like a retina display on a really expensive like MacBook. And, um, and you set a pixel value as like 100.5. On a high DPI display that has double or quadruple rather the pixel density as a regular display, that incrementing of the pixel coordinate by 0.5 will actually increment it by one physical pixel. And SVG, within SVG you could do transforms and even with CSS you can do transforms of scaling. And so SVG actually does accept pixel coordinates as floating point numbers. They don't need to be integers. And by the way, interestingly, this is different with Canvas, HTML5 Canvas, which is a raster based system. If you draw a line in Canvas and you give it a floating point number, I th I, I'll have to double check, but I think it like takes the floor of the number. So you can actually only get down to a single pixel in the canvas, which is a raster image because it's made up of pixels. However, in SVG, it's more um, detailed than that. So somewhat surprisingly, you can actually use uh, fractional values for pixels and also for things like line width. If you set the line width to 0.5, it, it makes it like slightly lighter when it gets anti-aliased onto the display. Uh, but again, if you were to view it on a, a high DPI display, it would actually be one physical pixel as opposed to like two physical pixels. Because it, it depends on the, what's it called, the device 
device pixel ratio or something like that. But yeah, long story short, SVG accepts floating points as um, values for pixels. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, I remember it blew my mind when I learned that, actually. Um, and it makes sense in a way because let's say you print an SVG. When you print something, it's like three, what, 300 DPI. So you can actually get to sub-pixel uh, precision when you print it or when you view it as a high-res display. Um, Karen, yeah. when it comes to choosing a scale, um, does that depend on what kind of um, what kind of metric we're dealing with? Uh, so we are, we've chosen a linear scale in this case, uh, and does that is that because it it's there's something about the original metrics um, uh, that that makes uh, linear scale appropriate? Yes, it does. And um, I will be getting into this in the future. But yeah, long story short, linear scales is just one type of scale. It's a particular type of um, continuous scale. And these continuous scales include other ones like a power scale, uh, which includes a square root scale, a log scale, a time scale, a radial scale. So all of these continuous scales are meant to deal with numbers as input. So anytime you have a column of data that just has numbers in it, you can use this type of scale. However, there are other types of scales that make sense to use for other types of values. Um, time scales, for example, work with dates. And it, it it's categorized as a continuous scale because it it acts like scale linear, but for dates, it treats a date as a point in time. And also, there are ordinal scales. So in our data value for the iris stuff, we have one column, which is species, right? And it has three distinct values that are strings, that are not numbers. And so when you have strings in your data, you can use ordinal scales either an ordinal scale directly, which is essentially a dictionary that maps an input value to an output value. But within this space of ordinal scales, you have band scales and point scales. A band scale maps these dis discrete input values to discrete output values that are arranged as bands on the screen. So this is useful for bar charts, for example. And then you have um, point scales point scales can be used to represent um, data that has discrete input values like different strings but then project that onto a space so if you wanted to have a scatter plot where, for example, y is the species, you could use scale point to map species to a y value. But since we're just dealing with numbers, mapping numbers to the screen, that's why we're using uh, linear scale. And we will start to use all these different scales in the future for all the various um, visualization techniques. Yeah, thanks. That makes, that makes uh, sense. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, let's get these circles to show up and make a, a basic scatter plot. I'm going to bring back this rendering logic that we started on earlier. By uncommenting it. And I'm going to change it to work with marks instead of the original data. Now, if we want to set the CX attribute, we can just give it a function that takes as input one entry in the marks array, and it can return d.x. And the same thing for y. CY, which is the center y coordinate of the circle, can return 
d dot y. And let's see if it worked. The Q of our sites. Sorry? The R. Uh, missing the R. Yeah, good call. Good call. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. If you don't give it R, if you don't give a circle a radius, it doesn't have a radius and it doesn't show up. So let's say 5. All right, there we go. Boom. Got a basic scatter plot. Okay, so how do we add axes to a scatter plot? First of all, we need to make room for the axes using a margin. And in the D3 world, there's this this thing called the margin convention. Actually, let me just show that one because it's it's really good. If you just Google D3 margin convention, Mike Bostock, the author of D3, has this piece in Observable, which is the D3 margin convention. The idea behind this is to make room for axes on the left and on the bottom, or on the top and the right, wherever you want to put them. But the whole idea is we define this margin object that has top, right, bottom, and left, and our code will sort of use that margin to, to know where to put things on the screen. So it impacts how we compute the range of our scales. Instead of going from zero to width, for example, we would want to go from margin.left to width minus margin.right. And that's what this example does here. Back in our code, let's define a margin. Margin is going to be an object that has top, I'll just set them all to 20 for now, can change it later. Right is 20, bottom is 20, and left is 20. And by the way, this is an actual convention to, to go from top, right, bottom, left, because it's clockwise around the screen. And I think that's how CSS, sometimes in CSS you can, you can like specify things as a big string. And um, it goes from top, right, bottom, and left like that. So that's why I chose that ordering. But anyway, now that we have this margin, we can tweak our scales. Instead of going from zero to width for our x scale, we can make it go from margin.left to width minus margin.right. And now we can see that there is actually a margin being applied. Um, let's do the same for our y scale. Instead of going from height to zero, it's going to go from height minus margin dot bottom to margin dot top. Like that. And everything else just sort of works. Everything else flows from the scales. So it just works. We can verify that it's working by testing each one of these one by one. Like, what if we set the top to 200? See that? It works. We have a, a big gap on the top. What if we set right to 200? It works. We have a big gap on the right. How about bottom? Yep. Got a gap on the bottom and left. Yes, have a gap on the left. 
That's how you can implement the margin convention. Now that we have space for axes, let's add some axes. When we destructure stuff out of D3, let's also pull out axis left and axis bottom. And the way that we can use those is on our SVG, we can append a group element for each of our axes. So this is going to be, um, well, let's do the y-axis first. svg.appendg.call. And this is where we can construct a new axis, axis left. And when we construct this axis, we can pass in the scale, namely uh, y like that. And uh, we're not seeing anything because it's sort of off to the side of the screen. What we need to do is move this group element to the right a little bit. Um, actually, we need to move it to the right by margin.left. We can do that by saying dot attr and we can set the transform to be translate and this is an ES6 string template literal. We want to translate by margin dot left in the y direction in, in the x direction and zero in the y direction. And now it shows up, see? You get some tick marks. Uh, the numbers seem to be cut off though, so let me just tweak the margin. I'm going to tweak the left margin to be, let's say, 50. And now we can see this axis shows up. All right, that's how you can add an axis with D3. Maybe let's do the same for the y-axis. Or <laughs> let's do the same for the x-axis now. I'm just going to copy this code and modify it to be for the x-axis which I would like to put at the bottom so we can call axis bottom and pass an X like this. But the transform is not quite right anymore. See we've got all these uh, numbers at the top. We want these to be at the bottom. So what we need to do is translate by 0 in the X direction but in the y direction, we want to translate it to be all the way down at the bottom. And so that's going to be height minus margin dot bottom. Yep. And that works. All right, very good. That's how we can add x and y axes to our scatter plot. One last little tweak I would like, like to, uh, yeah, question. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure. How, how do you ensure that the, um, uh, the mark in the, in the axis is exactly matching the, the value of the data? Because since you can transpose the axis, you could be ending the number in a different place. I don't know if I made myself clear. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, the shorter the short answer is because they're derived from the same scale. But yeah, if you if you wanted to, you know, 
you could translate it by, let's say, like 50 pixels in the x direction and make it misaligned. Like now it's not lined up. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that, um, it is perfectly aligned just because of how um, the scales are set up. So because the axis takes as input the x scale, the axis actually uses the range of the scale to position itself. And since it's the same scale that drives the x and y of the circles, it, it ends up aligning perfectly. Yeah, and we're translating it by... Notice how we're not translating the x-axis in the x-direction at all. We're just translating the x-axis in the y-direction to put it at the bottom. And so all... Yeah, so mm -hmm. all the X positioning is just strictly coming from the X scale. Okay. Okay. Nice. That's nice. And, and same with Y, by the way. We're translating Y in the X direction just to align it with the X scale. So we're all of the Y positioning is just strictly from the Y scale here. So that's why, that's why they all align correctly. And you can sort of see that they align because this, the... The lowest x value, which is the circle here, it, the center of the circle is exactly on that line of the axis. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, we can check the value for each circle by putting title on it, and we will see it matches with the axis. Oh, we totally could. Yeah, that's fairly easy to do. Let's just do it. That's a great idea. So there's this thing called title. Um, you know what? That might be a little more complicated. because we'd need to tap into the enter selection. Yeah, I don't know. That seems a little bit out of scope for today. Yeah, we need to we need to change this code around to access the enter selection. So, I don't know. I don't really Yeah, but it's no problem. Um, my question is uh, was wondering if we could mess it up but uh, as you said, we, we never transform in the axis that uh, we are actually uh, moving. That, exactly. That made sense completely. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, great, great. But but yes, we could potentially add tooltips that will show the numbers, um, which which we could then verify. That could conceivably work, but I don't think I'd like to do that right now because I want to keep this example um, nice and simple. I have a question. Um, if, if we want to do the, the axes to begin from zero, uh, what would we need to do? Oh, yeah, sure. If you wanted the axes to begin at zero, you could just use, um, instead of using extent, you could use max d3.max and as the first value you could explicitly just pass in zero like this. Now the right. x-axis starts at zero. Very cool. Very yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, that makes total sense. Nice. Yeah, my pleasure. And I love how, you know, d3 is, is designed in such a way where you, it's like you can fit things together like Lego blocks, you know? So it's you can just plug in whatever you want to for the domain, but it provides utilities like this max and extent for the most common use cases, which is, de you know, deriving the domain from your data. And for a bar chart, for for a scatter plot, it makes sense to use extent. But for other visualization types, um, like a bar chart, it always makes sense to start at zero, 
so you know if once we make bar charts we'll always start the domain at zero and then use d3.max and same thing if you're assigning areas to circles like the size of a circle based on some numbers i mean we'll get there in the future but i'm saying like there are very concrete use cases where it makes sense to start the domain at zero and then go from zero to the max of the data and that's how you would do it So yeah, I think we're pretty much done here. I kind of want to just, um, you know, give this a once over. Oh, one thing I wanted to do was make the ticks, the tick marks bigger because, um, in my opinion, the default size is pretty, pretty small. And I want to give a, 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 just a, a flavor of how you might customize some of the stuff on the axes, which is a, a rabbit hole. There's a lot of different things you could do there. But the simplest thing you can do is just um, use CSS to say for all text elements, which includes the tick marks, we can set the font size to be, I don't know, 24 pixels. And that works. It's, it's bigger. But as a best practice, I like to scope the changes because if there's, you know, if there's other text, this will apply to all the text, which may be what you want. But with D3 axes in the DOM, there is actually a structure that we can leverage, namely that each tick mark is, is composed of a group element that has a class of tick. And then within that group element, there's a line element and there's a text element. So we can select the text elements inside of the ticks by leveraging the fact that this group element has a class of tick by saying dot tick space text. What this, what this does is it constructs a selector, a CSS selector that selects the tick elements and then the space signifies okay within within that look for children of that element that are of t of the type text so this is how you can set the font size of the tick elements and uh, the labels are getting cut off so i'm just going to tweak the margin again i tweak the bottom margin to be let's say 50 or maybe 40. Yeah, and um, at this juncture, I think the code is, is done in a sense. But now, um, just to close this out, I want to look through this code from the perspective of someone who wants to fork and modify this. Because that's what the assignment is, to fork this and modify it to show some other data set. And so, you know, in, in this direction, what I want to look for is, are all of the tweakable things in one place and all the generic stuff in some other place? That's what I would aim for uh, if, if the goal is to create a reusable template. So let's just look through. And I'm going to make a, a comment here called tweakables. And all this stuff should be data set specific. So we got the CSV URL, very much data set specific. We got parse row, very much data set specific. X value and Y value, very much tweakable. And actually at this point, let me just show you how easy it is to change the meaning of, of one of these um, X or Y. Instead of sepal length, we can change it to sepal width and boom, our scatter plot updates just like that and so when you load in another data set part of the process is just going to be trying out different values for the columns and see and see what pops out the margin very tweakable something you'd want to probably tweak a lot and 
the width and the height, yeah, this part is sort of something you might want to tweak. Like if you have some downstream code that where you want to position the SVG inside something else. So sure, it's tweakable. Now, this part is generic. So I'm going to go through this and see, is there anything that's um, specific to this data set in this code or not? Um, so far, it looks pretty generic. You know, this co this same exact code could run on any data set. Oh, there's one thing that's tweakable, the radius. So I'll pull that out into a tweakable variable. I'll put it along with um, x value, y value, and margin. Radius is 5. Yeah, that's an arbitrary thing that uh, you might want to tweak. But um, I think that's about it. That's all I see. So that's how that's how you can polish up a uh, a forkable data viz template. All right, uh, great. I feel like uh, we've set out the original goal to have something that's just vanilla HTML, JavaScript. It doesn't use any bundler or anything. It approximates the feel of ES6 modules by destructuring the stuff out of the D3 global, but it's it's totally vanilla. So anyone could, you know, export this and use it. All right. I think that's it. Any um, any questions or things you want to discuss? Um, I have a question about the call function you used for access. Hmm. Uh, you can explain it if you want. Sure. Let me just plug in my laptop. There's the b battery's running out. <laughs> Yeah, the question is about dot .call. Um, I guess you could phrase the question as like, what is that? What is it really doing? And it's, it's really just a shorthand for invoking functions. And there's a way that you could do this without using dot .call. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, let's let's look at for for axis left. We could potentially pull that out like this into a variable, and then pull out this group element as another variable. So now we have. I'll get rid of that dot call. Now we have the axis as a standalone thing and the group element as a standalone thing. And we want to sort of inject that axis into that DOM element. And one way we could do it is y axis g dot call y axis, which is the same as it was before, but now things are split into variables. The other way to do it is like this y axis y axis g. Like that. And it still works. So what's going on here is when you invoke dot call on a selection, it expects that you pass in a function and it will invoke that function passing in the selection on which you invoked .call. So it's exactly the same as this. y-axis is actually a function that expects to be called with 
a D3 selection of a group element as the input. So these two are exactly the same behavior-wise. Um, dot call is just it's just sort of a shorthand, a convention. It's convenient because you can chain stuff onto it. You could say dot call that dot you know select um, you know domain path or something and remove it just as an example use case where you might want to use dot call and see that removes the domain line that path that, which is that vertical thing and often I find myself wanting to remove <laughs> the domain path because it's like I don't see much value that it provides But anyway, yeah, I hope that answers your question. These two are equivalent. Dot call just invokes a function and passes the selection. Yeah. But I think I'll put it back to the way it was. It's kind of confusing, but will work yeah yeah there's always a trade-off there's always a trade-off between writing concise code that might be a little cryptic versus verbose code that's like twice as long but it's easier to read yeah it's gonna try to strike a balance so it's the first argument to the uh, yes, the first argument of the first argument, in a way. Yeah, maybe I should just keep all that around as a reference. Yeah, just commenting will be nice. So the, you know, it's like the argument of axis left function is the selection SVG selection. Is that right? Yeah, the argument that y-axis expects is a group element. Well, rather, is a D3 selection of a group element that's empty. And the y-axis function is going to be like, okay, you give me an empty group element, I'm going to put an axis into it. And if there's an axis already there, I'm going to, I'm going to you know, update it to be, to be accurate. And it has to be group element. It expects a group element. Yeah, I mean, you could conceivably pass in like the top level SVG element, but yeah, it expects a group element. But yeah, it's a good question. Could you could you pass in something else? I don't know. Um, I've only ever seen it used with a group element. Oh, I I broke it. There we go. So so yeah, I mean it's it's good to study this because um, it is a lot of stuff sort of wrapped into one. So what it does here is says, okay, I'm constructing an instance of an axis, and I'm passing in the y scale. So the return value from this constructor is a function that we could call y-axis if we wanted to, that expects as input a, a D3 selection of a group element as its argument when it gets invoked. And that's exactly what gets passed in when you when you use dot call. And the dot call is is called on this group element that's been transformed. But um, yeah, yeah, that's how it all works. It does take some time to, to wrap your head around it. Um, but oh, in time, I've come to prefer like this, this sort of construct, rather than uh, making a bunch of variables. But again, it's just just personal preference. Either way works.
you know, another thing, <laughs> another, while we're at it, another way that you could potentially do this, which might be even more confusing, is that you can construct the axis and then pass in this selection here. That works as well. Uh, I don't understand this. To me, it seems like uh, could be because I'm more used to Python, but it seems that you're passing like uh, the SVG thing, like an uh, argument to the function that is left. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's not clear. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So when you call axis left from D3, you give it the scale it returns an instance of a d3 axis but that instance of d3 axis is in fact a function that expects to be invoked with a single argument namely a d3 selection of a group element and so this statement here returns a function and that's why we can invoke that function like this. So this part here, we are invoking that function that gets returned from the axis left constructor and we're passing in a D3 selection of this group element because as soon as we call svg.appendg it creates a brand new D3 selection of a brand new DOM element which is a group element and then it calls dot attr on that group element and because it uses this uh, method chaining api the return value from dot attr is the same as the return value from dot append g it's a d3 selection of the group element and so this whole expression here yields you know it returns a d3 selection of this group element and that's what gets passed into this uh, axis left function Okay, when when you inspect the, the inspect the element, uh, the result is exactly the same, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, all of these different um, all of these different ways of of invoking the axis result in the exact same behavior. They're just different ways of formulating it. But yeah, when you when you I mean, when you see it visually, it's the same, and when, yeah, when you inspect the DOM, it's going to be exactly the same. And from the perspective of the DOM, this thing here is the parent group element that we created uh, with this code here, svg.appendg, set the transform to be translate. This is that group element here, and then when we pass that into the D3 axis, the axis implementation adds all this stuff as children to it. So there's a path, which is the domain line, and then there's um, group elements for each and every tick. And within each tick you have a line and a text element. So yeah, no, no matter how you invoke it, it ends up to be the exact same DOM structure. Yeah. It's quite confusing. Yeah. It looks like you can pass axis function in the SVG selection and vice versa. Well, you can. That's exactly what dot call does. It sort of inverts everything. You know, I think probably the clearest one to read is this variant here. where we don't even use dot call, we construct a variable called y-axis, which is that return value from axis left, and then we construct a group element by appending a group element. This is a D3 selection of a group element. And you can see the relationship very clearly right here. y-axis is a function that expects as input 
a D3 selection of an empty group element. And this is, this is, um, I guess shows the border between them very clearly. But yeah, I, I get it that it's totally confusing that you can invert the order of those <laughs> in the code with dot call. Yeah, it takes a while to wrap your head around. Okay, let, let me ask you one thing. It's not quite related. I, I think I got my, my head around this. Uh, it's regarding the, the arrow function. Hmm. Uh, I don't need to use uh, the return ever in the arrow function. It's always the last line that's returning. Um, it, right, there is only one line, so it doesn't make sense, my question. But if I have um, an, an object and it has more than one line, um, do I have to use return or not? That's uh, a good question. Function, yeah. Yeah. Um, let me show a variant of this one. So with the arrow function, if it immediately goes to an expression, that could be an object, literal, could be a string, could be a number, it it sort of activates this thing called implicit return. It, it's, it implicitly adds or execute, it implicitly executes a return statement or the equivalent of a return statement. Um, and that's sort of one of the magical features of these arrow functions. However, if you start the arrow function with a curly brace like this, then it opens up into a function body where you need to explicitly return. So you, you could like, you know, run some code, blah, blah, blah. But then at the end of it, if you just define an object like this, it's not going to be returned. You need to explicitly return it like this. And so this function here is exactly equivalent to this function here, but the one on the top uses that syntactic sugar of the implicit return that comes with arrow functions. And that's, by the way, why it needs to be wrapped in these parentheses, because the parentheses signify, okay, we are defining a literal object. And and that's why it gets returned. If you leave out these parentheses, uh, it's not valid JavaScript and it breaks. So like if, if we try to run that, it's gonna say, oop, it's, it's not valid. It's unexpected token. Because when the parser goes in, it, it, it interprets it, okay, like we're starting a function body now, and then this is like garbage, doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, that's why you need those uh, parentheses. Okay, I, I got this error a lot, so it's good to know that <laughs> this could be a reason. Nice. Uh, the unexpected two columns. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's one of the most common errors you get, a syntax error, then you need to track it down, figure out where it is. Um, and by the way, you know, a lot of folks who have been maybe programming in JavaScript years ago, you're used to this other syntax where it's like a function like this. And this is like, I like to call it the old school function notation. This works too, but the arrow function syntax is just it's a lot more concise and um, that's what folks would use probably nowadays. All right, very good. 
a lot of fun. Uh, we've explored some ins and outs of um, of the details here, and we've ended up with this forkable template. Oops, hold on. So I'd like to wrap up and leave you all with an exercise. The exercise for this week is fork the scatter plot that we made, and I'll share the link, and change it around to visualize a different data set. And I've provided this link here to uh, this data repository that I have where I've just been accumulating over the years um, various public data sets of interest. And you don't have to necessarily derive any data from here. You could just find, you know, do a search for data that's interesting to you and plug it in to this scatter plot. And I've got this other video on YouTube called um, Preparing Data for Visualization. And this walks through how you can create a gist and put a CSV file in there. And then once that's there, you can follow the same steps that I did today to pull it into your code and visualize it. And this is all there um, in the VizHub forum. So please submit your, um, your work here. Looking forward to it. OK. Thank you. All right. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining today. It's a pleasure, as always. Today, I'd like to talk about reusable charts. This has been a fascination of mine for years, because every time you figure out how to make a certain visualization, um, it becomes sort of a, a telescope that you could point in different directions, right, at different data sets. Um, and encapsulating the reusable elements has always been somewhat of a challenge. Hey, Felipe, how are you? Hey, I'm fine. Thank you. What about you? Good. Good, good. We got a full house today. We got Sriram, Nita, Adil, and Felipe. This is amazing. Very cool. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about reusable charts. And what I'm going to do today, the idea, is to take what we did last time, uh, refactor it a little bit, start to use ES6 modules, and then adopt this um, reusable charts pattern, which is sort of the, the module pattern that uh, is, is commonly found with pure D3 implementations. But first, let me review um, the submissions from last week. Yeah, we got some really good stuff this week. Uh, here's Felipe's work. Title to the dot. Um, nice. So there's little tool tips that you get when you hover. Um, you want to talk about this a little bit? Well, that's that's not much about this. It's just uh, the title. I didn't uh, knew how to use the invert function, so I add px and py in the marks. Uh, but what px and py is doing, it's pretty much uh, the invert function. If you can uh, scroll a little bit up, the code, yeah. There, there you go. Right. Uh, nice. Uh, but uh, maybe there is some kind of invert function that I could use in the text. I, I think Andrea, I guess, it's, uh, talk about this in one of the posts. Right. But this is just, just to have the, uh, a title. And I, I got this from your cheat. Uh, oh yeah, tips. cheap tricks yeah. for interaction. Cheap tricks, yeah. Nice. Let me just provide a little bit of feedback on this. So this step here, creating marks as a derivative, you know, array of data, 
this is where all of the transformation can happen that you need in the visualization, including logic like putting together strings. See, doing it this way, it actually puts a bunch of intelligence into the rendering logic, meaning this, this string of the tooltip is derived in the rendering logic rather than in the pre-processing step. So here's um, one thing that you could do is just move this logic out of here and use something like d.title instead. And then you could just say the title of each mark is, and then you can get rid of these intermediate values, px and py. So it's a, it's a very small change, but this is more in the spirit of like but de de decoupling. But uh, then uh, here, do, do I have to put d dot x value? Yeah, OK. No, yeah, yeah, good catch. Yeah, I just overlooked that. Yep, because x value and d is visible here. So this should still be working. Yep, it's still there. Nice. But yeah, great work. Great work adding that. That's something that we had talked about during the last, uh, you know, last week's session, and I never added it. But I'm great. I'm happy to see that uh, it was added here. Yes, this was just after the, the class, the last class. And then my my exercise, it's, it's in the end of the posts. It's nice. not this one. Okay. It's a little tricky though, because just to just so you realize, um, whenever this runs, it's going to append another title every time. That's not a problem here because it only runs once, but just something to be aware of. Um, and yeah, in the future, we'll dig into the patterns that you need to to make it work properly. But yeah, nice work, very nice. Let's see. Oh, this one's beautiful. This is awesome. This is, um, well, let's read what it says. Daily new cases of COVID in Italy from uh, Andrea. This is awesome, awesome. Nice, yes, x-axis uses scale time. Excellent. And there's some interactivity here. Let's check it out. Toggle path, whoa. It turns the path on and off. That's super nice. Oh my gosh. Beautiful. Let's take a look at the code real quick. I see that there's different sizes in use as well. Ah, so when the when the path is toggled, it just changes the display attribute on the path. Brilliant. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, so it parses the date. Oh, a pretty generic way of parsing the numbers. And let's check out the rendering. R, nice. So the radius here changes along with X and Y. Beautiful way of doing it. Um, but I have to say that uh, with radius, here, let me just fork this and suggest a tweak. With radius, um, it's it's a good practice to have it so that the, the area of the circle corresponds with the data values. So one filled in pixel would correspond with one, you know, um, unit of, of the data. And this method here doesn't accomplish that because it uses a linear scale. But the area is a function of the square root. So we can change this to scale square root, SQRT, which we can also get from D3. like that. And then it really, the range really should start at zero. 
and the domain really should go from 0 to the max of the data. And yeah, max, we need to import from D3. So yeah, now, now that the domain starts at zero and the range starts at zero and we're using a square root scale, now the area of the circles is actually proportionate to the value. You see, as it goes down, it gets down to nothing, which is what you'd expect. And the higher values are, are you know, bigger circles. And I think, well, actually, what is the what is the radius value? Terapia intensiva. Nice. Yeah, I don't know what it means. But this is beautiful work. Beautiful work. Let's see what else we've got. It means intensive treatment. Ah. Intensive treatment. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. So the number of cases yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, pattern here. I'm not quite sure how to what to make of it. But as the case numbers were going up, it was not that number was not that high, but later on that number was higher. Oh, someone's joining. Hello. All right, we got someone new. Hello. Uh, how do you say, Max Maximiliano? You want to introduce yourself a little bit? Um, hello, Kuran. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Yes, I'm, I'm Max. You can call me Max, it's okay. Um, I'm from Chile and interest, I haven't been able to to see the course uh, like it's online the same day, so yeah. I, I managed to do it today. So Got it's it. great to be here. Nice, welcome. Welcome, I'm glad you could join us. So yeah, we got a full house Thank today. You. Bunch of people, Sri Ram, Adil, Anita, and Felipe is here. So, um, yeah, as I dig in, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions to clarify as we go. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. So, yeah, this week, there was just a lot of activity in this forum, like a lot of back and forth, and I'm, I'm really happy to see that. Uh, oh, here's, here's something that Adil made. Dinosaur D3 Scatterplot. Wow, Adil, you want to just talk briefly about this one? Uh, sure. Yeah, this was um, based on a, a data set from the Natural History Museum in London. Um, uh, they have about 300 plus dinosaurs in that data set. And um, I uh, just wanted to try uh, playing with it a bit using this. And uh, so I th uh, thought, try plotting the length of the dinosaur uh, on the x on the x-axis with the weight of the uh, dinosaur on the y-axis and um, I then also stole uh, uh, the tip from Felipe and yourself about implementing these little uh, tool tips um, and uh, yeah so it was just really uh, just just uh, getting familiar with the data set and um, um, it's a bit, it's a bit patchy the the data so i had to do a bit of extra processing because not all of the dinosaurs had a weight um and um so uh, uh from 300 plus dinosaurs i could only get 
uh, about 49, I think, um, which had both length and weight. And then I, uh, yeah, just just uh, just try to create a label um, early on that combined uh, uh, some interesting uh, bits about each dinosaur. Nice. That's beautiful. Beautiful stuff. The, uh, the the one in the corner I thought might might have been a typo, uh, the far corner, but it turns out it's actually a, um, the biggest land animal that's ever been discovered. Wow, uh, that's incredible. <laughs> 70,000 kilograms. Argentinosaurus, 35 meters, 70,000 kilograms. you got to be kidding me. Yeah, I looked on Wikipedia. Apparently, seventy thousand was kind of average for that dinosaur. Yeah, not that. <laughs> it's just sort of average. Wow. Um, one really small thing that I would suggest. Um, so when you have numbers like seventy thousand, I don't think we've touched upon number formatters, but it's a really quick change that I would like to just do right now, just to show how it could be done. So the idea is to, oh, it looks like you used it here. Um, oh, oh, I think that was already built into your fork, I think. I see. Oh, maybe the axis does it automatically. Format. Hmm. But if you, so one, the, like the first thing I noticed was in the tooltip, 70,000 kg um, ideally would have a comma after the 70 and we can add it pretty easily by importing format from D3 and then making something called uh, I'll call it comma format and we could just call format with a comma and format accepts this you know very specific string that you can do all sorts of things with but a very simple version of it is just to specify to, to add a comma separator and then in your code that generates the label we can just pass that through that function like so so whatever the, the y value is we format it with a comma and voila there it is 70 comma thousand that's very nice. Oh, that's that's really nice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Nice. Great work. Very fascinating data set. And I think that's it. Koha, if if you can just go a little bit up, uh, previous to this one. Yeah, this one. Um, oh yeah. Sorry, I, I skipped. You, you skipped. Yeah, just just it's a little bit different. Uh, it's it's Whoa. the same data set, but I use colors. Oh wow! The name of the the class. <laughs> but um, my goal here was to have all the information that we had in the data set uh, of the flowers uh, here. So I put also the um, a few mouse over. The color means the the specimen. Yep. Right, the species. Very nice. The species, yep. And uh, uh, the elliptical radius is the sepal. But uh, that's my question, because if I change the uh, the order of the data, uh, the petal and the sepal, uh, the radius becomes very small, so it almost vanished. So. Uh, how can I uh, like normalize the radius? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, let me dig in a little bit. It it depends on how you use the scales, like which scales you use for the radius. So. Oh, you had a question. How can I easily change shapes according to the data? Um, yeah, this this question's like because I didn't want to use ellipse in the beginning. Right. I thought, okay, I can use different uh, marks, 
But then I said, okay, I don't know how to do this. So I will just use Ellipsy and then I can use the, the radio different, radios different. Right, right. I mean, it's, um, you, it's, it's creative to use an ellipse that has, you know, a different width and height for the different values here, but it may be a bit hard to read. And so, you know, maybe, maybe the best we could do is just show three variables. Uh, I mean, color is, color, color is a great choice for the species because it represents a, you know, a column that has three distinct values, uh, quanti uh, yeah, qu qualitative, uh, categorical attribute. But when it comes to the radius, um, I would say, again, it might make sense to use circles and then set the radius using a square root scale. So I'm going to set R to be R of R value of D is the way I would set it up. And then R again could be a square root scale and then the domain can go from 0 to the max of R value and then the range would go from 0 to max radius and I think there's a lot of things that we don't have defined I can pull in this and this from D3. And then R value. Okay, you've got Rx value and Ry value. It may be sort of too tricky to show both of those at the same time. And so we can just pick one of these. And, oh, let's use this as a max radius. And I'll set it to be, I don't know, 15. That should work. Maybe I missed something. Oh yeah, data. The max over the data of the R value. Yeah, and so because the the data values are like they're they they do not even get close to zero. They're in centimeters. And so it works pretty well with um, with a square root scale to set the radius like this. And we can set the max radius to maybe 10 so we don't get so much overlap. But now, radius is showing the, the variability in sepal length. And it doesn't, it doesn't vary that much, actually. But yeah, this is how I would suggest to do it is to use a square root scale where the domain yep. range both start at zero yeah I, I see but um, if I if I have a, a kind of data that I won't like uh, make a normalization of of the range of the data how, how can I do it I don't how know. do you mean well, I'm not sure what you mean um, I mean imagine that I have uh, a range of data, but I want to restrict it from zero to one and uh, have the average. Hmm. Um, I'm not quite understanding. So let's take, for example, this data set. Yeah, uh, if you if you see like a petal width, it yeah. it has 0.2. If I if I use this, it's too small. So I want to make it from a range from, let's say, one to two, uh, the, the size of the, the radius. Then it would be a, a linear scale, right? Yeah. I mean, you could do that. 
that's totally, you know, something doable. So I'm just going to comment out this one and put this other one back where, like you said, we, we could make it so that the lowest value corresponds with some like min radius and the max value corresponds with some max radius and we could define min radius to be like I don't know 5 and this would work it would make it so that you have like it would make it so that it's guaranteed that the smallest circle has a radius of 5 and the biggest circle has a radius of max radius, which is 10. So this is how you would do that. I think this is what you were asking about. Yes, yes, that's, that's right. For, for this case, it doesn't make sense, but it's just something that I was thinking about. Yeah, I mean, technically it's possible. And, and you could use a, sca a linear scale and do it like this. However, the main problem with doing it this way is that the area of the circle does not correspond to the data values, which could be problematic. Um, it, it, it's, it's not easy to read this in a sense. I see. That it's not, it's not like, um, I don't know what the word, what the best word is like, like it's, it's almost like not really honest. Misleading. Yes. Misleading. Misleading. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It can be misleading, uh, because you know, you could pick a, a main radius of one and it would make some of the dots really tiny, but it would, you know, it's, it doesn't really express the true uh, like variability within that particular value of the data. And so, you know, this is an area of debate within the community of people who make visualizations. Some people are very lax on how they use radius. And so, you know, it could be a linear scale, it could be a square root scale, it could be a log scale, you know, whatever it takes to make a pretty picture. But I, I, my sort of philosophy is on the opposite end of the spectrum, where like I firmly believe that if you use size to encode some value from the data, then you should make it so that the area of the circle corresponds exactly with the values from the data. So if the value in the data is zero, it should be a zero size circle that you can't even see, you know? And, uh, but that's sort of an edge case. I've seen people use one as the min value so that you could at least see something on the screen. But um, besides that, you know, I, I would pretty, pretty firmly stick to that philosophy that if you do use radius, then the best thing to do is to use a square root scale because the area of a circle varies with the square root of the radius. Um, what's that? Uh, what's that, uh, that formula? Yeah, area is pi r squared. Right, so this is, this is why it makes sense to use a square root scale. And so the radius of a circle um, is calculated with respect to that same uh, formula. So that's why if you, if you want to make it so that the area of the circle corresponds with the values from the data, then you have to use a square root scale and make sure that the domain and the range both start at zero. And so the domain could go from zero to the max value. Oh, whoops, I'm editing Y, my mistake. Yeah, so it would be this version here 
of setting up the scale. Oh, whoops. That has to be defined above. Yeah, so it would be this version here. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't turn out the way you expect. Yeah, in this case, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything much. Right. Yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so this is, you know, part of the process of making data visualizations is just trying different things and seeing what works. Uh, you know, spreading the value across the screen from left to right between the min and the max, like, you know, the x-axis or the y-axis of a scatter plot, that's hugely effective at looking at, you know, things that fall in, in like a small range, but there's a lot of variability within that small range. Uh, but radius is not is not good for that sort of thing, you know, because the, these values, I mean, look, they value, they vary between like, I don't know, two and four or something. And so it's not really that great of a variation. So it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really pop out when you use radius, but it's worth a try for sure. All right, cool, cool. So um, yeah, great work, everybody. Very nice. All right, let's dig into this um, idea of a reusable chart. We will build a reusable chart based on the scatter plot we made last time. Uh, on the way, I'm going to refactor the code into modules. And then uh, the whole point of this reusable chart thing is to strictly decouple the specific and the generic meaning the stuff that's specific to the data set and the visualization that we're making, and then the generic stuff that, um, you know, implements reusable logic for a, a specific type of visualization. And we're going to use this tried and true pattern uh, from Mike Bostock in 2012, can you imagine? Towards reusable charts is what it's called. And... Um, I'm going to make it dynamically update. It's going to dynamically change X and Y. And I want to talk a little bit about why I'm doing this today um, from the structure of the course perspective. I, I want to go in this direction so that we have a very solid basis for starting on different visualization types. So rather than go wide in the beginning, like we only made one visualization type so far, a scatter plot. So rather than, you know, making a bar chart and a line chart from there, what I want to do is make a reusable chart version of the scatter plot and then use that as a basis for uh, future episodes where we branch out into all sorts of different visualization types. That way, um, by the end of the course, we'll have like a library of reusable chart components that are sort of usable off the shelf. And we'll be working within this, uh, this pattern, which is very useful um, to know. And it's one of the trickiest aspects of D3. So let's dig in. I'm going to start by forking this scatter plot that we made last time, and I'll call it a reusable D3 scatter plot. Right now, it's just um, this index.html single file sort of thing. Before we do anything, I want to change some stuff around so that it, it reflects like the structure of 
a, a JavaScript project that you might see. So I'll split out this the styles into a separate file. Oh, someone is joining. Hello. Hello, someone has joined us. Uh, Larry, how are you? You want to introduce? Hi, nice. You want to introduce yes. yourself a little bit? Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Larry Rancha. I'm from the Philippines. And nice. I work with uh, with the university as a faculty, and I also work as a, a developer for data visualization uh, for a company in Australia. So. Yeah, I've been using your resources nice. <laughs> since I started working with D3. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Well, I'm happy you could join. Um, I think this is the most people that have ever been on the, the live call. Um, <laughs> this is great. So we'll see how it goes. Um, all right. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is split out uh, the CSS into a different file, um, just because I personally prefer to have a bunch of small, well-defined files. That that way, you know, the complexity can scale over time. So I'll call it styles.css, and I'll take this CSS and move it into that file, and then get rid of that style tag, and then we can use a link tag, and I can never remember the syntax, so I'm just going to Google it. Um, yeah, the HTML link tag. There we go. Link rel equals style sheet, which is, I guess, the type of thing it is, and it points to styles.css. There we go. I'm also going to create a package.json and this is going to have inside of it um, dependencies d3 at a specific version which I'm going to find from unpackage. I'm just trying to figure out what's the latest version of d3. Okay, it's 6.7.0 so that's what I'll put there. That way, um, we can get rid of this script tag here. And then I'm going to put all of this JavaScript into a separate file called index.js. And the way that VizHub is set up, it automatically loads in that file, and it also automatically loads in our dependencies, which includes D3. This is how most modern-day uh, JavaScript build systems work. So like, it mirrors the experience of Webpack or Rollup locally. So now we're at sort of a, a comfortable starting point where we can start to refactor this stuff. At this point, I would like to introduce the concept of towards reusable charts. This is a great, great piece from Mike Bostock, the author of D3, from 2012. And it's one of those unique things that has actually stood the test of time. Um, so rather than trying to invent my own pattern, which I did for the 2018 version of this course, and rather than use a library that has components built in, like React does, which I used for last year's version of the course, this time I want to use the pure D3 way of making so-called uh, components. Once you make a component with this pattern, you can easily wrap it with whatever other framework you're using, like Vue or React or Angular or whatever. Um, but 
this is a way of making components that is just purely dependent on D3 and nothing else. So here's how it works. It's going to be a function. So as I go through, I'm going to implement these ideas. So I'll make a new file called scatterplot.js. This will be our scatterplot component. I'll start by saying export const scatterplot equals a function. And it's going to be used in much the same way as um, a D3 axis. This towards reusable charts pattern is actually used, or, or a variant of it, you know, is used within D3 itself, where you have a constructor for something, and then you have these chainable methods that you can add on to it. So let's keep reading in this towards reusable charts. One way of configuring the thing would be to pass arguments. But, um, you know, he, he, Mike Bostock here goes through the various ways of, of configuring something and the pros and cons of each. You know, it's cumbersome for the caller to remember, for example, the order of arguments. So maybe make it a, a config object. But that's also cumbersome for the caller because the calling code must then manage both the chart function and the configuration object over time. So rather than do it like that, we can use um, this method chaining pattern that looks something like this. You create the instance of the chart, and then you call, for example, dot .width, passing in the width. That, re that then returns the instance of the chart, and then you can call dot .height to set the height. And that state of width and height is stored inside of that instance of the chart. So let's work toward this in our code. Um, In this scatterplot component, we can have a thing that I'm going to call my, which is going to be the instance of the chart. And this name um, pays homage to the original article, which also uses my. So in this chart constructor, it returns a function called my. This is going to be a function. And this is what will be returned from this constructor. So let's create some of these um, accessors or getter setters. This here is a kind of verbose way of, of doing it, but let me just walk through what this means. My is a function. And in JavaScript, functions can have properties. So we can set my.width to be this function that accepts as input a value, which will be the new width, or not. And if it's, if it's invoked with no arguments, that's what this is checking here, arguments.length. So if there are no arguments, then the function acts as a getter. It returns the width, which is stored in this variable here, Otherwise, it sets width to be the passed in value. And crucially, it returns my. This, this returning of my is what enables method chaining to happen. And height is just the same pattern. But this is kind of verbose. And um, when I do this sort of thing, I like to look at the source code of D3 axis as a reference because um, it has much the same pattern to it, but the implementation is, is pretty, um, pretty concise. And this is part of D3 itself. So 
I think it's a good um, reference to use. It's a it's a much smaller way of implementing these getter setter functions. And since we'll have a bunch of these, I, I would prefer this one. The way it works is, you know, it, it uses underscore for the name of the thing that gets passed in. And it says, okay, return, if there is an argument, set the value of the thing internally, comma, axis. And axis, in our case, is going to be my. And this is a weird little JavaScript expression that you can do. You can actually have an expression that is just two things separated by a comma, and it implicitly returns the second thing. And so, in this case, axis gets returned to enable the method chaining. But if there if there's no argument, then it just returns uh, offset, this internal variable here. So I'm just going to copy this template and use it over here and adapt it to, to our code here. So instead of axis, it's going to be my. Instead of offset, I'm going to start with width and height, because width and height does need to be configured. So my.width equals a function where if a value is specified, it just sets that value to be width right here, and it returns my. Otherwise, it will just return width. But width is not defined in this scope yet, so I need to say let width like this. And we can't use const because we reassign to width here, so that's why this needs to be let. And this is the general pattern of these chainable getter setter functions. Now, I, I realize this might have been a lot. Um, are there any questions so far? Yeah, the the plus that came before the underscore um, was that to m ensure that it was a number because I think that worked, that this came up in the previous lesson. Exactly. Yep, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So in in D three axis, I think it was the offset which is expected to be a number, and so yeah, if you pass in a string like fifty you know, it, it gets to be that value, but if you if you preface it with this unary plus operator, it parses the string into a number. And so that um we, we actually could add it there. This is this is called um defensive programming, where you sort of expect the worst case. You know, you expect people might abuse the API and pass in a string where they're really supposed to pass in a number. So that's why the plus is there, is just to guarantee that before it gets to this variable inside, that it's the right type of thing. Um, so hey, why not? Let's, let's leave it there. It'll make our API more robust. So we could pass in a string if, you, you know, if we accidentally had a string as our width, and everything would work out just fine. Yeah. And the... Uh the my after the comma that that is I, I don't think i've seen that before um yeah yeah this one threw me for a loop the first time i saw it too let me unpack it a little bit yeah i'm glad you're asking because it's a lot to process so in javascript there is this um this construct that's not very widely used which is just parentheses and stuff separated by commas and when you execute that, it returns the last thing. Um, and those things in the middle could potentially have side effects. So let's say let x equals 0. We can have something like x equals 5, comma, foo, as a, a piece of JavaScript. And like, it's, yeah, it's cryptic, it's cr kind of weird. But to understand what it does, it just, you know, it just executes this and it returns the last thing. 
And so this is a miniature version of what's happening in the code here. Um, it says width equals this thing. And so now if we inspect the value of x, it, it, it's actually 5 because it was assigned here. And this, you know, <laughs> in all likelihood, this violates some kind of like, you know, if you were to use ESLint, this might not pass ESLint because it's too, it's cryptic. Um, but this is what Mike Bostock uses in D3Axis, so it's good enough for me. <laughs> That's sort of how I look at it. And I think these these parentheses inside may have been added by Prettier. If I run Prettier, it adds those parentheses, I guess just for clarity. Um, but yeah, that's what's going on here. If you just have parentheses with commas, um, it executes all of those things and it returns the last entry in the list. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and another another thing that may not be obvious is that we can't use the arrow function here because with um, with the arrow function arguments is not defined. Um, check this out. If we make an arrow function that just logs out arguments. Arguments is a, a special keyword in JavaScript. If we execute F, we get arguments is not defined. That's one of those little changes that was introduced with the fat arrow function. But instead, if we say F equals function, you know, the long form where we write out function, then we can access arguments and it gets undefined, but if we pass in like one, two, three as the arguments, that's what arguments resolves to is the is the arguments that you pass into the function. So um, we could, you know, instead check like is the value defined, but then that would like break in the case of zero, you know, which so as a general reusable pattern for these getter setter things. Um, this is the safest way to check if there were any arguments passed in or not. And that's why uh, we use this keyword function, so that, so that we get arguments defined inside of here. All right, so we can move on and, and we can do the same thing for um, height. We can set height and return height and define height up here. And now we can begin to move our uh, visualization logic into this component here. The way it's going to look is in our main, we're going to load in the data and then all this logic is going to be go inside of this scatterplot function, which we're calling my right here. So I'm just going to paste it. It's not going to work. Um, and this is how we can invoke this uh, component. We can say, well, first of all, we need to import it. Import scatterplot from dot slash scatterplot and now we can use it in much the same way as we use a d3 axis we can say scatterplot dot width is width which we have here as our um, you know window dot inner width and same thing for dot height we can call dot height, which invokes our setter, and we can pass in the local variable here, height. And then we can call this with our SVG element. And that's another aspect of this towards reusable charts pattern, is that 
it accepts as input a D3 selection. And it, it's going to put stuff inside of that selection. So um, similarly to axis, like D3 axis, it expects a D3 selection of a group element. And then it puts the axis stuff inside of there. Um, our scatter plot can do the same. You know, it could accept maybe a, a whole SVG element or, or an SVG group element. Either way could work. And this is how you would invoke it. You know, pass in the selection to the chart, which is equivalent to saying selection dot call my chart. And we got into this last time with the axes. And so the way that I would love to see it is SVG dot call scatter plot width and height like this. So this is the the overall pattern. Uh, I'm just going to keep going until it works. Um, another point of contention with this pattern is how to deal with the data. I think we should deal with the data as just another thing that we can set. You know, so let's set dot data. We pass in the data, and then in our scatter plot implementation, we can have another one of these local variables called data. And then we can have another one of these accessors for data. And in this case, we we must not have this little plus because uh, it's expected to be an array, not not a string that's going to be coerced into a number. So I'm going to get rid of that. It's just going to set data internally to whatever uh, was passed in here. And it's, it's going to remain broken for a while, so I'm just going to keep going like this, adding the things that we need. For example, x value, y value, margin, and radius. These are all, you know, configurable things. So let's go ahead and add add these as as configurable things on our plot. The way it would look to invoke this stuff is that we can say dot x value and pass in this function dot y value and pass in this function dot margin and pass in this margin and then dot radius passing in five like that and then when we use prettier it all formats nicely and this is what it looks like to configure our scatter plot now we need to go and implement all of those as you know local variables with getter setters so we've got what was it x value y value margin and radius and then I'm just going to copy the same uh, template four times change data to x value which is going to be a function change data to y value which is also going to be a function. Change data to margin, which will be an object. And then change data to radius, which will be a number. So we could actually bring back that little plus to be defensive about how we implement this. OK, now we have getter setters for x value, y value, margin, and radius. Now, Kuran, can I can I ask? Yeah, ask yeah, more sure, questions? sure. The, um, when I see the the more verbose version of that function, um, the, the one that you showed before, uh, the function evaluates the absence of argument with a, with an exclamation mark, right? 
in this more concise version, how is the absence of length is being evaluated in this in this version? Oh, I see what you're asking. Yeah, yeah. Let me explain. It's it's a um, oh, there's all our errors. <laughs> it's a behavior of JavaScript where. So let's say let um, bool equals true. Bool is going to be some Boolean value. And so if we have something like bool question mark, yes or no, it evaluates to yes. If bool is um, false, it evaluates to no. And here's the tricky bit. In JavaScript, there's this notion of truthy. Things are truthy or falsy. Um, you know, when they're coerced to Booleans, uh, strings, for example, numbers, when you pass them in, t when you treat them like Booleans, they're, they're coerced to be truthy or falsy. And so the way that that plays out in the case of arguments.length Arguments.length is going to be a number because arguments is an array. And so if arguments.length is zero, then the value of zero will be put into this ternary operator. And it turns out that zero is falsy in JavaScript. So that's why it would evaluate to no. But if the length of arguments is, let's say, one, that evaluates to something that is truthy in JavaScript. It's kind of true. It's, it's like true if it's treated as a Boolean. And so that would evaluate to yes. So that's why arguments.length works in this case like it does. Oh, great. OK, it makes sense. Thanks. Nice, nice. Happy to hear it. And this is so great. I'm so glad that, that you're asking these questions because um, Sometimes I don't know what to stop and explain and what, what not to, you know? So thanks for your question. All right, let's keep going here. Um, looking at this file, it seems like everything is right. We're pulling in the data. We're defining our SVG. Um, one thing that we're not doing yet is in our scatter plot, this function here needs to take as input a selection. I can call it SVG, but honestly, I would rather not because it could be an SVG, it could be a group element. And so I'm just going to replace SVG with selection. So I just replaced all instances of SVG with selection. And now it should work. We might be missing some imports. Yeah, that, that that's one thing that's outstanding. Um, oh, I never changed this around to use the ES6 import syntax. This is something I should have done as soon as I moved it to index.js. So we can import all this stuff that we need from D3. And in scatterplot, dot js. We're going to need scale linear extent, axis left, and axis bottom, but not CSV and not select. And in index.js, I don't think we're going to need any of that other stuff. So we could just use CSV and select over there. So let's see, is it working? Um, oh, we get a nice error. Unexpected token. OK. There's an unexpected token somewhere in index.js, line 46. It's missing the column in line 45. Um, then. Uh, in, in line 40? No, no, you're chaining. No, you cannot have that. 
Mm. It almost feels like it has like a like an older version of of my file. Ah, scale lin yeah, it was some some sort of glitch. Now it says scale linear is not defined. Okay, fair enough. Scale linear, we should be getting that from D3. That's odd. Let me try console.log scale linear to see if it is even like loading to that point. It is. It's there. So now what? 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 It's working? <laughs> this is a total, uh, total twilight. Magic. Yeah, total twilight <laughs> zone moment with errors that resolve themselves. Yeah, like magic. All right. Sweet. We've done it. It works. This is amazing. So, yeah, just just to quickly review everything. index.js has all the logic that we had er from earlier where it loads in the data, it sets up the SVG. But now our main function is a lot more concise. It just invokes our scatter plot and configures it with all this stuff. And here's something that's kind of mind blowing. You can take this expression and and we can skip that local variable. We could just pass that straight into data like that. That works too. Yeah, to me that's a mind blowing thing because await it's like this asynchronous control flow and it it has to like wait until that's done before it invokes this whole thing. But that's the magic of um, async await right there. And I kind of prefer it like this. It's it's more uniform. All the configuration happens right here. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, and, and in our scatter plot, we have a bunch of local variables in this closure. Um, a closure is this, the scope of the variables inside of this function. So when you invoke the scatterplot constructor, it creates this closure, and that's where these variables live. And we use let here, not const, because they can change over time. And then we've got this my function that gets invoked with a selection, and this is where it, it sets up all the scales and does all the you know, transformations right here. And it references these variables that are defined above, um, and it resolves to the things that we passed in to these these getter setter functions. And we just use them as setters, not getters. And uh, yeah, all the logic is the same as same as it was before for the scatter plot, and it works. So with this template, um, one would be able to change the data set and the and the name of the variables, the new variables, if you, if you change the data set, and it will update like automatically, no? Exactly. Yes, that's right. And and the key thing is that nothing at all inside scatterplot.js will need to change. Nothing at all if you change the data set. That's what I meant earlier by separating the specific from the generic. Like, this is a totally generic scatterplot implementation. If you were to change the data set, the only file you would need to change is index.js. You can change the CSV URL, change how the rows are parsed, and change the configuration of the plot. And all that, th th yeah, this is like the whole point of this reusable pattern is that all of this configuration happens outside of that reusable component. So yeah, you can just tweak it right here. If you want it to be, um, you know, 
pedal width, you could just change it right here, and boom, it updates. Go uh, If if I want to to have like the species as a different marker, as a classification marker, how could I add this to this code? That's a great question. And let me just clarify what you mean by marker. I think you might mean like a different shape, like these. Yep. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, this would be um, this would be a great thing to try to do as an exercise this week. And and I can outline how to do it. I don't think we have time today to actually do it, but I can outline. Yeah, but yeah, but should I use like a a case switch? Uh, inside and where in the logic this uh, switch case uh, alg algorithm would be or, or should I use something completely different well, let me walk through how how you would how you might do it um, the switch case meaning the logic that determines which shape it is is that what you mean yes yes, yes. so d3 symbol does that um with symbol dot type yeah yeah this would be actually a great thing to work through but what you would do is create an instance of d3 symbol and then set up an ordinal scale that maps the the three values for the species to these symbols you know maybe three particular symbols and I, yeah it's exposed as like symbol circle symbol cross symbol diamond so it would be something like you know create an ordinal scale and then set the range to be d3 symbol circle d3 symbol cross d3 symbol diamond and that scale you can pass in a value from the species column and it will give you back out one of these one of these symbol types. And then in the rendering logic of the scatter plot, instead of rendering circles, these would be paths. And then when you set the the D attribute of the path, you would want to change the type of the symbol and then invoke the symbol and that's how you could make a scatter plot with different shapes. I don't know. I kind of want to just go ahead and do it right now. <laughs> what do you think? Should I? Yes. Do it. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, let's do please. it. Let's yeah. do it. Why not? I'm going to keep this as it is because it's nice and clean. But I'm going to fork this and say reusable D3 scatter plot with symbols. Oh, I love this. It's going to be so much fun. Okay, now we need to import uh, these things. Oh, actually, symbols. Check it out. Symbols is an array containing all the set of built-in symbol types. So we could just use that. Okay, so I'm going to import symbols from D3. And then... I'm going to build out something very similar to X and Y. I'm going to call it um, symbol, I guess. Symbol value. And then I'll set up um, another one of these accessors for symbol value. It's going to be a function. And then in index.js, this is where we would want to say, okay, our symbol value is the species. I think it's d.species. Um, let's take a look. Yes, at yes, it is, it is. Nice. Yeah, species, nice. Okay, so this is how we would invoke it and configure it. Now let's implement the rendering. So instead of circles, these would be paths. 
select all paths. And instead of CX and CY, oh yeah, we would still need to position these paths. Oh, how would we do that? You know what we would want to do is um, probably use group L. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, it's getting a little tricky here. But let's just get a bunch of different shapes to show up and then we can um, we can worry about positioning them. Looking for the con okay, there's a constructor. So let's import symbol from D3. And then we're going to need a symbol scale. I'm going to call it symbol scale because symbol the word the the name symbol is already taken cuz it's imported. And this will be an ordinal scale. We need to import that as well from D3. And the range, this is the key thing. The range is going to be symbols. And the domain, you know, we don't actually need to set the domain because uh, it sort of fills in automatically. But just for completeness sake, we could say data.map symbol value. And that will just get all of the different species values. Uh, and that will contain duplicates, but that's okay because when you pass an array with duplicates to scale ordinal.domain, it automatically, you know, deduplicates it. So we can just say, just to inspect how that ended up, symbol scale dot domain. Let's just console dot log that. It should just give us those three values. Oh, there's some problem. Oh, I forgot a comma. There we go. See. So that's correct. Satosa versa color virginica. And then if we take a look at the range, it's a bunch of these um, D3 symbol implementations, which are actually objects that have a draw function. But we don't really strictly need to know what that is. OK, now we need to create a symbol generator. Symbol generator is new symbol using the constructor from D3 and let me see um, size defaults to 64 that should be fine I mean we could we could use it to change the size but let's just use the default for now see how it turns out and this is the thing we can say symbol dot type so this is what we need to do we need to make these paths and we don't need CY, CX, or R, but we need D, which is this domain specific language for SVG paths. Uh, that's what the symbol generator will output. So we can call symbol generator so this will be a function that takes as input D, and then we can call symbol generator of symbol value of D. Uh, those D's are different, right? The the string one and the the, the other one, they don't mean the, the same thing. Right, They're, they are totally distinct and different. Yeah, it's confusing that they have the same name. Um, D is the attribute of an SVG path, which has a very specific meaning. So if you look at the documentation for SVG paths, it expects a D attribute that is going to be a string that is a, it's an expression in a domain specific language that defines SVG paths. Okay. So, Clear. Yeah. yeah, so this D is the attribute D. And this D is, is a column. It's just one of the rows. Okay. N not a column, but a row. In it's yeah. an, it's okay. an element in the data array, or rather the marks array. 
And you know, oh my gosh, I, I, I sort of forgot that we have this transformation step. So this is actually where we can compute d, which makes it even more <laughs> confusing in a way, because we d dot d. Um, but this is where it makes sense to pass in, yeah, to do the transformation to the marks. To for clarity, I'm going to call it path path d, because it's there's too many d's. Okay, and this should work, I think, but looks like broken. Let's see what's going on. Cannot access symbol generator before initialization. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I have to move it to be before we compute the marks. Okay, I think it's sort of working. See that? We have some stuff in the corner. But it's in the corner, that's the problem. Um, and they're pretty tiny. They're pretty tiny. So I kind of want to make it um, bigger. Uh, but the, the main problem is they're all in one place. They're all in the corner. And I wonder, can we have a transform? If you just... Uh, set attribute x and y, it does not work. I don't believe x and y works on paths. I mean, we can try it. That would be ideal if it did. Uh, but it doesn't. Okay. Uh, we may be able to specify a transform on the path. So we can translate by d dot x and d dot y but I don't know if that's going to work oh sorry I forgot to make it a function of d oh well, look at that it sort of worked but but they're all circles they're all circles. That's indicative of a problem. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to, um, ha, I forgot to set the type. So here's what we need to do. This is not right. We need to, we need to call simple generator dot type and then invoke it. This is what we need to do. Uh, looks like there's some problem. Maybe that's not quite right. Why this empty parentheses in the end? Yeah, I think we need to invoke it. Or, you know, maybe I should consult the documentation. Simple dot type. Yeah, but it seems that you invoke in two times there. You, you invoke right. with the parameter and then you're invoking again. See, this is what I want to do. I want to, cr I want to create an instance of D3 symbol. We'll call it symbol generator. And then for each mark, I want to say symbol generator dot type is oh oh i forgot to pass it through the scale that's so silly so symbol scale of symbol value of d okay so symbol value of d will give us the species value we need to pass that through the scale symbol scale in order to get at the particular symbol and remember symbol scale it just maps the the symbol the species to the various symbols that we imported from D3. So we need to call symbol generator dot type to set the type and then these empty parentheses on the end are to invoke 
the symbol generator as a function to generate this path string. So now we can see that it's actually giving us different types of shapes. Yeah, it's kind of tricky business. It is. But I think what we need to do to move these around. Um, oh, wait a minute. It should be missing the close. Uh, yeah. Like this. That's what it needs to be. There we go. There we go. So it's translating by X and Y correctly now. Yeah. This is what you were trying to do, isn't it? Yes. Very cool. Amazing. Very Amazing. Great, great. Yeah, wow, that only take like 10 minutes. Amazing. Okay, now I can make a scatter plot with Kuhan's face. Yeah. <laughs> you totally could. Yeah, yeah. You could even put different people's faces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Wow, pretty satisfying. Um, one thing that's just not quite linked up yet. I just want to wrap this up nicely. Radius is here but it's not being used. So what I want to do is use it so that we can configure the size of the symbols. Um, but radius doesn't make sense. We can use size instead. And the default was what, 64? So let me say size is 50. And then in, in our scatter plot, I'm just gonna do a, a search and replace across the whole thing. I'm replacing radius with size. How do you do a search and replace in VSub? Oh, I'm using I'm using Vim mode. And then once you enter Vim mode, you can use the Vim command for the search and replace, which is this. Okay. So the the percent means global search and replace. Um, S means search I guess it's it's one of those sort of obscure vim things um, it works with uh, some other command line tools too in Linux but yeah this is how you trigger it you, you you hit colon to enter this little space which is you know derived from vim the editor and then radius is the thing you find size is the thing it gets replaced with G means global means um, it means to replace every instance on a line and okay. so this is just sort of the uh, the incantation to make it happen so once i run that we have size and once we have size defined here then what we can do is we can pass it into our symbol generator dot size size like that and it it could we could make it vary for each mark but for now I'm just gonna make it all the same size and just to confirm that it's working I'm gonna change the size here to like 500 okay and it gets bigger and yeah size it's the behavior of size with d3 symbols can be a little counterintuitive because it actually was really well thought out so that the area of each of the symbols is the same I'm pretty sure um, and and when you change the size you're actually changing the area so it's not a linear scale in at, at play here it's it's more like a square root scale internally so if I change it to like a thousand that means there's gonna be a thousand black pixels for each shape but if I change it to a hundred that means there's gonna be a hundred filled in black pixels for each shape and while I'm talking about symbols I, I would be remiss to not show this really nice piece um, oh that's not the one
Hang on, hang on. Mike Bostock has this really nice thing that illustrates that they're all the same area. It'll be worth the wait. There it is. Yeah, this is a really nice little piece by Mike Bostock that he developed, um, looks like in 2017, I think when he was working on building out D3 shape. And so notice here how the radius of each of these circles is different, but it says here each of these shapes has a configurable area. Here are 2,500 square pixels. And so this is the, this is the like deep thought that that you get for free when you use D3 symbol. It turns out that each of these shapes has exactly the same number of filled in pixels and that's what gets configured when you call dot size. All right, well, that's how we do it. That's how we make a scatter plot with symbols uh, within the confines of this reusable chart pattern. And I, this is just playing out so well. I mean, I would much prefer to do things this way, to have a reusable chart pattern in place and then branch out to all sorts of different visualization types rather than, you know, get it basically working in one huge file uh, and fork that a, a bunch of times. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for, for, you know, sticking with me through this refactoring effort. And I hope it was useful. Thanks, Kuran. It was really insightful, all this class. Nice. Happy to hear it. Happy to hear it. I'd like to leave you all with some exercise options. Fork and modify what we made and maybe add axis labels. One of the things that it's missing is the labels, the text labels on the axes. And I think we have now enough uh, knowledge of D3 to be able to do that. Another option would be, you know, fork this scatter plot and change the data set to get that experience uh, of just changing the index file and leaving, leaving the scatter plot implementation as it is, as a generic thing. Or fork this and change the chart type I mean, you would probably need to change the data set too uh, in order to do that, but that would be a great exercise if you could fork this and maybe change it to be a line chart component or an area chart or a bar chart. Uh, we're going to be doing that in subsequent episodes, but if you, you know, feel inspired, by all means, take a stab at it now. Um, and if, if you can't get it done, you know, at least take a stab at it, share your work, and maybe, maybe we could use that as a jumping off point for a future episode. So all of this is in the forum, the VizHub forum. I made one for episode nine. Uh, where did it go? I may have lost it or something but I'm going to make one now for episode nine, uh, so you can post there. Welcome everyone to episode 10 of Get It Right in Black and White, Dynamic Charts. So first I'd like to start with some introductions. Um, we have some, we have a new person today. Welcome Maxine. Uh, you wanna introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, so I'm Maxine or Max, and I worked a bit on um, VizHub with Corinne, and that was really fun because I think it's a great product. And now I'm a data visualization engineer for Mural, and in my free time, I just try to learn as much as I can about D3. Nice. I love Mural, by the way. I've started using it. It's a really neat oh, tool. Great. And uh, Adil is here. Hey, Adil. Hi, Karen. Hi, Maxine. 
All right, so let's start by reviewing the submissions from last time. Um, here we go, reusable charts. So here's one from uh, <clears throat> Felipe. Hilarious. Um, I think it's it's like the data of how many VizHub users there are, but with my face in there. <laughs> so nice work, Felipe. Um, yeah, very cool, very cool. I want to take a just quick look at the code. It's still the same scatter plot like template with the, you know, the methods and everything, and it's just been modified internally to show these SVG paths. Pretty cool. All right, what else have we got? Something from EJ Dasbach. This is pretty neat. I was actually pretty impressed with this one. It's a nice actual visualization of COVID-19 deaths over time. And uh, yeah, great work adding the title, adding the labels for the axes, uh, vaccination at 30%. That's like some additional information. Pretty cool. And great job linking to the source too, in the viz itself. Very cool. Very cool. And this easily could be converted to a line chart just by modifying some of the internals. I think a line chart might make more sense for this particular data. Although it's kind of cool with the dots because you can see the gaps. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Yeah, there was some confusion about last week. I had to cancel. But um, all right, I think that's it. That's all there is. So, all right, great to see some participation. Um, Yeah, before I dig into um, stuff for today, I'm just wondering, are there any questions from last week's content, Adil or Maxine, uh, that was unclear? Not from my end. I thought it was pretty clear. Nice. Yeah, it was, it was really very clear. Um, I think returning the method chaining in particular was quite... Um, um, it was it was just yeah really eye opening really. Oh great! Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah yeah that the pattern still blows my mind because it's just JavaScript, essentially. But you can make these components, and you're not tied to any particular framework like React or Vue or anything. I was wondering when um, doing the call dot call uh, and. Uh, all the method chaining that follows, whether there is a, uh, whether there's a convention uh, at all or um, a preferred, I, I guess it's a, um, a personal approach, but um, when, uh, is, uh, when, when doing this uh, svg.call scatterplot, um, then all the methods that uh, follow, um, are they, is it recommended to do them in any particular order? For example, to do the data manipulation first, followed by the DOM, uh, anything that touches the DOM, or is it, um, is that, is that just, just it's up to the uh, personal preference? Um... Yeah, that's a great question. Does the order matter? Is there any particular patterns? No, I would say no. It's it's like Lego blocks. You know, you can assemble these things in any way that you want. And as long as their relationships are correct between like the inputs and the outputs and um, the order of like the, the dependencies uh, is correct. Like first you need to set up the SVG, then you need to call it. But beyond that, um, no, it doesn't really matter. It's totally personal preference, you know, which order you call these things. Um, and even I've seen it quite often where you, you construct the, the element like 
right here instead of even having a variable and like that works too it's totally personal preference yeah stylistic yeah no, that, that, that makes sense thank you all right we've got another guest um e um hello there you want to um here let me just pull up the introduction slide E. Dasbach, are, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Eric Dasbach here. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great to meet Great. you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, finally got this down, figuring out between um, YouTube and um, uh, Google Meetup. So. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a kind of a quirky setup, but it, it works. Yep. So just a little about myself, uh, data scientist outside of Philadelphia, trying to upskill uh, my data visualization. So I uh, followed the first nine and uh, now uh, looking forward to participating live. Amazing, amazing, welcome. And I, I think I just um, presented your work, but- Yep. But I would like to welcome you to present it yourself. Here we go. Let me find it. Sure. Here it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Tell so me a little bit. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So the um, so appreciate the opportunity. The uh, part of what I do, and so I work in healthcare, and and part of what I do is visualizations of. Uh, these sorts of dynamics and so forth. And so I really enjoyed the notion that we had a reusable scatter plot. And I think the assignment was to switch out to another data set one, and then to start adding axes and so forth. And, you know, I found that framework uh, really useful from which to do it. I think probably one of the most challenging things I found was just the date scale and figuring that out and just, you know, um, trying to get that to line up right. And I still haven't figured out how to manipulate uh, the months and years and so forth quite right. But um, because VizHub is so nice and interactive, it allowed me to just keep trial and erroring to get it to this point, um, uh, which is really helpful for uh, learning. Nice. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, so yeah, and I guess the other th part of the assignment to Sorry, I lost you there. You there? I lost your sound there, Eric. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Oh, you, you were saying? Me? Oh, yeah, I was just saying, so... I think his sound is down. Yeah, I, I lost your sound. Um, oh, you muted yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I was just saying that I guess the other aspect of this was trying to um, figure out how to make things item potent. Oh, well, yeah, that's what I was going to get into today. That's what I plan to really touch on today. And so, um, so I was starting to go back to some of your work in React. <laughs> um. <laughs> ah, yep. Yeah, I mean, I would like to address some of your questions around the, the date formatting and stuff, because it's actually quite simple what you can do to make adjustments to the formatting. Um, so it's a little bit off topic, but I'll spend like five minutes on it just to to move that forward because because you were struggling with that. So when you oh I gotta fork this to make some edits to have a little more control over the the dates and the formatting there. So we've got a a scale time here. And one thing you can do is control the number of ticks by saying dot ticks and, it, and you pass in like five or something that gives you oh 
Oh, it's not loading. What happened? Oh, sorry, not on the scale, not on the scale, on the axis. Yeah, that's something that trips me up. So when we when we create the axis, oh, you did that already. Tick six. So if we up it to like sixteen, we get more ticks. And so if you want to change the formatting, is that what you wanted to do? Change that formatting? Yeah, I was trying to figure out. So um, implicitly, there was it, it dropped the years in, and then um, the months and so forth. And, and I was trying to figure out how, how to actually manipulate those sorts of things. Totally, totally. So you can use this thing called <clears throat> D3 time format. And this old example on blocks.org from Zan Armstrong in 2017 is a tried and true way of, of figuring out how to format dates with D3. So the way you use it is uh, now it's called time format, camel case. It used to be time dot format. But the API is pretty much the same. So you can pass in this weird looking string, like, you know, percent Y dash percent M. And each of these little codes has a specific meaning. Like this is the full year. This is the, the month as zero one. But let's see what kind of ticks might be appropriate. Maybe just the month. Right? Like, uh, Yep, I think I actually found this site too. But oh, nice! I, I was, I was um, not getting it. Uh, somewhere in there, I had the month uh, aspect. Oh, nice! And t time format is even there. I see. Yeah. Nice, nice. And so when you call axis bottom, you can just call dot format. Oh, uh, okay. Or maybe it's. I think it's actually tick format. Yeah, and then you can just pass in a time format of this string, which I can't remember. I have to look at the example. Dollar sign B for like Jan, Feb, like that. Yeah. Then I'll use prettier to format the code. And now we get... Huh, that did not seem to do the trick, actually. Yeah, and then you have to, I think, manipulate the ticks to the... Uh... Well, that should work. That should work. Let me see if I got any errors. No. Hmm. So if I search for D3 axis tick format, I hope I get the um, the name right. Yeah, axis dot tick format. I should do the trick. I wonder if it was set somewhere else as well. I think you're right. I, I, I know I set it somewhere else. I'm trying to remember where. <laughs> yeah, because I think if you if you set it on the axis or the scale, it might like take precedence or something. Oh, wait a minute. There's two. Oh, there. There's yeah. two axes on the bottom. Whoa. Yeah, I forgot to clean that out. This is when I was going to item potent. <laughs> oh, nice. Let me see. So that might be just not visible. And then let's try putting that on this other one. Let's see. Oh, well, you need one more paren. Yep. There we go. Yep. That's there. It. Got it. Boom. Yeah. So that's how it works. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you.
Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for doing the assignment. I'm really happy to see this sort of uh, engagement and participation. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. All right, we've got a bunch more people coming. Let's see what's going on here. We've got um, Maximiliano. Hello. I think you came last time. And we've got Ken Penn. Hey, Ken, welcome. And we've got uh, Maribel. Welcome, Maribel. Would, I, would anyone like to introduce themselves? Am I muted? Oh, there you go. I can hear you now. Oh. <laughs> Gosh, this is weird. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm still I'm new to to um, to D three and um, still learning a lot. So I have questions. I shall listen. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, feel free to interrupt me as I go and and ask the questions along the way. Thank you. Hey, Kuran and everyone. Yes, I was here last week. It's... How are you? Everything's fine, thanks. Good, good. So great to be here again. Welcome. And I see Ken joined us. Ken, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, there was a bit of an echo there, so I was kind of holding back. Uh, Ken Pan, um, currently- Hey, Kuran and everyone. Yes, I was here. <laughs> yeah, you got to close the YouTube. Sorry, it's a little a little funky of a setup. Good, good. But if you close out the YouTube uh, window, it should work. There we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, Ken Pan um, have been using D3 for a bunch of years. Um, currently um, unemployed and um, just uh, doing this to stay in practice and get tuned up on uh, incorporating d3 with uh, modern javascript nice well i'm glad you could join us ken um ken and i go way back from the d3 meetups in san francisco many fond memories of attending events there meeting people learning things so great you should provide a link to your uh d3 parade entry yesterday that was quite good oh yeah yeah, that was fun. Yeah, I hope to actually build something like that as part of the series as we get yeah. uh, further along. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. I, I think it was very instructive too, and it might be for um, for other people where you showed all the the uh, wrong steps, broken made art that you had. Oh yeah. Persisting to the right, kind of like you just helped uh, with the dates just now. I thought that, you know, learning to use it instead of uh, uh, just getting frustrated and quit is, uh, you know, how, how to persist through that is really important, I think. Nice, for sure. And that's why I'm having this whole thing, um, you know, live with q and A. So because I know people get stuck and I want to teach people how to go from stuck to unstuck because that's the, the key thing. Yeah. All right. All right, we've got some other folks joining us. Um, hello, Felipe, how are you? And we've also got Matt Oliver. Hello, Matt, welcome. Howdy. Uh, thanks for doing this, Quirin. I'm in Texas, and I'm a, in my day job, I'm a product manager, and I love building with D3. And... Um, love learning new stuff so happy to be here and um haven't been able to make the last few but um uh where, whenever there's time and whenever i can i want to i want to participate so thanks again nice this is amazing wow welcome well this is a full house we've got so many people so let me just dig into this what i wanted to do today was to make our chart that we made last time dynamic 
meaning uh, what I was thinking of doing is cycling through X and Y columns. Um, we saw last time that if you change the code to change the function that accesses the data for X, then the meaning of the X column changes to be that column. And what I want to really touch upon today is like, if you want to make such a change interactively without having to go and change the code, how do you do that? Uh, that gets into this concept of idempotent rendering, where you have this function that you invoke, namely the scatterplot, and what you want is that the scatterplot knows how it's supposed to look. It has all this configuration set up. And what you want to have happen is when you call that function again for the second time or the third time or the fourth time, it should just sort of whip the DOM into shape and, and be like, all right, DOM, like you need to now change to represent the new setup, the new configuration. And with D3, there's all these foot guns, um, things w that you could use to shoot yourself in the foot, uh, like dot append which doesn't really work well if you invoke the function again and again because it's going to append more and more elements again and again which is not what we want and there's a couple telltale signs of when this is happening that I think I'll get into today and then if there's time after we get the idempotent rendering down if there's time I would like to dig into animated transitions but we may not we may or may not get that far we'll see all right so, here is the reusable scatter plot from last time. After last week's session, I, I had like a realization that like, oh no, it's not actually done because it's not idempotent. Uh, which which sort of defeats the whole purpose of making it reusable. And this is a word that you don't usually come across unless you're in like computer science. So I just wanted to read the definition of the word. Um, I think I think the Wikipedia article does it justice. Idempotence is the property of certain operations in mathematics and computer science whereby they can be applied multiple times without changing the results beyond the initial application. So the, the key here is that the result that you get after invoking the function should be exactly the same regardless of the state of affairs before you invoke that function. And so that let's let's apply this to our to our code here. All right, so first of all, we need to have some change be happening. And so I propose that instead of just calling the scatter plot one time like we're doing here, we can call it multiple times in a, a loop of sorts. So let's say every every second or every two seconds we change the value that gets returned from this x value accessor function and that would have the effect of you know changing it from let's say pedal width to sepal width. Boom! See that change? That's the kind of, that's the change that I want to see without rerunning the program. So how would we do that? There is a, a construct in JavaScript called set interval. And what set interval does is it accepts a function as the first argument and as the second argument it accepts a number of milliseconds. So if I put a thousand here, that means every second it's going to run this function, whatever it may be. 
So let's just, you know, console.log here to make sure that this um, the setup is working. Then I'll open the console and we can see it's printing out here again and again and again every second. And those little numbers mean like that's the number of times that the same thing was printed out again and again. And we see it's incrementing every second. But if we change this to 100, it's going to increment every um, tenth of a second. So we'll see the number going a lot faster. So what I want to do here is, let's say every two seconds, we're going to change the meaning of x. But how do we do that? And, and this comes back to your question from earlier, Adil, of like, does the order that you do this stuff matter? Well, the order depends on the use case, like the scenario where you need to invoke this. Right now, we have to do a little bit of refactoring because there's a bunch of stuff happening in one call. But now the task at hand is to tease out what needs to happen once at the beginning versus what needs to happen every time we change x. For example, we're calling await CSV here, which will fetch the data. Um, and we don't want to fetch the data again every time we, we, we set it up. And also, the scatter plot is being invoked. I uh, mean, the, the constructor of the scatter plot is being invoked within this SVG call. So we have no way of accessing the instance of that plot to change its configuration. So I'm going to have to move this around a little bit. What I'm going to do is pull this out into a, a variable. I guess I'll call it plot equals and then we invoke the scatter plot now we have we sort of have a handle on this thing so we can change it after the fact now we can do svg call plot right here to initialize it and we can use the same construct inside of our set interval console.log plot like that so now it is invoking our plot function every two seconds. And we're already starting to see some of those telltale signs that, that the thing is not idempotent. Namely, notice how around these labels, it's not quite smooth. It's a little um, pixelated or like harsh when you look at it. Me, and, and what's happening is the anti-aliasing is getting messed up because what it is there actually is a bunch of layers of the axis again and again and again. And we can see this if we inspect the DOM. We can see if we zoom out to the right level, there are multiple copies of both the X and Y axis being added. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see that every two seconds, there's another copy of both axes being added. Uh, so this is the problem that we have to set out to fix. And this is a very common type of bug when you're working with D3. Because the way D3 is uh, structured, like you can get something working uh, when you invoke it once. And that's pretty straightforward. You can use the dot append construct. However, when you when you have a situation where you need the thing to change over time, you have to actually do different stuff. You need to make sure that you use the general update pattern of D3, which handles the enter, the update, and the exit of all of these DOM, DOM nodes. And the, the problem here is that the parent group for the axis is being just appended over and over. So that's what we need to change. So let me go back to our um, scatter plot. Although, you know, let me let me just finish this this thought first. What we want to do is change the value of x. And we're ready to do that. 
So let's do that first. Let's change X, and then let's go and make our, our reusable component item potent. We can just say plot dot x value, and instead of d dot pedal width, we're going to want to cycle through. So we can say d at column, and we can say column equals pedal width to start, and How do we cycle through the various columns? I propose we have something called columns, which is going to be an array, and pedal width will be one of the options. Another of the options is um, sepal width, and then we can copy those options and add height, or no, length, what was it? Let me figure out what that was actually from the data. Mm. Yes, it was length. Oh yeah, length, length it was indeed. So we can change width to length. Now we've got these options to choose from for our columns. And what we want to do is say column is uh, columns at index, let's say i. And i is something that I would like to increment every two seconds. But once it gets to the top, we should it should like cycle back. It should, it should circle back. So instead of using const, I'm going to define this outside of set interval and use let. I'll init initialize i to zero, and say i plus plus, and then console.log i. Uh, let's see what this does so far. It says one, two, three, four, five. And this is where it's getting buggy because um, once it gets beyond three, it should go back to zero. And the way that we can do this is i equals i plus one modulo um, columns dot length minus one and just for oh, let's see if it runs zero zero oh it's not working Just for some context, if you haven't seen the modulo operator, four modulo two is zero, but five modulo two is one. And modulo two is, is a way that you can check if it's even or odd. And so what we want to do is make i go from zero to like three and then go back to zero. So you know what we could do actually is just we could simply say i plus plus let it increment and then let's console.log i modulo column set length minus one. You know it could have been a parentheses issue. Let's try like this. So we see one, two, zero, one, two, zero. But we have four options. Um, maybe it's just a not off by one kind of a thing. Let's just modulo by columns dot length. I think this should give us the right thing now. 
one, two, three, zero. All right, so we just need to use this when we access from columns. like this. So we can just sort of um, compress this like so. And I kind of want it to start at zero. So let me just increment i after we do this, this stuff here. All right, now it should be behaving as we expect. So this is a dynamic scatter plot. Um, the circles are idempotent. They're behaving correctly. So what it's doing is it's cycling through each of these for x. And notice that at a certain point we see a diagonal. That's, that's when x and y are the same column. Here's the problem. Now, the axes are getting messed up. See the x-axis? It's just a bunch of copies. Now let's address that problem of multiple axes. Uh, but are, at this point, are there any questions about what I've done so far? Um, I, I'm... I wanted to ask uh, how this concept of item potent relates with the the update pattern in D3 because I I, I don't know if it's related but but it's like uh, the same principle I guess because the points are dynamically changing but I haven't seen this concept before when we see the update pattern, the enter, update, exit pattern. So I, I'm not sure if how they are related. Right, right. And by the way, people don't really talk about it. They don't use this term very often. And the term idempotent rendering, I think was used back in the, in the days of jQuery when it became like a thing. Um, so maybe that's why like, it's not a commonly used term. It's like a sort of a nerdy computer science term. But I think it's the right term to apply here. But the relationship between the concept of idempotent rendering and D3's general update pattern is, it's the same thing. D3's general update pattern makes the rendering idempotent. And so um, let's, let's take a look at our, our code for the circles. What this does is it uses the new dot join API, which does a bunch of stuff internally. It creates uh, an enter selection and an update selection, and it merges them together, and it returns the resulting selection. And then we can set the circle, the, the attributes on the resulting thing. So that is an idempotent rendering pattern. Let me show you a variant of this that is not idempotent. If we call dot enter dot append circle, and then we set the attributes on those circles, what we're going to get is a bunch of overlapping circles. Oh no, I'm that's not right. That's not right because it is actually only. So when it's when it says select all circle, it's picking up the circles that it rendered last time. But this is not idempotent because it's not updating. It's not updating. It's not working right. So to make it idempotent, we use enter dot append circle. Um, well, we could use the dot merge thing. Check it out. Um, circles dot merge. Um, sorry, this should be circles, which is the update selection. 
and then we merge it with the enter selection like this this should be the idempotent version of it see now it's updating properly and this is like super confusing it's sort of a deprecated API to use merge like this. It's very really low level. It helps you out. But what this is doing is exactly the same thing as this simplified API where you just call dot join. And it and join also handles the exit case. So if there were fewer circles, oops, I must have deleted something. And dot data we need. Yeah, so, so this, this does idempotent rendering. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, definitely. That Now I, I get uh, how that concept, like, is part of the, of the, of, of all this structure. Yeah, nice. And so the problem is our, our, our axes are not idempotent. I mean, the axis itself is coded in such a way that it does correctly do idempotent rendering. However, we are appending a group element on the outside, which is the part of this stuff that's not idempotent. It just appends a new group element on each render, which is not right. This is the special case of the general update pattern that deals with just a single element. And so it's sort of a non... It's not the most common form that you see. Usually we call dot data and we pass an array of things that actually represents data. However, if you want to use D3 selections for just a single element, we need to just make up some data that has a single element. So let's do it. Selection dot select all. Um, we could try dot G. Oh, we could try G here just to select all group elements. However, I can tell you right now, this is not going to fly because we have multiple group elements, one for each axis, and we need to disambiguate between them. So at this point, before I go any further, I'm going to, I'm going to use a class to disambiguate these. Select all dot, uh, I'll call it Y axis, Y dash axis, because it's, it's the Y axis. dot data and this is where we need to pass in an array that has a single element so I could just put the number one or whatever uh, I'm going to use null because I've seen this around in in the d3 source code actually for I think d3 axis uses this so it's it's an array of data <laughs> that doesn't really have data it's just null it's but the, the thing is it's a single element so it doesn't really matter what that element is, it just matters that it's an array that has a single element. Because when you use the dot join construct, uh, like I think I can say join g dot attr, I have to give it the class of y axis so that it picks up the one that was added previously. This, I believe, should work. And I think we could say g dot y axis just to make it really clear. I think that's a valid selector. It means it means that the the tag name is g and the class is y axis. So the y-axis actually looks good on the side. See, it's not getting that thick quality to it, which indicates to me that it's just rendering once. Um, so what happens is every time the function gets executed, it's taking a look at what was there from the last time and just whipping it into shape to match what it should be this time. And because we're not changing y, it, uh, it doesn't change. Uh, which is the right thing. So now let's apply the same pattern to X. This is where we'll actually see it. Um, we'll see it work. 
more clearly because the axis won't be totally messed up. So I'm just going to copy paste that whole pattern and then change uh, Y axis to X axis. And let's see. Let's see if that does the trick. Yeah, see that? Now it's correct. Yep. The axis is not getting all messed up. So just to run through what's happening again here, we're using this dot join API of D3, which is the modern day you know, general update pattern of D3 that handles enter, update, and exit. And we're passing it a data set that just has a single thing, a single element, which is null. But it could be anything. It doesn't It really doesn't matter what it is. But just the fact that there's one of them is what matters because the, the internals of dot join will take that data and say, okay, I just need to make a single group element. So if there's already a group element there that matches this selection, then I'm going to use it. I'm going to use the old one that was there before. I'm not going to make a new one. And so that's the beauty of this. The first time it runs, it will create a, a brand new, a mint brand new group element. But the second time, the third time, the fourth time, it's just going to use the group element that was there before. And then it's going to call this axis function, which itself implements idempotent rendering properly, internally, so that makes the whole thing idempotent and, and working correctly. So this is it. This is, this is the, the complete version of the reusable chart. Now you can use this, you know, swap out things in, in real time, and, and it'll work correctly. Any questions? Great, I think it's it's great. So so if I understand correctly, the, the with the null like uh, array that you create, it's like a, a a unique ID for the for the group, and that way it recognizes as the same thing when it updates. Well. It's not really an ID. It's not actually used at all. The thing that's serving as an ID to differentiate between the different groups is actually the class. So let me show you what happens. If we get rid of this class, if we just say select all G and then select all G for both of these axes, let's see what happens. See, it's only getting one of them. The y-axis is not showing up at all. And so in terms of the concept of unique ID uh, to disambiguate between them, the class is really what plays that role. The data, that array of null, is just to, to signify that there's one thing that we want. Not two, not zero, but there's just one thing. That's the significance of, the, of that right. array. Right, right, thank you. And just to deconstruct why there's no um, y-axis here, when this code runs, it builds up the y-axis first. Because select all g, the first time there's no group element, it'll create one. And then after that runs, the code that is for the x-axis says select all g. Boom, it's going to select that group element that was used for the y-axis. That's what happens. That's what happens when you don't use classes. It selects whatever group element is there on the page, like as a child of the selection. And so that's why um, it's clobbering the y-axis, and it's, it's using the same group element, and it's building it into the x-axis. So let's bring back our our selection that uses class. Yep, 
Yeah, so now it says select all elements that have the class y-axis. If, if it's the first time, there's going to be none, so it's going to make a new one, give it the class. But if it's the second time around, it's going to find the one that, that this code put there before and use it. Okay, so I'm going to leave this reusable scatter plot here as it is because now I feel like it's finished. I'm going to fork this because the animated transitions do add quite a bit of complexity. So I'll call it uh, animated. Reusable D3 scatter plot. All right, in our scatter plot, I'm thinking we can focus on the circles as the thing to add animation to. And maybe we could potentially animate the axes as well. Um, D3 axes are implemented in such a way that you can animate them, which is really cool. But first, uh, let's get grounded in some documentation or examples. So I'm going to search for D3 transitions. Yeah, D3 transition, here it is. I'm looking for some example code. Yeah, so with transitions, like, there's a million and one ways you can invoke them. Um, you could even just say dot transition. Actually, let me do that first to see what happens, because, uh, but I don't think it's the right behavior, but just, just as an experiment, if we just put dot transition right here, what happens? Okay, it, it worked. Now they're animating. See that? So that's the simplest way of invoking D3 transitions. We just add dot transition and it creates this thing called a D3 transition that kind of looks and feels like a D3 selection. It, so when you call dot transition, it creates a new thing which is an instance of a transition and returns it. And so these dot ATTRs, they're being invoked on the transition, not the original selection. And you can also say dot duration, like this, and pass in a number of milliseconds, like let's say 2000. Now the transitions are slower, two seconds and you can really see the stuff dance around. Pretty neat. However, this is sort of um, the, the lazy approach that ends up in semi-buggy stuff, because watch this. Uh, when this program runs, notice how the circles sort of fly in from the corner. Zoom. This is, to me, this, I mean, it's maybe acceptable, but like, to me, this is not right. Like, this is, this is kind of buggy, you know? So I think we need to do the more proper implementation of, of, um, of transitions, which we can get into now from the docs. So the thing to do, really, is to create a transition object that you can use in multiple places. Because what, what this does, if you call dot transition, it creates a new transition. And if we wanted to say transition the axes too, it would, it would like create a, a new different 
transition that has like slightly different timing or something like that. And so like if you want everything to be synchronized, the best way to do it is to create an instance of d3.transition. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'll just create it right above our circles. I'll use const instead of var. And instead of d3.transition, I will import transition from d3 at the top. And I'll get rid of this stuff down here. Ease linear. Um, oh yeah, you can specify all sorts of easing functions, which is like the the different way that they animate. But I think we can just we can just use the defaults for now. And I'll I'll, I'll we'll keep the duration of two seconds so we can see it clearly. Now, let me find some more examples. So we can call dot transition on a selection and pass in the transition that we created. So this is the same behavior as before. But what I want to focus on now is when the, the plot gets initialized for the first time. I want to have like some nuanced animated transitions where here's what I want to have happen. The circles should appear in their correct locations, but they should grow from nothing to something. So I would like to, to animate the radius of it. Right? I think that that feels to me like the proper way to start off a scatter plot that has animations is to, you know, do something sensible rather than like the default behavior which is they fly in from the upper left corner which is sort of nonsensical i mean it it makes sense in a way technically but like i wouldn't want to wouldn't want to see that you know so for this we have to we have to use dot join in a in a different way let me see if i can find i know there's a good example of this somewhere Let me see if I can just find it. I know it's probably here in observable. Here it is. Here it is. Yeah, this is the canonical example by Mike Bostock, author of D3, where it's the general update pattern with animated transitions. And these animated transitions are totally um, controlled. Like, like the code controls exactly all the cases of, of these animations. And so when, when things enter, they're green, they fall from the sky. When they exit, they transition down. They become red and transition down. And when they update, they're black here, and they just move from where they were to where they are, uh, or where they should be. This is the example I would like to follow. So here is, here is the, here's what it looks like to do this properly. We call dot join and instead of just passing a string, the selector, we pass in three functions. The first function is what to do on enter. The second function is what to do on update, meaning when there's something there from the last time around and we just need to update it. And what to do on exit when something disappears. Exit, we don't need to handle in our case because we don't have a case where things exit. I mean, that would be the case where, like, uh, when we invoke the scatter plot, we change the data so that there's one fewer uh, entry. So this case we might not touch upon, but we want to touch upon these two for sure. So let me, I'm just going to copy all this stuff because it's a, it serves as a decent template for reference. Uh, Kern, just a, yeah. a question. Uh, you went to uh, you went to observable rather than the documentation, right? And uh, is that is that the way to look stuff up? 
now? I mean, go to observable first rather than the documentation? Well, here's the thing. Like, the documentation of D3 and observable are becoming quite um, in interconnected. So, for, for example, if we look at um, D3 selection, I, I often do start with the docs in the readme of the GitHub stuff here. But the thing is, all of this stuff links into observable. Well, notebooks, okay. Yeah, and so joining data, for example, see the selection.join notebook. So this, uh. stu this stuff in observable is essentially an extension of the D3 documentation. Okay, I'm just planning on spending a lot of time in the documentation to learn how to do stuff in version six. Yep. Yeah, the documentation is great, but I don't think it contains a, a complete example. I mean, this is this is pretty close. So this is a place we could start as well. But I don't think it contains a full example with the animated transitions. So for that, we do need to go into observable. But yeah, my okay. my my general approach approach is to use the docs as much as I can and then if there's something that I can't find in the docs then I'll click through the observable links and and port it essentially port the stuff to vanilla JavaScript by copy pasting little chunks yep thank you yeah my pleasure thanks for the question here it is so yeah I mean if I had my druthers this code snippet should be in the readme <laughs> but it's not because this deals with how transitions and selections intermingle and work together so instead of using this approach I'm going to delete what we had earlier for the dot join and then I'll paste all this crazy looking stuff but, you know, really what I want to do is I want to use this as a reference and then code it ourselves. So I'll leave that commented out. Karan, yeah. uh, one practical question. <laughs> How? What's the shortcut for m multiple commenting out in BizHub? Oh, it's, well, if you're not in Vim mode, it's control slash. Control slash. Great. Yeah, and I've been Thanks. meaning to add something like a list of keyboard shortcuts. That would be useful, wouldn't it? Right here in the editor. Yes. <laughs> it's it's wow, on the you. it's on the to do list. Yeah, but um, yeah, control slash comments the line, multiple lines. Super useful. Thank you. The general structure that we need here is. A function that takes as input the enter selection and does something with it. A function that takes as input the update selection and does something with it. And lastly, a function that takes as input the exit selection and does something with it. Enter, what we're going to generally do is append something. In this case, we are appending a circle. And on update, is where we want to you know change the position and on exit is where we generally want to remove the stuff um, I'm just gonna keep it there as a good practice um, but we don't have like a test harness that tests that case yet but anyway what I think we should do on enter is initialize the circles to where they should be. So that's where I'm going to take these lines, move them up to here. So we are appending a circle, a brand new circle, the first time it gets invoked, and we're setting x and y. And what we're left with is now circles that don't move around <laughs> because we haven't addressed the update selection. So let's do the same thing on update. 
I'm just going to paste that logic there. So we're setting CX and CY on update as well. Now we're seeing that the circles change like they should. Okay, so now what I want to do is adopt the transitions. The way that we can do this um, Well, let's think about first what we want to happen. On the enter case, when the circles get created, what I want to do is transition them from being zero radius to having the radius that they're going to have for the rest of their lives. And that is R set to radius here. I'm going to move this logic over to here. But what, what I really want to do is initialize r to be 0. And that's what we can do here. I'll just set r to be 0, like this. And I want to, I want to have a transition to the next radius. However, there are some subtle things to consider here. Namely, this function needs to return the enter selection. That's just how this API works. It expects the enter selection to be returned. So that's why we can't just call dot transition like this because it's going to sort of mess things up internally. But uh, then the, the last line should be the, the radius, right? I cannot move the radius up and do the transition, right? Or the transition also return the, uh, returns the enter selection. Yeah, it, it can be a little confusing. So I'm just going to comment out that for now. And this is where we need to look to this pattern from, from the example, from observable. It uses dot call. And the reason why it uses dot call is that what gets returned from dot call is the enter selection. And the enter selection needs to be returned from this function, not the transition. But this is how we can create a transition derived from the enter selection and then use it to actually do our animations. And it takes as input the enter selection and it derives a transition from that. And the existence of this this transition is just strictly inside of this callback. Um, it doesn't get returned from this this outer function. Uh, what gets returned is the enter selection because dot call returns the selection that it was called on. So this is why you need to use dot call to get at what the transition should do. And in here is where we can say dot attr radius r and radius and all this stuff. And I might have like a mismatched paren or something, or missing comma. There it is. Yeah. So check this out. If I run this, I'm going to make a code change to trigger a run, make it full screen so you can see. This is the transition that we want. Yeah, I'll run that again so you can see it starts out as little dots that don't really exist to they grow into their final form. And actually, just to make it super visible, let me set the duration to like five seconds. Check this out. They're going to start at nothing, get bigger and bigger and bigger, and now they're big. And if you want to make it smaller after shows, then it's, you go in the exit, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we could apply the same pattern on exit. Um, yeah, exit is um, tricky. I think I'll leave that to another day. Um, Sure, no Be problem. Because we don't really have a use case for it at the moment. But yes, you can control what happens on exit. 
and in the example it's good like make it turn brown and then have it transition to go down and then remove it and the trick with exit and transitions is that you need to call dot remove on the transition because what we want to do is have it wait for the transition to finish and then remove the DOM element. But anyway, let's finish um, the desired update transition. Again, this this should return the update selection, so we need to use the same pattern of using dot call update dot call update and then update dot transition passing in the same transition object that we created earlier and this is where we want to set the CX and CY attributes so now when this runs it should slowly move there we go yeah so now we're having with this kind of a funny a funny effect that's going on because the transition is longer than the time that we're giving it to finish. The transition is five seconds, but we're changing stuff every two seconds. So let me just align on those values. Two seconds. Okay. This is correct. All right, and so let's, I just want to put a little icing on the cake here. Um, there is a magical thing that you can do with transitions. I'm going to make it one second and then do this magical um, trick, which is we can set a dot delay on the transition to be a function that takes as input one row and also the index and we can return the index times let's say 10 or 100 so you can see what the effect of this is oh you can't really see it um, I don't know if it actually worked What this should do is make it so that there is a sort of a staggering effect where not all the dots move at the same time. Um, I thought this would work. Uh, Kohan, um, I was doing a few tests another day, and I noticed that sometimes the index indexer and the d gets swapped uh, depends of oh really uh, I'm, yes I'm, I'm not sure why that happened i can check later and let you know but try try to change the i and d okay somehow i i i, I have my doubts but i'll try it yeah no no. Okay. I, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe we need to call this not here, but over here. After we call dot transition, what if we pass it in over there? Yeah, now it's working. <laughs> this is very cool. Very cool. Although it's it's set way too high but if if i set it to like a hundred we can see well let's see what happens yeah they all kind of move in a staggered manner uh, let me tweak things a little bit more i'm going to have just a slightly larger delay so instead of two seconds, let's make it three seconds. And then in the delay, let's set this delay to, I don't know, 50, 50 milliseconds to get the desired effect. Uh, 
that's still too high. Let's say like 10, 10 milliseconds. We can get a really beautiful sort of eye popping effect. There it is. That's the effect I was going for. So the whole thing finishes between uh, the intervals where it changes. But it's this beautiful, beautiful effect that I love with D3 transitions and setting the delay like this. It's got this like vroom, like this this really almost like a, a choreographed effect to it. Yeah, it's really cool, really cool. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, this is fun. So yeah, I try to, you know, spice it up with client work like if you add this to work that you do for other people they're gonna just freak out and love it so it's a nice icing on the cake that you can add all right and so lastly i i think we can we can transition on the axes as well so let me get rid of this reference code and just to wrap this up I'm sort of winging it here, but if I just say dot transition t before we call the axis, or let me do it on the x so we can see if it works. Let's see if that works. Yeah, it works. Boom. See that? Brilliant. Yeah, the way the D3 axis is implemented, it does, th it handles transitions correctly, which I just, it just finds so, I find it so beautiful. You can pass a transition and it updates the axis in an animated fashion. Brilliant. All right, I think our animation work is complete. Any, uh, any questions or thoughts about this? Um. Uh, yeah, it actually it's another task. Um, uh, the last class uh, exercise was to put um, the, the title in the axis. I did it, but I'm not sure I did the right way. So I would like to see how you do it. Sure. Um... Because in this case, you have to update also the, the title, right? Exactly. Or is this the exercise for this class? <laughs> Actually, it is. <laughs> okay. Actually, it. it is. This is the perfect exercise. Okay. And the timing is perfect. We're getting to the end of the time here. Um, add axis labels. That updates. That are idempotent. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is a very good exercise that I will leave you all uh, to do. And just as a as a little hint, you're going to have to use that dot data and pass in an array of of null of one item, null or whatever. And um, so instead of just selection dot append text, it would be selection dot select all text dot y-axis label you're going to have to use a class to disambiguate between the two things just like we did with the axis uh, and yeah essentially apply the same pattern that we did for the group element that contains our our axes for the text labels and i think this is a great exercise uh, because it 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 actually paves the way to a lot of other things. Like if you try to add labels to this, you're going to quickly find that we don't have enough information. We need to add another another um, accessor to this component, which is going to be the X label. We're going to have to pass that in too, because this passes in a function. And from this function, we can't tell what the name is of the column. So we're going to have to add one additional thing to get it to work so I, that's why i think it's a good exercise yeah um 
current. Yeah. I was just curious about the arguments that are passed to join. And I noticed that there are a couple of lines that are duplicated, namely the CX and CY. Oh, and yeah. And I, I recall that you, you, you've bought a merge in the past to help uh, uh, remove that duplication. And I was just wondering whether there was something equivalent uh, for inside the uh, yeah, for, for, for inside the arguments. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled that you brought this up because duplicated logic is, is one of those things that I just hate. I just hate to see it. And so I would like to address it. It's a, it's a great call to address that. We've got duplicated logic for CX and CY. And it's not so bad. I mean, it's only two lines that are pretty simple. But still, it's duplicated logic. And you may find yourself with complex logic, you know, 10 lines of complicated stuff that you copy-paste between these two places, which is not ideal. And so the problem is this logic really needs to be executed at these two different places. Um, in the past, like if you if we don't have animated transitions, you know, like we did before I started adding this stuff, it could just go once at the at the end, because it when you put it here, it acts on the merged enter and update selections. But if you do it like that, you lose the animated transitions, like it's not it's not actually correct anymore. So let me go back to the way it was. Is it possible to me like create uh, a function, an external function that updates CX and CY? Then I call this function in the enter and inside the update. Is yes. it possible? Yes, exactly. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly about what I was going to do. Cool. <laughs> and so let's do it. I'll call it. Um, what's it going to do? It's going to be positioning the circles. So I'll, I'm just going to call it position circles. And this is going to take as input a selection that contains the circles. Um, so I'll just, I'll call it circles. We could call it anything. But it'll take that as input and what it will do is just going to have this side effect of calling .attr on that selection. And it could actually return circles, but doesn't really need to. Um, and then to invoke this, that... Um, doesn't need because uh, later you will change the R attribute, right? So it should return the, the circle or not? Well, it, it all depends on how we invoke it. Um, if we use dot call, then it does not matter what this function returns because dot call is going to return the selection of the circles anyway. So it really doesn't matter what this function returns. And, and, and this is how we can do it. We can just say dot call position circles. And then in the other place where we have the same logic, we can put the same thing, dot call position circles, like that. And it seems to work. And on the creation step, yeah, it seems to work OK. Yep. So yes, indeed, this is how you can do it. This is how you can reduce the duplicated logic across these two places. And I think this is the best way to do it because this this logic needs to be executed in both of these places. It needs to be, the circles need to be positioned before the radius transition happens. And they also need to be positioned every time things update. And so, yeah, refactoring it into a common function that's invoked in these two places, I think is a good move.
Yeah, that, that's perfect. Thank you very much uh, for for walking through that. Nice. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'm glad you caught that because um, when I was planning for this episode, that I had this in mind, like, oh yeah, at the end I'm going to refactor it, but I totally forgot. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> also, uh, do you have a? You, I think you mentioned in a previous lesson request animation frame. Um, oh, yeah. Versus uh, set interval. Interval. Do you have a preference for one over the other? Is is one more? Um, does one have benefits over the other? Well, they have different properties. Request animation frame is actually used internally by D3 transitions. And when you invoke request animation frame and pass a callback, that callback will be invoked as soon as the next render cycle happens. And it depends on your system setup for example if your if your monitor is 60 frames a second which is most common or 30 frames a second which might happen if you have like a 4k monitor on a computer that's not very powerful and regardless of of your actual hardware request animation frame invokes that function on the next animation frame it's called an animate they call it an animation frame that means when the display updates so let's assume you have a, like a standard setup where your refresh rate on your monitor is 60 frames a second. That means, and that's that's standard, like when you move your mouse around on the screen, if, if you just sit there and up move your mouse around, you're going to see that it's not a continuous thing. Like it actually just appears at different places really fast. And every time it appears, uh, that's 1 60th of a second, which is approximately 16 milliseconds and so the benefit of using request animation frame for things like animation is that it it synchronizes correctly with your display whereas if you use request uh, if you use set interval for animation like if you if you were to use set interval and pass 16 milliseconds it would give you it would call your function roughly every animation frame but it might call it twice between animation frames sometimes. Or it might call it once across two animation frames, which would result in a, a slight, almost undetectable visual glitch in the animation. And so if you're, if you're doing animations, then request animation frame is the best thing to do, hands down. Uh, and, and that's why D3 transitions use it internally. For a time, it wasn't supported by all browsers. And so for a couple of years there, you had to, you had to implement a fallback that used um, set timeout or set, yeah, set timeout is the, is the like a variant of set interval that just calls the function once. Um, so I remember back in the day, I had to do like detection, like if request animation frame is there, then use it. Otherwise use set timeout and pass 16 milliseconds or whatever 1,000 divided by 60 is. Um, and so that would be an approximation. However, if you have other use cases that are not animation, like what we have here, um, like where you, you want to wait for one second or three seconds, then set interval is the thing to use, actually. Um, yeah, set interval is more appropriate when you have longer time scales that you're considering. But if you're doing animation, then request animation frame is, is the thing to use. Yeah, that, that, yeah. that makes total sense. Thank you. Nice. Uh, one other question. Yeah. Um, so if we go back to scatterplot.js. Um, and so, uh, where you or I guess the where did you have the abstraction out for position circles? Okay, yeah, there. Um, the question I had in terms of and just sort of style and uh, readability, I really like the notion of putting position circles there. Um, it, it just reflects what's actually happening. It, from a, a sort of a coding style, would someone do the same thing with the dot call enter? Like 
comes a little later, right after it. Um, it just seems, at least to me, a little strange, but that's probably how JavaScript works and so forth. But could you actually name that as a function that is, you know, uh, more reflective of what's happening, just like you did position circles? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I'm going to select some text. Do you mean this block here? Yeah, yeah that dot call enter. Um, which, or this inner um, one here. Yeah, yeah, that inner one yeah. there. Um, just could you name that, uh, create a function, just like you did dot call position circles in a way that um, it reflects what it's actually doing there. In other words, making the um, uh, radius bigger or transitioning. Yeah, grow radius, exactly. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just a function. Okay. So for sure, I mean, um, you can you can do all sorts of refactorings like this and organize the code. And I like doing things like this because in a way it's documentation, like variable name is in a sense documentation for what it does. Exactly. That's where I was going with this. Yeah. Um, okay. For sure. And so I love, you know, when I can, I love to structure code like uh, almost like a book. Exactly where you learn yes. about okay this grow radius hmm, what is that it's some cryptic code that sets the radius but it, it says grow so that therefore it must be like growing from zero to something and so yep. for sure i would encourage doing this sort of uh, slight refactoring to make the code more readable and clear yeah Great. and it's thank it's you a, you're welcome you're welcome but but yeah it's totally a stylistic thing like i personally probably wouldn't do that just because it's setting the radius on the line before uh but how you know it's totally personal preference like this may be more readable for somebody coming at this code for the first time for sure so yeah up to you okay thanks that helps yeah my pleasure but what's going on that the the radios oh the radius just right it's in, in the enter so it's, it's just begin in yeah okay i got it it's just in the enter it's not when it moves okay see cool. if we if we wanted to take this to the extreme we could say initialize radius and pair these together and so instead of saying right here attr r is zero we could say dot call initialize radius and that's what this would do right here and this actually implicitly returns it which we don't need to do so that's why I'm going to add these curly braces um, and actually same, same with this we don't need to return it so this is like the final form. If you were if you were to want to, you know, factor out things and name them, this works as well. So it's super clear now that like, okay, first we're going to position the circles, then we're going to initialize the radius. And if you read it, you realize it's initialized to zero. And then we're gonna grow the radius from zero to something else using a transition. So yeah, yeah, this code it's definitely more organized, more readable in, in a certain sense, but it's also more code. So it's always a balance between how verbose and clear do you want to be versus how minimal and concise and arguably cryptic you want to be. Yeah, there's trade-offs for sure. All right, maybe I'll take one more if there, if there is another, and then we'll call it, wrap it up for the day. Anyone? Well, Curran, I have one that's uh, on not on this chart, but on a, a, for, uh, a force layout. So I don't know if anybody has any other questions on this. You know, I'll be I'll be working on force layout in the future. So I my inclination is to is to hold off on that until we're dealing with it. Uh, but I'm I'm happy to, um, happy to field a question about it actually. 
it's it's mostly I see some places where um, you know, the links are set up as an empty array, and then how do you get that data to do that <laughs> so that instead of me having to do source target for you know a thousand different data points, I just do the automatic magic javascript and it does it for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's some there's some magic stuff that happens with d3 force to be sure um i need the force to be with me on this yeah it, i it, get it, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah when you and i think when you call for i don't remember exactly but when you pass data in there's some kind of magic initialization that happens um, but I, I will be doing force layouts in, in future episodes. So maybe hold that thought. Any idea of how long? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I, I haven't planned out the full series, but I think from here on out, I'm debating to go deeper into this, um, to add menus to this so you can interactively select. So that's one direction to go. Another direction to go would be to do a bunch of uh, things where we start from scratch and just implement different visualization techniques like a bar chart, uh, a line chart, an area chart, a pie chart from scratch with just enter and not this general update pattern stuff. Um, so th those are some of the things that I'm going to be doing in the future. Um, any any okay. preferences for, for which direction to take it? Uh I would say I would say uh, menus are a really good idea if you're uh, designing this for a user, having them have the power of choice over what what shows on the screen is right. powerful. Exactly, that's what I was thinking too. So, like now that we've got mm -hmm. it to this point, it's a cool technical demonstration. But you know, we're going to have to add the axis labels, and if you were to develop this for an actual use case of someone needing to visualize the data the logical next step would be to make it so that you can choose like you said which yes i will also appreciate that functionality you know yeah right on right on i like it sweet yeah i agree with ken and everyone yeah sweet yeah yeah let's do it so probably next week i'll add menus to this one and uh, yeah, that'll uncover some complexities along the way. All right, I think I'll wrap it up for today. So Thank you. thanks everyone for joining. Thanks so much. Thanks, Karen. My yes, pleasure. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, this was a, a lot nice of fun. Weekend. This was a lot of fun with a lot of people here. I love it. So um, yeah, hope you all can join next week as well and beyond. So yep. have a good weekend. Take care. All right. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Karen. Bye. Bye. Welcome, everyone, to episode 11 of Get It Right in Black and White, Charts with Menus. We've got a full house today. We've got Felipe, Adil, Anita, and Eric Dasbach. I think I'm saying that right. Is that right? Dasbach. Great. So, yeah, let's start by reviewing the submissions from last week. Visit forum from last week. All right, so the exercise was add labels to this reusable scatter plot. Let's see what folks did. Wow, this is pretty nice. The labels are animated. Very cool. Nice work. It's kind of surprising. The arrow, that's a good question. Let's check it out. I guess it would be in here somewhere. It's an actual character. See that? Yeah. Yeah, pretty neat. There's actually a lot of um, 
surprising characters that you can use. I think it's from Unicode. But there's arrows, there's little little dots, emojis, of course. You could put emojis in here and it should work. Nice. Okay, so the the axes the labels are animated as well with the same pattern. Very nice. Cool, let's take a look at what some other folks did. This is pretty cool. That's what the animation pattern is. It just disappears and then comes up from the bottom. Hello. Welcome. Perfect timing. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but uh, but you just joined the call. Welcome. I think this is the first time you're here. You want to uh, introduce yourself a bit? Uh, Kaustav? I'm not sure how to say your name, but welcome, Kaustav. You want to introduce yourself? You're muted. I'm not. I can't hear you. Welcome, Kathy. Hello. I think this is the first time you're here. You want to introduce yourself a little? Oh yes. Got it. Yeah, I'm 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 experimenting with opening up the the live chat, the live audio chat to everyone watching, because um, yeah, I think there's a lot of value in people, you know, stopping me, asking questions. We can have a lively discussion. All right, glad you could join. We have a full house today. Yeah, no, I, I would suggest you close the YouTube window. It's a little tricky of a setup. Yeah, because there's delayed audio coming from the YouTube window, and and there's the Google Meet window. So if you're in the Google Meet, you have to close the YouTube window. Sorry, it's a little it's a little confusing. Oh, good. Welcome, Kostov. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, I've I've seen your work recently, and it's really great. You want to introduce yourself a little bit? Excellent. Oh, this one. Nice. Yeah, this is really beautiful work. Yeah, I've been I've been really happy to see see your work in here and I'm thrilled you could join us today. This is amazing. This is amazing. So yeah, this is this is sort of a dream come true for me with this series. I was hoping to collect sort of a, a core group of people who are following along intensely with this stuff. And this is actually what happened. So just thank you so much for for joining me on this journey. This is amazing. 
So I was just showing your work. Uh, Ko Kostov, how do you say your name again? I'm sorry. Kostov. Kostov. Nice. Do you want to present this work a little bit See and, and explain how you did it? Very nice. Right. Yep. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's actually pretty nice. That's a pretty nice technique. You're actually checking the value to see if it's a number or not. Nice work. Yeah, so if folks if folks haven't seen this type of operator, this is a really nice operator. You can you can say type of something and that operator returns a string and it could be a number like the string number or the string string or object or anything and this tells you what type of thing it is so this is checking the first row at the certain column what type of of thing is it nice so it's filtering just by the numeric columns great work I see. Yeah, continue has to be an expression on its own. And so if you wanted to do that, let me just show you real quick how you could do that. So this is using the for in construct, which is slightly different from for of, uh, but this is this is working fine. So the thing is, the ternary operator it creates an expression that has some return value. And so, you know, if this value is true, then it returns the first thing right after the question mark. If it's false, it returns the thing after the colon. However, continue, continue needs to be its own separate statement. So if you wanted to use continue, you would need to do it like this. You would need to use an if statement, an, an if block right here. And, and this use of the ternary operator is a bit confusing but because it has a side effect. It's typically not recommended to, to have a side effect, meaning pushing a new thing onto the array uh, inside of a ternary operator. It's just a little bit confusing. So this is how I would suggest to do it. Use an if, and inside of that if block, do, this, do the thing with a side effect. So it's really clear that, okay, this is... This deserves its own line, it's doing something, it has a side effect, it's changing this array. And then in the else block, then you could use uh, continue, but yeah, I was about to say like, but you don't really need that because it's going to just continue and do nothing anyway. So nice. Nice. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad uh, this came up. Yeah, continue. It's a control flow thing that you only need to use if you're inside of some like deeply nested thing, and then you, you know, inside of some deeply like if you have four, like three, like I don't know, two or three nested if statements, and you come come to some case where you need to continue, 
that's where you would want to use um, continue. And I can't think of an example offhand. But if it's just a case like this, you don't actually need to use continue at all. So this is another way of doing it. Yeah, so with the for in construct, this actually works because it's block scoped. So this block here, so const, it, it declares this variable called col, column. And you could also use let here, that would work too. Uh, you could even use var if you're old school. <laughs> but const works. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. And um, what this what this block of code is actually doing is it's filtering the columns to have only the numeric columns. And so I can't help but just also suggest another alternate way of doing it as well, which is like this. Const numeric columns equals Um, there is no list comprehension, but there are many useful methods on arrays that you can use. And so this for in construct actually uses the keys of this object. So you could say object.keys of the first row. This gives you an array of all of these columns. And then you can say dot filter which is an array method. And a lot of this stuff you could do in Python with list comprehensions, but there is no list comprehension in JavaScript. It would be cool if there were. But we can just use these constructs like filter. And so we can pass in a function to filter. And this function can just return this Boolean. You know, if the type of the first row at this particular column is number, then return true. Otherwise, it returns false. And I'll just use prettier to format this code. And this actually does the exact same thing as all of this. It's just a more concise way of doing it. Understood. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And I can see that. Like I, I can see that you're, you're learning and trying new things, and this is a, this is a very good way of, um, like this. I can, yeah, I, it's great. I can see your learning process, which is amazing. And so this is a good, uh, first working version, and then you can simplify it with the addition of these different constructs like filter. VisHub does not do linting. I tried to get it to work with linting, but it was causing all sorts of instabilities. It started crashing. Uh, that's something on the roadmap for VisHub. It would be amazing to do linting in VisHub. That's something I really would like to see, but unfortunately, not right now. But the closest thing we have is Prettier, this little P, which, which formats the code for you. I find it super useful. And along these Go ahead. Sure. It's an array of strings. And it, just for some example, if we were to test against string, 
it should return just species, and it does, yeah. Species is actually uh, something that uh, sort of throws, throws a wrench in the works of how our scatterplot works, and this is, uh, is going to be related to the exercise for today. And we'll get more into it later. But yeah, this is an alternate way to do that filtering. Now let's see, what time is it? It's 11.20. Well, let's just see a couple more exercise submissions. Here's another one from Kostov. Um, I don't know which one I clicked, actually. Hold on. This is the one I wanted to click. Datasaurus Dozen D3 Scatterplot. Oh, this is amazing. The Datasaurus. So good. So good. Nice. So this... It, excellent. Yeah, great work. This this is awesome. The Datasaurus data set, by the way, it's it's got a lot of history to it. Um, I can go into it at another time. But it's a great data set because it it has this picture of a dinosaur that you can see here. And the point of it is that if you take all sorts of statistical summaries of this data set, they're all like the same for all the different columns but if you visualize it you get totally different things like that data source and dots and the star and the point of it and the circle here and the point of this data set is to show that statistical summaries lose a lot of information and when you visualize the data you can see these patterns and information that you cannot see with just the statistical summaries very nice And here's another one with labels. This one blew my mind when I saw it. It actually does the animated general update pattern example within the label. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah, really a lot of attention to detail on this one. It's <laughs> I was happy to see this one. It made me laugh. I'm like, oh my god, this is <laughs> this is so funny. Yeah, so really nice work, really nice work here by Andrea. Nice. Oh, here's one from Eric Dasbach. Nice. You want to talk about this a little bit? Ooh, cool animation. Right. Nice. Well, this is very nice. This is very nice. However, however, I do see some telltale signs that the labels are not adhering to the general update pattern. See, if you could see around the edges, they're like very sharp and crisp. That indicates to me that there's actually a bunch of labels on top of one another. So let me just go in here and see what's happening with that and how we might fix it. So the y-axis label 
looks fine, actually. This one is behaving correctly. Nice work with the dot data null. Um, Oh, nice. Oh, nice. That's great. That's great. I'm happy to see this like cross communication happening. But here's where there's still a problem. See, with this one, it's just appending a new group element every time for, for axis bottom year. But it's very close to what it needs to be. I mean, all you need to do here is selection dot select all uh, dot axis bottom year dot join G and now oh sorry 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 I forgot the dot data null here now if you see the animation play out this 2020 is is looking correct. It's not getting that crisp thing happening to it. So yeah, this is the pattern right here that you can apply to all the different text labels like this one, United States, and this other one here. Nice. So yeah, you're well on your way. Nice. Yeah, my pleasure. Great work. Great work. And while I'm in here, I just kind of <laughs> kind of want to see if we make this delay i times like 20. I kind of want to see it play out in its full slow beauty. See, this is this is really cool. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's <laughs> look what's happening here. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's what you got to do. You just got to dial it in. Dial it in. Or alternatively, you could make this a function of the um number of rows in the data. That's actually something I wanted to do earlier. But yeah, it's it's it gets a little detailed. But yeah, excellent work, excellent work. All right, last one from Andre. Check it out. Oh, is it broken? Oh, this is this is just a bug. This is a bug in VizHub. I don't know what this is coming from. I've been meaning to investigate this. I think just the data set was taking a long time to load. Oh, it's working now. Nice. Very cool. So it's just plugging in a different data set to that one with the um, with the transitions on the labels. Nice. Very nice work. Oh, let's check it out. Oh, you can only hear me? Oh my god, seriously. This is a disaster. Oh my gosh. It's been just my audio coming through this whole time. Can one of you say something just to check the levels? Uh.
Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's a. It's yeah, a sorry, I I had my YouTube closed. Otherwise, I said something. Um... I didn't quite realize. Yeah, it's it's my problem on the OBS config. Hold on, just let me try to figure this one out. All right, can you can one of you say something? Testing. Nice. Hello. There it is. What is this link? Is it okay, now it's coming through. Oh, this is a disaster. So all the audio so far was was lost from everybody else, but now it's coming through. Sorry about that. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, let no me, you, you saw it before the class start, but uh, the question is in the um, uh, it's in the meet uh, chat. Oh, the meet chat. Okay, this is too yeah. much for me to monitor. It's too many chats. Yeah, I, I, that's why I said because it's. Too much places. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you need to take break every half hour and check around. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, now let's get into today's episode. So I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to keep this to a half hour. What we're going to try to do today is add menus to our animated scatter plot so that instead of just cycling through different columns, it's going to be driven by the choice of the user. You know, what do I want to see right now? And so you can click the, a menu and select which column to use for both X and Y. Oops. So I'm going to start from what we did last week, this animated reusable scatter plot, and I'll drop the link here in the chat if you'd like to follow along. So I'll start by forking this one, and I'll say um, animated reusable T3 scatter plot, or just I'll say scatter plot with menus or reusable how about animated animated scatter plot with menus okay so what I'd like to do here is add menus how do you add menus it turns out there's this thing called the select tag in HTML and it looks something like this here's an example from W3 schools this is the sort of basic built-in menu that you get from HTML and this is this is good for us we can use this so I'm going to copy this code as a reference example and I'm thinking we can use the same pattern that we used for our scatter plot for the menu. So we're going to want to be able to say import menu from dot slash menu. And we can use the same reusable chart pattern for this menu component. So I'll create a new file called menu.js. And in here, I'm just going to paste this as a reference and comment it out. And then I'm going to copy all of this scatterplot stuff, paste it in here, and change scatterplot to menu. And, and then just remove everything inside of here except the core skeleton of what we need. And I'll keep one example of an accessor because we're going to want to have a bunch of these. All right, so this is the basic skeleton of what we want to do. And then let's 
let's um, invoke this from index.js to get to a starting point for development. I'm going to get rid of this set interval stuff because it's going to be replaced by uh, in the interaction of selection. And we have this columns thing here which can drive the menus. So we want to call uh, dot call menu on something, but we don't have that thing yet. And I think what that thing should be is a div that we append to the body. So maybe up here, I'm going to make another block called menu container where we select the body and we can append a div. A div is just a, a container element in HTML. And maybe let's give it a class of menu container just so that we can style it with CSS. And then we can use this to invoke our menu component. So what this uh, is... I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So this um, HTML elements, uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, attach them to SVG because they are basic HTML elements, so they go to body element only. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, within the SVG element, you can only use certain certain tags that make sense within an SVG, like circle and line and all that stuff. If you want to use a div inside of an SVG, there is actually a construct you can use to do this. It's called foreign element, SVG foreign element. Um, but I don't use that very much because I find it confusing to have divs inside of your SVG and it has some weird behavior. So what I generally do is keep the SVG graphics totally separate from the UI elements, the regular old DOM elements. And so this is why I'm setting up a div, giving it a class of menu container, and then we can put stuff into there. So we can instantiate our menu, pass it into dot .call, and then inside of menu, when it gets invoked, the selection is this div. It's the parent div. So let's just try something. Selection.text foo, just as an, a, a, an example of something. Notice how it doesn't actually show up anywhere, because I think it's showing up below the SVG, like beyond the boundary of the page. So what we want to do is style it so that it appears at the top of this page. So we've got this class, menu-container. In our styles.css, we can access that and I'm going to just position these menus on top of this SVG. To do that, we can say position fixed top zero and left zero. This will put it at the top left corner. So now we can see there it is foo at the top left corner. Um, I would like to ultimately center all of this stuff, and I think I'll do that now just while I'm in the CSS. Uh, to do that, I like to use Flexbox, which you can set up with Display Flex. And this is a whole thing that you know I could spend a bunch of time talking about, but suffice it to say that when you use Display Flex, it opens up this whole uh, landscape of options for you, which is extremely well documented in this thing called A Complete Guide to Flexbox, which has been a really great reference for me uh, whenever using Flexbox. So what I want to do is center it, so we can use Justify Content, um, I think Space Around is what I'd like to use, so that we have one menu on one side 
and another menu on the other side. So justify content space around. Um, it's still in the corner. Uh, I think we need uh, right zero as well, which will make this div span the whole the whole space from left to right. And now we can see that little foo is in the middle here, which is what we want. All right, we're going to actually want two menus, one for X and one for Y. So let's scaffold that out now while we're here. I will put these as children of menu containers. So I'll call it um, maybe X menu container. Or how about I'll just call it uh, X menu. And we can do the same. We can append a div, give it a class of X menu container. Um, but, you know, I don't think we actually need different classes for this. So I'll just append a div. The simpler, the better. So we've got X menu and Y menu. And down here, we can say x menu dot call, and then y menu dot call. And see now, we have two different labels, one on the left and one on the right. This is looking good. This is what I wanted to ultimately ultimately end up as: one menu on the left, one menu on the right. Now that we have our positioning down, let's develop this menu component. Uh, using this this example code as a reference. So I think the menu should be comprised of roughly this structure where there's a label and then there's a select element that has a bunch of options inside of it. Let's begin by creating this uh, label. We can say selection dot select all label dot data null. I'm just going to start by using this this idempotent pattern from the beginning so we don't end up with any bugs later if we invoke it multiple times. Dot join label like this. And the label is for this select and that has some implications for the UI like if you I think if you click on the label it gives focus to the select or something like this um, I'm just using this as a as a template because I think it's all correct so let's begin by setting this for attribute I can say dot ATTR for and I'll use something called ID, which is something that should be um, configurable. So let ID equals nothing to start, and we can we can set up an accessor for ID. Like this. Uh, what is where is label? What do you mean, where is label? Where is this variable? This is just an element here, select all label. Yeah, we're, we're, the Maybe. idea is we're going to create this structure in, inside the DOM. And so there's no variable called label. It's just the tag name label. And it's going to appear as some text next to the menu that says what the menu is about yeah but in this case you okay i, I gotta be you're selecting all the labels but there is none label right right now correct and then you will create but what what if we have 
a label in in our in our page right if there's already a label there as a child of this selection then it will it will select that and use it instead of creating a new one this is what this this whole pattern is all about this item potent rendering pattern the first time it's invoked it'll create a new label but subsequent times it's going to use the existing label and then change the change its attributes okay so we are using this fake data for now. So what is the real label in our that, uh, Iris data set? Well, that's where we're going to have to configure it. So I'm beginning by, by, by setting up this ID. And in this dummy example, the ID would be cars. So 4 equals cars here, name equals cars, and ID equals cars over here. But we have not set it up yet. And what I'm doing is I'm working on I'm working on the the accessor so that we can set this up. So I'm creating an accessor called ID, and over in index.js, when we set up the menu for X, we can we can call dot ID and pass in the particular ID. I'll call it X dash menu for example, and the key is that the ID for the Y menu needs to be different. So now this will work because we just set up this um, accessor. So we can call dot ID, pass in the ID, that invokes this function here, which sets the variable called ID to the value. Oh, we need to get rid of this plus because that will, that will parse the string to a number which we don't want here. And then once that is set, uh, when, when it gets invoked, it'll set for that ID. Now we need to put the, the text of the label, which I think I'll call label. Or how about um, label text, just so it's not confusing. We want the text inside of this label to be label text. So in our in our rendering code here, we can say dot text, which sets the inner text of the element to be label text. And again, we need to set up uh, an accessor where we just change ID to label text. like this. And then over in index.js we can call dot label text for these two different menus and pass in different things. So for x it would be x colon I think is what I want it to be. And then for y it would be y colon. Alright and then it shows up like that. x is here and y is here. Excellent. So far, so good. Now, let's begin working on this, this the actual menu part of it, which is sort of what all of this has been building up to. The general update pattern here, um, or yeah, this item potent rendering pattern will be the same, but instead of a label element, it's going to be a select element. And here we want to set name and ID to be ID, which is very similar to this line here where we, we're setting four on the label. So I'm going to use that same pattern, but instead of four, it's going to be name and ID like this. Now, notice that we have sort of a stub of a menu <laughs> that doesn't have anything in it. So we're getting there. Now we need to populate these options. Yeah, Hi, Karan. I just had a quick question here. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so when we're doing this select tag, uh, we're passing two attributes, name and ID. 
and in the example as well, they are both set to the same value. So, is this intentional or is this just specific to this particular example? Yeah, this is intentional. And to be honest, I haven't dug too deep into each of those things. I just sort of blindly copied it from the example that I found. But here's another example of an HTML select element from MDN where they do the same thing, where the label is for, and that has to match up with the ID. But I see here that name is different. And I do, I do not actually fully understand the role of the name attribute on a select. So let's see if we can find that name. It's used to specify the name of the control. I mean, this is one of those things where I'm just going to sort of blindly follow the example. Well, what about ID? Yeah, I'm not really sure. But the thing is, when you when you click on when you click on the label, it gives that menu focus. That's why I think it's important that these match. But apparently, okay, okay. only the ID needs to match and not the name. So we Could it be like the ID is, the name is sort of like a class uh, to apply, say, CSS styling or something like that? Could be. Could be, but then, I mean, if you want to use CSS, you may as well just give it a class and be sort of standard about it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it would work to just leave out the name, honestly. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, but the four should match the ID. That's the main thing. Correct. Yeah, four should match ID. Got um, it. Got it. Thanks. Um, I think I think the ID should be unique to the whole HTML document. Right. Yeah. Generally, ID needs to be unique in the whole document. And to get to the bottom of this, we can do some experiments. Like if I click on X, see how the menu gets focus? And I'm curious, if I if I leave out both of these, name and ID, and I click on that label, it does not get focus. So we know that one of these is important. Uh, let me try just setting name and see what happens. If I just set name and I click on it, it does not get focus. It does not get focus at all. However, if I leave out name and I just set ID and then I click on the label, it does get focus. This is the behavior that I'm after. This is why this is the whole reason why I'm setting this up. So, you know, maybe I'll just be a little cowboy about it and leave out name cuz like I like to have this philosophy of like if I don't understand why it's there, I'm not going to put it there. You know, if it doesn't do anything for me, there's no need to put it. So thanks for asking that question. I have always wondered about this, actually. And now with this little experiment, we got to the bottom of it. So I'm just going to set ID and be done with it. Yeah. But ID generally, yeah, it does need to be unique on the whole page. That's why it's important that the ID is different for X and Y. All right, great, let's continue. Let's add these options to our menu. Inside the select, we want a bunch of options, which is where we can continue this expression here. So we're inside of the select. In here, we can say dot select all option dot data options which we have not defined yet I'm gonna define that dot join option and then each of these options needs to have a value attribute and also some text and the text inside the option element is what you see on the screen 
the value is more like an internal ID that the code uses. So let us let us assume that each element of this options array, which we're going to define in a minute, will have a couple things. Namely, a value property, which we can use here to set the value attribute, like this, and also a, um, a text attribute. So I'm going to say dot text, and here we can also pass in a function that takes as input one row, and we can return text like that. Yeah, this should be the complete code required to render our set of options. Now we just need to define options. And options is something we want to define from the outside, so I'm going to set up an accessor for options. So we define the variable at the top. I'll use this uh, this template here to create a new accessor for options. I'll just replace ID with options everywhere here. All right, and then in index.js, we need to pass in our options to both of these. And columns is pretty close to options. However, it only has the actual columns. It doesn't have the labels that we want to use. I mean, we could use the same for both, but my preference would be to set up objects for each of these that have labels as well. So value will be the original value here. And then from here, we can say text will be some string. And for pedal width, that should be uppercase pedal space uh, width. I'll just type these out. These are the labels that we're going to see on the screen, so they should be nice, human-readable stuff, not this lowercase underscore delimited thing, which is kind of like uh, nerdy. You know, it's not really, not really presentable. So pedal length and sepal length. All right, uh, these are actually our options. So I'll just rename that variable to options, which we can pass into the options accessor for both of these different menus. All right, now we have options in our menu. Look at that, it worked. Amazing. Amazing. All right, now is the fun part where we get to wire it up and make it all work, make it all happen. This is where things get a little a little tricky. What we want to do, um, I want to be able to call dot on on this thing here, which is generally how we add event listeners to things. Typically, the first argument is the, the name of the event on change. And then the second argument is some callback where it accepts a value and it does something. So for now, I'll just say console.log value. And later on, we'll have that actually interact with the scatter plot to change, to change x and y. But for now, let's just put it like this to see if it works. And this is where it's kind of a challenging thing to, to iterate on this pattern, this reusable charts pattern, to handle events. Luckily, there are a couple D3 packages that do this. One of them is D3 Brush. And I, I like to study the source code of D3 itself to see how to do some of this stuff. You'll see that 
the, D the implementation of D3 Brush uses this other package for events called D3 Dispatch, which is what we can use as well. This is, this is part of D3. This is how you can set up components with event listeners. So the way that Brush does it is first it imports Dispatch from D3 Dispatch, which we're going to have to do as well. So I'll just do that now. Import Dispatch from, in our case, D3. Um, and let's see where it's used. Listeners equals Dispatch passing in various types of events that could potentially happen. Well, let's do that as well. I'll say const listeners equals dispatch. We're only going to want one type of event, which is change. So I'm going to put that like that here. This is the conduit by which we can emit events, and we can event we can listen to these events externally. And let's see. Where is listeners used? Ah, to emit an event, we need to use dot call. But first, we need to expose dot on to the external world. And this is the pattern that D3 Brush uses. It calls listeners dot on dot apply listeners and the arguments to this function. And if that value is the same as listeners, then it returns the, the brush. Otherwise, it returns the thing that was returned by those listeners. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have not fully dissected and grokked everything that's happening here. I just know that it works. And Mike Bostock, the author of this module, must have really thought this through. So I'm going to do something a little uncharacteristic and just copy-paste this whole thing without fully understanding it. And of course I'll we have to change brush to my and this effectively exposes the dot on method so that you can add an event listener to this menu. So now our code should work. It's going to add the event listener the next thing we need to do is actually emit that event from our event listener every time that the menu changes. This is where we need to iterate our rendering logic to add an event listener to the select element itself, uh, which we can do with dot on change, I'm pretty sure. And this will take as input an event, which is the DOM event that, that's provided to you from, from the DOM environment. Now let's console.log event here just to see if this is uh, working at all. I'll open up the console and then if I select something from this menu, we get this event. It worked. All right. I just know from experience that you can use event.target and then unpack um, the value from this. Uh, dot value is in here somewhere among all this stuff. So event.target.value is how you extract the actual thing that you clicked on from this. So now if I click on pedal width, whoops, sepal width rather, it's, it prints out the name of the column, sepal underscore width, like this. And if I click uh, sepal length, it outputs sepal length. This is the value that we want to dispatch to our outer event listeners. And let me again refer to D3 dispatch. There is a method here called um, dot .call. This is the method that you need to use to dispatch events, to tell all the, the event listeners, like, hey, this event actually happened. 
So what we need to do is call type, and then the the context object, which will resolve to dot this. I'm not really a big fan of using this. Like we don't need to use this necessarily. But the third argument is important. It's the arguments that get passed. So let's see how to how to actually set this up. Our instance of dispatch is called listeners here. So in here we can say listeners.call. The first argument will be the type, which is the name of the event. In our case, it's going to be change. The second argument is going to be the the context that resolves to this, and I'm not I'm not a fan of using that. So I'm just going to pass in null to say like this is not this is not a thing that we're doing. It's not a thing that we're using. But the third argument is important, which is going to be event dot target dot value. This will make it so that the na the column that you click on is passed to the outer event listener that we've defined in index.js. So now let's just say console.log in index.js to be sure this is where we are. Now, let's see, did it work? If I click on this thing, it worked. Boom. So I clicked on it. The event sort of got forwarded through this component to the outer index.html. And now, in index.html, we get notified when we, when we change this. So this is, this is the pattern that you can use to introduce events to your components. And let me just give another overview of how this is working. We import dispatch from D3, which gives us this event emitter construct from D3. We instantiate it once when we instantiate the menu. It's an instance of dispatch that only has one type of event, which I'm calling change. We could call it anything, but I'm calling it change, because that's sort of a standard name for menus. We're calling that listeners in here. When we render our select element, we're adding a change event listener to that element, which is a, it's a standard um, thing that emits events from the DOM. When we get that event, we are extracting the value that was clicked on. And then we're using listeners.call to essentially forward that event through our D3 dispatch construct. So what this is doing, it's essentially emitting a change event, and it's it's just passing in uh, the value, which is the the name of the column that was clicked on. So you know we could just pass in the event, but I, I my preference is to to eliminate all that complexity for the external listener, so that all you need to do is is use the value that was passed in to this callback here. Right? So I, I realize this is a lot. Um, this was actually pretty difficult to figure out how to do, but I think it's the right pattern. I want to pause now and ask, you know, are there any questions so far? Yeah, the, the, the null that you did there that's supposed to be this and that, uh, what what's that? Um, yeah, we can dig into that because I it's it's a little it's sort of a mysterious thing. I'll pass in foo here, just to demonstrate what this is. In our index.js, if we use the old school function syntax, not the fat arrow notation, to define this function, then we can say console.log this and I'll get rid of all that other stuff so we can just isolate that. I think there's a typo in function. Oh, whoops. Function. 
Now, if I select something from that menu, foo gets output to the console. It's um, it goes to like the history of JavaScript and object-oriented programming. You know, there's a bunch of patterns throughout history of JavaScript where people try to make it object-oriented and use the keyword this extensively. But I think, like, to me, that's sort of a thing of the past. Like, there's no need to use this at all. Um, and it, it's just, it's essentially another way of passing another thing into this callback in addition to the value. But I personally just don't see, I just don't see the the usefulness in it. But if, if you wanted to do it, if you wanted to use this, then you could. Um, but is this like uh, we have like two combo boxes um, does does it somehow to uh, I don't know identify which combo box are you using or could be use it like this or not I mean one thing I could imagine is passing in my here so that it would resolve to the instance of our menu component in the external listener. So you could say like, I don't know. So you could manipulate the menu or, or something like that. But like I said, I don't really get it. I don't really get the point of it. It's just sort of okay. an inherited thing from, from patterns of the past that we've sort of moved away from in modern times. Um, so that's why I don't really like to use it. It's just a confusing thing. Um, like in D3, a lot of the time, it, this is referred, is, is the, is the DOM node, but it just goes to show you in JavaScript, the keyword, this could resolve to literally anything. It depends on how you invoke the function. That's why I just find it confusing to use the keyword, this, when you're developing software. Um, but this is it, it. This is how it's how it could be used. You could pass something in as the second argument could be anything, and then in the callback, if you use the old school function notation, then you can use the this keyword, and it will resolve to whatever you pass in as the second argument here. Okay. Um. I'm not familiar with this. I'm familiar with that you would listen to an event using the on and attach a, a function that will that will be operated on when that event is fired. And I think I missed the point why we're doing all this, why we're using the D3 dispatch. Oh, we're using D3 dispatch so that we can essentially define our own set of events in this component. So we can call dot on change and pass a callback, which is sort of the ideal API that I would envision for for adding an event listener. And it's it's a way of decoupling the DOM, like what we're doing when we actually render the thing from the component itself. It means we can add this event listener to our menu component. And then internally, that menu component can choose to fire that event anytime inside. So I mean, we could we could fire this event anytime. It just so happens that we're listening to the change event on our select element and then essentially forwarding that event. I see. So for example, suppose you're changing one of the select but you want to change both of the axes, you will be able to fire two events based on a selection on one of your selects. If you need to. Well, I mean, if you wanted to do that, then you could just change what the body of the listener does. You could like set one axis and then set another. You don't need necessarily two different events for that. Yeah. But let me revert this change because using this is confusing and I prefer the, the, the arrow the fat arrow syntax for functions. 
And then in our menu.js, we just pass null as the second argument. So so yeah, this is this is just generally the pattern that you you can use if you want to introduce events into your reusable components that you generate with this with this towards reusable charts pattern. And the reason why we're using D3 dispatch is so that we can control the set of events. It's a generalized pattern. Um, to be clear, where you can you can set it up like this, you can set up dot on like this, and then you could add any sort of interaction. Like let's say for example you wanted to make it so that your scatter plot could listen to events when you click on the, the circles. You could use the same pattern to accomplish that. So the pattern can be the same, it's just that the things that trigger those events could be different depending on whatever your component is. I wanted to introduce this general pattern because it's, it's useful in a, in a number of different contexts whenever you want to add interaction to your to your components. This just so happens to be a menu component where to know when to trigger the event we need to attach an event listener to the select DOM element and then unpack it like this and then we pass it into our our change listeners like this. All right. Now, let's make it so that when we select something, it actually changes the scatter plot. This is the moment we've all been waiting for, right? We've got all this wiring set up that it, you know, it dispatches the event and everything. This is the this is the moment of truth where we sort of connect these two things together. Let's look at this code that we had earlier. It it uses plot.x value to set the accessor and then it uses svg.call plot. Value in this case is actually the column so I'm going to rename it to column, just because that makes more sense. And then in this event listener, we can say svg.call plot. This will cause our scatter plot to re-render. But just before we render that, I'm going to call dot x value. And set that x value accessor to be a brand new function that takes as input one of these rows and it returns d at column. Column being whatever column we just selected from the menu. Now, if I select something, it actually changes. Yeah, this is the this is the moment where it all comes together. And we can actually use a menu to select what is being displayed on the x-axis. And it, it ends up pretty small and concise. But we're getting the column from the event dispatcher. And we're setting the x-value accessor of our plot to be a function that accesses that particular column for x. And then we're invoking our plot with svg.call. And to complete this, we can do the same for y. But instead of saying x value, we set the y value. And this is it. It's done. We can set x, and we can set y. So now we can explore the data. And one beautiful thing about the, S the, the select elements is you can actually use the arrow keys to quickly navigate between the different options. So any questions? Does um, the event change on the select element fires when you first render the page to make sure that you've got the first selections correct? It does not. That's actually a really good point. 
uh, when we set up our scatter plot, it's defaulting to this. X value is petal width and Y value is sepal length. But when we initialize the menus, they're just getting, um, I think the first, the first option is what they're defaulting to. So that's a good call out that when it loads, it's actually not correct. It says pedal width and it says pedal width for both X and Y. Yep, yep, so that's a bug. That's a bug. Ideally, we would have something like uh, initial option or what have you. But just to fix the bug, I'm going to initialize x value and y value both to be pedal width. Now at least it's, it's correct and accurate when it loads. But yeah, good catch. Good catch. There are a number of things we could do here to to like make it so that initially there is some some selection of the menus and the accessors that's initialized correctly but i think they'll i'll leave that as an uh, an exercise for the reader <laughs> but actually here here's what i want to leave you with as an exercise for today handle species This is going to be kind of challenging. The value here would be species, and the text here would be species. This would be the ideal situation where you could select species and it would work. But right now, it does not work because we're using linear scales. We're using linear scales with with a thing that is is not numbers it's different strings and so if you wanted to visualize species you would need to use um, scale point instead and have the domain be data dot map x value like this and so the challenge is set up x and y scales conditionally based on the type of attribute you've selected. And and the overall goal here would be to make it so that if you select species for x, the x scale would change to be a point scale, not a linear scale, and the axis should render correctly. So that's the challenge for this week. All right, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, any other last questions? Just say thank you. This was great. My pleasure. Yeah, this was. Um, I was I was a little nervous going into this because I know it's a lot of stuff to digest. Um, but thank you all for asking questions along the way, when when things were not clear. And uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's not clear to me uh, what we should see if I, if I get the, the specimen. Because uh, I, I can imagine like uh, using different icon for different species. Oh. If I, if I get like the axis as a species, um, species I, I don't get it because I will have like two species two or three, something like this. Let me just show you real quick. It should be scale point, which will distribute those three values across X. And then the domain would be data.map X value like this. So it just gets all the unique values. And now if I, oh, scale point, we need to import that from D3. And if it runs now, and if I set X to species, it looks like this. This is what it should look like. Uh, okay, I got it. Um, oh, That's but clear. yeah. Actually, let's add a little bit of padding because it's all up against the edge there. Uh, we can say 
stop padding of like 0 0.2 maybe. And now if we select species, it looks like this. So this is what it should look like when you select species as X. Because we're using scale point all the time, if we go back to one of these numeric columns, it's using a point scale. What it's doing is it's, it's taking all the unique values that it sees and giving them a location along X, which is totally not right. It's totally incorrect. A, a point scale should only be used if you have a bunch of discrete values, for example, three species, not if you have quantities. So what I envision could be the solution uh, is like, you have some ternary operator here, like if X type is uh, categorical, uh, is if X type is categorical, and you can create an accessor for X type, then use scale point. Otherwise, use scale linear. So there's sort of a sketch of what the solution should be, and I'll leave it to you to implement it. And I might even implement it uh, next episode. If yeah, the other way could be implemented is a third menu, which is then a stratification variable, which says, says overall, and then by the species, I think. Then you would see subgroups for each of those XY plots. Oh yeah, you mean like you'd you'd see like three scatter plots side by side? You could do that, or if someone wants to d dive in, and you'd have a menu which would be let's say Z it says overall, and then each of the species, and so then you could select each of, each species or overall. So right now we're looking at overall. Yep. Um, and so that would be another way. That way you're not confounding that categorical variable with. Um, the actual intent of the scatter plot. True. Yeah, good call. You could do it a number of ways. You could use color, or you could facet into like three different plots that have the, the different yep. subsets highlighted or, or filtered to just show them. Yeah, yeah, totally. There's a number of ways to do it. Yep, good call. And we'll be getting into those. I hope to add color to the scatter plot in the future. Um, and also do all sorts of different like aggregations like you could you could do a box plot all sorts of options many things many things to do is there a time for a very quick question on selections and join sure yeah thank you if you go back please to uh, where you select for the label for example this one yes thank you there seems to be a pattern where you select all for a special uh, uh, value and then you join the same value. Is there a case where you would do it two different things or is it always the same? You would select all for one thing and then you join for exact that same thing. That's a great question. This is the case where we're selecting on the tag name that appears here, label. And this string is a selector. You could select by class as well if you want to, but this case is simple. They're the same because we know for sure that inside of any one of these given um, divs, this is our parent, that we're just going to have one label element. If we know that there's only going to be one label element in here, then, then we can use the tag name in the select all. However, if there's going to be different instances of the same tag name as children of the same parent, then we want to have something different, which we have here in our scatter plot, because we have one group element as a container for the y-axis, and we have another group element as the container for the x-axis. In this case, then we need to somehow differentiate between the two. And I think the best way to do that is with classes. And this is the case where what we pass into select all will be different than what we pass into dot join. What we pass into select all is a selector string that uses dot at the beginning to signify that it's going to look for an element that has that class attribute, y-axis. 
So if, if there's no y-axis, then it's going to create a new group element. And the thing you need to pass into dot join is always going to be a tag name, not a class. You're not allowed to pass a class into dot join. So this is a case where they could be different. Yeah, and you need to do this. Like if you pass G into here and into here, then this block is going to result it's going to find the group element that was left over for the y axis and it's going to use it for the x axis and you're going to get rid of your y axis it's going to be a bug and so th this is the case where you need to differentiate between two things that are the same tag name namely a group element in for in this case with classes perfect thank you very much now my pleasure Welcome everyone to episode 11 of Get It Right in Black and White, quantitative and categorical. We've got a full house today. Uh, we've got Kostov here, Adil is here, Eric is here, Anita, and myself. And welcome everybody. How are things? Going all right. Great, great, thank you. Yep, nice. thanks. And you? Good, thanks. All is well. All is well. Um, yeah, the submissions for this week were quite cool. Um, looking forward to step through them. And maybe we can bring up some any questions that, that have arisen through trying to do this exercise. So here we go. Here's the forum submissions from last week. Um, Oh, there was a typo in there. Make the menus work with species. That was the goal. So let's see what happened. Um, let's see. Oh, can you all see my screen? Actually, I can't see your screen. There we go. Sorry. Now you should be able to see it. Uh, great. Yep. All right. So Gustav, uh had some had some great um, discussion, and I was so impressed uh, that you were able to use the little snippet embed feature of VizHub. That's so cool. So we can talk about the specific line numbers. Yeah, this was really helpful to have the snippet in the chat as well. Thanks for the tip on how to do that. Nice. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to see the feature being used. It's a feature that's been there for a while. We haven't really used it much, but it's soup. It comes in handy when we're, you know, asking questions about the code. So the question was, um, you were trying to add the click event listener to the option element. Yeah, see. This is actually what I did too. The first time I tried to get the menu working. And I was also confused as to why it wasn't working. But it turns out that what you need to do, it turns out that what you need to do is actually add the event on the select element, not the inner option elements. And once you do that, it seems to work. But yes, yes, that's right. yeah, did that work out for you, Kostov? Yes, yes, that worked out. So I was, instead of use applying the listener on the options element and applied on the select element it worked. Yep. Excellent. So yeah, I think event.target.value works. Um, and this is a great lead into some of the stuff we're going to do today. But the follow on question was, okay, now that I have, you know, the column name back from the menu, how do you get the text of it? Like the, the label text? And it's a great question. Um, there are a couple of different approaches, but my preference is to keep uh, sort of metadata about the columns in a, in a data structure that you define yourself. And this is also something I'd like to do in today's um, live coding. This way, you can associate the value, the label, and the type for each of the columns, which lets you then distinguish, okay, species is categorical. And you could do this by introspecting on the data, like checking the type. Um, but I like to, you know, type it out explicitly so that we have this data structure. And to be clear, you can generate this data structure by looking at the first row 
of the data. So it's a nice way to decouple those two different activities, to have an intermediate data structure like this. And then, to answer the question, you could look up the text by constructing a map, which is a data structure that's essentially a dictionary, looking up key value pairs. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this was really nice. I really like the way you structured your metadata as a separate variable. And looking into it, I also found a subtle difference. Like when you said map, I think previously we also used the map function, which had a lowercase m. Right. While this map, this had this uppercase m. For sure. So this uppercase m map, that's the dictionary, and the lowercase one is like uh, a functional, functional programming construct. Is that right? Exactly. That's exactly right. And I could see how it's confusing because they have the same name. But yeah, map is a data structure built in from uh, ES6. From I think it's from the introduction of ES6. So it's a fairly new data structure. If I want to know about it, I just type JavaScript map, map MDN, which is the best place to look for documentation. So this page here tells you all about uppercase M map what it does, how to use it. So it's it's different from regular objects in a number of ways. Um, but essentially it's the same and it has some nice methods on it. Hi, hey, Felipe's here. Welcome, Felipe. But yeah, map, you can create a new thing, you can set keys and values for that thing, and then you can check, does it have a certain key? All of this stuff is available on maps. Whereas, JavaScript array map is a method on arrays, which you can find out more about here. It's, it's indeed a functional programming construct, where on an array, you, there's a method called map, you can pass in a function that takes as input one of the elements of the array and returns something. And then you get a new array of just the returned values. So yeah, that's the distinction between lowercase m map and uppercase m map here. And I think we'll, we'll end up using this data structure in today's live coding as well. Great, thanks. This was really helpful. Nice. So yeah, here's the uh, the submission. Oh, I like the styling on the menus. Very nice. And it works. Fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful. Very nice work. Awesome. Let me just take a quick look how it's done. Nice. See, here's the trigger. Nice work. So it says, if x name is not species, so for any other column except for species, we use scale linear just like we did before, but otherwise, use a point scale and set the domain to data.map x value, which isolates all the unique values, and then point scale spreads them across uh, the visible space. So that's why this works. Nice job. Let's see, what else do we have? Wael Assad. also took a stab at this. And went a little bit beyond as well. Uh, this is quite impressive. So we got sepal length, petal width using linear scales. Species works using the point scale and nice job adding the padding. See, it's not all the way down to the bottom. And then also added an option to use a square root scale. This is amazing. Or a power scale. What is this? 
So yeah, different types of scales in use here. It's brilliant. So we, if we want to see what the scale does, we can say, OK, pedal width linear, and then pedal width square. <clears throat> you can see it's a square root uh, relationship. If I remember my high school math, is this a parabola? <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. But yeah, very nice work. Uh, I have a question about this one. Sure. Are there circles on top of this, like mini circles in one place? It looks like that. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like there is. Yep. You could see this. The edge on this one is, is sort of soft. I don't know if it comes through in the stream. But the edge on this one is really rough which indicates that there's a bunch of circles in the exact same spot. Yeah, and this makes sense because there may be a bunch of data points that share the same uh, value. What's the point of square scale? Ah, great question. I think here it's just an experiment. So there's not really any any point per se except to figure out how to do it however the the place where square root scales come in handy is defining the radius of circles based on data such that the area of the circle is equal to uh, the quantity in the data yeah I think we'll get that <clears throat> we'll get to using it like that some in some future stream where we use size but that's I think the main use case for a square root scale yeah, and then there's a log scale, which is not here, but that's useful when the data follows a power law distribution. And I think we'll we'll use we'll get into that again also in the future. But yeah, great work here from uh, Whale Assad. Let's see how he did this. Just adding a type property to the various columns. Very nice. Band square square power. And then in the scatter plot, hook into that value. And he even made a, a separate function called get scale, which is very nice, very nice refactoring. So if it's in the, the code is very readable. If it's linear, then use scale linear. If it's log, then use log. If it's square, then use square root. Otherwise, use power scales or band scales. Uh, so yeah, great work. Let's see what else. Yeah, there was some interesting discussion. Using the options array approach works. Oh, Eric has one. Look at this. Eric's here with us right now. Let's see what is going on here. Oh my gosh, they're blue. That's awesome. And it does filtering. Look at that. Oh, this is brilliant. Brilliant. So it filters by the species, you know, each particular species. Eric, you want to talk a little bit about um, your experience with this? Sure, yeah. I uh, I guess misinterpreted the assignment. So I, I was just wanting to look at um, all the data stratified by species. This is awesome. Oh, nice. Yep. Oh yeah, Flexbox can be um, kind of tricky. And the way I did it last time was sort of a, a shortcut in a way to just overlay them on the top. But yeah, when you need more complex layout, you need different different tools. CSS Grid is an amazing tool to use. Nice. That's awesome. 
And I see that the colors change as well. Now that they're now they're all blue, but if you go to one of these, it's it's red. Nice, nice. Yeah, this is awesome. Um So, yeah, let's just take a look at at, at how it was done. Options. So we've got all Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica, which is this menu here. And then that's passed in to the scatter plot. And then here's where the filtering happens. Nice. So this is, yeah, this is great. It uses the dot filter method on arrays, and if, sp if species equals the z value of d, which is passed in through these accessors, then uh, include it. Very cool, very cool. And I like how you split it out into functions with dot call. That's a nice approach. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about JavaScript. Um, and one of the reasons why I love it, because it's it's got elements of functional programming and it's got elements of object-oriented programming. And you can mix yeah, and match like them. you just showed that map. <laughs> yep. Lower and uppercase. I'm like, what? So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's a it's a great playground to be in. There's tons of um, tools in the toolbox, so to speak. Yep. Yeah, it's getting complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's a journey. It's a journey of learning new things, using them. And it's functional and object oriented programming is kind of confusing really and mm. you don't know where which one starts and which one ends. Right. Yeah, and the other thing that's also interesting is how uh, I don't know if this is a style. Right. Yeah, it does get confusing when a variable has the same name as a function or a property has the same name as a function somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally a trade-off picking variable names. But um the one piece of feedback I would I would have for this in terms of like visualization design is that when you sw when you switch between Setosa and Versicolor, the dots animate. And that's a cool effect. However, it communicates to the viewer that each dot is like the same in a sense. You know what I mean? It's like when a dot when a dot moves across the screen, it makes sense if it's the same exact the same iris flower as it was before. Like this kind of animation makes perfect sense because when the circle moves, its identity remains unchanged. It's the same flower that it was. However, when when this animation happens, it's actually kind of misleading because the flower is a different flower that's represented by the same circle as it moves across the screen, you know what I mean? Well, I think it's just a matter of, you know, noticing that that's an issue and we can go in and fix it. And here's how. I'll fork this so I can play around. And I don't think I ever even talked about this but because we didn't need it. But there's a second argument that you can pass into dot data, which is a function that defines the identity of the thing. And D3's internals will use that to distinguish between 
um, you know, things that are the same and things that are different. So here's here's what we can do. Uh, we need some some kind of identity across the different iris flowers first, actually, before we do anything else. So here's here's what I propose. When we load in the data, there there is no column that is a unique identifier for each individual flower. It's just not there. But we can easily make one by saying d.id equals, uh, you know, the simplest way to do it is just to have an ID counter. So like ID counter plus plus. And oftentimes there is something in the data that is a unique ID, but since there's not here, we can just use the index in the table as the ID. And so just to see what this does, it gives us Oh, sorry, d.id. I had a typo. Wait, why is that not working? Somehow it's broken? Did I break it? I didn't really do anything. I don't know. I'm having um, what I like to call a Twilight Zone moment, where I have no idea what's going on. So I think I'm just going to delete this and try again. I'm getting a little sidetracked. Here it is. The original one is not loading now, which is weird. I don't know. Maybe there's some outage. Or, oh, there it comes. There it is. Maybe the data was just taking forever to load or something? I don't know. Let me try again. I, I want to do this because it's a very useful thing to know. Okay, now it's working. There must have been like a data latency issue or network problem. So, ID counter is zero d.id is id counter plus plus console.log d just to see what we're dealing with here it should be integers see this one id 133 id 134 the point is that it's unique to each of these different iris flowers so now that we have that Um, and also, we might actually get past i as a second argument to parse row. I don't remember. But if we do, then we don't need to do the id counter. Oh, we do! Check that out. That's nice. So that's even easier. We don't need to do the incrementing ourselves. So d.id equals i. Done. We're just going to have integers as the ids. Now, in the scatter plot, when we do the data binding, we can pass as a second argument a function that takes as input one row and returns d.id. And hopefully, with that one single change, it should actually solve the visualization design issue 
that we were talking about. Okay, it sort of does. There's there's one there's one that's not behaving correctly. But it's getting close. And this is this is more accurate in a sense, more honest in terms of what's happening. Although there's Well, I mean, I've, I've seen this sort of thing so many times that, like, oh, it's sort of muscle memory at this point. I don't know why that one is misbehaving, though. Yeah. I'm getting not a number from somewhere. Is it? Huh. Let's try console.log d.id just to see what it is. Yeah, so these are coming from our index.js. There's a not a number coming from some other console.log somewhere else. But I think the IDs are good. Maybe, maybe they need to be strings or something. So if we do empty string plus I, they're going to be strings now. Maybe zero is coming back falsy and that's causing problems. No, that doesn't do it. The problem is that there's a little, <laughs> there's one of these red ones. Yeah, good idea. You know, this is buggy too, because now it, they should animate. They should animate smoothly. Yeah, it sure does. It looks like they're they're exiting and then entering again, which is not supposed to happen. Good idea. Ah, it does not. Yeah, see, we're doing this. I think I know what's going on. We are missing the ID in this transformation here. So good idea to look at this place. We can just solve it by adding the ID to the resulting objects. And this makes sense. I mean, it decouples the the data transformation from the rendering, which is good, but it adds a place where we can forget something. <laughs> but let's see if it works now. Hmm. It still exits all the time, which is not what we would want. Oh, there's something else. Marks overall. Oh, there's different paths that it takes. So we add it there too. Now this is working as I would expect. So when you do it like that, the right thing happens now. The right thing happens as well. See? OK. Great. This gets to the bottom of it. And I think this is like the you know correct, quote, in quotes, <laughs> correct design, where if you change these columns, it makes sense that because the identity of the dot correlates to that iris flower. But then when you do the filtering, they don't animate anymore. They sort of disappear and then reappear. And if you wanted to be complete about it, <laughs> you would um, make it so that the exit 
mirrors the enter in terms of the animation. So in, instead of animating in, it would animate back to zero radius and then disappear. That I think would be the ultimate best solution. But this is uh, this is pretty awesome as it stands. So I think I'll leave that as an exercise for you, Eric, if you want to take that yeah, on. Yeah, this, this is great learning, so thank you. Awesome, awesome, yeah, my pleasure. And the way to do it, just a little teaser, would be to um, put, put the transition on the exit. Okay. And have something like grow radius, but, oh, here's actually how you would do it. Dot transition T dot call shrink radius. Something like that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Can I have a quick question here? Sure. Uh, when you have things entering and exiting at the same time, which runs first in terms of animation? Well, they, uh, that's the elegance of using the same transition. They run at the exact same time. I see. And what would you do if you want things to exit first and then enter again? Well, you would have to in invoke the entire code multiple times with different data. Um, that's the only way to trigger things that happen at different times. Or, now that I think of it, I mean, you could add a delay to the whole thing so, so that the transition is delayed by a fixed amount of time, if you wanted to. Yes, I see. If so you... if I want them to exit first, I would add a delay to the enter. So they would exit, and that would that would be enough time for them to exit, and then enter will will be involved. Oh, I see what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. And it almost pains me not to do it right now because we're so close, and we're discussing this. Let me just let me just do it real quick. Thank you. So on exit, we use exit dot call so that we can use the transitions, and then. Um, we can call shrink radius and then dot remove. R calling the dot remove on the transition will remove the DOM elements only after the transition finishes, which is something that only D3 does really well. If you try to do transitions with other libraries like React, it's such a pain to do this sort of thing. Uh, but D3 does it very well. Now we just need to implement shrink radius, which should be pretty easy. Just copy grow radius and make it transition R to zero, like this. Let's see if it works. It does, but the delay is problematic. The delay is like too much. I don't think we need any delay at all, as a matter of fact. The delay is the fancy thing for moving X and Y, but for exiting and entering, I don't think we need any delay at all. Hmm, not sure what's happening here. Is shrink radius taking the enter selection as an input? Shrink radius is just taking, well, it's it's called enter here, but the name doesn't matter. Oh, wait a minute. It's adding the transition here. Oh, well, if it's if it's adding the transition there, we don't need to add the transition here as well. And we don't even need this call. So here's what we can do. Just exit dot call shrink radius. <laughs> Easy peasy. Let's see if that works. Oh, I think I think we're not making the radius um 
we're not growing the radius on update. And shrink radius really should remove the elements as well. Let's see if that works. Yeah, there we go. That's how it should be. Yeah, this is exactly what I was hoping for. Okay, cool. Problem solved. And it was an interesting journey to get there. Okay, great. So, I think now what I'd like to do is, you know, present my take on how we would implement this. Just so that every all the pieces are very clear. Um, I was just noticing that the problem we were just working on is not fully done. I'm not going to solve it now, but just to, just to show you, if you wait for the transition to finish before you change the menu, everything works perfectly. However, if you change the menu twice before the transition ends, or rather if you change it three times, before the transition ends, you can end up in a state like this that's not correct. And I think what's happening here is that the exit transition is starting and then you change the selection which causes the filtering to change and everything to update. But that exit transition is still going on and when it finishes it removes those DOM elements. And so to really solve this, um, Eric, if you wanted to take this on as a challenge, because this started from your work, um, if you really wanted to solve this, the thing to do would be to cancel the exit transition whenever you render the data again, which may be a little tricky to figure out, but that would be the ultimate solution. Okay. Give it a go. Yeah, give it a go. See, see if you can... Uh, make it happen because this is I'm, I'm glad we got to this point though because this this reveals some of the trickiest aspects of working with d3 and this would be a good solution a good uh, a good little puzzle to solve to really solidify the knowledge of everything uh, great thanks yeah so good luck good luck with that <laughs> Okay, let's dig into today's um, live coding by handling species using scale point and manually adding metadata about the columns, like type, for example. So column name and type, that's what I'm thinking of as metadata. Before we dig in, though, I want to talk about these terms quantitative and categorical. These are terms that I got from Tamara Munzner's book, Tamara Munzner's textbook called Visualization Analysis and Design, which is a great book, really great book, highly recommend. And it's used in a lot of classrooms. You know, people teaching about data visualization use this as the textbook. I use it, for example, when I teach every fall. And that book defines terminology that can be used across, you know, discussions of visualization design, so on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of different terms that have been used over the years. And she sort of defines it and like, okay, these are the terms I'm going to use. So I'm going with her set of terms to define different types of attributes in the data. And the term attribute, that's another term that means column. Some people refer to them as columns. I often refer to columns as columns because <laughs> that's what they are to me. But in a data table sense, columns can also be called as attributes. And attributes have types much like variables have types. 
and the types of attributes that we're dealing with here when we come up against this problem of handling species in our drop down menu is categorical. Categorical attributes have different type things in them, meaning not numbers. They are not numbers. They're strings or identifiers for for things that have identity. So the identity of the values in a categorical col column categorical attribute are different. And in the case of this iris data set, we've got a bunch of quantitative columns that are numbers that you see here on the left. But then we've got one column that is special and needs to be treated differently than all of those other columns that are numbers, namely species. And the reason why it's fundamentally different is because it's not numbers. It's strings. It's a different species of a virus. Setosa is one species, Versicolor is another, and there's one more. But the point is that they're strings, they're different things. They need to be mapped to the visual uh, space in a fundamentally different way. And so that's what we'll get into here. Any questions so far about this? All right, I think I'll move on. OK, so now we'll actually handle species. And we're going to use scale point, which is kind of like scale linear, but it deals with categorical attributes. You can give it different strings, and it will, it will spread the unique values across the space, which is how we want to do it. All right, so let's dig in. The place where I'm going to start from is animated scatter plot with menus. This is what we created last week. And just to give a quick recap of what we did, we added these menus with these animated transitions. So you can change x and y to be the various uh, quantitative attributes of the iris data set. But when you select species, it just breaks, it crashes. And the way we did this is we introduced a menu component, which is using the D3 reusable charts pattern, but for a menu, added event, <laughs> you know, event infrastructure to that thing. And then in index.js, we add a, a listener for the change event on these menus, which will change the x value accessor of the scatterplot instance and re-render it with svg.call. And in scatterplot, whenever it gets rendered, it redefines these, these scales, x and y scale. And it's here in the definition of the scale that we're going to have to make some adjustments. So to start, I'm going to fork this one. I'll call it scatterplot with menus um, that handles. <laughs> uh, um, let me come up with a nice title. Including species. Thank you. <laughs> That's perfect. Perfect. Thank you. OK. So what we want to have happen is that when you select species here in this menu, in for Y, for example, it should spread out across the Y coordinates the different values. But it doesn't do that right now. Let's see where we can jump in to solve this issue.
to me, it makes sense to, to start. Scratch that. To me, it makes the most sense to start here at the definition of these options for the menus. And what this does here is it defines the entries of our menu, essentially. That's the ID for the thing. This is the text, uh, the label, the display name that appears in the menu. I think the the most sensible approach would be to introduce another property on these objects called type. And the type of the species column, I would say, using Tamar Munzner's terminology, is categorical. And the type for all the others is quantitative. So just for completeness sake, I'm going to fill all those out. Run prettier. Yeah, unfortunately, it gets, it gets to be long. <laughs> I think that's okay. It's explicit. So now we know when we select a given option what type it is, which is information that we need in order to change the type of the scale that we use. So now that we've got this in hand, we need to tell the scatter plot, you know, what type of column it's dealing with. We could do that in a number of ways, but I think this the most straightforward way would be to add another accessor, you know, at one of these getter setter functions on the plot called x type because we already have x value it's working perfectly fine we don't want to overcomplicate that um, but I think we can add another one called x type and the invocation would be something like dot x type and then we need to figure out what the type is for the column so we have column which is you know the name of the column and we can use it to construct the accessor like this, but we also need to use it to get the type somehow. I'm not sure how. And because I'm not sure how, you know, this is a perfect place to introduce a level of indirection. I'm going to I'm going to call a function called get type. Uh, cool, huh? Yeah. Uh, just just one question. I, I was trying to do this uh, at home, but I was not able what I tried, uh, I, first I rewrote the get data uh, I put outside in a module, and and then I tried to get the JSON that's inside your your GitHub uh, together with the the data. There mm -hmm. is in the site where I got the data. There is a JSON there that has all these options already, uh, the type oh. and everything. Really? Yeah, yeah so the I, gist I, in here. Yes, and I tried to use uh, the JSON, uh, but I'm not able to get the data out of the scope. Ah. When I try to, to put this in an in a array or in a dictionary, uh, I, lose, I lose the data. Inside the loop, I have the data. Right. But when I get outside of the loop, uh, the, the data vanish. So... Huh. How could we use this so we don't have to hard code like uh, uh, the type string or the type number we right can get from from this right and it's so funny I actually forgot that I put this here um, let's see when did I make this this was like years ago that I put this up here and at that time as well I was thinking about metadata for columns because it makes sense to be able to manipulate the metadata along with the data set, which is totally possible. So, I mean, we can use the raw URL here, and we could potentially use d3.json to fetch this file and use it. But uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to, you know, paste it into the code. But 
because we have this data structure, you know, uh, we could potentially do it like that. And years ago, I was thinking about like, oh, I'm going to develop a data publishing format where it's supposed to be a CSV file and a little JSON file like this that describes each of the columns. Don't give up on that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad idea. I mean, it would be super useful to be able to have like a standard that you could just plug in. Um, so I'll keep that in mind. But yeah, the way to do it would be d3.json to fetch this file and then use promise.all to fetch the CSV and the JSON at the same time and then run some code after both of them have loaded. But no matter where this information comes from, we're going to have to implement this function get type for the column. I'll just yes, yep, sure. And so let me just put that right here. Get type is a function that takes as input the column and returns the type of the column. Now, the name column might be confusing because conceptually a column is described by one of these objects, but what this really is is the column value, meaning like the name, the name of the column. So it's just a string. It's it's not the entire object. If it were, that'd be simpler. But it's just the string, sepal length. So, you know, honestly, to make that more clear, I'm going to call it column name or column value. Eh. I like to think of it as column name. That way. Column attribute? Column attribute, I don't know. In a way, I want to, I want to, I want this to be name. Like this. But it's a refactoring that would need, we'd need to update the code elsewhere. I don't know. Maybe I'll just leave it like the, the way it was. But we just have to understand. Here's here's what I'll do. I'll add a comment. Say, column is a string corresponding to the value property. On metadata objects. Can I can I ask a question about the problem we're trying to solve here? Sure. Thank you. So <clears throat> am I right to understand that we have an array of objects and we have a value, a unique value for one of the properties of those objects somewhere in that array, and we want to reach the other property of that same object within the array? That's exactly right. Yeah, we have this. As in, we have the string corresponding to the value properties in these objects that exist in this array. And what we want to get is the type, which is a string that comes from a different property of those objects. But we have an array of objects, right? Correct. And we, we need to get uh, the value of the object inside the array. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We have to, given the column name, for example, species, this function should return the type, namely categorical. Yeah. And so one, one way we could do this is, you know, iterate through each of these entries and then when it matches, when the value matches, we'll have access to the entire object. And then we can just access the type of it. And that would look something like options.find, which is another method on arrays. d.value equals column. 
this would give us the object, and then we could just access dot type. That should work. Yeah, cool. Yes. And and that will enable us to get to jump from any property to any other property within the same object. Exactly. In an, in an array of objects. Correct. Perfect. However, the dot find method on arrays will check, you know, the way it works, dot find, the way it works is it checks each and every one. It says, okay, let's take a look at this one. And it passes that object into this thing. And then this function runs, it returns true or false. So it says, is d dot value equal to column? It checks the first one. It says, okay, d dot value is battle width. Is that equal to column, which is, you know, whatever column we selected. If it is, then it returns true. And then array.find returns that one that matched. But if it returns false, array.find goes on to the next one and it passes in the next one and says, okay, is that one the same? No, it's not the same. Go on to the next one. Check it again. If it, if it, if it is the same, then the dot find method returns that object. So if it matches species, for example, it would return this entire object from this expression here. That's why we can say dot type. We could we could just as easily say dot text to access the text. So because it iterates through each and every one, I generally don't like to do it this way because it's a big O of N algorithm wise that means the algorithm takes n steps where n is the number of columns in this case it's it's not that bad there's only like 5 so it's not really it's not really an issue uh, so this would per work perfectly well but i kind of do want to show the way i would do it which is to create a lookup table using the map data structure but any questions so far? I just had a quick question around this find method. Yeah. So if like it's not present in this current table lookup example, but say we had multiple columns or multiple columns with the same name, so species was appearing twice, so would find like return both those objects or will it just return the first uh, occurrence of the, of the uh, selection selected column or the column that we're trying to find. That's correct. It would just return the first one. Okay, okay. Great. Yep. Thanks. That's what find does. It just returns the first match that it encounters. So if you did have species as the mm -hmm. value for multiple of these, which you wouldn't want to, that would be a bug. But if you did, uh, it would just return the first one and not the second one. Thanks. Thanks is, is there a find all uh, method? Um, it's not the case here, but uh, just yeah, this is what I would do. <laughs> I don't think there is, but there is array dot filter, which is essentially does the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if you wanted to do that, you would say options dot filter, and you wouldn't want to say dot type because the result would be an array. This would find all of the matches. It would. So filter is essentially find all that match. Perfect. Okay. Clear. Now, I just want to, before moving on to the implementation with map, I just want to make sure that this is actually working. I have changed the filter for find. Oh, thanks. So to just check if it's working, I'm going to say console.log get type of column. This will let us um, just check if it's working. And this is on the um, the X menu. So when I change X, it works. It says quantitative. Excellent. And what about species? Yeah, so if I if I use species, it outputs categorical. Perfect. 
So it works. Quantitative, 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 categorical if it's species. So that part works. That's great. Um, X dot type is not a function, but yeah, we'll deal with that later. But first, because we're on this topic and this is such a common thing to have to do, I just want to say this is not how I would actually implement this. How I would actually implement this is to create a map. I'll call it um, column to type is a new map data structure. And this is built in to the browser. You don't have to import any libraries or anything. It's an ES6 feature. And map has a number of methods like set and get. So column to type, meaning uh, the way <laughs> I named it like that because it's a lookup table from column to type. You know, from column, which you use as the keys, to type, which are going to be used as the values. And so what we can do is loop through all of these options. Maybe something like uh, options dot for each is a way to iterate through these. And we could say for each of these options, we can say we want to set the value. And the key will be option dot value. And the value that the key maps to, which is confusing because the value, you know, we're using the word value here, but the, the value that the, the key maps to will be type, option.type. So how do we put these together? This is where we can say column to type, which is an instance of the map data structure, dot set. And set takes as input two arguments, the key and the value. Okay, I think this uh, solves the problem that I was having when I imported from the from the website the JSON. Ah. Because when I tried to to set the uh, what I did, I create a external array like before the column to type, and try to push the value inside this array. But outside this scope, when I try to get back. The, the array it's empty oh. inside the for each if i if i create a array outside and try to push the values inside this array when it's outside it's empty so i think hmm. this set may solve this yeah and it, it's important to connect the dots between the, the data structures because what you need to implement this get type is a a dictionary essentially a map a key value mapping where you give it the key it gives it gives you the value but if you're starting from an array you have to do something else like dot find which traverses each element of the array which you don't want and you can't you can't say like options at index column which is you know you could use an, an object as a map as well but um, but yeah I think this does solve the problem and once we have built up this map we can access it. Uh, but first, just to really comprehend what's happening, let me say console.log column to type so we can see what this map and ended up looking like. It's a map instance that has a bunch of entries. And this is just how Chrome presents it to you in the console. It means the key is pedal width and the value is quantitative and this double arrow here means like it maps to you know if you give pedal width to the function dot get it will return quantitative and it'll do so efficiently it doesn't have to check each one internally it implements probably like a hash table kind of a lookup scheme where it's big O of one instead of big O of n in algorithmic terms it doesn't have to check all of those it just gives you back instantly the one you, that you want. So if we say column 
to type dot get column inside of get type, this should work as well. And to test it, we can change the column and observe that, yeah, okay, it still prints out the right thing, quantitative. And if I switch to species, it outputs categorical. Okay, this is working. This is working. However, this is not the best way. It's not the simplest way to do it. The simplest way to do it is to take advantage of a way of calling the, the map constructor where you can actually pass in an array of arrays and each of those inner arrays has only two elements the key and the value that way of doing it is much more concise and all you know although it is a, a bit more cryptic and the way that we would do that is is we can pass in options.map again the functional programming construct that lets you give it a function that function accepts each element and the return values end up as a new array we can return an array that has just two elements option.value and option.type and this should work as well let me see if I got it right seems to work just fine. So just to review what I did there, options.map maps over all the options and it returns an array that has the value and the type, the first thing being the key of the map, the second thing being the value in the map, and this is just a, an alternative syntax for doing the exact same thing as this other thing does namely looping through all of the entries and calling dot set. And to simplify this even further, we could use ES6 destructuring to destructure value and type from the argument. And then we don't have to say option dot and option dot. So all of this is a roundabout way of you know, exploring the ins and outs of constructing maps. Um, but since it comes up so often, I wanted to dig into this this level of detail because you know I think it's it's really important to to fundamentally understand how to use maps in today's JavaScript world. I see there are some questions. Let me see. What is this? And is it live? <laughs> yeah. It is. It's live. Why are you not using TypeScript? Well, I'm not using TypeScript because TypeScript is a pain to use in my experience. Um, then you don't have to write comments. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's just it's just a pain. Is this Microsoft Monaco? No, it's not. It's VizHub. It's a thing that I made. And you can use it too. Anyone can use it. Uh, you can fork this stuff and get a link to it. What are we doing here? <laughs> I love these questions. <laughs> these are great. Um, it's a new visualization tool people can use. Yeah, I mean, this being VizHub. Yeah, I created it about two years ago. Um, D3's been around a while, as Larry points out. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, D3's been around a while. But the APIs have changed, so that's why I'm doing this tutorial now, to like use the most modern way of doing it. Okay, thanks for those questions. Okay, um, now we can move on to the next phase, namely implementing X-Type. But before we do that, I just want to make sure, are there any questions so far about what we've done here so far? It's so Am I? Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
Please go ahead. That song. Oh, she just said it's so complicated. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of details. There are a lot of details to remember, but... Um, and the first time you see stuff like this, I realize it can be overwhelming. That's why I wanted to, like... Yeah, you know. this happens all the time. First time I see something, it's like, wow, I'm not understanding it. And once I get into it, it's like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, and console.log is your friend. I mean, if you were on your own, you can say console.log, options.map, value type, and see what it is. And and use, use console.log to interrogate what you see here, anything that's confusing, to unpack it and understand what's what's happening in that intermediate stage. See, it's an array of arrays, and I realized when I described it, it's a bit abstract, but when you console.log it and you see it, you can understand, oh, it's an array of arrays with the keys and the values. And also, if you're on your own and find the stuff confusing, it's good to consult MDN, which is the de facto standard documentation for the built-in stuff in JavaScript, such as map. And it says right here, it describes the map constructor. Creates a new map object, and it says right here that you can pass an iterable into the constructor, which is what we're doing. And it, just, it documents that right here. It says, what is this iterable? It's an array whose elements are key value pairs in the form of arrays. So here's an example that maps numbers to strings. So yeah, if, you, if you're ever looking at this stuff on your own and feel, oh my gosh, this is so confusing, use console.log and, and, and just do Google searches for the data structures that we use, like map, because the documentation is great. And also the same goes for D3. The D3 documentation is really good. So if you see a D3 method that you don't know, like just Google it, find the documentation. Um, yeah, bada yeah. bing, bada boom. I do it all the time, but it takes such a long time. It does. It does. There are so a number of... Um, yeah. There are a lot of rabbit holes that you could go down and get distracted. Yeah. Really time-consuming. It just takes a lot of time. Yeah. Totally. If you want to really dig into everything. It but does. It. Yeah, it does work. It. Yep, I would say it's well worth it. It's an investment in your future. Yeah, I agree. And it, uh, that's why you and you have every other week. Yeah, I changed. And that makes it difficult because, for example, I'm so behind, I'm supposed to catch up. Yeah. I wish it was every other week. Well, actually, I was going to announce it at the end, but since you brought it up, I did change it to be every other week, not every week. So going forward, it's going to be every other week. Thank God. I updated the meetup page. Oh, boy. Because, yeah, it's, for me, too, it's a bit hectic to do this every week. Um, anyway, are there any other questions? I just yeah. wanted to ask what, what would happen if you have two entries with the same keys. So you like while you were trying to iterate, you're passing two keys, two exact keys to in your map object. That's a fantastic idea. Well, if we if we go back to this other variant that I did here, with this variant, it's easy to understand what the answer to that question would be. If you understand the semantics of dot set, if you call dot set multiple times with the same key, it will change the value. And so in this case, let's say we had two of these where species was the same. What this algorithm would do is call dot set passing the key species. And it would set the value to be this one here. However, the next time around, you know, in the for each, when it gets evaluated with the last option, it's going to call dot set again. And so when it calls set the second time with the same key, the way that maps work, it's going to overwrite the first version of it. 
And so we're going to end up with a map that only has one value for species, and it's going to be the last one encountered in this array. So that's the complete opposite of find, in a way. Exactly. It's the opposite of find. Yes. Yes, that's a great insight. The way find works is it checks each one and it returns the first match. The way this works is it sets up entries in the map for each of these entry, entries in the options array one at a time and if it does encounter the key multiple times it overwrites it. So essentially it's putting the last occurrence of the match in the original array as the the value in the map that you get. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'm not so certain what the behavior is when you use the constructor like this but it may well be the same. Yeah, it may well take the last match, although I'm not 100% sure. So you know what we can do, we can actually test it out. And this is the beautiful thing about coding too, you can use the code to ask questions about the code. For example, um, oh, there's a breakage. Column to type is not defined. Sorry, forgot to uncomment. Uh, sorry, I'm just a little disoriented. But yeah, let's do this little experiment to figure out what the answer is. All right. So when we use this variant that uses for each, goes through all of them, I would expect it's going to give us the last one. And if we select species, it outputs categorical, which is the last one. See, the first one was quantitative. And we actually have the same key here multiple times. Now, let's answer the other question of what if we use the map constructor like this, is it the same? So if I select species, it outputs categorical. So the answer is yes, it is the same. So it takes the last one. Great question, great question. I love how it digs in a little deeper. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now Let's go ahead and solve the next piece of this puzzle. Now that we know what the type should be when we select it, we need to pass it into X type. And you know, while we're at it, uh, let's pass it into Y type as well. Y type is get type of column. Oh, there's some error. There's a syntax error. Mm, I don't know what that was about. So I'm going to also call y type here Okay, it's fine. Nothing was. There was no problem. So now, from the outer sort of view of things, we're invoking it where we want to be invoking it. We're setting Y type when we change the Y menu, and we're setting X type when we change the X menu. Now the task at hand is to implement that method in our scatter plot. So let's go into our scatter plot code. In scatterplot.js, we've got a bunch of these getter setter accessors. And uh, let's just make a few more. We've got x value and y value. I'm just going to copy paste these and change value to type. 
So x type is going to be x type. Change y value to y type. And we're referring to the variable y type and x type. Those don't exist yet. So let's make those at the top of the file. Like this. Now, these are available to us when we render our scatter plot. Let's just make sure, because this is where we're going to want to use those. Let's make sure it's available with console.log x type here. So we get undefined initially, which makes sense because we're only passing it in when we change the menu. But when we do change the menu, we get quantitative for these, and if we type, if we select species, we get categorical, which is exactly what we want. Okay. This is great. And I think what we can do is say if x type is categorical using this um, ternary syntax, we create a linear scale. Otherwise, now this is where we can use. No, uh Category yeah. call me scale. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, the good call. So I got the order reversed. So it's going to be scale linear if it's not categorical. But if it is categorical, then it's going to use scale point. Just use prettier to format that. And if it is a scale point, we can set the domain to be data.map x value. And what this, what this does is it returns an array of all the different x values, including duplicates. So it's going to return like versicolor, 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 setosa, setosa, setosa. But then when you, when you pass that array into dot domain, the scale will internally figure out that there are duplicates and it will deduplicate it. So the domain will only end up having three entries, the unique values of the species column. And then dot range um, actually should be the same because we want it to span across the same space in pixels. So this should work. Let's see if it does. If I change x to species, there's some breakage. Let's see what it is. Oh, scale point is not defined. Yeah, I forgot to import it. We just need to import that from D3 along with this other stuff. Now it should work. Okay, great. Check it out. It works. Hooray! We solved the problem. Yep, everything's working. The quantitative stuff is working, and when we hit species, it transitions to this which is the behavior of a point scale, by the way. It just takes the values that it sees in the order it receives them and identifies the unique ones and spreads those across the space, across the screen. It's exactly what we want. And I must say I am impressed by the way that D3Axis handles the transition. See how it fades? D3Axis is brilliantly implemented because if it is given 
another linear scale, see how it animates the numbers? It animates the ticks. But if you pass into D3 axis with the transition, a different type of scale, it does this nice fade animation, which is just brilliant. Brilliant. But anyway, there's a little bit of cleanup work to do here. But um, any questions so far? Yeah, just um, one question here, Zarek. Um, just curious, uh, how hard would it be to actually um, show um, all the data that are in each of those categories as dot plots? Dot plots. So in other words, in other words, some of those, as you mentioned earlier, are on top of each other, but you would ha really have sort of a <clears throat> frequency. Is this what you mean by dot plot? Yep. Yep. So, oh. so, so what you're trying to show is a, almost a distribution across right. those categories so that you can see where the peaks are. So that's yeah. hidden right now. Yep. But it's a, sort of a natural transition. But um, as I'm thinking about it, uh, just trying to get a sense from your expertise how deep one would have to go and actually to do that. Totally. Not that we do it here, but I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah it's, I, it's a great question. Go ahead. I, I, I just want to suggest an idea for doing that and, and uh, let you see whether it works or not. So we... Yes, that's right. Um, to implement that, what you described, Eric, the first thing I would do is just look at it from, from a bird's eye view and say, like, what should the architecture of this be? Should it be one visualization or should it be a parent visualization and a child visualization where the child is one of these reusable components like the scatter plot, but for a single dot plot. Got it. You know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. I would I would get it to work. That's probably how I would do it. I would get it to work for a single dot plot. And like you said, Costa, that requires a step of binning where you take these... Um, well, in this case, you can just use the the different values that are present here. I think it increments by 0.1. That's the resolution of the data. So for e each one of these unique values, you would want to bin them and count how many occurrences there are for each of these unique values. And that there's a feature in D3 called D3 bin, I think, or D3 histogram. If you Google search D3 histogram, you can see this in action. So that's a, d a data pr processing step. So first you need to do that binning so that for each of these n numbers, you know how many occurrences there are. And then based on that, after that binning happens, you can visualize that as a dot plot. Got it. And then okay. that would be one of these components. And then to, what you're doing essentially is called small multiples dot plots, where you would want to actually have three dot plots, one for each species. Yep. And so then you would need to change this scatterplot code completely so that for each of the values across the x-axis here, it would iterate through those and for each one invoke that reusable dot plot instance. So you'd have three instances of a reusable dot plot. That's one way to do it. Okay, that's what I was, that, that, that's what I was just curious how, how you'd approach it. So. Um... Not that obviously we tackle it, but it's it, yeah. So that's how you would do that. But there's a uh, if you step back a little, there's another question: What is the best visualization design to show this type of data? And small multiples dot plots is one option, but there are a number of different options. 
There's actually one option that's very low-hanging fruit for us that we could do right now. And I love doing this because it's so simple. On the circles, we could set the fill opacity to 0 0.2 in the CSS. Um, I don't think that actually worked. Maybe it's just opacity. Yeah, there we go. That worked. So if we set the opacity on the circles and we subdivide them by species, you can see... Oh, that's see? doing it right there. See yeah. what I'm saying? That's, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. it. So this is a simple modification we can do to make the visualization communicate the information of density, like how many overlapping dots there are, which is the same thing that would be communicated by the dot plots. Yep. Okay, so this is a bird's eye view. Yep. Okay. So the bird's That's eye great. view, meaning <laughs> what, I, what I meant by bird's eye view is you step back and look at the design space of the visualization. This is one other option. There are so many other options. I mean, you could have small multiples box plots, for example. You could have small multiples histograms like bar style histograms. You could have small multiples violin plots. So many different ways. I mean, once you get this data structure and you want to visualize it, there are so many options. But you can frame it as small multiples, meaning you want to implement one instance of it and then just multiply it across the different values. That and, was really cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and R, by the way, ggplot in R uh -huh. does all this stuff. Okay. It's brilliant the way it does it. So, yeah, stuff to look into. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, let's finish this up here. It's almost done, but we've only done it for X and not Y. And this code itself can be cleaned up. Whenever I see duplicated logic like this, dot range, dot range, copy pasted, it's the exact same thing. I asked myself, how can we get rid of this duplicated logic? In this case, it's fairly simple because this expression, if you put parentheses around it, returns a scale. It could be a point scale, it could be a linear scale, but it returns the scale. And so we can essentially factor out the call to dot range so that it gets applied to the returned scale, whatever type of scale it happens to be. Then I just run prettier on that, and, and this is what we get. Yeah, I would prefer this, just because it has less duplication. So to be clear, this set of parentheses creates the scale, you know, a different type of scale, depending on whether X type is categorical or not, it sets the domain, but it does not set the range. But whatever scale comes back from this expression, we call dot range on that scale, whatever it is. So that's just a simpler way to do it. Now that we've got that, we can just do the exact same thing for Y. I'm just going to copy paste it, change X to Y all over the place. Uh, so instead of X value, it's going to be Y value. But with the Y scale, we need to be careful about the range because it's different. It's height minus margin dot bottom and margin dot top. So I'm going to take this definition of the range and use it here and get rid of our original Y scale definition. And this should do the trick for both X and Y. We'll see if it does. X species works. Y species works. Excellent. And one last little thing that I don't like about this is that there's no padding. It goes all the way up to the edge. Maybe it's just personal preference or stylistic, but I like always to put a little um, padding 
And the way where we can put that is right here, scale point dot domain dot padding. That's a function on these scales. Up say zero point two. Yeah, so if we look at it now, we get this nice padding. It doesn't go all the way up to the edge, which I just find kind of I don't know. Distasteful. It has space to breathe. The labels, you can read all the labels now. So Virginica used to be off the screen. And just as the final step, I'm going to call dot padding in the case of Y as well. So now it works for both X and Y. And the, the labels get cut off. Yeah, l let me just... Um, change the margin to address that problem because what I want to do is finish today with a complete product that works um, for all the cases that you select but where's my margin margin oh it's right here margin left well, let me set it to 150 pixels and see if that's enough for species okay that's a little too much maybe 120 All right, there we have it. Any questions? So <clears throat> one question I had was with those drop downs there. Um, I couldn't find where one um, does this or if it's even possible to change the font and the size of those drop downs oh is yeah. that a css thing that's a great question you know the html select element and the options it's notoriously difficult to style with css okay. so if you're working on a product where you need styled menus the best approach might to go might be to go seeking out some third party library that implements a drop down widget that you can style with CSS. Okay. I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, Explain the hunt. <laughs> yeah, there okay. it's it's a hunt. Yeah. And and like you just it's very difficult to style these the way you want. Um but again it's a whole other level of complexity to like evaluate the different libraries and pick one and figure out how to use it. Um however with this D3 reusable chart pattern, you could implement a menu component just like this, having the same API, you know, having the same methods and everything. But internally, it could use that third-party menu library. That would be the approach that I would suggest. Okay. Thank you. But that said, I was actually surprised to see that in one of the submissions, the menus were styled. Let me see if I can find which. Was that you, Kostov? Yes. Kostov, how did you do this? I think I used normal CSS to do this. See, this is beautiful. It has that custom font. That's awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to make the font consistent with the axis and menu. I think. So I just used this select uh, HTML tag and applied this property here. Worked. Brilliant. So, you know. There you go. All right. I was trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So it looks Thank like you. it looks like you had to style the select, the label, and option to get it to work. Yep. So I think the labels were for these uh, axis uh, labels, and the option and select were for the drop down. Right. Yep. So there's your answer, Eric. Should work. Thank you. And I was actually quite surprised to see this working because um, I've, I've struggled in the past to try to do this, but it looks like this works. Yeah, I was just playing around with it. I, I totally forgot that it worked for my case. That's awesome. And I wonder if it would behave correctly if you try more advanced CSS, like setting the, the background color or the, you know, the roundedness of the edges. I think you might run into a wall beyond which you can't customize, but worth exploring for sure. Right. But yeah, this is very nice. And I, I have to say, it's really nice how these animate. 
or how your labels animate. Really nice work. All right. Well, I think that's all for today. I Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you all. Thank for you very coming. much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's I changed it to every other week. So just mark your calendars. It's not going to be every week. And I will leave you all with an exercise for this next two weeks. I want you to find a compelling data set. Look around online for different data sets. And uh, yeah, try to find a compelling public data set and just search around. You know, I would suggest coming up with some idea of like data that you want to see visualized that you've maybe seen in the past or thought about deeply, like some sort of existential like question about society or I don't know, climate change, the Keeling curve, if you the Keeling curve would be a good one. Um, but yeah, find a compelling data set that interests you. And the way to do it is just search for the topic, see if you can find any visualizations that pertain to the topic, track down their data source, uh, you know, follow links until you can get to a downloadable data file, like an Excel file, and then export it as CSV, or just try to find a CSV or a JSON file. Load that up, you know, fork the scatter plot we made with the menus, load in that data, update the data parsing logic, and I want you to actually explore the data using this scatter plot with the menus. Because now that now that the scatter plot has the transparency, uh, we can see the density of things. And now that we made it handle species, it can handle any column that's categorical. And uh, I want you to write up the key insights that you discover in the readme of the viz. So fork this, modify the readme.md file to write up like bullet points of like, this is cool. Um, this other thing is cool. You know, interesting insights that you find about the data, not about the viz or the coding, but I want you to like actually explore some data. And uh, yeah, share your results in the forum. I've made an entry for for today, episode 12. Here it is. VizHub has been my passion project since 2018. And um, I've rewritten it twice. And I'm, I'm embarking on rewriting it again. Because, okay. Because I went in the other day to try to redeploy and like up, upgrade the dependencies, and it's like it was just so heavy feeling, you know, a code base that I've been working on for two years, and so I really want to like do a deep dive and like make VizHub as good as it could possibly be, and uh, focus on things like you know hot, hot reloading of the code is is what I've really been intrigued by, and also having some state associated with the visuals so that you, if you want to tweak something you would not have to change the code but you'd have like a knob or a dial that you could just touch oh, cool. and tweak and see the feedback instantaneously so I was just very um, inspired to start working on the next the next iteration of VizHub so that's that's what I'm going to do but Excellent. but this has been a really great experience this series because it's developed this little following which i think is is i mean, it's amazing it's 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 a golden little um group of folks and and i just want to say i really appreciate all of you who've participated it's been really fun and i've it, it's been really great to see you all learn and grow and do new things that you've never done before so thanks for that no thanks you for all, all your being so kind to to share your knowledge you know it's my pleasure. Yeah, and it's it's you know it's proved it sort of proved the one of the original vision goals of of VizHub and my teaching to to reach a wider audience of folks who might not 
otherwise be able to learn this stuff. You know, may not have access to, you know, a university. <laughs> so, mm. and it it worked. It's it's working. I mean, I've I've seen people from all sorts of different countries. Um, if I look at the Google Analytics of VizHub, it's not just the U.S. It's global. The audience is global, particularly mm. in like developing countries, which which I'm so thrilled by. I just that's well, I'm so happy to see it. Yeah, I, I'm for example, I'm from Chile, and you know, la last year, I it was really a struggle, or maybe 2000, 2019, it was really a struggle to find here. Uh, a course on D3, uh, like a lead course. Uh, mm. uh, and well, in the internet, there's a lot of tutorials, uh, but, but uh, you know, the, the ones that you produce are, 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 are the ones that really made me understand D3. And this one that was synchronous, it was really also, I, I, I've learned a lot uh, thanks to this. Oh, great. Great. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I remember being on and seeing someone from New Zealand, I think, was on. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> we had New Zealand, India, <laughs> US. Exactly. If folks from India. I think, Kostov, you're located in India, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm from India. Quite a diverse set that we have here. Well, I'm curious, where do you live in India? Uh, so I live near Delhi. Ah. Uh. Nice up north, you know. I up lived. North, yeah. um, I lived outside of Nagpur for four and a half years. Oh, well, I didn't know that. And actually, I developed VizHub when I was living in India. I was riding my scooter, <laughs> my Honda Activa, to my little <laughs> rented office, and uh, coding VizHub all day. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, I also like would be definitely interested in like you know uh, seeing this grow and. I found it really nice, that feature that you just write your code and you automatically see the changes. You don't have to press any button or build. Right. Build your... Right, that's, exactly. That's yep. And, and that's, that's one of the things that I love about VizHub too. But the way that it works right now is that every time you make a, a change, it, to it reruns the entire page. And I want to move away from that. I want to share with you all Brett Victor inventing on principle. This talk was hugely, hugely inspiring to me. So in this case, the, the value I found. Because he's got this idea that, yeah, check this out. He's so got this. Got um, we are not seeing the anything. Oh, know? I'm sorry. I have to share my screen in, in this in this system too. I forgot to do that. It's live on YouTube, but not in the a Google Meet. But now you should be able to see it. Okay. The yeah, this is the thing. I just want to play this because it really resonates with me. Spent working in the code, working in a text editor blindly without an immediate connection to this thing, which is what I'm actually trying to make. So I feel this goes against this principle I have, that creators need an immediate connection to what they're making. So I tried to come up with a coding environment that I thought might be more in line with this principle I have. So what I have here is I've got this picture on this side and the code on this side. and you know, this, this part draws the sky, and this draws the mountains, and this draws the tree. And when I make any change to the code, the picture changes immediately. That's what I want to have. So the code and the picture to. are always in sync. There's oh, wow. no compiling. Who did lines. this? Brett Victor. I just change things in the code. Oh, Brett Victor. And oh. I see <laughs> things change in the picture. But yeah. check this out. He's about to do the craziest thing. And now that we have this immediate connection between the code and the picture, we can start thinking about ways of changing the code other than typing. So for example, this number here is here the, comes. the length of the branches. If I want to control that number, I just point my mouse to it, hold down the control key, and I can dial it up and down. That's what I want. Oh, wow. So I can see what it looks like for big branches or small branches. And I can kind of converge on what feels right to me artistically. I, and this I, works for anything. I followed some of the stuff in the past. It's amazing. So this video by Vet, it's from 2012, this video by Brent yeah. Victor. He's a visionary. He is. 
and what strikes me about this is it the way this environment this little environment that he custom built for just the, this one talk it it seems to not reload the entire page it just reruns the code in the page without having to reload the entire html and so i think you know this is the direction i want to take vizhub i want to make it so that you can author your code and and updates to the code should take on the order of milliseconds to execute without having to rerun rerun the entire html and then from there i want to add like the ability to extract different variables into like little widgets on the side like in the editor of vizhub there should be a visual editor with colors and, and numbers and strings and as you change those it should update instantly so yeah i just wanted to share some some context for why i'm why i'm ending this this series right now so, yeah, that's it. Have you been in contact with him on how he's done that? No. Okay. I mean, he's he's a towering figure. I mean, Brett Victor, he's... Yeah. So I don't know if he's the kind of person I could just get in touch with, you know? He's like this, this like celebrity figure. Yeah. You know, I worked at Apple for years and years. I think he developed a lot of the the early UI for like the iPads and stuff. But hey, that's not a bad idea. Maybe I should just send him an email. <laughs> yeah, I do it. <laughs> Worth a try, I guess. And yeah, someone asked how to support VizHub. Yeah. The best way to support it right now is just to sign up for the the paid plan, which is $4 a month. There's current, there are currently not that many customers and it's not making money. It's not even paying for the servers, but, um, and this is another direction I'm going to take it. I want to add more features that people would be willing to pay for. So if anybody has ideas, I mean, I have a lot of ideas like pay for storage, pay for collaborator seats, pay for, um, white label embedding where you could embed a viz onto a website without the viz hub logo in it. Um, custom domains for vizs. I mean, imagine if you could create something in VizHub and and create a, set up a domain name to point to that, and so VizHub could be your website hosting provider. So I've got a lot of ideas. Um, if anybody else has more ideas, let me know. And I'd also I also want to make it the best tool out there for professors and teachers to use for teaching web any any courses to do with web technology. So what's the best way to get to get in touch with you oh just just email me okay uh, at gmail yeah curran.kelleher at gmail.com okay. all right yep yeah and um i'm on twitter so you know after i end this series i'll still be active on twitter i, I will definitely announce um so it's yeah curran what is it Curran Kelleher on Twitter. This is where I'll announce okay. um, any new developments or activities. Um, okay. And I, I am thinking of doing like a, a beta program where where I invite people to test out the, the new version of VizHub that I'm developing. And so if anybody would be interested in that, let me know. Um, I don't have any any onboarding form set up or anything like that. But let me know. I'd be happy to. Oh. Great. Yeah, I'll keep you in mind. All right. So let's let's dig into this. I, I want to just wrap up the series by reviewing all the last, uh, the, the work that everyone's done for the last assignment and uh, responding to whatever questions that come up. I don't have any prepared material that I'm going to go through today. So it's really just more of an informal discussion sort of a thing. So let's see. Oh, Kustav is here with us. Um, Kustav, you want to walk us through what, um, what you've, what you've done? Yeah, sure. So like I took a copy of the scatterplot templates template that we prepared last time and plugged in a data set which comes from this Tidy Tuesday project 
which also runs on Twitter. So this is run by the R for Data Science online learning community. And they release like new data, data sets every week. And this was a data set that I hadn't explored before and just wanted to try out, like explore it a bit further and thought like using D3 and the, uh, and all the things that we have learned over the past past weeks to create this list. So it shows the, I think the median income, uh, median household income over time and varies by uh, the different communities. So as you can see that there's a significant difference between like uh, whites and blacks and Hispanics. So this sort of brings out uh, the income inequality, which is still prevalent. Wow, this is amazing. And what, where is this localized? Is it for the US or globally or? Yes. So this is it's, just it's in, in the US. US. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the, the entire US. US. Yes, yes. Wow. I think the original data comes from the US census. Right. Oh, great. Urban Institute, that's a great group. Mm. Great, great work to start. Uh, I, I have a question for Curran about this piece, if yeah. it's OK. Sure. Um, is there a way, because I really lo love the idea, but, but I, th I think that maybe uh, if the labels of the years are exactly, uh, or correspond exactly to the, to the point, it could be more easy to, to read. Is there a way for the uh, x-axis, the scale x-axis, uh, process that or, or do that? Let's take a look. Yeah, I think that would be a very nice addition. Totally agree. Yeah. Nice. But before we dig into that, I just want to say that this is exactly the kind of work that I was hoping for, where it, it actually looks at a an issue in the world. And I just want to take a, a second, and I will I will get into that that question, but I just want to take a second and think about what it means that white people in the U.S. are earning. It looks like on the order of you know 160k up and down whereas black people in the u.s are earning on the order of less than forty thousand a year i mean that's profound that's that's a profound piece of information also i was also surprised when i looked at that to revisit the raw data just to confirm like I hadn't read it incorrectly or something Right? Like, like that. is that correct? Like, oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, that's such what I was wondering. There's such income inequality? Like, this is... That's the, the median? What's the, the metric? Yeah, this this is the median median household earnings. Adjusted for inflation, I think. Yeah, it's adjusted for inflation as well. What is shocking to me as well, that, that, that this difference is not improving in time. It's right. Still it's not improving at all it's it's you know it seems to almost have been getting worse and if you if you if you inspect the median of the white group again you would see that they have increased in time right rising up compared to the other ethnic minorities and this big gap this big gap here must have been the 2008 um Financial crisis, yeah, yes. financial crisis, recession, whatever they call it. So that seems to have impacted everyone, but it is it is shocking and like disturbing. Like, why is it that white people earn so much more than black people? I think that's that's ridiculous. And just I, you know, thank you, Costa, for selecting this particular data set and surfacing this particular issue. I think it's a very important thing to look at. And can I say as well, you brought last time, you brought an important point that animation need to serve a purpose. And it's nice seeing, it's not it's not very nice, but it's it's very telling seeing those points drop when you swap yes. it. Yeah. Yes, I agree. It's a very great use of animation. Yeah. And I would be curious to, 
to do a similar analysis for different countries across the world and see if the gap is so high in other countries as well, or if it's something that's unique to the U.S. I don't know. I haven't looked at the data, but that would be an interesting analysis. Or maybe have this broken down in males and females as well. Right. That would be another good analysis. Yes, for sure, for sure. And then once you do that, the possibilities of different ways of visualizing that increase dramatically because you can show multiple things at once. And um, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to get to with this course of like the variety of visualization types. But we didn't. We just essentially worked on scatter plots. But I think that's okay because because you can build things that are interactive and scatter plots actually cover a huge range of data. And so the first first thing you can do with any data set is is make a scatter plot. So yeah, amazing work, Custom. Now, um, who asked that question about aligning? I did. Great, great. Let's dig into that, because I agree. I agree. This this appar apparently uses the built-in axis of you know from D3, which is not the same as the data points, and so it makes you wonder, you know, for a given dot, what year is that, right? And I agree that that's a that's a good that's a good um, issue that I want to see fixed. I'm just scrolling through to see what is actually going on. Here's the x-axis. So if we just comment out that, oh, I forgot the dot call line. If we just comment that out, it renders without the axis, which is fine. Although I kind of like, I kind of want to keep the visual elements of the axis. Um, so I'm just thinking, how could we do this? We could do some other rendering logic where we we render these tick tick marks ourselves. Or we may be able to configure D3 axis with a set number of points. I believe we can do that. Let me just consult the D3 documentation. Yeah, I think so. Ticks. So, yeah, the nature of the ticks method is not just one format. See, this is the format that we're using, like 10. And then, oh, Put something in the chat. Oh, which chat? The Google Meet. Nice. So I'll copy it from the chat and take a look. This is I'm pasting from the chat. See, dot ticks six. I, I still don't think this will do what we need, because what I'm thinking is, we may be able to pass an array of specific values into ticks. That's what I'm trying to figure out. See this this one here. You it this passes in an array to ticks, which leads me to believe that I think we can pass in an array of of dates. So let's just try it. Instead of passing in ticks 10, what if I pass in an array that has just a single date 
where it's like uh, the year 2000. Does that show up? No. What if I get rid of the formatter? No. Do I? Huh. I'm pretty sure there's a way to specify. Oh, look, here it is. Sorry. To set the tick values explicitly, use access.tick values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what we need. This is what we need. All right, let's try that. So I'll just undo to where it was before. And then what if we say dot tick values? And here we pass in a new date, year 2000. Boom, that works. See? Great. It says 2000. And so now what we need to do to implement your idea is to just isolate the unique dates that appear in the data, which should be relatively straightforward. Let me see, what is the structure of the data? Oh, we already have x value, which is perfect. And I think this is the function that we need right here data.map, a function that just returns all the x values, all the dates. Or, <laughs> for that matter, <laughs> for that matter, we can, um, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was just thinking, could we use x scale domain? No, we can't, because that's the extent of it, which we don't want. So, I'll just try this. If I copy that down into the place where we put new date, that does the trick. Awesome, that was exciting. That's impressive. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, this is exactly what you were describing, and I think it is a very nice improvement to the viz, because now you know exactly what year each of these are, and it's kind of surprising which years they selected. I mean, I, it doesn't seem to make any sense. There's not really any pattern to it. Is there? I mean, 1980. I think it's every three years since 1989. Oh, is it every three years? Yeah. With, yeah. One, with one missing value in 1986. In it was there was some missing data, so I removed that. But oh, I think I it's every three years. Interesting. I wonder why they chose every three years. Well, I guess that's the census. Every three years? Hmm. Interesting. Oh, I see there's a message in the chat from people's feelings. You want to describe that? Oh, yeah, this is I was working on a similar thing. I don't know if this is directly pertinent, but just in case you wanted to look at it. Nice. It's the same as the earlier approach you looked at. What is the approach? Because it seems so it's a scatter plot and it references a cell. This is from observable HQ. So tornado years is an array. But this, really this, I mean, this will create an axis that just has the ticks that are defined by the like default tick generator setup. So I don't think it actually addresses the issue that we were having. Oh, where, sorry. Where, because yeah, we, the issue that we wanted to do is is make it so that it's not just like every year or every ten years or every five years, but it's actually just the ticks from the years that are present in the data. Um, uh, but yeah, thanks, can you have, thanks for that. Can you have as well default labels? 
Default labels, how do you mean? So <clears throat> I, was, I was experimenting with something and I failed completely. Um, say, for example, you have a, a, a categorical variable you wanna, you wanna show, but one way of showing that is assigning uh, numerical values for those, say, zero and one. Hmm. And, by, and by adding a jitter, you allow the points not to position themselves over each other. But then I got stuck with the actual label on the axis because then they display zeros and ones. And, and I want them to display back those categorical strings. Oh. Is this something in VizHub that we could look at? I've, I failed completely to put it in this hub. Oh, it's not there? Oh, okay. It's not, it's not, I apologize. It's just an idea in my head. I see, but you tried it, you tried something. I, for, for the exercise, I wanted to represent data from the Titanic, and I wanted to show those, uh, say, different uh, deck levels, but I want to show them as in numerical values with a little bit of random jitter, so the points don't right. position themselves. But I wanted to add the labels in, and I kept turning in my head, and I felt completely, I didn't know where to, to start from, really. I see. That is the basis of my question. Like a label over each point of the scatter plot? Uh, like the current sc scatter plot we have, but instead of saying 2005, you, you, you want to say, say, for example, the financial collapse year, you, you may want to label that financial collapse instead of 2008. So I think what you're describing, it's a lot like species, right? Where you have discrete values and you want to map them to some x, y, like this. Is yes. That... Uh, so suppose in your data set, those species were represented by three different numbers, one, two, and three. Right. But when you want to display the access label, you want that label, you want that access to display the actual species strings. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, in that case, you could do a data pre-processing step where before you pass the data into the visualization code, you can just replace those numbers with the strings in the data. But then I would lose that bit of jitter I would have on those values. So the so you jitter... Okay, I, I, I encountered the same challenge, uh, you know, um, and I was able to, I don't know if, if that's the correct approach, but I was able to add jitter to a scale point, uh, even though it was a discrete variable. Um, it, it's it uh, current, if you want to, to, to show my example, it's in, in, in the in the forum, and I think it addresses, I, I believe it addresses this, this issue. Oh, great. Is it in here, in this thread? Yes. That's the one. Oh, this one. Ah, let's take a look. Very cool. So, if you put uh, the, the continent in the y-axis, and the date inscribed in the x-axis, there's a little bit of jitter, and that way it's not like uh, like in the in the setosa example, in the in the flower example, it's not like on the same exactly exact line. This is brilliant. Exactly, exactly. So how did you do it? Uh, look the the y scale. I believe I I added some at random there. At some point. So it's not mm. in it's not in the scale definition. It could be in the is it in the y value accessor, perhaps? I don't know. I I you know, I, I look for example, see I, it it took me a time a, a while to figure out, you know. I and yep. I borrowed it from somewhere. So I don't remember exactly where I put it. So it's not no. there. It must be not there. it must be in the rendering <clears throat> step. Yes. Let me see. Wow, let me just search for a random. There it is. Yeah, it's right in the rendering logic. See, that makes a per that makes perfect sense, and that's how I would have done it as well. 
Yeah. I see now. I see. Yeah. So yeah. right before you render it to the point, add the jitter, which is just a random number times 10. However, math.random, you have to understand, it varies between 0 and 1. And so this code here will jitter the points only in one specific direction, meaning it's, it's, going, it's going to be the original x or greater. So it's going to be right. some place between the original x and the original x plus 10. Normally, jitter would... Um, would move it in both directions and the way that you can do that oh it's I have to fork this to edit it and another just another side point I want VizHub to show the previous authors too because it looks like I made this but it's not my work so that's one thing I want to address um, but the way that you could do that is something like minus 5 so then it would it would be x plus or minus 5 randomly and in general that would be like if you could you could if you wanted a variable for jitter you could make it like that and say random times jitter minus jitter divided by 2. Yeah, jitter is an interesting technique. Just adding adding random variation. And this one, actually, if you were to put a bunch of points and jitter them like this, what you would see is a square, not a circle. Because it varies them in x and y in a square. Uh, I've seen other people do jitter with such that when you jitter it, you would see a circle. And so then what you want to do is compute a random angle and a random distance from that angle and do the jitter like that. Mm, that sounds difficult. <laughs> it's, it's not that bad. I mean, you just need some uh, sine and cosine. <laughs> Is it to just create a function for, for this, right? Yeah. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, because there's duplicated logic, which is unfortunate. So we can call this jitter magnitude. And we can make a function. It's just a number. And then we just do the jittering of that number. And so that way we can say d is jitter of d dot x and then jitter of d dot y. That would be uh, one way on. to, to do it. Um, uh, you define in jitter for the jitter, it's a recursive. Oh, uh, whoops. This one. Yeah. I forgot to change the name. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, jitter is an interesting technique, but um, there's another technique that I like, which is the force layout. And um, in certain cases, the force layout could be better than the jitter. And this comes back to this notion that you mentioned. Here it is. Yeah. So in the original question, it was like how do we how do we split up how how do we split the points? Um, jitter is one option, but with jitter there's still a high probability that they're going to overlap each other. However, if you use D3Force with the collision constraint, um, it has a similar effect to jitter, but it guarantees that there's not going to be any overlap. 
and this this could be a really nice option as well yes especially because my purpose was to like visualize each el so that you were able to visualize each element each heritage element so i right. think that this solution is more proper to accomplish that goal yeah i think it's it's more accurate in a sense as well i'm trying to find a good example it gives a better sense where points cluster at specific places as opposed to jitu yes yes because for example in my in my in my case i i wanted to show how in europe uh, there's a disproportionately amount of heritage elements and and you can't really see that in this version because because as as Kuren says uh, there's a lot of overplotting in in europe right Yeah. Yes. If you did the bee swarm on this layout, or maybe this one, that would be a very yes. that if yeah, I would suggest to try that to try the force layout, the force directed layout with the collision constraint for this exact view without the jitter. That way, you would see that like w this this really dense area here in Europe, it would actually spread up and down. It would give you a, a visual up and down spread so you could really see the, the quantity, like the density of the points much more clearly than in this view. Yeah, that would be similar to sort of a, a quasi dot plot. Yes. Yes. And, and also almost reminiscent of um, like a violin plot. But yeah, this is really nice work. So I'm curious, did you see any insights from the data in here that surprised you? Well, that's the main insight uh, that, that I put because I, I read that, that uh, before the 90s, there was a, like a really disproportionate amount of uh, cultural and natural heritage sites in Europe, and there was less of a presence in Latin America, Africa, and other parts of the world. But but you can't really see see that with these visualizations, you know. Uh, right. And, and and it was surprising. Maybe it's because of this visualization doesn't show it. But but I didn't really see that uh, that uh, tem temporal trend. Uh, with this visualization, but but indeed uh, Europe has like the the most heritage sites sites declared by UNESCO. So that's the main insight, you know. I see. I want to yeah, try. I guess the other thing I thought that I really loved about this plot, just from an artistic standpoint, was that how it showed the world map. Um, oh yeah, that's indirectly. Cool. <laughs> Yes, yes. I, indeed, in, in the readme section, I, I I said that it's really a map, but but I like I don't I haven't yeah. learned yet how to make it, but but because I use latitude and longitude, it really it's it resembles the the geographical points. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I I, I can talk a little bit about. About how to actually make it a map. Um, but first, I kind of want to try tweaking some of the things that we have available to us to tweak to, to show more clearly the things that you're describing. Um, one thing is if we pull the opacity way down, that helps us to show density in Europe. See that? Right, yes, definitely. And then if we do it by continent and date, um, I want to try making the radius more. So instead of a radius of 5, let's say a radius of 20. Oh, see. 
huh, this is this is one thing where like the next version of VizHub, I want to be able to tweak the radius, but have it remember which things I selected. You know what I mean? Now, maybe that's a little too big. We'll say 15, but then I want to bring down the opacity even more, like 0.05. Now we can see a little more clearly how dis disproportionate the density is in Europe. And if that's the thing you want to highlight, it's it's currently confounded with the colors. It's hard to tell based on the colors. So just to tease out that one thing, if I just make them all black, Oh, whoops, that should be date, continent. Now you can see it more clearly, see? Yes, definitely, right. Man, I'm, it's impressive how it gets almost completely black. It's a heritage x-ray. Is there a way you could also filter on the counts and then switch up the color once it hits a threshold so that it pops so you could have a red <laughs> yeah that's a great idea to do that you yeah and hey if you wanted to show that europe has more or like if that's the message with this probably the that's that's the thing to do is to aggregate it by binning it by the years and then maybe applying some smoothing even and then you would have um, an aggregated view where you could apply a threshold of, say, if it's more than 100 per year, make it red or something. So it really pops. Yeah, that could totally work. And to do the binning, you could leverage D3 histogram. I think it might have been renamed to D3 bin. Or is it banned? No, it's not banned. It's, huh, it's bin. This is the one. So this this example is a normal distribution of like a thousand points. Oh, sorry, I lost it. And then what it's doing is it's it's calculating the number of points that fall into each bin, each bucket. And in this case, each bin is like 0 0.5 or 0 0.05 or... Here's 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So 0 0.05 is the, the width of the buckets. But you could bin by the years. And so, yeah, that's right. that's one thing I would suggest to try is binning by yes. year. And, and another thing that now that I, I'm looking at the, at the visualization, I, I think that that it, it doesn't reflect the message uh, so clearly uh, because it, be, I, I mean, the, the main message is, is that, for example, Asia, that's a continent with a, a, a bigger population than Europe, has significant, significantly lower heritage sites. So their culture is not being like highlighted by UNESCO as much as Europe. And, and, and because uh, the population, for example, it's not being considered in this beast. You don't really see that disproportionate uh, reality, you know? Mm. Yes. This so is so maybe I, I, I should I should I should have done th that that data uh, transformation before to to highlight uh, that disparity. But th th those are the kind of things that that I'm thinking now when when I hear about you guys. Yeah, taking the population into account would be quite interesting as well. Um, why Africa was doing much better in the 60s compared to later years? That's a great question. I, I don't know, but th that's a great question. So 1980, there's a lot more heritage sites defined in the 80s. And by the way, this, this number formatting is not right. That's something we could fix. 
see in the um, see Y type what is Y type for the so I'm I'm looking at the problem of the number formatting and I'm thinking to myself those should actually be just represented as years without the comma right and this actually is I'm glad you did this because it highlights the fact that we need another type which is which is right. date. I, I just put it quantitative like date as quantitative not as date exactly type. oh I'm so happy that that this happened yeah so now we can actually do that next step which is the the complete the completion of this generic scatter plot make it handle quantitative categorical and time or dates uh, what is the type of that I'll just call it time and if it's time we need to have a time format which is how we parse it Zan Armstrong has this really great um, time formatting example so the specifier for the time parsing would be if it's just year it would be this one percent y and I'm pretty sure that's what it is in the data if it's showing up like that and so now let's actually do this work of making it work with time so let me get more space for the code so we're looking at just X if X type is categorical then do this otherwise and this is where I want to introduce another another case where if X type is time then is do there so a switch and case for uh, JavaScript oh yeah we could do that we could do that yeah as we add more of these it's getting a little cumbersome to use this this ternary operator yeah that could work but I feel like this is pretty close I mean we're pretty close to having okay, it working just one type it doesn't make sense to create another logic for this yeah but at this juncture I mean I, it's a good thought and and what I would do is get it working first with the minimal effort and then after we run prettier on that then we make the call of like is this ugly enough to to merit a refactoring where we use the case switch and then we would we could write it with the case switch and see how it looks and that might turn out to be more more code more complicated so yeah it's a good thought it's a good thought but let's try to get this to, to work so it would be exactly the same as scale linear except that it would be scale time which we need to import from d3 and now that I think about it we may not need to specify the time formatter if the data is already parsed into dates which I'm not sure if it is um, let's see where's the data loaded where is the data await oh, oh parse row parse row where's that here it is yeah 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 so this is where we can say instead of just parsing the string into a number like this we can use time parse or yeah we need to come up with a parse date function that we can pass in that string and the way we can use um, 
D3 time format, or no, um, sorry, time parse. And then we can use that um, percent %y to parse those into dates. And we need to import time parse from D3. And let me just see if it's working by logging these out. Okay, they appear to be dates. That's good. And yeah, I think I implemented all the all the logic. Let's see if it works. It does. See that? Awesome. This is great. Yeah, this so now we have a truly generic scatter plot that can handle dates as well. But we're not quite done yet. Because um, the code is kind of a mess. I'm going to run prettier on it. Yeah, I mean, it's OK. But it is a little cumbersome with, the, with two levels of this. Um, you were asking about the switch statement. Let me see what time it is. Oh, it's noon. Yeah, let's try the switch statement. I always like to look at MDN for examples. This is what the switch statement looks like in JavaScript. So let me copy this and try it out. Okay, so if we use a switch statement, we're going to have to use let. So I'll comment this out for now. And let's just see how this plays out if we do use the switch statement. Let x. And then we are switching on x type. And if the case is categorical, then we say x equals this one here. And then if x type is time, then we use this one here. x equals that. Break. We need to put these break statements, otherwise it continues down to the next one. And then Finally, if it's quantitative, uh, which we're not even explicitly stating here, we're assuming that if it's not categorical and if it's not time, it's going to be quantitative. I think uh, that's fine. The default, yeah. Yeah, we could. So we can use the default here. Okay. Yeah, and then so the last case is this one x equals scale linear and then I'll try prettier on this and this is what we get and let's see if it still works oh there's something we didn't we didn't assign it back to the x-axis we didn't assign the new x back to the I, I think we also need to assign that range uh, which we did Oh, I missed Previously. the range. I missed the range. Ah, that's what it is. Good catch. So yeah, the way that this works is the return value from this expression is, you know, it's the value of x, and then we say dot range. So what we can do is just say x dot range like this. Okay, that works. Great, and so now it's up to us to decide which version is more aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, in this case, yeah. maybe the, 
the if and else makes sense, but maybe if we increase the number of of options, then switch would be better. I, I, I guess I don't know. Yeah, I, I like the case. I, I was wondering, just from a, I don't know this style um, works in JavaScript, but could when type is passed in, could that automatically call a function uh, that would render uh, that logic for the X assignment? Oh yeah. You know, I mean, other lang other languages where you just so so that you don't have anything there, <laughs> and that each of those would be a, a function in itself. Oh yeah. I think I think it may be complicated by the fact we have different types of domains depending on those different scales. And actually, I, I like the idea of abstracting it out into a function. That way, we could call the same function for x and y. And we can we don't need to put x and y in our in our stuff. So we can just have it a function of type. And data, and value, which is going to be the accessor. And in this case, we can just move this into the function. And then instead of instead of x, we can call it scale. And then we can switch on type. And then instead of x value, we can use value. All these places. Oh, type is not a reserved word here. I don't think it is. No, in JavaScript, I don't believe I don't believe type is a reserved keyword. Okay. And then we can return it at the end. And then all we have to do is say x equals compute scale, x type, data, and x value. And that still seems to work. And then once we've done that, we can use it for, for Y as well. So we actually get rid of a bunch of code, which is great. But the question remains, when we implement that function, should we use switch? Or this other thing. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but this is the process that you that you go through, and this is what I wanted to also convey in this in this course. Is like, what is the process of writing code? You have to make so many decisions, evaluate things based on efficiency, but also, you know, aesthetics. And you could do the same thing with if else, if, you know, you you could go on and on trying different ways. And I actually do that when I write code. I spend time evaluating all possible ways of doing one thing and then getting them all to work and then looking at the code from a number of angles you know how easy is it to read if I give it to somebody else in the future how easy is it going to be um, be able to be understood by someone else and also how efficient is it does it create additional new objects that you don't need to does it need to be optimized anyway these are all considerations um, can I have a quick question? Yeah. So in your switch, scale is assigned once, yet you still have to declare it as let. Because it's going to go past one of these cases only, and it's going to be assigned once, but you still have to declare it as let, not const. I believe so, yes. If you have the, um, well, actually, let's do some experiments with that. If we don't declare it there and we declare it here, I'm not sure if that would work. I'm not sure what the scoping rules are for for the switch. 
statement. But it says, it gives us an error that says the identifier has been already declared in the same scope. So this approach would not work. I see. And Thank you. If you if you use const here, that's also not going to work. Whoops. That's also not going to work because Oh, well, you need to assign a const uh when it's declared. But here's here's another approach that could work. If you don't define any variables, you could just return them. like this. Actually, this, this simplifies the code quite a bit. Then we don't need the breaks, because when we return, it's implicitly breaking out of the whole function. However, we need to pull out the setting of the range to be outside this function, which is, again, duplicated logic down here. We'd have to do it twice. So that's sort of a dead end. I would rather not do it like that. Ah. So let's see, is it still working? There seems to be some problem. Oh, I set the range, or what happened? Somehow it got messed up. That's odd. It was working a second ago. Is it because we missed the brakes again? No. It's the brakes are there. Is it because like the range takes this width thing? Like, but for a wide scale, you would need like yeah, height, margin bottom. Yeah, that's it. Oh, good catch, good catch. So in that case, maybe we do want to use the return approach and then set the range separately. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. So the range for the y scale is going to be, well, let me just see what it was in the one that I forked it from. I, I accidentally assumed that the range would be the same across each, but it's not. That's the right range. Yeah, that's right. And then, Now we can just use return. But let me keep this around as a reference. So this is option three. This is option two. And I was just thinking to myself, if we're going to use a return, we may as well just use if statements, which might be even more clear to read. If type equals categorical, then return this kind of a scale. And since we return it, we don't need to use elf. Uh, we, know, we don't need to use else. We could just have another if. So if it's time, then we can return this one. And then if it's nothing else, then we can fall through to the default of the linear scale. So this also works 
as an alternate way of doing it. So yeah, it's up to you. It's a stylistic choice. Um, I personally kind of like this just because it's only a couple lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. However, it could be cryptic for others to read if you hand it off to somebody else. So maybe maybe this is the best choice. Or maybe this is good. I don't know. It's it, it's a it's a very subjective choice. Yeah. But yeah, this this has been fun. Really nice work. And I like how how all of these I mean, this visualization, as well as the one that Kostov worked on, it highlights social inequality issues, which I think is a very important topic area to address with data visualization in particular, because it really makes clear things that are in the data. They're clear in the data if you look at the data in the right way. And so, yeah, I think this is a valid point. Like, why is why are there so many World Heritage sites in Europe? Does your is Europe really the like center of civilization, or is it just you know is this UNESCO neglecting you know other countries out of some kind of I don't know racist underpinnings? I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea about it. But but just to start investing these ang investigating these angles is uh, it's great. It's really interesting seeing how removing colors have brought this much clearer. Right, because color itself has a brightness value to it. It's called it, there's hue, saturation, and luminance in colors. And luminance is the it, luminance means how how much between white and black it is. But if you have hue, um, it confounds the the brightness. I mean. <laughs> Yes, and I think it's full circle that this is get it right in black and white. Right, and we and we turn the the, the visualizations into black and white. Exactly. Finally. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, I'm happy it ended up in black and white. Turns out black and white is clear. Is more clear, and it's the same with 3D. By the way, if you see 3D pie charts, 3D scatter plots, it's it's the same kind of thing as adding color, where you just make it like more flashy. But it doesn't really add any value most of the time. So yeah, as a next step for this, I would suggest trying to do the binning and the smoothing. And I wanted to show you all this thing that I built fairly recently that that does exactly that. It's a stream graph of D3 contributions over time. And it, what, it, what I did is I took... Um, D commits commit data from git from github um, on all the various d3 packages and i i bin to them by i think week and then i applied smoothing and i wanted to show you the effect of of changing the smoothing parameter see if there's no smoothing it looks something like this this is just the raw aggregated values per week and I think if you were to aggregate the data that you have per year, you would get something kind of similar to this, um, but with you know with a different layout. And you can apply smoothing though to get a more broad picture of of generally when things increased or decreased. It's a smoothed out view of it and. For this particular analysis, the smoothed out view is much more useful than the detailed view. You can see clearly, okay, D3 was developed monolithically from 2011 to 2014, and then it was split into a bunch of packages. And then some new packages were created after that. The, the other thing is it gave you an opportunity to annotate, which you just couldn't. With the, exactly. The, Exactly. There's no room for the labels in the version that's not smoothed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And even if you hovered over, you wouldn't get the insight. Yeah. It's tricky to, to hover over each and every one to try to figure out what it is. Yeah. 
So I forgot what it was originally. 15 maybe. That's cool. So yeah, this this one was a lot of fun to make. Um, I had hoped to continue this series and, and get to making something like this. But, uh, you know, in the future. I'll do it in the future. All right, well, I think we're going to wrap up. But, um... Let me see. Yeah, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you all for joining me for this, this ongoing saga of uh, Get It Right in Black and White with VizHub as our, as our tool. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the future sometime. And yeah, feel free to reach out to me um, if you want to get involved with upcoming versions of VizHub, maybe be a beta tester. Um, and just and let me know if you have any feedback on VizHub in general or the way I'm doing the courses, ways that things could be improved, um, what you've gotten out of it, um, what things that have been frustrating. I, I want to hear it all. Um, all right. So thank you all. Fantastic. Any, any final thank thoughts? Thank you so much, Curran. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Karen. I'll, I'll be in touch. <laughs> All right, great. And if you want to support me in the meantime, sign up for this measly $4 a month, and it'll go a long way. <laughs> yep, done. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you, Karen. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.